Chapter 11 The Desert The journey began. Mara pulled free of Ayaki's embrace, trying with all of her will not to cry. She climbed into her litter and looked one last time on the faces of her advisers, whom she might never see again on this side of the Wheel of Life. Nakoya, frowning harder than usual, probably to conceal her grief. Jikan, who had a harder time hiding his emotion, since his hands were empty of slates. Arakasi, shadow still, silent and, against his nature, looking grim. And Kiyoke, dependably expressionless, standing erect on the leg he had left, the crutches leaned unobtrusively against the door jamb. He wore his sword, but seemed a stranger without armour and warrior's plumed helm. God, Ayaki and the Natami, and may the gods of fortunate aspect look favourably upon our endeavours, Mara said. Somehow she managed to finish in the proper firm tone. Her advisers and the house servants arrayed behind them looked on with pride as she waved to force Commander Lujan to signal her army to march. The tramp of many feet lifted a dust plume over the road, as it had not since Sezu's time. That army had departed, and only forty had survived to return. An older generation of servants wondered if the past would repeat itself, while the newer generation sensed their fear. They watched three companies in green and a shiny black company of Choja march out bravely under the Shatrabird banner. The sun burned down through the morning mists and flashed off polished lacquer armour. It caught on the streamed points of spears and on the feathered crests of strike leaders, patrol leaders and officers' aides. At Sulanku, the Akoma host boarded barges. Naked slaves pulled them down river through the press of commercial traffic and grain barges, guild boats and raftsmen pulled aside to let them pass. Southward they floated through Hokani province, past the lands of the Anasati, where warriors in red and yellow offered them salute from the shore. Although Lord Takuma was a reluctant ally, Mara did not stop. He would make no overtures towards social friendship unless Mara returned from Dastari with her family honour intact. For Kevin, the river offered endless fascination. He spent even the hottest hours by the rail, talking to the barge master and the slaves who manned the poles with equal interest. He studied the watercraft, so different from those of his homeworld, and within days became expert at distinguishing guild colours from house crests, hired craft from those privately owned. Mara's army drew steadily towards the south, past flotillas of barges bearing market goods, some lashed together into permanent stalls that were patronised by the nobles who used the river as transport between Jamar and Salunkur. Fast messenger boats raced between slower craft, furiously paddled by sweating slaves. Once they passed an imperial barge, bright with gilt and hung with banners, its white and gold colouring a dazzling change from the many-coloured craft of the nobles. Mara travelled in her barge of state, which was green and adorned with a Shatrabird figurehead. She sat beneath a feathered shade, fanned by her slaves, and comfortably surrounded with perfumed flowers to mask the less pleasant stinks of sewage and river mud. Kevin saw other lords travelling in style, attended by musicians, poets and performers. One even had a troop of travelling players performing upon a stage for his pleasure. Overflowing baskets of fruit lay before him, and fat lapdogs lounged all over his pillows like so many beribboned sausages. Unlike the pets and hunting dogs of Midkemia, the dogs of Kelawan were short-haired and sleek as a consequence of the climate. They passed Thysa barges and travelling farm workers and what looked like the Kelawanese equivalent of travelling gypsy musicians. Cardengo! Mara identified, when Kevin mentioned the comparison, giving a brief description of gypsies. It is written in the old chronicles that they were a family that preferred wandering to taking land. They live in barges and wagons, it is true, 
much like your gypsies of Midkemia. But, unlike your barbarians, the Kardengo have honour. They do not steal for their living. Kevin laughed. The gypsies have their own culture. By their mores, they do not steal. Only... He paused, unable to find the right word, and settled for his own language. Borrow. Borrow? Mara squinted up at him where he lounged, chewing rinds dipped in vinegar. What is that? Kevin used other words to explain, and saw her raise her eyebrows in astonishment. Strange, he thought, that the Surani concept of honour allowed goods to be exchanged as purchases, gifts and spoils, but no equivalent to the neighbourly concept of lending a thing between friends existed at all. He prepared himself for another afternoon of talk as Mara explored the concept exhaustively. The river flowed into the great delta above the city of Jamar. There they held to the west side of the river, which took them into a deep channel leading to the harbour. To the east, the great delta fanned out, alive with rafts scurrying across the water as fishermen netted the soft-shelled denizens of the shallows or sought to capture game birds. Kevin openly stared as they entered the river traffic at Jamar, the major seaport and trade centre for Zetak and Hakani provinces. Larger than Sulanke, the city was grander and more sprawling. The wharves were built as wide as an avenue and elevated enough to loom over high tides when storms struck from the south. The length was as crowded as any thoroughfare, bustling with stevedores unloading the blue-water ships that made port from all parts of the empire. The ships rode high as the tide was almost full, and Kevin could see the rich tapestry of alien sights along the wharf as the Acoma barges passed. Bales of dye-stuffs lay piled next to lashed stacks of rare woods, alongside chests whose chops were ribboned and complex. Mercenaries stood guard over such shipments, indicating their value. The Acoma barges passed by a low-riding series of ferry barges, loaded to near sinking by stout crates. They leaked exotic smells of spices used to cure hides, perfumes and the rich aroma of ground chochala. The Acoma craft passed by landings piled high with rugs, prayer mats and yarns, leather and lacquer, spirits and resin. Each valuable shipment was shepherded by slate-bearing factors, hodonras and caravan masters. Under hot sunlight, two-wheeled vehicles pulled by slaves transported the goods from shipboard to docks and from docks into wagons on dry land. Kevin watched with interest those Surani he had never had a chance to glimpse before. Sly-eyed sailors drank jugs of liquor in the shadow of the alleys or paired off with the painted ladies of the reed life who displayed their fleshly wares from gallery boudoirs hung with perfumed silks. Street urchins begged coins and cart vendors hawked wares in a variety of sing-song calls. Bead sellers vied for shorefront space where incoming ships landed tenders to be first to sell trinkets for sweethearts to sailors coming ashore. Kevin felt a chill as they rounded the bulk of a large ship and the slave market came into view. Though it was ignored by the others on Mara's barge, Kevin recognised the compound at once from its high picket fence and the naked men standing in coffles with overseers snapping their goads. The female slaves were kept from the sun under canopies, and if they were no more clothed, the pretty ones were clean, so they might attract masters who would buy them for pleasure. Reminded by the sight that he was still Mara's property, Kevin's interest in Jamar's strange sights flagged at last. He felt no regret when the ship hired to carry the Akoma army across the sea came into sight. Nets were lowered for the Chojar to scramble up, and then the Akoma soldiers. Mara's litter was lifted while she calmly sat inside by the hoist used to load cargo. Then supplies were hurried aboard. The captain that Lujan had engaged to provide their overseas passage was efficient and determined to make the peak tide that was but minutes away. 
He called the dock crews to cast off, even as his sailors were lashing down boxes of Acoma supplies. The vessel drew away from the wharf, dragged into deeper, less crowded waters by a longboat with a dozen oarsmen. Slaves rowed in time to a drum pounded by a fat man in loincloth who called off rhymes to synchronise the dip, pull and lift of the heavy looms. The blades rose from the water in a flash of bright colours. Slaves had painted them in bright patterns to ward off ill luck at sea. Colteca was the name of the vessel Lujan had hired. She carried three masts and a massive carven tiller that took seven slaves to man. The ship drew off from the land, and the smaller craft used by fishermen and shore traders thinned out. The towboat cast off lines, and the pilot on board waved the disengaged signal to Colteca's captain, who barked commands to raise sail. Deck hands scurried aloft and loosed lines, and yards of fibre sails cascaded down and bellied into the wind. Standing in kaleidoscopic patterns of reflected light, Kevin saw that the canvas, like the slave's oars, was painted with symbols and patterns. The result lent the air of a circus tent, a mad riot of colours that held no harmony except to Sirani eyes. Kevin squinted, rubbed his temples, and decided that if he was a god of ill fortune, he would avert his gaze from such a ship, if only to keep from getting headaches. As he leaned on the rail and hoped he would escape the seasickness he had suffered on board a kingdom ship, he stared at the waves and wondered if Cole Tecker's keel was painted in patterns to ward off attack by sea serpents. After sundown, in a comfortable cabin lit with the fireless blue-violet globes made by the Chojar, he asked Mara. This required learning a new word, as the concept of sea monsters had never before been discussed. Ah! Mara cried in discovery, after a quarter hour of gestures and finally crude chalk drawings on a slate. I understand what you want to say. You ask about the Egu, large creatures similar to Reli that live in the deeps beneath the waves. Yes, the Sea of Blood is filled with them. Each ship carries lances tipped with oiled rags. You called them harpoons earlier, but they are not the same as darts to kill fish. An egu lance is always lit when fired. Sailors say only flame or a great one's spells will repel attacks by egu. Kevin rubbed his temples again. Dinner did not find him with any appetite, and he decided to retire to sleep. My great barbarian gets seasick, Mara teased, the healthy flush of her own cheeks a sure indication that the malady was no problem for her. She shot her lover a flashing glance and said, I know an infallible cure for belly aches." She then shed her robe without ceremony and tumbled into the alcove where he knelt, trying to sort cushions from blankets. His robe soon joined hers, abandoned in a heap on the floor. Further thoughts of Egu did not trouble his sleep after that, for he had no energy left to think. Colteca completed her crossing inside a week, untroubled by Egu and tossed by surprisingly few squalls. It is summer, Lujan said in answer to Kevin's inquiry. The winds are steady and the rain falls slight. He raised a sunburned arm and indicated the shoreline of Dastari, rising purple off Colteca's painted prow. Look, you can see our destination, the city of Ilama. The port in Distari differed greatly from what Kevin had observed of Jamar, built on granite hills and backed by jagged mountains. The wood and paper screen construction favoured throughout the mainland empire was here augmented by stone. Immense multi-tiered towers arose, their pyramid structures serving as watch stations for a massive crenellated wall. Other towers with light beacons marked the string of scattered islets that extended seaward arms to the west. The headlands bulked darkly rocky, 
between expanses of reddish-black sand of volcanic origin. The contours of the hills were steep-sided and lush with trees that had unfamiliar shapes. The smells on the breeze were also strange and peppered with a pungence of spice. The grinders of condiments have sheds at the harbour side, Lujan said when Kevin commented. Ilama does great trade in spices that grow only in the mountains to the south. The folk were also famous for their weaving and prayer mats woven in Dastari were reputed to carry good fortune in their threads. Fey blood ran strong in the folk from that shore. Many children born here grew up to take service with the Assembly of Magicians. Kevin longed for the chance to explore the town and watched the street traffic avidly as Colteca dropped anchor in the bay. Two wheeled carts moved along the decks, hauled by a six-legged creature much slighter than a nidra. Weaving flocks of scarlet and white shorebirds screamed and dived above the masts, chasing one another for the chance to snatch scraps tossed overboard by the cooks. Dirty urchins shouted, their voices echoing across the harbour as they likewise sought handouts. Suddenly, their cries stilled and they wheeled and fled into waterfront alleys. Kevin's interest sharpened. Onto the wharf marched soldiers armoured in yellow and purple. Bearers carried a lacquered litter hung with banners bearing the symbol of a cat-like animal entwined with a snake. Servants hurried astride to clear the way for the company, and the dock crews bowed low in deference. The Lord of the Zacatecas comes personally to meet us, Mara commented in some surprise. Poised by Kevin's shoulder and dressed in rich robes of green, she wore makeup that artfully managed to play down her youth. You didn't expect him? Kevin asked, turning to assess the reason for her nerves. I did not, Mara considered, frowning. That he has left his war camp to attend the arrival of the Akoma honours us. She waved to one of her maids and said quickly, Unseal my black lacquered carry chest. I'm going to need a finer overrobe. Kevin's eyes widened in surprise. The jewels you wear now are already blinding. Mara fingered the seed pearls and emeralds stitched in rows and whorls at lapel and cuffs. For a lord who rules one of the five families and the war chief of Clan Zakala, I shall wear metal. To appear in less than my finest apparel might be taken as insult, and this man is one my people must never risk offending. Sailors began to lower Colteca's tender, and under Lujan's direction, Mara's honor guard assembled on the deck, their armor polished and their spearheads adorned with streamers. The lady hastened off to change her robe. Kevin, dressed in Midkemian-style trousers and shirt, took his place among her cortege like a grey and white dove in the midst of a festival. Shortly after, Mara reappeared, clothed in an emerald silk overrobe, tastefully sewn with copper sequins. Kevin preferred it to the pearls, and said so. The reddish glint of the copper set off the deep brown of her eyes, but the compliment brought no smile from her. Lujan saw his lady settled on board the canopied tender that would bear her party ashore. The new force commander's light brand of humour also seemed absent, which Kevin interpreted as a cue to be restrained. Changed from the brash captive freshly taken from the battlefield, the mid had finally learned the wisdom of keeping quiet when the time warranted. That Lord Zacatecas was immensely powerful was apparent by the depth of Mara's bow made the moment she stepped onto the stone wharf to the personage in yellow armour and dazzling gold wristbands who sat like a king enthroned upon his litter. The Lord of the Zacatecas inclined his head, arose and returned a polite bow. He was an older man who did not appear dissipated. His flesh was sunburned and hard, and his hazel eyes shrewd amid their wrinkles. His dress was fine, yet not frivolous, and his mouth was bracketed by deep folds that hinted at irony as he smiled. Lady Mara, are you well? His voice was gruff, 
but well modulated. And Mara, looking up at him, smiled also. You honour me too much, my lord, she said in quick deference, by which Kevin knew the man had higher rank, but had not insisted she speak first. Lord greeted Lady in friendliness, with a public display of favour. I am well, Mara continued, her poise belying her strain, and greatly flattered to see you here. You are well, Lord Chipino? Well, indeed, the man replied with sudden acid sarcasm. He tossed back steel-coloured hair and laughed. Kevin could not see why, but decided the Lord was responding to some subtle nuance of Mara's as he offered his arm and led her forward. Lord Decio, may he and his cousins thy choking shall be made to regret this day. Mara murmured something in reply that caused the Lord of the Zacatecas to laugh again and to eye her with fresh appreciation. He completed a gracious motion, and the lady was handed into the Lord's own litter, a thoughtful courtesy, since his personal appearance had not been expected and time had not allowed the Acoma servants to unpack her palanquin. The company of warriors moved off in squares of black and yellow, offset like a checkerboard with squares of green. If I were younger, boomed the Lord in his gravelly voice, I would be minded to give young Hokanu some competition. Well, Kevin decided, with a small pang of jealousy, at least the Lord of the Zacatecas seemed charmed by the lady who desired his alliance. For which your beautiful lady wife would wish me poisoned, Mara demurred smoothly. Is Isashani well? Well, thank you, and grateful for my absence, which keeps her from becoming pregnant again. Turn here, Lord Cipino instructed his bearers. The company wheeled smartly across a narrow intersection and entered the canopied shade of an open-fronted hostel. A refreshment bar extended the length of the back wall and the sides were open framework. Soups, pastries and assorted blends of local herb brew called tesh as well as the usual chocha were sold here. Benches and tables emptied as patrons of lesser rank scurried to make room for their betters and a flurry of servants in smocks descended to clean up leavings and lay out clean cups and plates. Cipino saw Mara to a seat, took the Lord's place at the head of the table and set his elbows on the sanded planks, chin rested on his steepled fingertips. He regarded the girl who had routed Lord Jingu of the Minwanabi in his own home and whose quickness at the game was earning her notoriety. Around him, Lujan's warriors and Zacatecas were arrayed in defensive formation, leaving Kevin standing with the bearers just beyond earshot of the conversation. He could tell by Mara's bearing that the social chat ended and that discussion of serious matters began almost immediately. Servants brought food, which was laid aside barely touched, to make room for parchment maps and a series of slates brought in by a servant in yellow and purple livery. Presently, Mara waved for Kevin to come and stand at her shoulder. I want you to hear this, she said, and by her tone the Midkemian understood that she intended to ask his opinion later, when they had time in private for talk. The afternoon passed in discussion of the previous year's succession of skirmishes, which had resulted in Mara's summons from the High Council. There is only one thing to be concluded, Zacatec has wrapped up. The raiders from Suba are growing vastly more numerous and aggressive beyond their normal nature. What I would ask you is, why? Mara regarded the older man steadily, thinking. We shall find out, Lord Chipino. She spun her empty tesh cup with her fingers and said obliquely, Rest assured, my estates are vigorously fortified. The Lord of the Zacatecas smiled to show even teeth. Then, daughter of Sezu, we understand each other well. 
The enemy shall gain nothing of advantage. He reached out and lifted his goblet of Jamar crystal in hands that bore no rings. To the victory, he said softly. Mara met his eyes and nodded, and for some unknown reason Kevin felt chilled. The Coltecker had been unloaded by the time the Lord and Lady emerged from their table of refreshment. Mara's palanquin awaited beside Lord Chipino's, and servants had commandeered a herd of pack beasts. They were lightweight, six-legged, and, to Kevin's eyes, resembled a cross between a camel and a llama, except for the ears, which were scaled and whirled like a lizard's. Mara's wardrobe, chests and the tents, braziers, charcoal sacks, oil barrels and stores, and supplies for her army, had all been strapped to strange U-shaped racks that rode the creature's backs like saddles. The train was a very long one, noisy with the bleat of animals and the calls of swarthy-faced tenders who wore loose scarves at their throats. Drovers in baggy garments striped in garish colours prodded their charges into a straggling order of march, the human and Chojar companies formed up more quickly and ascent into the mountains began. Kevin followed with the rest of Mara's house servants. Distracted by a giggling child who rolled in the gutter by the roadside, he was startled by a splash of warm fluid. He spun, discovered a white gobbit of saliva dripping from his shirt sleeve and grimaced. Damn it to hell, he said in Midkemian. Lujan smiled broadly in commiseration. Don't stand too close to the Querdidra, he called in caution. They spit! Kevin flicked his hand and shed a foaming mess on the pavement. It reeked unpleasantly like rotted onions. Evidently, they don't like your smell! The force commander finished, laughing. Kevin eyed the offending pack beast, which was looking at him through violet, long lashed eyes and curling its monkey like lips. Feelings mutual, he groused and he wished it a painful attack of constipation and thorns in all six of its padded feet. Dustari was going to be peachy, he groused to himself, when the Kredridra that carried the supplies seemed to outnumber the soldiers. The mountains changed drastically as they approached the passes. Forested slopes fell away, scoured by winds and driven sand to bare rock. The smells of sun-heated stone replaced those of greenery and soil, and the land became a vista of bleakness. The high country dropped sharply off into a broken series of butts awash in vast oceans of sand. The sun burned in a sky pale green with drifts of airborne dust and cooked the lands beneath to a shimmering curtain of heat waves. The rock itself seemed to smoulder, rough-grained and textured red, black and ochre. The fires of its forming seemed very recent and renewed each day with the sharp blaze of sunrise. In contrast, the nights were chill, with dry gusts cutting through clothing like ice. It became no surprise that the drovers and native guides wore their neckerchiefs over their faces to protect them from wind-driven grit. Centuries of such weather had chiselled the rocks into odd formations, resembling towers or stacks of crockery, or sometimes demon-like pillars that seemed to prop up the Kelowanese sky. Kevin and Mara both stared at such shapes in fascination early on, but not after the first raid by desert men, which happened on the steep trail leading to the top of a pass. Aware first of a blood-curdling yell and a disturbance in the line of pack beasts up ahead, Mara whipped aside the curtains of her palanquin. What's amiss? Lujan motioned for her to stay back and then drew his sword. Mara peered around him and through the ranks of her honour guard saw small, broad-shouldered figures in dun-coloured robes leaping in a screeching charge from a cleft between the rocks. They grabbed the bridles of several Querdidra and dragged them bleating off the road. Sure-footed, even on loose stone, the creatures bucked and shied as warriors in Zacatecas' colours jumped down slope in pursuit. 
Lu Jan shouted to his first strike leader and signalled broadly with his sword. A coma warriors broke from the caravan line lower down on a switchback curve below their position. Their sally was joined, then overtaken by a fast-moving strike from a force of Cho Jia. Less sure than the insects, the humans fanned out in a wide ring to cut off the desert men. While the Cho Jia, under their strike leader, slipped past them and cut in an arc across the path of the raiders' descent. Defer to Lord Chipino's officers," Lu Jan commanded the Akoma. Then, as the Lord of the Zacatecas called something to Mara from his litter, the lady touched her officer's sleeve. "The Lord would have no live prisoners," she instructed. Lu Jan relayed the order. Kevin watched wide-eyed as the Choja overtook the raiders. Seeing the shining black insectoids race up slope to take them, with their helmets sitting square on faces that were nothing close to human, and upraised forelimbs lifted like razors to kill, the diminutive mountain men skidded to a stop. They drove the Quedidra forward with slaps and curses, trying to disrupt the Choja ranks. But Laxul's warriors were fast, almost black blurs in the sunlight, as they swerved around the fear-maddened beasts, and. Uncannily, they made no sound beyond the click of hooked feet on broken rock. The Choja flowed past the disturbance and came on, while the desert men spun and tried frantically to run. The slaughter was swift. Kevin, who had never seen Choja in war, felt goose flesh rise beneath his sleeves. He had seen men die, but never disemboweled from behind. With a single stroke of those black chitin-bladed forelimbs, the Choja were deadly swift, and they slew with a machine-like thoroughness. Your Choja makes short work of the nomads," Lord Chipino observed, his grim tone revealing he derived no enjoyment from the deaths. Perhaps they will think twice about harassing our supply trains into Ilama henceforth. Mara lifted a fan from her cushions and tapped it open thoughtfully. She cooled herself more from nerves than heat. Though blood sports did not appeal to her, she did not show squeamishness at the sight of battle and death. Why attack so heavily guarded a caravan? By Lashima, can't they see we have your honor guard as well as three companies of warriors? Down slope. The Akoma strike leader's men were ineffectively trying to round up the frightened Quedidra. Lord Chipino dispatched some of his own drovers to help, since their knowledge of the beast's handling was a necessity if the caravan was to be moving again before sundown. Who can say what motivates the barbarians? He concluded, regarding Mara across the space between Palanquin and Letter. If I did not know better. I would say we were fighting fanatics of the Red God. But the Dastari nomads did not believe in Turakamu, or so said the texts at Lashima's temple, where Mara had studied during her youth. The increase in border unrest made no sense, and the descriptions of engagements Lord Chipino had offered in the hostel over maps added up to nothing but a profligate waste of lives. Mara flicked her fan closed. More than ever, she feared for Ayaki, left at home on her estates. She had expected to cross the ocean to provide support and swift solution for the troublesome attacks on the border. Longing for a quick return home, she sensed that the problem was worse than she had initially thought. She might not be back for the fall planting, and that turned her heart icy with foreboding. Yet she did not speak aloud of her worries. When the caravan regrouped and started forward, she asked to be shown the mountain landmarks. Kevin walked beside her litter, listening to Chipino's best scout name the peaks, the valleys, and the rock tables that sometimes span the trail in wind-carved archways of stone. They need not have been in a hurry to orient themselves to this new strange land. 
Time weighed heavily during the months between engagements, and after the novelty of the early weeks, the stark, barren valleys soared at the spirit, and the vast desert horizons scoured the soul to insignificance. As often as he could, Kevin retired to Mara's command tent, which, though constructed of layers of sewn nidrahide, oiled to keep it pliable against the weather, was nonetheless opulent inside. Who passes? called the guard at the door flap. Kevin lowered the cloth he held pressed against his face and sucked in a dust laden breath. <coughs> it is I. The armoured guard waved him past with his spear butt. Kevin stooped, ducked through an inner door of fringes that filtered out most of the dirt, and blinked at the abrupt change in lighting. The main chamber of the command tent was lit by torches of oiled rags, supported in crockery sconces on poles jabbed upright into the earth. Hanging from the roof peaks were chojar globes, an eerie blue-violet that mixed uneasily with the warmer glow of flame light. The colours of woven rugs, cushions and hangings sparkled strangely, spiked by starred shadows that formed a mosaic of geometric patterns of their own, as though the belongings and their assorted shadow shapes formed some alien game board upon which people were the players. Try as he might, Kevin had never been able to liken the game of the council to chess. The Surani system of honour was far too convoluted a custom for a foreigner to break down into moves. The desert men's strategies, on the other hand, were less opaque. He had studied them exhaustively through the seasons that had passed since their arrival. The nomads sent raiders against the fortified passes, mostly at night and always in stealth. They sought to wear away at the armies of Zacatecas and Acoma, here through attrition and there through the nerve-soaring, actionless boredom. Day after day dawned with no battle beyond the wasp stings of raiding at night. The forays were just frequent enough and just well enough engineered to keep the armies on the hair-trigger edge of vigilance. The Zacatecas' forces had been stretched thin to keep all the minor trails through the mountains adequately guarded. With the support of the Acoma companies, Lord Chipino had hoped the raiders would acknowledge superior numbers and abandon incursions across the borders. Yet the desert men had done no such thing. Rather, they stepped up the frequency of their strikes, goading like insects flying at nidra bulls. As the months dragged by with no change, Kevin had been hesitant to venture his full opinion that the attacks held purpose behind them. He'd had the experience on the field to justify his hunches, but Surani killed Midkemian officers taken captive, and in preservation of his life he had never dared to admit his birth was noble to anyone this side of the rift save a handful of Midkemian slaves. Shedding his headcloth and sandals and leaving them for servants to beat clean, he now walked across beautifully woven carpets to where his lady sat on cushions, a sand table depicting the mountains and the desert border of the empire spread before her and Lujan. There you are, Mara said looking up. A river of raven hair spilled loose over one shoulder. She caught it back with a hand like fine porcelain and smiled her welcome. We were discussing a change in strategy. And she nodded to indicate Lujan. Interested, Kevin quickened his step. He knelt on the cushions opposite the sand table and studied the small clusters of green and yellow markers that represented Acoma and Zacatecas companies. The positions were clustered like chains of beads along river courses, passes and rocky steep-sided valleys, through which the winds keened after dark. Unless a sentry happened to catch the movement of the enemy silhouetted against stars or sky, he would not hear footsteps, only a chance rattle of gravel, which often as not was set off by wind, and an attack that happened in a flurried surprise ambush. The knives of the desert men were not metal, but they cut throats readily enough. We want to eradicate their supply caches, Mara said. Burn them out. Your opinion is of interest, since you have as much knowledge of the terrain here as any of us. Kevin licked his lips, 
a chill chasing his skin under the sleeves of his shirt and the broad-banded desert robe he wore like a cloak over top. He looked at the sand map and wondered silently whether this was precisely what the enemy hoped to do. Lure their warriors out of the defensible passes and harry them into ambush in the open. I suggest again, lady, that we not sally forth against these desert men. They hold all the advantage in their own country. I say, as I have said before, that we let them come to us and die on our spears with little cost to your companies. There is no honour in hanging back from attack, Lujan pointed out. The longer the lady is absent from her estates, the greater the danger to Ayaki. To wade through another turn of seasons wins her no gain in the game of the council, nor any stature in the eyes of the gods. It is not the fate of warriors to wait idly by while desert men treat their presence like that of Querdidra herders, staging small raids at their pleasure. Then you have no use for my opinion, said Kevin, biting back exasperation. I believe there is strategy in the movements of these nomads. You insist there is not. They are barbarians, Mara cut in. They raid across our borders because the land is rich and green. Why should tribes of desert men suddenly organise against a nation armed and prepared against them? What could they hope to gain except obliteration? Kevin heard her anger and took no offence, aware as he was that the time away from home had stretched out into almost a year and the separation from her son was wearing at her. Each month the trader's ships made port at Ilama and Jikan's messenger reached her, but no word arrived of an attack by the Minwanabi. She had left her best troops to guard the estate. Here, with the ones that remained, she had expected to lend support to Zacatecas and then be free to depart. But the attack at home had not happened, or at least, if it had, word had not reached them. And on this side of the Sea of Blood, the campaign was unexplainably drawn out and showed no signs of resolution. We must find the nomad supply caches and burn them out, she insisted emphatically, or else grow old in this wretched waste and never see satisfaction against Minwanabi. Her pronouncement ended discussion. The scouts went out. They made a five-day sweep of the lowlands that extended into a month of seeking. The nomads could not be tracked across sands continuously shifted by the winds, nor over swept slabs of rock. The Tsurani were forced to search for the smoke of cooking fires in a land that had no trees, but imported oil or charcoal for heat and light. The warriors had to lie for days in hiding, scanning the barren horizons for signs of enemy encampments. They marched across smouldering hardpan and found nothing. Just old fire rings filled with ash and burned bones, and sometimes the imprint where a hide tent had stood, or broken bits of discarded crockery. The nomads' caches of supplies remained elusively hidden. After three unfruitful months, Zacatecas and Acoma soldiers began taking captives. These unfortunates were dragged back to Chipino's tents for questioning. The desert raiders were small, of wiry stature, and often bearded. They smelt of querdidra and sour wine, and they wore leather studded with bosses of the pack-beast's horn and bone. Over this primitive light armour they threw loose-fitting robes in beige colours, tied with beaded sashes that held talismans denoting their prowess and tribe. Very tough, with skins weathered by the climate, few could be induced to talk. The ones that had looser tongues were not highly placed in their clan hierarchies. The caches they disclosed in the following four months were of little consequence – just a few skins of wine and some grains stored in earthen jars. Not enough to be worth losing warriors over, Lord Chipino said to Mara in a frustrated talk after a day spent in blazing sunlight, digging one such cache from the sandy floor of an arroyo. The Acoma command tent was still under the gloom of twilight. The calls of the sentries as the watch changed mingled with smells of roasting meat that drifted in through the flaps, 
opened to the cooling evening breeze. Charcoal smoke arose in blue puffs against darkening hills, and inside the smouldering of oiled rags threw cherry-coloured light through the decorative pierced patterns in the light sconces. Mara clapped hands for a servant to bring the Lord of the Zacatecas some tesh, sweetened as he preferred it. She said, Then you think we waste our time by searching the foothills? I do. Lord Gipino emphasised his frustration with a jerk of his chin. The supplies of the nomads must be held in the deep desert beyond our scout's line of sight, and where no trails exist to leave tracks. I believe we must attempt an incursion with perhaps two companies of warriors. The servant arrived with the Tesh, lending Mara a moment for thought. She had also come to feel that some similar tactic was necessary, and Lujan supported her. The only dissenter was Kevin, who tirelessly insisted that the nomads might be planning for just such a contingency. She gave a small shake of her head. Why should barbarians taunt her people to invade? What possible need might motivate them? None of this makes sense, Cipino said, tugging the straps at his neck to loosen his dust-caked armour. He scratched the leathery skin of his throat, almost frowning, then wet his gullet with the tesh. Its sweetness rinsed the taste of the desert grit from his mouth and also eased his temper. Isashani wrote to me to say that Hokanu of the Shinzawai came visiting in Ontoset. Mara raised her eyebrows. Is your wife by chance trying to matchmake? Zacatecas laughed. Perpetually. But in this case, with Hokanu's enthusiastic interest, so it would seem. The younger Shinzawai misses you. He asked after you more than once. And Isashani kept score, Mara prompted. At Chipino's resigned nod, she added, What brought Hokanu to Antoset? That's a bit far afield for him, I should think. That's just what Isashani pointed out, Chipino added. The interfering woman suggests that the young man came to trade for spices that can as easily be purchased in Jamar. Which implied he had gone specifically to speak with Lady Isashani to hear direct news of Dastari. Maru was unsure how to react to this, not certain that Hokanu's overt interest in news of her might not simply mask his father's latest ploy in the great game. The thought was interrupted by the return of that day's officer of the watch, with the dispatches brought in by the scouts. He bowed in deference. Mara gave him permission to speak before her guest, saving herself the trouble of sending word across to the Zacatecas camp later. No findings to report, my lady, the armoured man recited, his plumed helm crooked in one dirty elbow. One man was injured in a rock slide, and two more were killed in an ambush. The wounded are being tended in the camp by the South Mesa. The other five bands of scouts found nothing. Which added up to a loss that had no purpose, Mara concluded in silence. Needled by the progression of useless days, useless deaths, and no sign of change beyond attrition, she found her patience at an end. The nomads were just toying with them. About this, Kevin was correct. But to sit and wait without action was unacceptable. Mara excused her tired officer from duty, then met the dark, sardonic eyes of the Lord of the Zacatecas. The Akoma offer one company to march out in a foray beyond the foothills. My first strike leader, Migachi, will command, and a half patrol of Choja will go along to act as message bearers between here and the main camp. Lord Chipino of the Zacatecas inclined his head. He set his tesh cup on the low table, between the stone-weighted corners of the map scrolls and the slates and the ground-down ends of chalk, and reached for his sun-bleached helm. To the honour of our houses and the ruin of enemies, he intoned, 
I will send a company also, and a gift to recompense for your Choja, whose abilities I cannot match from my own ranks. The hive on our lands had no warriors to spare, with the unrest of House Zirentari on the northern borders of our home estate. Mara did not venture the fact that she had bargained with her own queen to breed extras. One did not divulge the unnecessary even to friends, for in the great game, today's allies could be tomorrow's bitterest enemy. She arose out of politeness and bowed to her social superior, though between herself and the Lord the forms were not always observed in private. I waive the need for the gift. Lord Cipino studied her, squinting slightly in the spangled light thrown off by the pierced designs of the sconces. You are wrong, he said gently, as he might perhaps have corrected a daughter. A woman in the beauty of her youth should never be permitted to languish in a desert without gifts. Mara flushed. She found no words to cover her intense moment of self-consciousness, so Lord Cipino smoothed over the embarrassment for her. Hokanu made Isashani promise to see that your charms were not forgotten in this desolate barbarian land. The Lady of the Akoma laughed freely, which was a change after two years that felt in isolation like captivity. You and Hokanu both are flatterers. Cipino turned his head, then shoved his helm over rumpled grey hair and left the chin-strap hanging. Well, it's true there are no women here to exercise that failing of mine. I'd flatter the Quadidra males if I could. He shrugged, but they spit. Do you spit? No, I don't think so. Then the true compliment came underhandedly, so she would not brush it off in a change of subject. Hokanu is a man of shrewd sense and fine taste. Else Isashani would have shown him and his questions out her door, you can be certain. The gift, when it came, was a copper bracelet wrought in the form of a shatterer bird on the wing and set with a solitaire emerald. It was beautiful, made specially for her and at a cost beyond the worth of a mere half-patrol of Choja, even were such warriors to die in the course of their duty. Mara laid the jewellery back in the velvet-lined box it had been delivered in. Why would he do this? She asked what she thought was an empty tent. Kevin spoke up from behind her shoulder, making her start. Cipino admires you for yourself, he wants you to know that. Mara's frown deepened. Lord Zacatecas, why should he admire me? He is of the five families, preeminent in the empire. What does he hope to gain from a house under siege by the Minwanabi? Kevin shook his head in a flash of impatience and sat on the cushions beside her. He reached up lifted her masses of loose hair and gently began to knead the tense muscles in her shoulders. Mara leaned into the caress with a sigh and surrendered knots of tension she had not noticed were there. Why should he? She persisted in reference to the Lord of the Zacatecas. Kevin's hands rested warmly on either side of her chin. Because he likes you. Not because he has designs on you, though I'll wager he might indulge in a little discreet dalliance if he thought you were of a mind, but he has no overt designs on you or your house or what gain he might make in the great game, lady. Not all of life is bloody politics. Too often you seem to forget that. When I consider your gift and Lord Zacatecas's motives... I see nothing but a man the age of your father who is pleased with you and who wishes to give you something that you yourself seldom do. A pat on the back, because you are competent and caring and well-loved. Well-loved? A wicked smile curved Mara's lips, which Kevin echoed. 
His hands moved gently and slipped the clothing from her shoulders. Together they sank back into the cushions in the soft warmth of the flame light, and their passions kindled in swift and wordless rapport. The patrols marched out the next morning to a blast of horns blown by the cooks from Lord Chipino's compound. So long had the Zacatecas troops been stationed here that they had taken on the nomad's custom used to inform the gods and the enemy that the day began in triumph. An army marched at sunrise, and the fanfare was intended to make its enemies tremble. In the months that followed, nothing happened quickly. Mara took to waiting on the heights in the lookout nook manned by the scouts. The wind-swept table of rock had no shade, so she exchanged her woven straw headdress for a boy's helmet wrapped with a gauze-thin silk scarf. As the days passed, she grew as adept as her warriors at spotting the trailing puffs of dust that signalled the return of a Choja messenger. At such times, she would send a runner slave to inform Lord Chipino then scrambled down the rocky trail at speed to meet the incoming warriors. Her legs grew as firm as any boy's from such climbing, where litter and slaves could not bear her. Lujan was a wise enough commander to observe that the lady's presence had the effect of inspiring his men to diligence. Unlike many Tsurani nobles, this lady gained thorough understanding of the conditions under which her sentries and patrols addressed their duties. She did not demand that they keep impossible hours under the noon sun, nor did she complain when the heat waves off the distant sands obscured the visibility and caused conflicting reports. Although she vastly preferred finance to warfare, she made it her business to study the fine points of strategy and supply. She had as good a grasp of their predicament as any of her officers, but her innovative perceptions could not affect what seemed to lack purpose or pattern. The reports sent back by the companies assigned to patrol in the desert did little to reveal the border deadlock. One small cache was discovered and destroyed, along with the nest of nomads that protected it. Two more months passed in fruitless search, and then another spent chasing down false leads. The Chojar brought word of an oasis gone dry and the remains of a stock burrow that had been uprooted in apparent haste. The patrol who gave chase to see if they could overtake the nomads who had deserted the site exhausted themselves in a fruitless march. Of those who remained to investigate, two soldiers were injured when the ground gave way over a pit trap. Infection claimed the life of one, the other was sent back by litter. He would never walk again, and requested honourable suicide by the blade. Mara granted permission, and barely managed not to curse Chochokan for the waste of a fine man. Another season passed without event. The Lady of the Akoma grew sharp-tempered with brooding. We should send out more soldiers, she snapped to Kevin, while combing her hair with sweet oils, since water for baths was wasteful and one had to remove the dust somehow. The Midkemian paused, then pointedly went back to restringing a broken lace on his sandal. This discussion had taken place repeatedly, and each time he had insisted that a march from the mountains in strength was what the enemy desired of them. The words had been said, but the one fact that would have lent his advice credence remained an unvoiced secret. Month after sun-blazing month, Kevin bit back any comment that might reveal his prior military experience. To admit that he had been an officer in command on the field in mid Kemia was to ask for a sentence of death. Yet, even ignorant of his past, Mara did not discount his opinion entirely. Though she was the more impetuous of the two family rulers charged with border patrol in Dastari, it was Lord Chipino who brought up the need for aggressive tactics at the last. He came into her tent just past twilight, bringing the smell of charcoal fire and roast chalnuts that he had been sharing over coals with his strike leader. I've had word from the desert companies, he opened, without bothering with social ceremony. They captured a nomad trader, 
and I think we have a lead. At least, we know where large caravans from the other side of the desert have been leaving off grain parcels. Mara snapped her fingers for servants to set out warm tesh. My choja say the same, but add that the sand smells of footsteps. By now, all had learned to trust the fact that the insects could scent traces of the oils the nomads used to cure their sandal leather. The caravans are no falsehood scent to lead us astray. She gestured to her sand table, which, through nearly two weary years, had come to dominate the front chamber of her command tent. Over the course of the campaign, the mountains had been levelled and reformed to one side, allowing space for the broad, undulating valleys of desert dunes that lay beyond the border. The topography was done by a wizened old man with a squint, paid exorbitant rates to be absent from his large family and trade in Ilama. But on that table, paid out in pins with beaded heads, Mara knew the location of every one of her soldiers. Let us compare what we know. She invited Lord Chipino in what had lately become an evening ritual. But, in a departure from the routine, she and the Lord began a parley that lasted deep into the night. Their voices rose and fell with planning over the moan of the wind across the tent ridges and around the sigh of the draughts that rippled the hangings and fanned the embers in the light sconces scarlet. Lord and Lady reached an accord without argument. Come the morning they would each call up another company. Leaving two companies of mixed troops to keep the border, they would journey with the rest into the desert and join the army there. A faster patrol would hasten ahead with orders to supply the newest leads and locate the nomads' main supply caches. When we arrive with the two new companies... Lord Chipino concluded, We will have an army of a thousand with which to formulate our attack. He rose, his multiple shadows thrown by the Chojar lights swooping across flame patterned carpets. Better we attack in force than sit like poets in the heights. To wait out the year is to give those barbarian nomads more honour than they justly deserve. That night, Kevin lay sleepless in the dark. He listened to Mara's breathing and the endless moan of the winds and the creaking of the lines that lashed the tent. To leave the mountains with an army would be a mistake. He knew it. But a slave in the empire was accorded no honour and his voice would not be heard. But where the lady of the Acoma went, so he would go also. He loved her too well to stay behind. The huge centre pole crashed down and what seemed acres of canvas billowed slowly down to the ground. Kevin dashed, tripping over a mound of rolled throw rugs and all but knocked over Mara. You're taking the command tent, he asked, using his own clumsiness as an excuse to capture her in an embrace. Mara raised her eyebrows in reproof. But of course... She sounded as if carting chests of tapestries, carpets, sconces and braziers into a hostile and barren desert were a foregone conclusion. The Akoma are not barbarians. We do not sleep on the ground like peasants unless we are travelling in disguise. She waved at the swarms of servants who laboured to dismantle her dwelling. Lord Chipino's tent is far larger. By the size of our pavilions, the nomads will know they reckon with great families. Kevin pulled a face. And uh, seeing the size of your respective tents, they will run like jigabirds from trouble? Mara's brows rose a notch higher. They are not civilised. Meaning if they were, they'd run like jigabirds. Kevin qualified. You have a habit of repeating the obvious. Mara pushed impatiently at his hands, which were stroking her intimately through her thin robes. Not now, busy man. When I insisted that you stay at my shoulder, I did not mean bed sport in plain view of gods and sky. 
Kevin backed off, smiling. The Quadidra drivers have rounded up their herds. He glanced at the growing piles of chests, carpets and cushions. Are you certain you have enough pack saddles for all this stuff? Mara looked exasperated. One more comment, and I'll have you carrying a share like a bearer slave. Very likely you belong with them anyway, as punishment for incurable insolence. Kevin bowed with mock deference and hurried off to help bridle the insufferable and fractious-tempered six-leggers. By damn, we'll be lucky to have this army marching before sundown, he muttered as he passed out of earshot. In fact, it took until noon. The army under Lord Chipino and Lady Mara moved off to a fanfare of horn calls and the snap of Quadidra drivers' goads. The litters of the Lord and the Lady moved in the centre of the column, surrounded by the protection of their soldiers. With Chojar patrols leading and following, and an advance guard of scouts, the columns wound their way downward from the heights and into the dense heat of the flatlands, looking more like a merchant's caravan than an army. The pace set was brisk, despite the unrelenting heat. Once the mountains fell behind, the warriors marched over the loose, ever-shifting sands, their progress marked by a rising trail of dust that was visible for miles in all directions. Any nomad child with eyes would know that a large force was moving against them, and sound carried far on the winds. Secrecy was impossible in any event, with the dunes devoid of plant life or shelter of any kind. Barren tables of rock thrust up through the sands, wind carved into fantastic shapes and sliced by deep chasmed arroyos that sometimes held springs in their shadowed, almost cave-like depths. Any of these might hide a camp of enemies. The tribes would be watching the armies of the Akoma and the Zacatecas, trying to determine whether to stay where they were and stage ambush, or to slip away under cover of blown dust and nightfall, to avoid getting bottled up inside and slaughtered. The land was unsuitable for pitched battle of any sort, Kevin decided. Superior numbers were the only assurance of victory, and no one could guess how many desert clans were allied for the campaign against the Empire. They could be holed up in the rocks on all sides, or they might melt away invisible while the army marched itself to exhaustion in search of them. Gouging loose sand from beneath the straps of his sandals and feeling the blisters starting underneath, Kevin swore. If you were a desert man, armed with long knives and poisoned arrows, your tactics in provoking a large war force made sense only if you had a trap out there, carefully set and awaiting the army to spring it. The whole thing reeked of long-range planning. Yet Mara stayed reluctant to see reason. The desert tribes cannot be bought, she said under the stars when at last they made camp. It was too hot and still yet to retire into the command tent, and slave and lady sat companionably on a carpet, snacking on dry wine and quadidra cheese. There are too many tribes, and too many split loyalties. Wealth has no meaning to a chief if he cannot carry it with his tents. Kevin conceded this point in silence. He had observed enough of the desert men taken captive to appreciate the point. They might be diminutive, but they were as fiercely proud as the dwarves of his homeworld, and argumentative as a sand snake. They tended to bite first and worry about survival after. They were children of a harsh country, where death walked behind every man. Most would jump through fire rather than betray their tribes, and their chieftains, as near as Kevin could see, fought and killed one another as readily as they raided the Surani border. We should sleep soon, Mara said, interrupting her barbarian's brooding. We shall have to be well up before the dawn to allow the servants enough time to dismantle my quarters. Kevin shook grit from his tunic and cursed as it contaminated the last few swallows of his wine. We might sleep right here, he suggested. Barbarian!
barbarian? The lady laughed. If there was an emergency, how would my force commander find me? If an assassin chanced to come for you, that could be an advantage. Kevin arose and extended a hand to lift her. Show me the assassin who could get through Lujan's patrols, Mara retorted, slipping comfortably into his arms. Which was true enough, Kevin reflected, but not in the least reassuring. If the nomads had intended to send assassins, they would have done so without baiting a whole army. The next week's march led them into a country of rocky tablelands and dunes crowned with broken clutches of boulder. The army was hemmed in by poor footing, forced to straggle through deep sand in a twisting succession of narrow valleys. The place had a canyon-like feel, not at all to Kevin's liking, and even Lujan voiced doubts. But messengers from the advance troops rushed in with excited word that there was a cache, a large one, as well as a sizable force of desert men encamped on the hard pan on the other side of the hills. Mara and Lord Zacatecas held parley and decided to press on. The Choja do not get mired in this sand, Mara explained to Kevin when the latter questioned the decision. They are fast and fierce and the heat does not slow them. One company of Choja is worth two of humans in this desert. And what can the barbarians do as counter-offensive against that? There was no ready answer. The army marched on until night fell over the land and the copper-gold moon of Kelowan rose and bathed the dunes in metallic light. Mara retired to the comfort of her command tent and the soothing voice of a musician while Kevin paced the camp perimeter and wrestled with conflicts of his own. He loved the lady. She was in his blood and nothing could change that. But did he love her enough that he should risk his own life? The Midkemian walked, listening to the talk of the warriors and the banter that passed between them. The language might be different, but soldiers on the eve of a conflict were no different here from those in the Kingdom of the Isles. Honour notwithstanding, the warriors of Mara's army diced and joked and upbraided one another, but they did not mention death and they avoided talk of loved ones left home on the estate. Dawn broke in a haze of fine dust thrown up by the restless breezes. The servants by now had the knack of collapsing the great tents. The Quadidra had stopped spitting and grown resigned to their added burdens, or else they were too thirsty and too wise to waste fluid, Kevin thought, as he worked grit from between his teeth and sipped sour water from a flask. Too soon the army was gathered into ranks and marching through the defile that wound down between Messas to the hardpan. The nomads were massed there, waiting, a motley spread of perhaps eight hundred drably clothed warriors clustered around tribal banners woven in bright colours and embellished with the cured tails of Kurek, an animal resembling a fox. Kevin looked on them and felt the skin of his arms crawl with goose flesh. While the warriors of the Akoma and the Zacatecas formed ranks and readied weapons, he retied the laces on his light midkemian style brigandine and hung close by Mara's litter. There, Lujan, Lord Zacatecas, Moxel, the Chojar force commander, and Envedi, who commanded the Zacatecas army, held conference. They would attack the ragtag force of tribesmen, their honour required it, as performance of their duty as guardians of the Empire's southern border. Kevin wished Sirani custom allowed a slave to bear weapons, for that this army prepared for disaster he had not the smallest doubt. I will lead my two companies into the valley and attack in a frontal charge, Lord Zacatecas rumbled in his bass voice, if the barbarians break and flee before us, your Choja company can flank and engage from the rear and cut them off. If the desert men do not run, then Zacatecas will send a great offering to Turakamu. Mara inclined her head. 
as you wish, she intoned formally. Although Lu Jan would have preferred to send in a mixed company of Akoma and Zacatecas warriors, Lord Chipino had social seniority. His were the more experienced officers, and Mara had made it clear that she desired alliance, not rivalry, between her house and that of Zacatecas. To contend over the war honours and protocol would not be to a coma advantage. The sun climbed toward noon, and the shadows shrank beneath the rocks. The army of Lord Zacatecas formed up into battle array and aligned itself for the charge. Mara set observers upon the crests of the escarpments on either side and arranged messenger runners to carry dispatches. The air was still, the silence complete. Kevin stood sweating at Mara's shoulder, almost wishing for the scrape of chitinous shell that the Chojar made while wetting their blade-like forelimbs to a razor sharpness for killing. His teeth were on edge anyway, and the sound would have justified the discomfort. Then the horn sounded, and the Zacatecas force commander signalled the charge. In a wave, the warriors in yellow and purple broke into a run toward the valley. Kevin shivered before a horrible, gut-ringing premonition that disaster was about to overtake them. Lady, he said hoarsely, lady, listen to me. There is something I desperately need to tell you. Wholly engaged with watching the army that descended at a run toward the hardpan and the screaming ragged ranks of desert men who surged yipping to meet it, Mara glanced barely in Kevin's direction. Let it wait, she snapped. I'll hear you after the battle. Chapter 12 Snares The army charged. From a niche in a cleft of rock behind the desert men's lines, Tassayo licked his teeth. Good. Good, he murmured gently. At last we have the Lord of the Zacatecas precisely where we want him. The strike leader at Tassayo's shoulder restrained an urge to scratch an itch beneath his armour. Do you wish our offensive to begin now, sir? Tassayo's cat-yellow eyes blinked once. Fool, he said, with no change of tone, but the strike leader squirmed back. We do not attack now. But when Lord Zacatecas has fully engaged his troops and is absorbed with the slaughter of tribesmen. The strike leader swallowed. Sir, that is not what you told their chiefs in last night's council. Tassayo lounged back, his hair dark like copper against his cheek, a fine stubble showing just in front of his ear where his helm strap had worn the growth short. Of course not, he said in the same velvet tone. The tribes would hardly have committed their people to a battle to the death, the slinking cowards. The strike leader of the Minwanabi tightened his lips and said nothing. Tasayo laughed brightly. You think I have acted dishonorably? Uh, uh, of course not, sir, the strike leader stuttered hastily. He had heard that laugh before, and learned to fear what action might follow. "'Of course not!' snapped Tassayo, in disgusted imitation of his junior officer. "'The desert men are barbarians, without honour, and the promise to their chiefs is as wind. Turakamu will avenge no people who question his divine truth.' The desert men are soulless bugs, and even a land such as this will be cleaner without them. As you say, sir, the strike leader said obsequiously. His fawning disgusted Tassayo. He turned aside and watched the oncoming ranks of the Zacatecas crash into the lightly armed desert men. Weapons clattered against weapons, and screams arose as the first of the fallen watered the dry sands with their blood. Wait. Tassayo soothed his near-to-fidgeting strike leader. We shall attack in due time. 
He leaned against the shoulder of stone, totally at ease, as if the sounds of death and battle were music to his ears. The Minwanabi strike leader maintained his own calm by strength of will. If he was disturbed by the sight of their desert men allies being cut down and slaughtered as a sacrifice, he said no word. Stiffly correct and obedient to his master, he observed without flinching as the desert men were driven back and back again, leaving their numbers in thrashing, bleeding heaps upon the sand. The soldiers of Lord Zacatecas were thorough, efficient, and in no mind for showing mercy. They had been prisoned for years in a backlands post with a cruel climate and had suffered the insect stings of a thousand covert raids. Their swords reaped lives in bloody slaughter until the surviving desert men broke and fled. Tiny as a doll on a distant field, the Lord of the Zacatecas raised his blade and his force commander called the companies to form ranks and pursue. For the honour of the Empire, and in hopes that the border unrest might be ended, his warriors regrouped and surged forward. Tassio's eyes narrowed slightly, measuring distances. As if the Zacatecas' forces crossed a line invisibly drawn in his mind, he said to his sweating sub-officer, in an inflection that did not change from the beginning, Now, Shagatiri, now. Signal the start of our offensive. On the rise, overlooking the hardpan, Lu Jan nodded to himself. They're routed, look! And he waved a hand as the ranks of the desert men broke apart into fleeing knots. Zagatekas will regroup and pursue now, without needing help from the Choja. Mara looked up from her seat on the litter which rested on the ground at the top of a knoll. She pushed aside the gauzy fabric that served as a veil to keep the blown dust off her face. You sound disappointed. Lujan shrugged. What newly appointed force commander would be pleased to sit idly by with a battle going on? He gave a wry smile. My lady's honour is mine. I accept the wisdom of her choice. Mara smiled also. Nicely spoken. Also, a forgivable lie. I promise you all the action you wish when we get out of this desert, and if there is an Akoma Natami to return to. As if her words were an omen, a horn call split the air. Far down in the valley, on either side of the hardpan, where Zacatecas' two companies were pursuing tribal warriors, a dark tide flanked the dunes. Lujan spun his humour fading, and his hand half clenched on his sword-hilt. Mara turned also, her veils whipped aside by the motion. She saw tribal banners and rank upon rank of figures in odd bits of armour and desert garb advancing to hit Lord Zacateca's troops in the flank from two sides where the forces met. They would seal off retreat into the hills where Mara's support companies waited. Swiftly, with eyes sharpened by Kiyoki's training, the lady counted phalanxes. She estimated quickly and found Lord Chipino's force was outnumbered two to one. Worse, her heart slammed in recognition, these were not desert men. To a man, the advancing army stood full height. There was not a diminutive figure of a tribesman among them, which meant but one thing. They were not of this land, but impostors, enemies from within the Empire in this war to see an end to her house, despite their barbaric aspect. Minwanabi! she cried sharply. So this is what Desio planned! She raised widened eyes to her force commander and tried not to show the knife thrust of fear that pierced her. Lujan, rally our men! We must hit this new army from the rear, or Zacatecas will be slaughtered in the field! Lujan began a hasty bow, his lungs already filling with air to raise his shout of command. Wait! Kevin's cry cut between with an intensity that demanded hearing. Mara turned white. Kevin! she snapped in a near whisper. You presume too much if you think to interfere between sworn allies. There is honour at stake here. She jerked her head at Lujan. Continue, Force Commander. 
Kevin shot up from his crouch, very fast for a man of his size. He reached out, caught Lujan's arm, and then froze as the Force Commander's blade cleared its scabbard, snapped down, and stopped in perfect control against the bones in his wrist. A fine line of scarlet opened where the skin split under the edge. Stop! Mara said. Her voice shook, as it never had in the memory of any man present. In the valley, the shouts of the armies reached a crescendo, and the rattle of shields and swords clashing together added to the din as the Zacatecas' forces wheeled to take the shock of the enemy reinforcements. Mara flicked dark eyes from her force commander to her slave, and even her lips were white. You might lose your head for this transgression. Her expression showed that with house honour resting on her aiding Zacatecas, even her feelings for Kevin were of no consequence. Kevin started to loosen his grip, then reversed the motion. He looked at his lady, grim, with an expression she had never seen. His eyes were too wide, his mouth tight, and his breathing shallow and fast. I have reason. Lujan stood like a statue, his blade a whisper of a touch against skin that bled a trickle of scarlet. Speak then, Mara said tersely. Quickly, for Zacatecas soldiers are dying while we delay. She did not add that if this was another of his barbarian whims, he would hang for it. No matter what her love for him, the name of her ancestors must never be disgraced. Kevin swallowed. Lady... If your warriors charge in Zacatecas' defence, they will all die in a trap. Her eyes did not change, but stayed flat without feeling. Lady, I know! Almost Kevin found himself shouting. He controlled himself. I have seen these tactics before, on my world. There was a small company of our people in a glade before a walled city. They routed the local conquerors and were advancing only to be attacked from the rear. The force that rushed to support was set upon by ambush, and they were, all of them, cut to pieces. Mara's manner did not thaw. Still, she jerked her chin at Lujan, who withdrew his blade in silence. Kevin loosened his fingers. They were shaking. Lady, on my life, withhold your charge. Her eyes yet bored into him. You were a common soldier. How do you presume to advise? Kevin closed his eyes, shrugged in his brazen, offhand manner, and seemed to come to an inward decision. Apparently careless and hiding his inner desperation, he spoke what should have been his death warrant. I was an officer on my home world of Midkemia. I commanded my father's garrison when taken captive in the field. He waited. Mara said nothing. He realised that, against custom, she was granting him further leave to speak. He went on. You have said that Tasayo of the Minwanabi was sub-commander of the warlord's troops beyond the rift. I have fought against him, and I earnestly believe that the battle plan before us on the hard pan has his stamp and signature. Mara moved her hand, indicating he should be silent. Kevin stopped talking. He searched her face for some clue upon which to gauge the reception of his remarks. You realise, she said presently, that if you are wrong, I must have you hanged. More, you will have brought ruin to us all, even to my young son at home. Kevin expelled an explosive breath. I am not wrong, Mara. And he stared levelly back. Mara seemed to stir as if from a spell. We are better off dying in defence of Lord Chipino than surviving in cowardice by hanging back. Lujan nodded grimly at her shoulder. Exasperated, Kevin rubbed the shallow cut on his wrist. There might be a way to save your bacon. Bacon? Mara said in puzzlement. What has this to do with animal fat? I meant turn the tables on the Minwanabi, Kevin snapped. The clamour of battle on the hard pan was drawing closer, with the Zacatecas taking losses, and the desert men survivors fleeing in small puffs of dust over the farther dunes. If I am right, Tasayo will have another war host concealed in these hills.
He will expect us to charge onto the hardpan. His reserve troops wait in hiding to hit us from the rear. Then the companies engaging Zacatecas would split themselves into two forces. He held his hands to illustrate. One company would simply hold Zacatecas in place while the other counterattacked your force. Your companies would find themselves surrounded and annihilated, with Zacatecas' troops cleaned up afterwards. And you propose? Lujan prompted urgently. Kevin raised his eyebrows. I say we send a small company down to aid Lord Chipino. We send the rest of our troops back down the valley we marched in through. Then we send a fast-moving company with the Chojar to surround the hills where Tasayo's troops are in hiding and harry them out into the open, over the hills and into the company in the valley. Our attacking companies will have the advantage of height. With decent timing, our archers can pick a third of them off before they hit our centre lines in force. We'll have a battle in the valley, but one we stand a chance of winning with all our enemies surrounded. We could drive them into Zacatecas waiting spears. Lujan spun his blade, expertly flicking off the fine traces of blood that marred the edge. His voice held disgust as he answered Kevin's bold plan. Your ideas are no better than a dream. Only Chojar could move fast enough to affect the manoeuvre you describe, and one company of them will not be enough to surround this stand of hills. We'll have to try, Mara cut in or else be caught in this Minwanabi snare and break our trust with the Lord of the Zacatecas. No, Kevin corrected. He glanced across the incline to where the Chojar waited, still as statues in their ranks. He wondered briefly whether the creatures had a prickly sense of dignity, then gave that up as moot. Mara and all of her following were going to be cut down where they stood if Minwanabi had the chance to complete his offensive as planned. Not to mention the fact that he, Kevin of Zun, would be hanged in disgrace if he proved wrong. With a fatalistic sigh that approached a laugh, the Midkemian sucked in new breath and related his intentions to Mara and her force commander. Tassio repressed a shameful desire to slam his fist against the rocks. Damha! Why does the whore not order her troops to charge? Her brother and father were not cowards. Why does she hesitate? On the hard pan, cooked under the merciless noon sun, the Zacatecas forces retreated into a tight-knit defensive shield ring. Pinned in place and surrounded by enemy warriors, they could do nothing but close ranks and suffer losses until Mara sent in relief companies to save them. The black and yellow banner with its sigil poked stubbornly from the press of defenders, now and then obscured by blown dust kicked up by the battle. Tasayo squinted across the hard pan, littered with the limp, blood-soaked dead of the tribes and the yellow and purple armour of fallen Surani. He stared until his eyes burned at the low stand of hills beyond, seeking to sort out the movement that ran like the seething water on the boil through the Akoma troops still stationed there. Why does she hold back? Tasayo snapped impatiently. Her ally stands in peril of his life, and all her family honour is in jeopardy. On the hard pan, pinned down by enemies, Lord Chipino was likely wondering the same thing. A horn call arose from the company beleaguered on the plain, signalling urgently for aid. In answer, a small dense square broke away from the rise of the hills and advanced upon the battle that swirled the lowland dust. A half company looks to be, offered the Minwanabi strike leader, trying to be helpful. I see that. Tasayo stroked his weapon hilt repressed a peevish impulse to pace, and instead gathered up the plain, unplumed helm he had acquired for his campaign in the desert. I need a better vantage point. He snapped the buckles and jerked the strap adjustments tight. And find me runners. We are going to have to send messages to the companies hiding behind the ridges to inform them the battle is not proceeding at all as we had planned. Yes, sir, as you command. The strike leader hastened off, clumsy before Tassayo's angry grace. Yet the irritation of his senior held nothing of discouragement. 
battles did not always go as intended. The brilliant man, the master tactician, was the one who could turn setbacks to advantage. Lujan placed a hand in trepidation on the slick, horny carapace of the chojar. He resisted the impulse to ask the insectoid strike leader again if he minded the idea of carrying a human rider. The creature and its fellows had agreed to Kevin's outlandish request, and to question again would be to cast doubt on Chojar dignity. Moxel, you will tell me if I discomfort you. The Akoma Force leader offered by way of compromise. Moxel turned his rounded, black-armored head. His eyes lost in shadow beneath his plumed helm. I have strength sufficient for the purpose. He intoned. Perhaps I should crouch lower for you to mount. Lujan cringed inwardly. No, he said quickly. That's not necessary. He decided that he would rather split his britches than allow the Chojar officer to act in the least bit subservient. He wondered, as he searched for a nearby rock to use as a mounting block, whether, if their roles were reversed, the human warriors in his company would take as kindly to the dictates of necessity. Perhaps Kevin was right that the Sirani concept of honor was self-limiting. Then, as Lujan scrabbled ungracefully to find perches on the smooth, chitinous shell of his mount, he banished such impious thoughts. It was ill to contemplate blasphemy with battle in the offing. If the Akoma had earned the wrath of the gods, he would find out soon enough. Feeling a trepidation that for honor must never be revealed, Lujan gripped the chojar behind its neck segment and swung his leg over its rounded, faintly ridged middle. He sprang and hauled himself astride. The creature's triple sets of legs depressed and recovered to compensate for his weight, and around him the company of human warriors paired off with an equal number of chojar followed his bold lead and mounted. If they found their seats slippery or uncomfortable, they withheld complaint. How do you feel, Moxel? Lujan asked. The Chojar's voice sounded strange coming from a point to the front of and below him. The creatures habitually walked upright when in the presence of humans, using all six of their legs only to run at need. You are considerate to ask of me, Force Commander. I am not in distress. Instead, I would ask that you have a care for the safety of your lower hind leg limb, that my bladed lower forehand limb not give you injury when we run. Lujan looked down and saw that indeed his ankles and shins would be at risk of getting diced when the choja extended to full stride. I presume to suggest, Moxel continued politely. Fix your knee behind the lateral knob on my carapace. The protrusion might offer you support. You presume in kindness, and I thank you," Lujan replied in somewhat stilted politeness that marked the etiquette of the hive-born. He slid his leg farther underneath himself and found that the bodily feature Moxel mentioned did indeed serve as a wedge to steady his seat. Then, at a loss, he searched the top of the insectoid shell for somewhere to grip with his hands. His efforts met with Moxel's tinny laugh. The creature tilted its head and managed to twist its face around to look at him in a manner no human could repeat. Force commander. My parts are not soft like yours. Your hands may grasp my throat joint with safety. My windpipe is protected quite sufficiently by my exoskeleton and will not be disturbed by your strength. Still gingerly, Lujan did as he was bid. The moment his fingers found their place, Moxel faced forward. We are ready, Force Commander. It is time now for haste. The Choja scuttled ahead with the startling shift into motion that characterized his race. All but thrown from his perch, Lujan clutched and precariously maintained balance. Around him, with near mechanical precision and never a single voice order, the Choja company formed ranks. 
Then, perhaps newly appreciative of his rider's fragile balance, Moxel poised and held his company, awaiting Lu Jan's order. The Akoma force leader raised his arm to signal his half of the mounted strike force to move out. Then a voice called out from the sidelines, Don't pinch so hard with your calves, or you're certain to land on your butt! Lu Jan turned his head and found his lady's barbarian slave grinning from ear to ear on the sidelines. The force commander considered a retort, but decided that ignoring the taunt would be more dignified. Kevin was a master of crudities, but lost when it came to subtle insult. Then, belatedly, Lu Jan recalled that in Midkemia the barbarians were said to ride upon great beasts into battle. The advice, perhaps, was quite valid and genuinely offered as well. Worry instead about the safety of my lady, the Akoma force commander called back. Then he waved to the ranks surrounding him, and the Chojar surged forward into a run. Their long, many-jointed legs adjusted to the uneven terrain with inhuman agility. Heat did not trouble them. Their gait had a slight surge to it, back and forth, but almost no sway. A rider did not feel the jolt of each leg striking ground. Lujan revelled in the sensation of speed beyond his imagination. He felt the wind whip his officer's plumes and trappings, and the snap of loose hair against his cheek. His heart surged with the thrill of the unknown, and before he realised the lapse in manners, he found himself grinning like a boy. His levity vanished soon after as Moxel reached the edge of the tableland and rushed headlong down a rocky gully toward the lowlands backing the hills. Lujan bit back trepidation. The pace of the Chojar was dizzying, too fast for human reactions to encompass. The Akoma soldiers clung in fear of life and limb. The ground rushed by very fast. Moxel and his warriors leapt over washes and boulder-strewn scree. Now and again one clawed-foot appendage would scatter a fall of loose stones. Human riders squeezed their eyes shut and thought ahead, anticipating battle with the enemy. Facing death by the sword seemed less risky than this headlong dash on Chojar backs. By the grace of the gods, the Akoma force commander could do nothing but cling and hope that his company of humans would survive the ride without breaking their necks. The land levelled out into sand flats. If Moxel tired from his burden, he showed none of the signs a human might. His chitinous body did not sweat, and his armoured flanks did not labour with fast breathing. Lujan unglued watering eyes and glanced to either side. His fellow warriors were all still in place, though not a few looked white-faced and stiff. He called encouragement to his sub-officers, then faced forward into the whip of the air to mark their progress. The Chojar had borne the warriors better than three leagues in a fraction of the time a human company could march. They made even better time in the flatlands, their quick, clawed feet raising minimal puffs of dust. In the distance, Lujan caught sight of a lone runner. Confident now, even exhilarated, he leaned down and pointed past Moxel's many-faceted eye. The Chojar force commander nodded without breaking stride. A messenger of the enemy flees before us, he elaborated, his eyesight being keener than a human's. We must overtake him, else risk the success of our mission. Lujan opened his mouth to agree, then checked in a moment of inspiration. No, he decided. Let the man race in terror and reach his commanders unharmed. We will follow on his heels and let his fear sap the heart from our enemies. Humans know humans best, Moxel recited from Hive Proverb. We shall proceed as you think best, for the honour of your lady and our queen. The ride ended at the base of the hills, before a chain of grottoes that notched the slopes opposite the valley where the allied armies of Akoma and Zacatecas had marched the day before. Lujan saw the runner scurry like a gazan into shadow. 
and then there rose a flurry of movement as warriors too tall for desert men emerged from hiding in a rush to buckle their helms. They were not fully in armour, having expected to climb over the hills and then march upon Mara's troops through the knolls overlooking the hardpan. Now, caught unprepared, they formed ranks in disarray, shouting for haste and cursing their loosened sword belts. Lujan and his mounted strike force raced in until they were scarcely beyond bowshot range. Then the Chojar stopped sharply. Human warriors dismounted from their insectoid companions and the companies flowed into battle lines and charged. The manoeuvre could not have gone off more smoothly had they practised. Apprehension kept the Akoma men from recklessness. They did not know how many of the enemy they might be facing. Mindful of their fellows, even the most hot-blooded of the warriors held their places as they ran screaming battle calls into the ranks of their enemy. They struck, and the conflict was closed. Outnumbered, perhaps, but outraged at the trap that had been set to dishonour their lady, the Akoma fought as though inspired. They had done the impossible, crossed leagues of hostile desert on Chojar back. Their muscles were fresh, and their bodies charged with the adrenaline of daring the unthinkable. Danger from the unknown was replaced by the familiar rhythm of thrust, parry and lunge as Mara's green-armoured warriors engaged the enemy with a will. Void of such emotions, but bred expressly for killing, the Chojar cut a swathe into the ranks of Minwanabi in disguise. Razor-edged, chitinous forelimbs clove through shields and wrist bones like butcher's blades, while clawed hind and middle limbs stabbed out, dispatching the fallen wounded who strove to thrust swords through softer segmented abdomens. Lujan ducked an enemy spear, sliced an enemy wrist, then followed through with a killing stroke to the neck. He stepped over the corpse, unmindful of fountaining blood, and engaged the next man in line. On both sides he saw his companions advance with him. The Minwanabi were shade-blind and blinking, brought out into sunlight into the thick of battle in a totally unanticipated attack. The Akoma fared well in these first minutes of engagement. It remained to be seen whether they could stay the distance and maintain the advantage when the surprise wore off and the enemy rallied to the task at hand. Thrusting, parrying, battering his way forward with almost maniacal inspiration, Lujan spared small thought for worry. He had once been a grey warrior and would not willingly be inflicted with such a fate once again. Death was preferable to the loss of his lady's honour. He was too busy fighting and staying alive to wonder more than fleetingly whether the other company of Choja and Akoma, under the command of his first strike leader, had met with as resounding a success on the far side of the hills across the valley. And, if the patrols sent on the march down yesterday's back trail were not in place, Mara was left as defenceless as a sacrifice alone on the hillside with her honour guard of twelve. On the hard pan, the sun beat down with the merciless might of full noon. The token a coma force sent down to Zacateca's aid had not significantly altered the odds, except to draw some of the overwhelming numbers of attackers away from Lord Chipino's shield ring. The Akoma forces soon became as beleaguered as their allies, but with one difference. They had a purpose to their defence. Huddled together in a wedge, they appeared to be fighting as desperate a defence as the Zacatecas, except that, step by gradual step, they seemed to be winning their way closer to their allies. Not one to miss nuance, Tassayo noticed. His frown darkened. That his enemy should take more losses than strictly necessary just to gain an insignificant bit of ground discomforted him. He might call Mara coward for sending so small a relief force, but he was too cold-bloodedly wise to discount that another purpose beyond fear might motivate her actions. His suspicion was confirmed a moment later, when an archer within Mara's shield wall fired off a signal arrow in a high arc. Tassayo cursed more fervently when the shaft reached its height, tipped into downward flight and landed unrecoverable in the midst of Zacateca's troops. 
suppose she has got a message through, worried the interfering strike leader. No doubt, Tassio snarled. His plot had gone wrong. He was sure of it. There was dust rising beyond the ridge at the edge of the hardpan, which warned of another battle well in progress. His hidden troops had certainly been discovered, which explained much and none to the good. Quickly, we must call off half of the troops that pinned down Lord Chipino, Tassio concluded. Our best chance now is to charge upon Mara's command position and hope she has engaged the bulk of her soldiers elsewhere. If she has done so, we stand good odds of overrunning her honor guard and killing her. If we act swiftly, Lord Chipino and that ridiculous little company she sent to distract us will have no opportunity to win free. The strike leader raced off to sound the appropriate horn calls, and Tassio, slit-eyed, arose from his position and checked his sword belt. With a stiff nod to his battle servant, who accompanied him always, he stalked off to join his warriors. Nothing would go amiss this time, he swore by Turakamu the Red. Against whatever outside contingency might arise, and even should his life become forfeit, Lord Decio's cousin would personally lead the foray against the notch where Mara had taken refuge. You won't come out, little bitch. Then I will send killers in after you. So saying, Tassio drew his sword and took his place at the head of the warriors called into position by his strike leader. The scout bowed to Tassio. It is as you expected, sir. Mara has sent all of her companies around the ridges to attack our forces in hiding. She keeps with her one officer as honor guard to stand by her litter. Then we have her. Infused by a glow of confidence and satisfaction, Tassio dismissed half of the warriors he had called from the battle on the hardpan. Return to support our fellows against the Akoma and Lord Zakatekas. One patrol should be more than enough to ensure the Akoma bitch dies. He waved, and the company started forward. Tassio marched them up the slope toward the saddle between two knolls, where Mara and her honor guard held position. He made no effort at concealment. Indeed, it would only be a satisfaction to him if his quarry trembled in fear at his approach. If the lady broke in terror before his threat, he would bring home to his cousin and lord the gratifying story of Mara's shame. Very much he would enjoy seeing her cringe before him at the end. The warriors crested the rise. Tassio had time to notice that the curtains of Mara's litter were drawn closed, her form but a shadowy presence through layers of gauzy silk. Eyes narrowed against sun glare, Tassio also saw that the honor guard who stood vigil was exceptionally tall and red-haired. His greaves were too short for his long shanks. The helm pressed over his unkempt locks was not snapped in the heat. As he sighted the advancing ranks of the Minwanabi, he widened eyes of a rare deep blue. Then, to Tassio's ultimate surprise, the red-headed guardsman, who should have been the first pick of Mara's warriors, gave a gasp of alarm. He plucked at the gore's curtains and whined, Lady, the enemy comes! Enjoying the moment hugely, Tassio signalled the charge. Around him, his warriors leaned into full stride for the attack. With a strange expression on his face, the Akoma guard braced his spear. Then... As if he rethought the matter, and as his attackers came within arrow range, he dropped his weapon with a noisy clatter, spun on his heel, and ran. Tassio loosed a startled laugh. Take the bitch! he called, and waved his following onward. The strike patrol raced for the kill, sandals scattering stones as they pressed eagerly into the draw. Tassio in the lead loosed an ululating cry that was half battle yell and partly a pian to the red god. He dashed to the green lacquered litter, slashed the silken curtains aside and thrust his sword deep into the silk-clad figure inside. A cloudy puff of jigger bird feathers burst outward from the pillow his blade impaled. 
Caught between fury and reflex, Tasayo struck again. Silk split, and a second gutted cushion disgorged its contents into the air. Tasayo inhaled a lungful of down and cursed aloud. Enraged and forgetful of decorum, he slashed a third time in an explosion of sheer temper. The litter contained only pillows wrapped up in a lady's fine robe. The honor guard, the redhead, had too obviously been a slave set up as decoy, and this litter a gambit and a trap. Tasayo's mind reasoned quickly, even though he was irate. This minute, hidden in the surrounding rocks, Mara was certainly enjoying a rich laugh at Minwanabi expense. Tasayo scanned the nearby knolls to glean some clue where to send his shamed patrol of warriors, who were now as mortified and hot for blood as he was. To follow after the fleeing slave was too obvious. Mara surely would be more clever. That moment, the arrows began to fall. The man next to Tasayo caught one just above his cheek guard. He fell, clawing at his face. Tasayo saw other warriors stagger out of their ranks, and he himself took a glancing blow to his armor that scored deeply through hide layers before rebounding and leaving him unharmed. His instinctive reaction as a commander was to call orders and prevent a sloppy retreat. His warriors were seasoned. They responded as the trained elite they were, and withdrew in orderly fashion into the cover of rocks and outcrops. At once, Tasayo began to trace the flights of the arrows and to formulate a counterattack to obliterate the Akoma archers. But a clattering of loose rocks sounded on the ridge he had only recently climbed. Distracted by the disturbance, Tasayo spun and saw the plumed helm of an Akoma officer flash past a gap in the rock. Green armored shapes followed, accompanied by the unmistakable hiss of blades being drawn. Voices added to the din, ordering ranks to close in preparation for a charge. They seek to cut us off, the Minwanabi patrol leader said quickly. Impossible, Tasayo snapped. There was no way Mara could have moved warriors so swiftly to flank Tasayo and attack from the rear. More canny to the ways of his superior than the strike leader, the patrol leader said nothing but waited for his senior to issue commands. Choja, Tasayo said abruptly. She must have kept some of them in reserve. They could move swiftly enough in this uncertain terrain. And yet, the voices and the noise from beyond the ridge sounded distinctly human. Tasayo hesitated only a moment more. He could not afford a mistake. If Mara had lured him here, surely she had means to cut him off and annihilate both him and his men. And that would spell disaster for his Minwanabi master. His face would be known, if not to her, then to Lord Zacatecas. He had cut too forward a figure in the war party not to be recognised. To have the body of so highly placed a cousin in House Minwanabi would be solid evidence of treason. For although this incident had happened outside the borders of the Empire, to treat with the desert men was to support the enemies of the Emperor. Although Tasayo personally would have been willing, if not eager, to trade his life for the chance to send Mara to Turakamu, he dared not do so in a fashion that left the honour of his ancestors compromised. No, Mara had him trapped. He had but one alternative, however distasteful the necessity. Fall back, Tasayo called curtly. Move in good order, but quickly. We must give the enemy no victory. The warriors obeyed without question, abandoning the safety of cover. They ran in neat zigzags and suffered renewed assault by Akoma archers as they withdrew toward the hardpan. Their faces showed no expression in true warrior fashion. So did Tasayo reveal no emotion but every step that he took in retreat burned. Never had he been forced to flee from the field of battle. The ignominy cut into him like physical pain. He had reviled Mara until now as an enemy of his house and people. This moment, that hatred assumed a personal score. 
For this current shame, brought about by an error in tactics and his own over-eagerness and bloodlust, the Acoma lady must in the future be made to pay. He would hunt her and all of her issue until his last breath was drawn. Arrows clattered around him in concert with the suppressed grunts of warriors who fell and died. Tasayo swore as he ran he would arrange her downfall coldly. Each plot made and executed in icy surety until this insult was avenged. One of the fallen was his personal battle servant. Aware the man no longer ran behind his shoulder, Tasayo cursed yet again. He would have to train another, and that was wasteful, since many candidates usually died before he found one with reflexes quick enough to suit him. Here was another personal score to be settled, another reason Mara must be made to bleed and suffer. Absorbed in his hatred, Tasayo raced across the hard pan without once looking back. And so he did not know, until he reached the safety of the half-company he had rashly and prematurely dismissed, that he and his strike force had been routed by a handful of Chojar and soldiers, who had duped him into the belief he was surrounded. In fact, they had carried nothing better than some spare helms mounted on poles and loose bits of armour dragged on cords through the sand to create plentiful noise and much dust. The strike leader laboriously pointed this out, and, though his face was woebegone and not in the least bit mocking, Tasayo whirled on him in a fury. Silence that man, he called to his patrol leader. Cut his throat and take his plumes. You are this moment promoted to his position. The patrol leader bowed to his superior. No hint of distress showed on his face as he drew his sword to carry out his superior's orders. Tasayo glared at the ridge where Mara and her honour guard must lie hidden, mightily enjoying his defeat. The fact that he had Zacatecas surrounded and all but at his mercy did not ease his disgrace. Tasayo did not turn a hair as his strike leader was cut down behind him. As if the man did not gurgle out his last breaths on the sand, the cousin of Decio turned his resources to salvaging what he could of the afternoon, by ordering renewed assault upon Lord Chipino and the isolated half-company of the Acoma the lady had sent out as sacrifice. If he could not get at Mara, at least he could ensure that her honour perished with her ally. And yet... As the sun passed its zenith and descended through the layered dust toward the horizon, Lord Chipino's warriors held without breaking. Many of them lay dead, but the survivors did not lose heart. Tasayo's mood worsened when an exhausted runner brought word that the warriors behind the West Ridge had been attacked and decimated by a coma. The East Ridge perhaps held its own. No messenger arrived to say for sure. Tasayo sent scouts to check, but none returned. Damn the ladies, Choja, the messenger ended. Without them, her victory would not have been possible. Explain what you mean, Tasayo demanded irritably. But a short time later he saw with his own eyes, as a company of Acoma warriors rushed from the valley between knolls to come to Zacateca's defence. They arrived with impossible speed, mounted on the backs of their Chojar allies. When they reached the fringes of battle, they dismounted, assembled ranks, and charged with a vengeance upon his troops. Tasayo's warriors had been fighting all day in the relentless sun of the hardpan. They had sweated out their freshness and had no edge to bring to bear against this new and unexpected threat. In contrast, the soldiers of Lord Zacatecas took new heart from their rescuers and pressed back with freshened hope. The Minwanabi could not hold them, and once again Tasayo found himself calling the order for retreat. He spoke between clenched teeth, pale to the point of nausea with mortification. His plot in Dostari was in ruins, an unmitigated failure and all because he had been outmanoeuvred on the field, a thing that had never happened on Keliwan nor in the warlord's campaign against the Midkemians. The taste of defeat was new and all too potently bitter. 
Tassayo oversaw the withdrawal of his army, what remained of it. His stomach churned with the realisation that he had destroyed his chances to retaliate. He could not remain in the desert to mount a second assault. The desert men he had sent forth as bait would not forgive his betrayal. The tribes would now be set against him, their chiefs perhaps angry enough to swear blood debt. Though Tassayo looked with scorn upon tribal custom, and was not in the least afraid of any retaliation the desert men could call down upon his house, he could not discount their retaliations. All the way to Banganok and the ships that would return him to the mainland, he must endure petty raids as the desert men sought to settle blood score against his company. That night, sitting tentless and tired in camp between a fold of dunes to the east, Tassayo brooded in solitude. He would take no sa wine to blunt the aches left from battle. He shut out the voices of his soldiers, raised in bitter complaint, as they wrapped their wounds and sharpened the chips from their swords. Above all, he would not look to the west, where the afterglow of sunset was displaced by the glimmer of Akoma and Zacatecas' victory fires. Soon enough, he promised, those fires would be as ashes. Soon enough would Mara come to regret this brief victory. For next time he matched wits against her, Akoma defeat would be utter and final. In the command tent of the Lord of the Zacatecas, Surrounded by the soft light of lamps and by hushed conversation between a healer and a favoured wounded soldier, Mara made the bow that was proper from a ruling lady to a social superior. Although hers had been the triumph in the day's rout, she had chosen not to press the acknowledgement of her laurels. She did not wait haughtily in her own tent and insist that the lord of the indebted house come to her. Wisely, subtly, she did not force her new one position upon a lord who could potentially cause the Akoma more harm than help were his pride unduly ruffled. Neither did she attempt to ingratiate herself, but passed off her presence as a social visit of little consequence. My lord Chipino, she opened, smiling slightly as she arose. You expressed an interest in my honour guard, and specifically the soldier who betrayed such remarkable cowardice that Desio's much-praised cousin Tassayo was set off his guard. Lord Chipino waved away the servant who applied a hot compress to the sore muscles of his back and neck. Glistening with massage oils and smelling of sweet ointments, he gestured to a waiting slave boy who slipped a light robe over his body. Yes. Cipino fixed bland eyes on a tall figure in the shadows behind Mara and said, Come forward. Kevin stepped forth, dressed in his Midkemian trousers and a loose-sleeved shirt, gathered at the waist with a Surani belt of overlapping shell discs. His blue eyes were laughing as he stopped, hands on hips, to suffer Lord Cipino's scrutiny. The Lord of the Zacatecas eyes widened at the sight of the barbarian slave, whom he had observed often enough in Mara's tent. And yet, having been told by the Akoma force commander that the day's tactics had been Kevin's, and that all of them lived and breathed as a result of barbarian logic, he looked more carefully at the man from beyond the rift. Politely, he cleared his throat. Since his culture had no protocol for addressing a slave who had been heroic, he settled with inclining his head. Fetch the lad a cushion, he told his slave boy. One was plucked from the master's own sleeping alcove. Nonplussed, the lord bade the barbarian sit. Then, satisfied in his paternal way that the fellow was comfortable, Lord Cipino opened what he held to be a most sensitive topic. You are a slave, and so you were able to run from the enemy in cowardice, since your lady ordered you to do so, yes? To Cipino's startlement, Kevin laughed. Being a slave has nothing to do with it, he said in his booming kingdom voice, just to see the look of surprise on Commander Tassayo's face was satisfaction enough. Lord Cipino frowned, 
then covered his puzzlement by sipping at the tesh that waited on the tray by his elbow. Yet, you were an officer in the army in your own land, or so your mistress tells me. Did you not feel shamed to show cowardice? Kevin's eyebrows slanted up. Shamed? Either we tricked the enemy or we died. I hold shame to be a pittance beside the permanent state of being dead. His people esteem life far more than we do, Mara interjected. They do not acknowledge the wheel of life, nor do they comprehend divine truth. They do not understand that they will return in their next incarnation based upon the honour they acquire in this present state. Here Kevin snorted. You people have tradition, but no sense of evolving style. You don't appreciate jokes as do the folk in the Kingdom of the Isles. Ah! Lord Cipino broke in, the puzzlement on his leathery features relenting as if all was explained. You fled from Tassio and experienced no shame because you perceive the action as a jest. Kevin buried an amused irritation behind tolerance. You could simplify the issue that way, perhaps, yes. He tilted his head to one side, raked back red bangs, and added, The worst thing about the assignment was that I could barely keep from laughing outright. Good thing the straps of Lujan's spare armour were too tight, or I would have exploded in spite of my best efforts. Cipino stroked his chin. A joke, he concluded, though underneath he was obviously mystified afresh. You, mid Kemians, are wondrously strange in your thinking. He shifted his glance to Mara and smoothly ascertained that his servants had anticipated her needs and brought Chocha as she liked it. A man who lived by subtleties, he had trained his staff to observe his guests, learn their needs, and respond in their duties of hospitality without spoken orders from him. The practice had rewards. It was amazing how soft an opponent could become when he was personally catered to with as little fuss as though he sat in his own hall. Mara was not here as an enemy, but Lord Cipino recognised his debt to her and was anxious to negotiate a favourable settlement. He chose his moment, broaching the subject after Mara was settled with refreshment, but quickly enough that she had little space for deep thinking. Lady Mara, your soldiers and the brilliance of your war tactics today spared House Zacatecas from yet more tragic losses. We are in your debt for the occasion and are prepared to offer fair and honourable reward. The lady was young. She was gifted, but she still had much hardening to undergo before she became practised in the great game. She proved so now, for she blushed. My lord, the Akoma soldiers achieved only what was proper between allies. Little reward is required beyond a formal swearing of alliance with witnesses upon our return to the mainland. She paused, dropped her eyes, and seemed more than ever the young girl. A slight frown creased her forehead as she thought upon the matter and realised that she must ask something more of House Zacatecas, lest she leave a social superior with an implied debt of obligation. To leave such business unfinished was an unwise move that could strain further amicable relations. Lord Cipino, she added formally, as if the matter were an embarrassment to her, for the actions of the Akoma on behalf of your house, I ask one boon, that, at a time of my choosing, you grant me your vote in the Imperial Council to be cast as I wish. Will this be acceptable? Lord Cipino inclined his head well pleased. The request was a pittance, and the girl was cautious beyond her years to keep her asking modest. He murmured a command, and his runner hurried to fetch his scribe, to set the matter officially under seal. To Mara's most appropriate response, he added one thing more. 
Let a suit of fine armor be made for the barbarian slave in Acoma colors, that he may serve his lady in comfort the next time she requires to bait her traps with an honor guardsman. Kevin smiled in appreciation of the dried Sirani humor. He would never be permitted to wear this armor, but he would have it as a trophy of sorts. Then, the matter disposed of in lasting satisfaction of the debt, Cipino clapped for servants to bring food. You shall dine here, he said, and he waved to indicate the barbarian slave was to be included. Together we shall drink fine spirits to celebrate the defeat of our enemies. Mara woke to the touch of a hand shaking her shoulder briskly. She rolled over, dark hair caught in her lashes, and she sighed, still deep in sleep. Lady, you must wake up, Kevin said in her ear. The bedding seemed much too warm and comfortable. Reluctantly, Mara stirred. Though weary still from the battle the previous day, and no little bit discomforted by the sa wine consumed with Lord Cipino to celebrate the victory, she forced her heavy eyes to open. What is it? Dawn greyed the sky beyond the tent flap, left open to catch the night breezes. In the sandy dunes of the low country, the temperature did not fall after sundown as happened in the mountains. Mara blinked and rolled closer to Kevin's warmth. It's too early, she protested, and began provocatively to tickle him. Lady, the tall barbarian scolded gently, Lujan is waiting with a message. What? Now fully wakened, Mara sat up. Loose hair spilt like ribbons over her shoulders as she clapped sharply for a servant to bring a robe. Across the command tent, seen as a shadow against the lamp-lit antechamber, Lujan stalked the breadth of the carpet in long strides, his officer's helm crooked in his elbow. Quickly, the lady of the Acoma shoved her hands into waiting sleeves. She rose, leaving Kevin fumbling for his trousers, and hurried through the fringed partition between the rooms. What's amiss? she said in response to Lujan's agitation. The Acoma strike leader completed a swift bow. Lady, come quickly. I think the best thing would be for you to see for yourself. Made tolerant by curiosity, Mara followed her officer, pausing only to slip on the sandals brought to her by a servant as she stepped into the thin light of dawn. Her eyes adjusted to the gloom, and she halted very quickly, colliding with Kevin, who hurried less gracefully after her. Involved with fastening his buttons and still barefoot, he had not seen her stop. Yet his clumsiness raised no imprecations. Mara was utterly absorbed by the sight of seven motley figures who descended the dunes just beyond the perimeter of her camp. They were short, almost dwarf-like in stature. Their robes were fringed with beads of glass, horn and jade, and their hair was braided. The ends were tasseled in colours, though the rest of their clothing was drab, and around the wrist of each, in varied and elaborate patterns, were blue tattoos like bracelets. They looked like tribal chiefs, Mara said in wonderment. So I thought, Lujan replied, and yet they come alone and unarmed. Fetch Lord Cipino, Mara ordered. Her force commander inclined his head in his usual wry fashion. I have already taken that liberty. Then, acting purely on instinct, Mara added, Ask our sentries to disarm. Now, at once. Lujan directed a suspicious glance at the approaching figures, then shrugged. Let us pray the gods are with us. After Tasayo's performance yesterday... The clan chiefs will have small cause to love us. That's just what I am hoping, Mara said quickly. She stood, a frown on her face, while Lujan carried out her wishes. All around the camp, Akoma soldiers removed their sword belts and laid their weapons flat upon the sand. You think these chiefs come as peace emissaries, said a voice. 
Chipinos, still gruff from sleep. The lord of the Zacatecas stepped up to Mara's side, his robe sash half-tied in his haste. That's what I am counting on, Mara murmured. And if they are not? Chipino prompted. He sounded dryly interested rather than worried. And Mara smiled back. You guess right. My lord, I am not without reservations. Lujan was told only to ask the sentries to disarm. The reserve troops, no doubt, are even at this moment being mustered into armour behind the cover of the command tent. Lujan stepped back into view from that very quarter, looking faintly sheepish. Someone has to keep a weather eye open for trouble, he said cheerfully. Then his levity faded, and he too looked southward to where the seven small visitors paused by the still rows of sentries. The one in the lead, who wore the most beads, performed a flourishing salute. Let them pass, called Lord Cipino. We are willing to parley. The sentries obediently parted, and without speech the desert men came through. They walked on short, bandy legs across the camp, looking neither to the right nor to the left. Unerringly, they proceeded until they reached the lord and the lady before the tent. They stopped, arrayed in a semicircle, and stared without speaking like sand-carved wooden icons, their beads swinging gently in the breeze. Send for an interpreter, Lord Chipino said softly to one of Mara's servants. Then, taking the lady's hand, he led her forward two measured paces. Together, Lord and Lady inclined their heads. In the sign language of the desert tribes, they held forth opened hands, signifying suspension of hostilities. At once, the lead chieftain repeated his salute, which involved a series of gestures that framed his nose, mouth and ears. He bowed, empire-style, his beads jouncing briskly on their fringes. Then, quite at odds with his precise movements, he broke into excited speech. The interpreter, a rotund little fellow hired out of Elama, had to hustle to arrive in time to catch the gist, for the desert man's on-rushing babble abruptly ceased. What did he say? Mara demanded, losing her poise to impatience. The interpreter raised sandy eyebrows in a look of unfeigned surprise. He seemed to try the words out on his tongue once, to ascertain their validity before he answered. These are the chiefs of the seven tribes of the Starry's northern desert, called the Winds of Sand in their dialect. They are here to swear enmity and blood debt against the man whom you know as Tasayo of the Minwanabi. Further, since the lands of the Minwanabi are across the Great Sea, and warriors from the Winds of Sand may not travel within the Empire, these, the chiefs of the seven tribes of the Winds of Sand, are here to ask an alliance between your tribes and theirs. Mara and Lord Chipino locked eyes in satisfaction. Then Mara inclined her head, granting the Lord of the Zacatecas his right to speak for them both. Lord Chipino gave answer, looking directly into the hot, dark eyes of the desert chief and not waiting for the interpreter to keep up. Tell the chiefs of the Winds of Sand, he intoned, that our tribes would welcome such alliance. Further, our tribes of Acoma and Zacatecas will promise to send to the chiefs of the Winds of Sand Tassio's sword as evidence that blood debt has been met and paid in full. It was assumed the desert men would know enough of imperial custom to know the only way a warrior's sword could be acquired would be to take it from dead fingers. But... If the Acoma and Zacatecas so swear to this alliance, they must have assurance upon clan honour that the tribes of the Winds of Sand will sign treaty with the Empire in Dostari. Raids upon the borderlands must stop, 
so that the Akoma and Zacatecas may be free to pursue the tribe of Minwanabi and claim blood price. So that the tribes of the Winds of Sand need no reason to raid, we shall establish an outpost that will be a free trading town for the tribes. He smiled at Mara. It will be jointly administered by the Akoma. Turning back to the chieftains, he said, Any traders seeking to cheat or rob our new allies will have to deal with the Zacatecas and the Akoma. The interpreter hastily caught up and silence fell. The faces of the desert men stayed inscrutable for an interval. Then the leader stamped his foot and spat upon the sand. He ejected one curt syllable, spun on his heel and departed, the others falling in after him. The interpreter, looking astounded, turned to Mara and Chipino. He said yes. Lord Zacatecas laughed in disbelief. Just like that? The interpreter returned a gesture, betraying that he had desert blood somewhere in his ancestry. The Lord of the Seven Chiefs of the Winds of Sand spat water. When nobody's puzzlement cleared, he made a small sign of impatience. That is life oath for a chief and all of his tribe. He and his heirs and all of his clansmen and relations would die by ritual starvation were any of the winds of sand to break trust. My lord, my lady, you have just concluded a treaty with the desert men more binding than any ever sealed in all the long history of the empire. This took a second or two to sink in. When it did, Lord Cipino grinned delightedly. A worthy exchange for Tassio's sword, I should think. Certainly, that part of the bargain will not be a bother to carry out. Then Kevin whooped and caught Mara into a hug and spun her round. You can go home, he said delightedly. Home to your estate and Ayaki. Lujan stood bemused, scratching his chin, and Cipino, with characteristic dry irony, summed up. Our houses will receive recognition and honour from the Emperor himself for this, and Lord Desio will chew rocks when he finds out. Then, as if his own thoughts turned toward home, he muttered, Isishani will be furious to know how much weight I have lost. Shall we retire to my command tent and share breakfast? Chapter 13 Realignment The guard signalled. Desio of the Minwanabi strode into the vast conference chamber, his nailed sandals striking the flagstone with a surprisingly loud snap. Incomo watched his master approach the dais, his broad hands stripping off his battle gloves, which he flung to the body servant who scurried to keep up. While still not the crafty schemer his father had been, nor as brilliant a strategist as his cousin, Desio now threw himself into the tasks he had avoided at the start of his rule. Before his first adviser could speak, the lord shouted, Is it true? Incomo clutched the latest report tighter to his chest and nodded. Damn! Still heated from his hour of exercise with his honour guard, the lord of the Minwanabi vented his rage, hurling his helm with total disregard for rich furnishings and glass ornaments. The servant dived but missed the catch. The helmet bounced across polished flooring, fortunately missing anything of value, skipping twice before it hammered against the far wall with enough force to mar its shiny finish. The servant distastefully picked a path through a scattering of lacquer chips to effect a retrieval. Miserable as a whipped dog, he crept back to his lord's side, holding the battered helm. But Desio was too intent on upbraiding his first adviser to curse the servant for damage to his armour. You 
Hold a report less than an hour from the boat, and every servant and soldier knows the news before I do. Decio stuck out a sweaty hand, impatiently raking damp hair from his eyes with the other. Incomo surrendered the parchment, struck that the pudgy fingers he recalled in the boy were hardened to heavy calluses. The fat, self-indulgent youth who had sought to lose himself in drink and women had changed to a self-assured ruler. Decio was far from the ideal Sirani warrior, but he now looked the part of a soldier rather than a caricature of one. Decio scanned the opening lines with narrowed eyes, flipped through pages still gritty with desert dust, then, disgusted with the contents, tossed aside the stack. Tassio is nothing if not thorough in admitting his failure. His lips white with anger, the Lord sank heavily into the cushions he preferred for conducting court. A sigh escaped him. And our defeat. Incomo surveyed his master's flushed features and warily hoped that he would not be asked for advice. After two years of stalemate, Mara's triumph in relieving Lord Zacatecas in Dastari came as a bitter surprise. Until today's report, every communique from Tassayo had indicated the plan was proceeding as designed. For close to a month, Minwanabi Lord and First Advisor had waited in keen anticipation of a final victory over the Akoma. But when the jaws of Tassayo's trap snapped shut, Mara had eluded capture once again. Worse, her brilliant counter-offensive, using tactics never seen within Siranuani, had established the first treaty with the Subar desert men who had preyed upon the borders for generations. Desio pounded a fist into his pillows. Breath of Turakamu! How could Tasayo have bungled his job? Waving at the report on the floor, he said, Our own factor in Juma reports that the combined armies of Zacatecas and Akoma were greeted there with fanfares. He even suggests Mara may receive a citation from the Emperor. She has gained her alliance. Instead of two solitary weakened enemies, we now face powerful families on the verge of joining to oppose us. Wincing at Decio's ranting, Incomo tried gently to ease matters. While their treaty is a noteworthy accomplishment, Master, Chipino of the Zacatecas is not a man to enter into binding commitments, at least not without strong motives and sureties. Mara accomplished no more than her duty to the Empire when she rescued his army in the desert. Her victory may have impressed the Lord enough to rethink his position once more, but if it didn't impress him, he's a fool! Decio raked angry fingers across some nameless itch on his neck, then dropped his hand in befuddlement. How does the woman do it? Luck must sleep in her bed! Incomo stepped to the table and dressed the scattered pages into a meticulous pile. We shall know soon how she... He was about to say defeated us, but thought better of that and said, Again, managed to avoid ruin. Frustrated by a report that still seemed offensively untidy with bent corners and musty ribbons, as if the writing had been done under adverse circumstances, the first adviser indulged in a sigh of irritation. We will need time to dig out the truth of the matter. Decio snapped out of his black musing. Mara is coming. But of course. Incomo laced dry hands at his belt. She would hasten to her estate after so long an absence from her son. Decio interrupted. No, she'll be coming here. Eyebrows raised, Incomo said, What makes you say this, Lord? 
because it's what I would do. Desio heaved his bulk off his cushions, and the servant with his load of sweaty armour ducked clear as his master stamped across the dais. Strike while strongest! Ally to Zacatecas, and safe from attack from the Anasati, Mara is free to savage us. Even if Chipino is tentative in his support, the bitch has won public favour. She need do nothing more than invoke a call to clan! Desio glared at Incomo, as if expecting agreement, but the first adviser held up a placating hand. In all this, there is some good emerging, my lord. With a faint smile, he offered another parchment. The lord's expression grew thunderous as he saw the proffered scroll bore the personal crest of Bruli of the Kehotara. Desio refused to look at the document. Bruli has been whining for our patronage for years now, but he lost my father's goodwill and mine when he refused to swear as vassal upon his father's death. He wants the benefits of Minoanabi protection without being under our rule. Frustrated further by suspicions that Mara might somehow be behind House Kehotara's truculence, Desio flopped back on his cushions. Another request for alliance should be refused. Then Desio sighed. But right now we can use all the friends we can manage. What does the weak fish say? Dryly, Nkomo said, I suggest, my lord, read the message. The parchment changed hands. Stillness fell, marred by the creak of armour as the slave who bore the lord's gloves and helm shifted his burden from one tired arm to the other. Desio laboriously scanned the closing lines, and his eyes widened with pleasure. Is Bruley's observation reliable? Incomo tapped his cheek with a finger. Who can ever be certain? I read into this situation, as you might, my lord, that sundry factions in Mara's clan fear her sudden rise. Should she gain much more honour and wealth, she'll certainly come to dominate Clan Hadama. No other house is more powerful now, if the truth were known. Only divided loyalties prevent Mara from dictating clan policy. That, however, could change. These worthy lords who have presumed to contact Bruli of the Kehotara are careful to let us know they do not see their own fortunes necessarily tied to those of House Akoma. Desio sat forward, elbows rested on his knees. He pondered, realised he was thirsty, and waved for his slave to carry his armour off and fetch refreshments. We can thank the gods for small favours. Still, better Clan Hadama's families remain neutral than join their ranks against us. Incomo said, I think my lord has missed the other implication. Matured by his power, and less intolerant of correction, Desio returned a penetrating gaze. Plainly, his first adviser had best be concise if he wished to escape his lord's ire. What implication? Our agents have progressed in their work to infiltrate Mara's spy network. Fired by acerbic enthusiasm, Incomo spread his bony palms. We have isolated still another Acoma agent. Nearly all their contacts have been traced, their couriers identified. Occasional plants of useful information have kept those lines open. At need, we can manipulate these Acoma dogs to our advantage. A strange look passed over Desio's face, and a headshake prevented his adviser from disturbing thoughts not yet formed as he stretched to grip a notion that tantalised his mind. 
when the servant returned with the refreshment tray, the Lord had lost his appetite. I must think on something. Have my bath prepared. I stink like a Nidra pen. Incomo bowed. Which girls does my master wish to attend his comforts? Desio silenced his adviser with a raised palm. No, I need to think. Just the bath attendant. No women. No musicians. A large mug of spiced juice will do nicely. I must have quiet for contemplation. Intrigued by this sudden turn towards asceticism, Incomo stepped from the dais to carry out instructions. At the door, he stopped on an afterthought. Any new orders for Tassio, my lord? Fury smouldered under Desio's hooded eyes. Yes, my brilliant strategist. After four years of squandering our resources on his masterful plan in Suba, he must be tired. Let's see that he's given a post that will not tax his depleted energies. We still command that fortress at Outpost Isles. Send him there. Let him protect our westernmost holdings from the seabirds and fish. Incomo lowered his rounded shoulders into a bow, then left his master brooding and continued down a stone corridor that cut into the hill upon which the estate house rested. The cool passage was lit at long intervals with torches. Sheltered from view by thick shadow, the Minwanabi first adviser let his frustration show. His pace turned brisk, and his robe of office flapped around thin ankles. A pity that Desio's wits had not developed to match his resolve, for if Tassio's failure was dramatic, no plot in the game could ever be guaranteed. If there had been fault with the plan, it was simply that no provision had been made to allow for failure. Down a shallow flight of steps and through a worn postern, Incomo arrived at the wing that jutted out of the hill toward the lake shore. While not as closely situated to the Great Hall as lesser quarters, the Lord of the Minwanabi's chambers had an unobstructed view of the lake at sunset that made the walk worthwhile. Incomo clapped for servants and ordered his Lord's private bath chamber made ready. As the servants hurried off to assign slaves to heat the water, Incomo crossed back through the maze-like house to his own less sumptuous quarters. There, surrounded by screens painted with patterns of kill wings and clouds, he cursed at his master's orders to Tassio. His bitterness must never be shown in public. That fate would send away the truly gifted son of the house and leave Minwanabi fortunes in the hands of... Incomo slammed his fists on a chest in a display more like his master than himself. The thoughts he entertained were unthinkable for a loyal servant, even in the strictest privacy. Desio must somehow contrive to lead the Minwanabi out of this dilemma. Incomo sank onto a cushion and clapped for his personal servant. Fetch my writing desk and move it over to my contemplation mat he commanded, rubbing his temples. Then open the screen to admit the evening breeze and depart. Alone once more, and confronted by his pens and his desk, the first adviser thumbed a blank sheet of parchment and pondered how to compose his missive to Tassio. While the man was ostensibly transferred to command of another Minwanabi garrison, Desio had effectively ordered banishment. The fortress in the outpost isles had only been established to protect Minwanabi shipping from piracy, and those waters had been cleared of such brigands for over a century and a half. The fort still stood due to the hidebound Surani reluctance to surrender any ground once taken. The Minwanabi manned that desolate, fog-bound chunk of rock simply to prevent anyone else from supplanting them. Now, one of the most gifted military minds in the Empire was being sent to the hinterlands to grow moss. Disgusted by what he perceived as a waste, Incomo reminded himself that as the price of a grand failure went, life on that rock was light punishment. Had Lord Jingu remained alive to wear the Lord's mantle, 
Tassayo would have answered for such disgrace with his head preserved in a jar of vinegar and red bee honey. Setting brush and ink to parchment, the first advisor sighed that so painful an order should be relegated to written correspondence. Tassayo surely deserved better. A slight word of personal regret would be appropriate, seasoned with the reverses of politics, Incomo knew better than to burn any bridge at his back. Fortune in the great game could turn all too quickly, and a man never knew where he might owe his loyalty in the future. As the litter rounded the last bend in the road, Mara leaned out of the curtains with childish eagerness. The Sirani bearers shouldered their off-balanced burden in stoic silence. They could sense their mistress's excitement. Nothing has changed, Mara said breathlessly. The trees and the grass look so green. The wet season lushness of the landscape was a balm to the eye after years of barren desert. Over the final knoll, past the fences of the outermost Nidra fields, the well-kept estate spread across the land. Dead branches and brush roots had been pruned back, and the grass under the hedges stood neatly clipped. Mara could see the advanced scout waving from the top of the next rise. For an instant she worried. Could some clever enemy have set an ambush to turn her homecoming to disaster? Had she, in her excitement, pushed her warriors and her scouts ahead too rapidly to ascertain the safety of the road? Then... Logic absolved her fear. She rode at the van of a triumphant army. More than one foe must join ranks in force to threaten her at her own borders. A scout reported to the head of the column. Mara pushed impatiently at the gauze hanging that separated her from the officers who marched beside her. What news, Lujan? Her force commander flashed a smile, his teeth vividly white in his desert-tanned face, Mistress, a reception. Mara smiled. Only now could she admit to anyone, most of all herself, just how desperately she had longed for home. The fanfares that had greeted her and Lord Zacatecas in Ilama and Jamar had been flattering, but even celebrations that heaped her with honours had proven taxing. Close to three years had passed since the orders to send her garrison in defence of the borders, too long a time in the life of a young son for a mother to be absent. Nights in Kevin's arms and the rigours of battle by day were only a distraction from her ache to see Ayaki. The returning army crested the hill, the tramp of three thousand feet in the damp soil of the road a dull thunder in the morning quiet. Mara breathed in the scents of rich foliage and akasi, then went wide-eyed with wonder. At the junction of the Imperial Way and the road to the Acoma estate rose the ornate towering arch of a magnificent prayer gate. New paint and enamelled roof tiles sparkled in sunlight, and in the gate's deep shadow a hundred Acoma soldiers stood in ceremonial armour. Before their rows of shining shields were other well-loved figures, Kiyoke, correct as his warriors, but wearing the embroidered badge of an advisor. Jikan, dwarfed by the Hadonra's staff of office. Nakoya, her bothered expression buried in smiles. And, a pace ahead of her, a boy. Mara's breath caught. She fought a rush of tears, determined not to succumb to unseemly display. But the moment she had longed for, that at times had seemed elusive as a dream, overwhelmed her resolve. Kevin acted the role of body servant to perfection, lifting aside the hanging and offering his free hand to Mara. His steadiness allowed her to recover decorum as she stepped onto her native soil at last. She had to wait, as befitted her rank, for the party by the gate to approach her. The delay was torture, and her eyes drank in details. Kiyoke had mastered his crutch. He moved with barely a hitch in stride despite his missing leg, and Mara exulted in her pride for him. Nakoya had not aged so smoothly, but had acquired a slight limp. 
Mara smothered an impulse to rush and offer an arm. The first adviser would never forgive such a breach of manners over something as trivial as an aching hip. Lastly, in tingling apprehension, Mara dared a look at the boy who strode resolutely toward her, head held high, back straight and chin outward. He was so tall and rangy. Mara's throat tightened as she took in his child's armour, the miniature sword at his side, the helm he lifted from ink-black hair with the bearing of a perfect little Acoma warrior. Her child had grown nearly twice the size she remembered on her departure. With rehearsed dignity, Ayaki completed the bow of son to mother. He spoke out, his child's treble carrying solemnly over the ranks of still warriors. I bid welcome to the Lady of the Akoma. We are a hundred times blessed by the good gods for her safe return to our home. Mara's resistance crumbled. She knelt before her son, and suddenly the boy's arms were around her neck, hugging fiercely enough to crumple her fine silks. I missed you, Mummy, the boy quavered into her hair. Moisture trembled in Mara's eyes as she answered, though somehow she kept her voice firm. I have missed you, my little soldier, more than you can ever know. Standing with pursed lips to one side, Nakoya allowed mother and son a moment of public indiscretion before pointedly clearing her throat. Ye entire house of Akoma waits to welcome our mistress. So gladdened were our hearts at news of your triumph that this prayer gate was erected to honour your victory. We trust it pleases you, lady. Mara raised her face from Ayaki and examined the brilliant panels of the prayer gate, each one carved and painted with the icons of the felicitous gods. Chotokan, the good god, seemed to smile directly upon her, while Hantukama, the bringer of blessed health, spread his hands in benediction toward her army. Duran, the just, beamed down from the crest of the crossbar, as if in blessing of those about to pass through. Lashima the wise seemed to gaze with affection at one who almost had been committed to her service. The artisans had done superlative work, and the figures seemed charged with divine wisdom, but the allure of the images quickly palled. Mara took in the familiar faces of servants and soldiers, advisers and friends, then glanced back to Kevin, who returned his barbaric wide smile. Lost in a daze of happiness, she answered her waiting first adviser, Yes, Nakoya, I am pleased. She gave the son at her side another squeeze and added, Let us return to the house of my ancestors. Despite the fatigue from a long journey home, Mara's spirits soared as the night fell. The grounds of her family estate were decked out in grand celebration, coloured lanterns hanging from the trees in all the gardens and bright bunting festooning the rails of the central entrance. Candles flickered in courtyards, porticos and halls. Strings of tiny bells strung from every doorway and screen chimed sweet melodies in thanks for the gods' blessings with each person's passage. Hired musicians from Sulanke added their melodies to those played by performers under a coma patronage. And song rang gaily across the grounds. Everyone, free workers, guests and advisers, danced to celebrate a coma triumph. Maids and serving girls laughed as they waited upon victorious soldiers who regaled them with tales of the campaign against the desert men. In time-honoured Surani fashion, the warriors were modest about their own achievements, but lavished accolades upon one another. To a man, they praised the daring tactics that had reversed a bitter defeat into a brilliant victory. What their lady had done in the game of the council, she had accomplished on the battlefield. Make innovation her ally. From his place at the mistress's shoulder, Kevin smiled indulgently at her beaming expression. Ayaki perched like a miniature soldier at his mother's right hand, determined to stay the course until the festivities ended, but battling drooping eyelids. 
He had been appointed Defender of the House in the army's absence, and though the real military orders came from Kiyoki, the boy revealed a single-minded devotion that astonished his elders. Unfailingly, he had turned out to oversee every change of patrol. Ayaki was much like his father in that regard. No matter what else might be recalled of Lord Buntakapi, none spoke ill of his sense of duty or bravery. But the excitement bested the boy finally. His chin slowly lowered until he dozed against his mother's side. Presuming to speak without being addressed, Kevin whispered, Should I carry the boy to bed? Mara stroked her son's soft cheek and shook her head. Let him stay. Then, as if her own happiness made her sensitive to the needs of others, she said discreetly, Go say your greetings to your countrymen. You need not return until later. Kevin smothered a smile as he stepped through sumptuous piles of cushions and made his bow. The long journey from Dastari had permitted little privacy for Mara to consort with her body slave. Unlike the huge command tent on the field with its many rooms and the comings and goings of servants, a matter beneath notice, the trader's galley, which had borne them back across the Sea of Blood and up the River Gagajin, had been too cramped to allow intimacy. As much as Kevin longed to visit his fellows, he ached for the moment he could return to Mara's side. He might have won his mistress's lasting love, but Sirani culture would never change. Kevin slipped from his lady's hall with the briskness of a man dispatched on an errand. Once outside the main house, he crossed the lighted grounds at a jog. His favour as Mara's lover would avail him nothing should Jikan find him lazing about with work to be done. Kevin kept to the shadows, an easier task as he drew away from the kitchens and barracks. Fewer lights burned in the servants' compound, and the slaves' quarters beyond were almost dark. The music of the victory festivities seemed distant, too faint to make out a melody. Kevin stumbled over ruts in the packed earth until his eyes adjusted to the night. Left only a coppery half-moon for guidance, he passed the outermost buildings and entered the cluster of board-walled shacks beyond. There were no trappings of gaiety here. Kevin felt his chest tighten as he noticed. The slave quarters might wear fresh whitewash for the celebration, but they were still only bare little huts. Seated on the ground before the doorways, clusters of ragged, dirty men shared the contents of several ceramic kettles. They ate their portion of the banquet given in Mara's honour with their hands, wolfing down each bit as if it might be their last meal. One man noticed Kevin's approach and whispered, and instantly conversation broke off. All eyes turned from the food pots. Then someone commented in mid that a body as tall as Kevin's could never be a Surani overseer. Yet another voice shouted through a hut's open doorway, I'll be damned! They haven't hanged you yet! A laugh followed and a bulky figure in a patched grey robe rushed outside to meet him. Kevin returned the laugh and hugged the broad-shouldered man, playfully rubbing his bald head. Patrick! They haven't hanged you either, I see. Patrick gave a wide grin. Not hardly, old son. I'm the only one who can keep this murderous crew in line. Voice lowered to a whisper, he added, Or at least that's what we've convinced the runts. Stiffly, Kevin broke off the embrace. For three years he had lived with only runts, and the derogatory term shocked the recognition that his view of the Surani had changed. Now, confronted by the gaunt faces of his countrymen, he could not escape the fact that his perspective was unique. Familiar features had changed, become sun-tanned and hard, despite the smiles that welcomed the discovery that their liege lord's son still survived. Kevin surveyed the ragged gathering, his joy dampened further as he took stock of who was absent. Brandon and William of Lamut, Where are they? As if more men might be hidden within the dim doorways, Kevin cast about. Marcus, Stephen and Henry... The two Tims? 
Brian, Donal and John. Where are they, Patrick? Things changed since you left, old son. Patrick expostulated with a tired sigh. This Gcan's a fiend for cutting expenses, so the favours you arranged from her ladyship vanished. We're treated the same as any other slaves now. But where are the rest of us? Kevin demanded in concern. A mutter ran through the men while thin-lipped Patrick answered. Brian's stomach turned sour and he died in a week. The runts let him lay there and wouldn't call any doctors for a slave. Donald was killed by a nidra ball during breeding last spring. Marcus died from the fever the wet season after you left. Some sort of snake, called Relly by the runts, bit Tim Masonson and the guards killed him without batting an eye. They claimed they spared him a slow death. That, at least, was a kindness. Kevin cut in. Relly poison kills very slowly and painfully, and nobody knows of a remedy. Unconvinced, Patrick laid his arm around his countryman's shoulder. He smelled of dirt and nidra and unwashed sweat, but Kevin noticed little beyond his whispered words. Some of these runts understand bits of the king's tongue, we suspect. John was sent elsewhere to work with wood. Somehow they discovered he was a carpenter. We've not seen him for a year. Samuel of Torren lost his temper and struck a run, and him they hanged within minutes. Glancing nervously across the compound, Patrick dared one last line. But Tim Bloggett and the others have escaped. Kevin forgot himself. He jerked back, eyes wide, and said, Escaped? Patrick caught Kevin by the wrist and pulled him strongly away from the huts, past the perimeter hedge and over to the bank of a small brook. Jumpy, tense, and looking often over his shoulder, he continued in a low murmur. There are camps of bandits in the foothills to the west. The runts name them Grey Warriors. We overheard some soldiers speaking of them after the army left. William of Lamut escaped and then snuck back, telling us it was true. Brandon, Tim Blogger, and Stephen went with him, and we've got a few messages back and forth. The streamlet chuckled quietly over its bed of stones. The music could not be heard at all here, only the scraping of night insects. Kevin sat down, his hands gripped tightly to his forearms. Escape, he muttered. Patrick chose a worn rock, sat also, and absently pulled a grass stalk. Security's tighter now. That Kyoki's no fool. Once the overseers figured out the boys had cut and run, he changed the patrols and doubled the guards who escort us to work. Patrick sucked his grass stem, found it bitter, and spat. Leaving would be tougher now the runts have puzzled out what took place. Before, they never imagined a slave might want to escape. He chuckled in bitter irony. Odd lot. Lived here five years and I've still got no clue how they think. Kevin shrugged. I understand them better now. A snap to his words, Patrick said, Well, you should. You're the educated one, Kevin, being a noble and all. I'd have taken the other boys into the hills by now, but I thought it wiser to leave that to you. We need your leadership, because one chance is very likely all we're going to get, and... Wait! Kevin kicked a clod with a splash into the stream. Escape to where? Why, to the mountains? Patrick peered closely at his companion, but the gloom hid details of expression. These grey warriors want nothing to do with us, but they will trade a bit. They're not about to hunt us down. So I figured we'd wait for our moment, then bolt and make our own camp in the eye country. And do what? Exasperated, Kevin shook his head. Though Patrick had been born a commoner, they had been friends, hunting companions, and later soldiers together. While a loyal man and a staunch fighter, Patrick had little imagination. On campaign in Dastari, Kevin had been quartered among Mara's soldiers often enough to learn that some had once been grey warriors. Their existence, as they told it, had been a misery of poverty and starvation. 
Heaven! Damn it! We'd be free! Patrick insisted, as if that settled things. Free to do what? Kevin pried loose another bit of dirt. He tossed it hard into the water, and the splash startled nearby insects to silence. Ambush patrols of Akoma soldiers. Chojar. To fight our way back to wherever the hell we came through that magical hole from our own world. Or, far more likely, we can die of fever or starvation. Patrick answered in anger. We are nothing here, Kevin. If we kill ourselves working, do we get thanks? A better meal? A day of rest? No. We get the same treatment as the animals. Damn it, man. Today was the first we've not had to labour from dawn to sunset since you left. At least in the mountains we can lead our own lives. Kevin shrugged in resignation. I don't know. You're a gifted enough hunter in the Grey Towers, he said in reference to the mountains near Zun. But up there? He sliced a hand at the dark. So you snare some six-legged creature, do you even know if you can eat it? Half the damn things are poisonous, not like the game at home. We can learn! snapped Patrick. Would you rather work until you die of old age? A thought struck him. Or is there another reason, old son? Maybe you've come to appreciate the runt way of looking at things. Surprisingly stung, Kevin stood up and spun away. No, I... He sighed, shed his hurt, and tried again. It's different for me, Patrick. Very different. You won't work as hard as us, for one thing. The insects scraped loudly and long through a silence. Then Patrick rose also. I see that much. Kevin whipped irritably around. No, I don't think you do. Aware he had reached a sort of watershed, he struggled for words to tell his friend what he had come to know and feel for Mara. His hands twisted in frustration. No matter what he said, Patrick would only see the lady as his captor. A man of plain tastes and simple intellect could not appreciate her ingenious way of seeing things, or Kevin's own delight when she laughed at his jokes when they were alone. Neither could he explain the magic, the fulfilment of his life, as he lost himself in her. Too tired to communicate the impossible, Kevin threw up his hands. Look... We'll talk about this again. I can't promise anything in a hurry, but we can always leave. And since the starry, things are not quite so hidebound as before. In what way? Patrick snorted, unconvinced. Are the overseers going to treat us like drinking pals now that you've come back with her ladyship? Kevin shook his head, the gesture mostly lost in the dimness under the trees. No, but I think I'm making progress. Someday, someday we'll be dead, Patrick said brutally. He gripped Kevin's shoulders and all but shook him. Don't go daft, man, over a little soft thigh. I know you've always been one to moon after this pretty face or that, thinking a ready sword meant you were in love, but, Kevin, there are no lovely ladies for us to cuddle. In the murk, Kevin could see Patrick nod toward the distant estate house. While you enjoy your silks, we sleep in mud. When you dine with the mistress in the morning, we're three hours in the field already. And when you take supper with her, we're just coming back. You're only spared our lot as long as you can keep your sword sharp and the woman don't get tired of you. She'll choose herself another lover one day, and then you'll come to know how we live. Kevin wanted to argue, but in gritty honesty, he knew Patrick spoke the truth. Mara might love her tall barbarian, but he must never fool himself. She would order his death without an instant's hesitation if the honour of her house became compromised. Generous, innovative, even soft-hearted as Mara could be, she was equally capable of ruthlessness. Kevin laid his hands over his friend's taut wrists. I'm not saying I'm against the idea of escape, just I'm not convinced that living as outlaws, eating whatever we can steal, and sleeping on the run in the forest is one whit better than slavery. Give me time. Let me see what I can do about arranging better food and less work. He pulled away, 
torn by a conflict he had rashly never foreseen. Don't let the lads do anything stupid. I'll use my influence with the mistress and find another way to recover our freedom. Don't linger too long, old son. If you've come to like the runts, that's your affair. I'll never stop loving you like a brother. Patrick spun away from the stream bank, his voice suddenly cold. But know this. I'd kill you if you try to keep us here. The lads have decided. We'd rather die free than live as slaves. We figured the Sirani out enough to know that if your lady had failed down south, it would have been every man for himself. Demons take the hindmost. So we waited for news. If the lady was dead, we'd be off with no one to tell us stay. When we heard she'd won, we agreed to wait for you to come back. You being our officer and most likely to get us out safe. He fixed his countryman with a hard gaze. When Kevin didn't answer, Patrick added, We won't stay much longer. With you or without you, old son, we'll go. Kevin sighed. I understand. I won't try to keep you. Just give me a few days. A few days it is. Wrapped in uncomfortable quiet, the two men picked their way back to the slave huts. Kevin lingered to chat with the men he had known as soldiers in the field and a few others he had met in the slave pens and coffles en route to Sulankur. The captive Midkemians had formed a tight-knit friendship since coming to Mara's estate, except he was a man marked apart. That had not been so apparent during the year he had worked on the Nidra fields, but now the distance between Mara's bed and a miserable life in the slave huts left an unbridgeable alienation. Kevin listened to gossip and commiseration over insect bites, hunger and sores. He had little to contribute to such talk. The exhilaration of a triumphant homecoming faded, and he did not mention the marvels he had encountered in Dastari. Well before midnight, the slaves began to rise and seek their huts. They would be roused before dawn, celebration notwithstanding, and Sirani overseers used the whip on any laggards. Kevin made excuses and departed. As he walked alone through the night, past sentries who nodded him greeting and servants who made way to let him pass, each small privilege galled him. As he passed on into the lantern light and laughter and pretty serving maids who teased and called for him to dance, his discomfort sharpened to bitterness. For the first time since his headlong plunge into love, he wondered how soon he would come to curse himself for a fool. Incomo hurried into his lord's chamber. Desio sprawled before an open screen, his robe flapped open to allow the lakeshore breeze to cool him. Stacks of reports from his various holdings lay scattered at his feet, but he had taken a break from reading to hear a trio of poets recite ballads from the Empire's history. Incomo heard enough to identify a stanza from the Deeds of the Twenty, a tale of ancient heroes revered for extraordinary service. Titled Servants of the Empire by some long-past light of heaven, they were fondly recalled, although the scholars of present generations insisted they were legends. Since Tassio's influence had bent Desio toward the martial tradition, the Lord's tastes had shifted from pursuit of lascivious adventure to the glorified exploits of champions. His choice of activity may have changed, but his resentment of interruptions remained in force. The Minwanabi lord glanced aside at his first adviser's abrupt entry, and, as if his scowl were a signal, the chorus trailed raggedly into silence. What is it? Incomo bowed. We have an unexpected visitor. Since the poets were travelling players and not given patronage by the household, the first adviser leaned close and whispered, Jiro of the Anasati awaits at the far dock, asking permission to cross the lake. Desio blinked in surprise. Jiro of the Anasati? At Incomo's near reprimand, he prudently lowered his voice. What possible reason could bring Takuma's brat here unannounced? 
Then, aware he inconvenienced himself by whispering for the sake of the hired entertainers, Desio waved the poets away. A servant would pay them. They had not been gifted enough to retain. The first adviser watched the doorway until the chamber was private. I have little to add. Jiro sends you greeting. He regrets the informality of his call and begs a few moments of your time. The messenger in from the river gate adds that the boy travels with a minimal honor guard, only twelve men. Twelve <laughs> men! Desio's annoyance evaporated. I could take him at the docks, with Jiro to ransom. Lord Takuma would. He broke off at his first adviser's stillness, then sighed. No, the old man would not trade a younger son for his only grandson. Jiro isn't quite stupid. Certainly so, my master. Incomo backed clear as Desio shoved to his feet, flung open the screen to the side hallway, and shouted, "Send guards to escort our guest to the main house docks." The Lord clapped briskly for servants and demanded dresses and formal robes. Then a large tray of refreshments to be brought to the great hall. Incomo heard the list of preparations through without comment. Early on, Desio had decided that even trivial entertaining must take place in the grand hall. The vast stone amphitheatre, with its high vaulted roof, was resplendent enough to unsettle most guests. No other estate house in the empire could match its construction. Imitators had tried, but their efforts had lacked the natural site, ringed by stone-crested hills and situated on a lake shore that even in spring was not marshy. Easily the most splendid court this side of the emperor's palace, Desio believed that confronting anyone there lent the Minwanabi the advantage. Puffed by his own self-importance, he said, "What would lure Jiro here?" Honestly, my lord, I suspect nothing and everything. Incomo ticked points on dry fingers. Perhaps the lord of the Anasati grows feeble. As heir, Halesco might send his younger brother as emissary to propose something. Servants knocked and entered, bearing folded silk and ropes of tasselled sashes, slippers, jewels, and pins. They bowed, shed their burdens, and helped their master strip off his crumpled day robe. As the fabric was whisked aside. Incoma was struck that Desio's sleekness now overlay heavy slabs of muscle. The boyhood fat of five years before had nearly vanished, along with the vacuous attitude. Slipping his arms into his not worked orange and black robe, Desio said, "I don't know. Old Takuma keeps his household on a short leash, especially his two sons." The last time I met Halesco at the games, he seemed just like his father, but Jiro is an unknown. The conversation lapsed as body servants applied combs to the master's hair and hung his pink ears with ornaments. As attention shifted to slippers and the servants washed and toweled Desio's feet, Incomo stole the moment to draw upon the detailed information that any good adviser kept current concerning every important figure in the empire. Jiro is something of an enigma, very bright, so don't let anything he says mislead you into thinking him witless. Raising his other foot to be washed, Desio frowned. He would never be taken in by so transparent a ploy. Though he hated to be made to feel stupid, the Lord listened carefully as Incomo went on and described Mara's past proposal to take an Anasati son in marriage. All present presumed she sued for Jiro, but the younger brother Buntakapi had become her husband instead. Desio grinned. Ah. She slighted Jiro and gained an enemy. Incomo sniffed. One could safely assume that much. A slave proffered a jewelled slipper. Desio shoved in his foot, then peered at his reflection in a precious metal mirror. 
Now, what sort of man is he? He's quiet, in coma recited. Jiro keeps to himself and has few friends. His vices are moderate, a little gambling, but never to excess like his deceased brother. Nor does he drink like Halesco. An occasional woman, but never a favourite. He is inclined to say little, but implies a lot. Cryptic, but each word has meaning, Decio defined. Impressed that he need not spell out subtleties, the first adviser listed the rest. Jiro lacked his elder brother's military experience, but was an avid student of history. He preferred scroll books to poets and ballads, and spent hours with scribes in the libraries. Well, Decio pouted at his reflection, I hate to read, so he would hardly be coming here for scholarly conversation. I shall meet our uninvited guest at the dockside, and if I don't care to hear out the younger son of the Anasati, I can send him packing without wasting any more bother. Does my lord wish an honour guard? Decio straightened one of his jewels and laid the mirror in the hands of a servant, who reverently returned it to a velvet slip case. How many men did you say Jiro brought? Twelve. Then order twenty soldiers to the docks. It's too hot for a crowd, and I feel no need to put on a display. Noon sunlight beat down on the grey boards of the dock and flashed reflections off the trappings of the honour guard. Sensitive to the light, Decio squinted across the water toward the approaching Anasati barge. The craft was not imposing enough to indicate a state visit. It was smaller, adorned only with paint, and its primary service was running messages along the river Gagajin. Except this journey was not made for dispatches. Between the ranks of Jiro's honour guard, Decio made out the bulk of a heavy slatted cargo crate. His curiosity became piqued. As the pole men manoeuvred the barge to the dockside, Decio had Force Commander Irilandi call his warriors to attention. The Anasati craft bumped against the landing. Slaves at bow and stern leapt ashore to secure lines, and a strange and unsettling growl issued from the depths of the crate. Apparently, the container can find a vicious animal. An avid enthusiast of the Imperial Games, which held spectacles of beast fights and warriors, Decio craned his neck until a nudge from Incomo recalled decorum. Soldiers in Anasati Red and Yellow were already stepping onto the wharf. In their midst, robed in velvet stitched with river pearls, Jiro greeted his host with a graceful bow. He was slightly older than Decio, decisively more poised and strictly observant of the forms. Without hesitation, he said, Are you well, Lord Decio? I am well, Jiro of the Anasati. Eyes narrowed, Decio returned the proper response. Is your father well? Well, indeed, my lord. A louder, more savage growl issued from the depths of the cargo crate. Jiro gave the haughty suggestion of a smile. Careful of his timing, he drew breath to continue the tiresome formal ritual of greeting. But Decio's patience deserted him. A fire to ask after the beast in the crate, he blurted, I am happy to say all of my family is well. Released from protocols, Jiro glanced smugly at Incomo, who radiated intense annoyance, but who at this moment was powerless to intervene. Thank you, murmured the Anasati son. My Lord Decio is kind to welcome an unexpected visitor. I apologise for my rudeness, but I chanced to be in your area and I felt it would be useful for us to speak. Something clawed at the crate slats, and the slaves on the barge shifted nervously. Decio twitched from foot to foot. The moment had come to invite his guest inside for refreshments or turn him away at once. The irritation of honouring an enemy's son was balanced by fascination. While Decio dithered, Jiro seized the initiative. Please, Lord, 
I had not intended to presume upon your hospitality. I have live creatures on board that dislike the motion of the barge. It is well for me and best for them if I may speak here. Perspiration made Decio's face itch. If Jiro could do without a cool drink, the lord of the Minwanabi preferred not to. He waved magnanimously to his guest and the entire Anasati honor guard. Come in and sit where we need not hasten our talk. As his visitor darted a concerned glance at the crate, Decio added, I'll have servants move your beasts into the shade so they will not suffer. Jiro hesitated. Indelicately caught between refusing the kindness of a superior or acknowledging fear of an enemy's hospitality and implied shame, he fingered his shell and lacquer belt. My lord is generous, but the beasts I transport are too vicious to be left in strange hands. I would not risk an injury to any of the servants in your household. A strange, deep light touched Decio's eyes. Then bring the beasts along. They sound interesting. Jiro bowed. To the servant who lingered on the barge, he ordered, Leash the hounds and bring them. And as you value your honour, make sure no hapless Minwanabi servant stands too close and takes harm. The servant paled at the comment. Decio saw. His own palms grew moist in excitement. As Irilandi formed the Minwanabi honour guard into ranks for the march indoors, he could not resist a look back. On the barge, the white-faced servant donned a heavy pair of gloves. He then gathered two thick braided leashes and signalled the slaves who hesitantly dragged the cover off the cage. A strident bark and more growls answered the unveiling, and the slaves jumped back in fright. Then the servant raised a bone whistle to his lips. He blasted a single note, and two muzzles poked through the opening, followed by wide-set slanting eyes and ears trimmed short into points. Two dogs of ferocious aspect braced long forepaws on the cage, the slaves cowered back, and every warrior in the Anasati honour guard surreptitiously touched his weapon. Magnificent! Decio breathed as the servant stepped in and looped the leashes through two jewel-studded collars. The dogs flowed out of their prison with sinuous grace, Massive of shoulder and jaw, and brindled in light tan and black, the creatures sprang over to the dock, then sat as regally as if they owned it. "'My lord would be wise to stand back,' murmured Jiro. Decio did so, too rapt to notice that an enemy had told him what to do. "'Magnificent!' he repeated and he stared at amber eyes that were passionless in their canine ferocity as Tassaios out on the archery field. Then, annoyed by the reminder of the cousin who had failed him, and made aware by Incomo's quiet hiss that he stood gawking like a farmer, Decio motioned for his honour guard and adviser to follow and strode off toward the entrance to the great hall. "'What sort of hounds are those?' he asked as he crossed the hall and mounted his cushioned dais, his first adviser a half-step behind. They are hunters without peer. A gesture from Jiro and the servant led the dogs to a safe corner, out of reach of passing servants and set back from any doors. The animals sat, too poised for relaxation, their eyes restless and hungry. By now, Incomo's headshakes had drawn notice. Dacio understood that his eagerness set him at a disadvantage. As he sat down, he sniffed with intent to diminish. We have fine tracking dogs. Jiro rebutted him quietly. None like these, my lord. Perhaps when our conference is over, I could offer a demonstration. Dacio brightened. Indeed, perhaps you should. He sighed in restrained anticipation, then waved for his guest to choose a cushion. Come, let us be refreshed. Slaves rushed in with laden trays of food and drink. 
Keeping his bearing erect and proper, Decio resisted the urge to turn to look at the dogs who were offering low, menacing growls to everyone that passed. At Decio's gesture, Irlandi withdrew the Minwanabi honour guard a discreet distance away. Jiro's strike leader did the same, and across the vast chamber came more slaves with bowls and towels to assist both nobles to wash. One of the dogs whined. Jiro paid it no mind, but dipped his fingers in the scented water and held them out to be dried. You have an impressive home, my lord. When I imagine this hall filled with grand entertainment, I deeply regret that I missed attending the warlord's birthday celebration. Incomo froze, caught in the motion of sitting down at his master's right hand. He looked urgently at Decio, and by the hardness of the Lord's expression knew that he need not take action. The reference to the event when Lady Mara had trapped the former Minwanabi Lord into dishonour and ritual suicide had not escaped his master's notice. The vast hall was silent. Decio reached out and took a glass of fruit juice from the tray. That he eschewed stronger spirits showed his inner anger. He sipped, pointedly withholding permission to eat from his guest. No fascination with dogs could ease the Anasati's current danger. Decio was a powerful lord, seated within his own hall. The silence would stretch to eternity before he stooped to ask what this upstart second son might wish. Jiro let the stillness extend enough to show he was not cowed. With sudden brightness he said, Splendid news from the Starry. Now the desert men and their allies are routed. The Empire shall enjoy peace on the southern border for many years to come. Decio flicked a glance to his first adviser, who signalled a discreet warning. By his reference to allies, Jiro either guessed the desert men had acted under Minwanabi influence, or else the Enosati had spies as cleverly concealed as Mara's. A dog whined. Its attendant whispered frantic reprimand. The Minwanabi lord said nothing. Except for the fabled Akoma luck... This triumph would never have come to pass, Jiro finished, then proved also that he could wait. In leisurely fashion, Decio drained his glass. He listened to a few whispered words from his adviser, then answered in faultless form, Any action undertaken in defence of the Empire is to be applauded, or do you think otherwise? Jiro smiled without warmth. The duty of every ruler is to serve the Empire, naturally. Conversation faltered to a halt. Incomo's shrewdness rescued the issue from stalemate. I wonder how Takuma views Lady Mara's brilliant victory. Given the cue he had sought for, Jiro gave the skinny old adviser a polite nod. We, Anasati find ourselves bound to a difficult course. Since blood relation to Mara's heir forces adherence to goals that occasionally align with the coma interests. Go on, Incomo encouraged, with a sidewise glower at his master to recall courtesy and offer refreshments. Decio complied with a sulky wave. Jiro accepted a fruit drink, the same variety the Minwanabi lord had chosen. He took a sip, shook back burnished brown hair, and stared off into the distance. That such conditions should endure is unnatural, of course. His manner turned disarmingly offhand. I share concern for my nephew well enough, but let me speak forthrightly. He delayed for another drink until Decio once again leaned raptly forward on his cushions. Jiro resumed. Ayaki's mother has too few friends to warrant such a dangerous course for the Anasati. He allowed a suggestive pause. So, if harm comes to my nephew, I would understand. My father is less given to bending with the whims of fate, but my brother and I see things differently. 
Here, Incomo had to touch his master's arm to remind the young lord not to show his interest. But where Mara's name was at issue, tact was lost on Decio. If fate should remove a nephew from this life... Fine crystal clanged and raised echoes as Jiro set down his glass. The dogs whined in unison, as if they sensed tension in the air. I must correct you, the Anasati son said coldly. My brother and I honour our father as dutiful and loving sons. As long as Tekuma lives, his wishes are to be obeyed instantly. His emphasis word made clear beyond doubt. Jiro was not dissembling. If his father so ordered, he would fight and even die in Mara's defence. But, Jiro qualified delicately, should the woman come to misfortune and the boy survive, my lord father need not be bound to reprisal. Decio's eyebrows rose. He looked at his guest and saw in Jiro an abiding bitter anger. A thought struck him, and he leaned toward Incomo. He really hates the bitch, do you see? The Minwanabi first adviser gave a fractional nod. A personal feud, it would appear. Go softly. I would hazard the boy is here without his father's knowledge. Trying to sound disinterested, Decio spoke around a mouthful of sweet roll. Your ideas are intriguing, but not feasible. My house has sworn oath to the Red God that the Akoma bloodline must perish. Jiro took a slice of cold meat. He did not eat, but fingered the morsel thoughtfully. I had heard of your vow of sacrifice. Of course, if Mara were dead and her Natami were broken and buried... The little heir would be a lord with no resources. He tore his titbit in two with his nails. Lacking a house and loyal warriors, Ayaki would have only his father's family to shelter him. Perhaps he would be called to swear loyalty to the name of Anasati. So this was the ploy that had brought Jiro into the house of an enemy. Decio considered, searching for duplicity in his guest. The boy would swear. Jiro twisted on his cushions and tossed the meat toward the dogs. Obedient to command, they did not arise, but snapped the snack out of the air with a clash of strong jaws. Ayaki is a boy. He must do as his grandfather and uncles instruct. As Lord of the Akoma, he can release anyone from house loyalty, including himself. Should he bow to the Anasati Natami, Akoma blood would cease to exist. The Red God must be satisfied. That is a bold presumption, Incomo interjected. He looked askance at his lord. Perhaps too bold. But enjoyable conjecture nonetheless, Decio arose from his cushions. This discussion has its merits. Well, Jiro, should the gods look favourably upon the demise of Mara and her house, we will hope, for the sake of goodwill, that events transpire as you suggest. For friendship's sake agreed Jiro, rising also and taking his cue to depart. For it would be poor judgment for any house, no matter how mighty, to think they could bloody themselves upon the Akoma and emerge with strength enough to withstand my father's rage. Decio's face darkened so swiftly that Incomo almost could not rise fast enough to touch his master's sleeve. In a whisper he said, The point to remember, my lord, is that without the backing of Tekuma, the Akoma are just another small house. Consider this also. The lord of the Anasati is ageing, and Jiro has taken risks to let you know that his brother, the heir, may not share the father's sentiment for a nephew born to Mara. 
Desio turned toward Jiro, his face composed and smiling. I will take up your offer to see your dogs hunt now. He stepped down from the dais. The Anasati son repeated his courtier's bow as Desio passed. As you wish, Lord Desio. For the display, we will need your practice field and a dummy dressed in man's clothing. Desio's interest sharpened. Your beasts course after humans. You shall see. Jiro snapped his fingers, and the servant with the leashed dogs nervously commanded them to heal as Desio led them back out of the hall. They are bred from herd dogs in Yankora, but these I call man-killers. At the first scent of fresh air, the dogs growled and barked. They strained at their leashes, yellow eyes quick to follow the movement of any passing human. Slaves and servants backed away in fright, and the Minwanabi honor guard marched close on the heels of their master, lest some trickery be in play. Only Desio and Jiro seemed unfazed by the beast's ferocity as they reached the wide practice field where Irilandi customarily drilled his soldiers. Two slaves were sent across a small gully to dismantle an archery target and stuff the old robe of a slave with huat straw to make a dummy. Desio watched eyes glittering as his guest explained how dangerous beasts should be handled. Do you see the gloves and the whistle? Jiro pointed to the servant who managed the hounds, tugging now at their restraint, the muscles under their brindled hides quivering in high-strung eagerness. At Desio's nod, Jiro continued. The leather has been soaked in bitch urine. These particular hounds have been trained to recognise that odour as belonging to their master. These dogs were trained as a gift, so they answer only to the whistle. Once in the hands of their owner, they will come to know his personal scent as the smell on the gloves wears away and eventually mind only his voice. The gloves and whistle allow them to be controlled in the meantime. An admirable system, Desio observed enviously. Jiro did not miss the note of longing. He motioned magnanimously to the servant. Would my host care to course the dogs himself? Desio's face lit. I would be honoured, Jiro, and grateful. One at a time, the Anasati servant relinquished the gloves. Desio shoved large hands inside and grasped the leashes. The magnificent dogs now eyed him with expectancy and tugged against his hold. He laughed in a rush of elation. Recklessly, he stroked one brindled head. The dog he fondled flashed him an impatient look, then resumed watching the men, servants and soldiers who stood well clear on the practice field. Very soon, my beauties, Desio soothed. He glanced across the gully, where the servants seemed slow in tying the robe to the dummy. He quivered, just like the hounds. Incomo noted and felt consternation. Thus had the past lord, Jingu, appeared when he pursued unwholesome pleasures. Jiro also saw, and the barest hint of distaste marred his veneer of courtesy. Desio fingered the bone whistle. You! he called to the slaves. Don't bother with those stupid targets. Run that way! He gestured across the practice field. The slaves hesitated, horror on their sun-browned faces. Then, more afraid of the hanging they would receive if they dared to disobey their master's order, they let fall the robe, half stuffed with straw, and sprinted into the open. They ran as if all the demons of hell were behind them. A hungry smile curled Desio's lips. With flawless politeness, Jiro finished his instructions. My lord, one long blast on the whistle will order the dogs to hunt. Two short whistles will recall them. Desio savoured a moment of soul-deep anticipation. He felt the surge of the dogs against his hand as they strained and whined to be cut loose. A moment longer he teased them, withholding them from their desire. Then he raised the whistle and slipped the leashes from their collars.
The dogs bounded forward, dark shadows against sunlit grass. Hunt, murmured Desio. Hunt until your hearts burst. The hounds surged across the ground, reaching full stride within seconds. Their tails streamed on the wind, and their savage baying echoed off the hills. They ate up the distance that separated their fleeing prey in long, elastic strides. The slaves flashed terrified glances over their shoulders, and suddenly the dogs were upon them. Wind brought back a human scream as the lead hound sprang stiff-legged upon the trailing man's back. He pitched forward, flailing desperately, but jaws closed on the nape of his neck. The cries ceased, but only for an instant. The other hound overtook the leader, ripped out a hamstring, and the slave went down with a shriek. A chorus of harrowing wails and snarls rang across the practice field. Desio licked his lips. He watched the thrashing victim with wide, fascinated eyes and laughed at his feeble attempt to save himself. The dogs were clever and swift. They darted and circled, tearing exposed flesh, then dodging as swiftly away. A man armed with a knife would not easily escape them, Jiro observed. They were trained to kill carefully. Desio sighed. Magnificent. Truly magnificent. He savoured every moment of the carnage until the struggles of the slaves subsided and the hounds closed in for a firm grip. One tore its victim's throat out and the last cry died away. Into uncomfortable stillness, Desio said, Like the legendary battle hounds in the sagas. Jiro shrugged. Perhaps the war dogs of legend might have been akin to these. As if he were bored by the topic, he bowed to Desio. But since they please you, keep them as my gift to you, Lord of the Minwanabi. Hunt them, and as they kill at your command, think kindly on our afternoon's discussion. Flushed with delight, Desio returned the bow. Your generosity enriches me, Jiro. Softly, he added, More than you will know. Jiro could not match his host's enjoyment, but the lord of the Minwanabi barely noticed, absorbed as he was by the hound's bloodthirsty feasting. Allow me to provide you and your men with quarters, he murmured. We will dine, and I shall see your every need is met. I regret to decline your kindness, Jiro returned, almost quickly, but I am expected downriver to sup with a trade factor of my father's. Another time, then. Desio whistled twice, and the dogs ceased worrying the mangled corpses. The beasts stood alert, scarlet, dripping muzzles trained toward their new master. Desio blew another shrill pair of blasts. As the beasts raced obediently toward him, he thought of Mara, and long white fangs rending her hated flesh. Then he laughed aloud. Unmindful of soiling his robes, he patted each square head before slipping the leashes on the collars. Wonderful, he observed to the silent ranks of his honour guard and the stiff-faced presence of his first adviser. A worthy gift for one of my lineage. Gripping the slightly larger dog's muzzle, he said... You I shall call Slayer. Stroking the other dog on its smeared nose, he added, And you shall henceforward be slaughter. The hounds whined and meekly settled at his feet. Desio raised blue eyes to the guest he had all but forgotten. Your generosity is unparalleled, Jiro. I must see that your visit with us results in a fruitful reward. The shadows of the hills had lengthened. Regretfully, Desio whistled his new pets to heal. His gaze never left them, the entire distance back to the docks, and he sighed with regret when the crate was unloaded and the dog securely locked inside for transfer to the Minwanabi kennels. Jiro took his leave and boarded his barge, and his pole men sculled him out across the waters, deepening with the approach of sunset. 
Desio stripped off the stinking gloves and gestured for Incomo to accompany him to his quarters. I wish a hot bath. The first adviser restrained a curl of his lip. His master reeked of the urine that soaked the gloves, and his sandals had been spattered by the dogs. Drenched in perspiration and talking excitedly, Desio glowed as if with a lust for sex. Incomo realised he hadn't seen the master so aroused since Jingu had ordered slave girls whipped for his amusement. Those dogs are... unusual, the first adviser ventured. Desio said, more than that. They are a reflection of myself. Unrelenting, unmerciful, bringing pain and destruction to enemies. They are Minwanabi dogs. Incomo hid consternation as he followed on his master's heels into the estate house. Desio clapped for his bath attendants, then added, I know Jiro has his own reasons for tempting me to betray my oath to Turakamu, but whatever they may be, he has gained my favour with Slayer and Slaughter. Incomo managed a magnanimous tilt of his head. I am sure my master will be cautious of unreasonable... Uh, requests. Sensing buried disapproval, Desio scowled. Leave me. Return to the Great Hall when dinner is served. Thin fingers clasped at his belt, Incomo bowed low and departed from a bath chamber that suddenly seemed crowded with steam and scented slave girls. As his slippered feet whispered down the corridors, he ruminated sadly on Tasayo's loss of favour. No stranger to Minwanabi excesses, Incomo knew by his sour stomach that the day's bloodletting had struck a responsive chord in Desio. The master was acting more the bold lord with each passing day, but if his future choices followed his taste for the hounds, Incomo felt Minwanabi fortunes would not be better for it. Undeniably, Jingu's excesses had brought the house to the brink of disaster. Sighing at the trials forced upon mortals by the whim of gods and capricious masters, Lord Desio's first adviser retired to his quarters. He stretched on his cushions to nap, but the bloodthirsty baying of hounds marred his rest and his dreams. Chapter 14 Celebration The boy screamed. Kevin yelled back as he dodged away between flower beds. Ayaki gave chase, shouting a coma battle cries in a boyish imitation of bloodlust. At times he became too intense, and Kevin would reverse course, capture the boy in his arms and tickle him. Then Ayaki would shriek in delight and fill the garden with his laughter. Mara allowed herself pleasure at the sight of their play. Kevin was often a mystery to her despite their years of intimacy, but one thing she knew. Without doubt, the man was devoted to her son. His companionship was good for Ayaki. Approaching seven years of age, the boy had a tendency toward brooding, intensified during his mother's lengthy absence. But Ayaki could not lapse into dark moods with the Midkemian near. For, as if he sensed the onset of the boy's troubled thoughts, Kevin was instantly diverting him with a fanciful story or riddle, a game or physical contact. Through the month since her return from Suba, Ayaki became more the boy Mara remembered. She reflected with wistfulness that Kevin could not have shown more affection had he been the child's father. Putting aside daydreams, she returned her attention to the document with its weighty seals and ribbons. Motionless in the shade before her, Arakasi awaited his mistress's response. Finally, Mara said, Must we go? Arakasi stayed quiet as the leaves in the still air as he answered, Imperial peace will be enforced so no overt threat can be mounted. Overt, she said, that is scant reassurance against Minwanabi plotting. 
need I remind you the first attempt upon my life was by an assassin of the Red Hands of the Flower Brotherhood in my own contemplation glade. The event had occurred before Arakasi's service, yet he knew the story well. He inclined his head. Mistress, there is a good chance Desio will behave. Your standing in the council is the highest in memory, higher than your father's, if truth be told. And our remaining agents in the Minwanabi house have sent us word that Jiro of the Anasati visited with Desio not two weeks ago. Mara raised her eyebrows. Go on. Dapples of sunlight slid across Arakasi's face as he sipped at a cup of fruit juice. Our agents were unable to overhear them directly. But after Jiro departed, Desio raged for an entire day, complaining bitterly that he would not be dictated to in his own house by a rival family. From this we might surmise that Tekuma of the Anasati had sent his son to warn against precipitate actions against his grandson. Mara glanced at Ayaki, shrieking his enthusiasm as he leapt upon the now prone Kevin. Perhaps, though I find it difficult to believe Tekuma would send his second son. Jiro's hatred of me is no secret. Arakasi shrugged. Possibly Tekuma sent his son to emphasize his serious intentions. The flower's perfume suddenly seemed oppressive. Emphasize to whom? Mara said. Desio or Jiro? Arakasi showed a faint smile. Perhaps both? Mara shifted on her cushions. I would like to know for certain before I risk a trip to the Holy City. Her restlessness signaled decision, intuitively grasped by Arakasi. Mysteries, I think I had best be present when you attend this celebration to honour the light of heaven. For reasons that elude my network, the Blue Wheel Party's sudden reversal of loyalty has vaulted the warlord into an almost unassailable position. Our Mecho can dictate to the council now, and should Ichinda break tradition, as gossip says he might, and attend the games in person. Excited that his assessment matched hers, Mara nodded. The Emperor's appearance would endorse our Mecho's acts, effectively undermining the High Council for the span of this warlord's rule. In a rapport that only deepened with time's passage, Mistress and spy master contemplated possible ramifications. Much would occur in Kentasami besides games and celebrations. Those families who seized the initiative would not hang back at home. The warlord might become dictator for life, but he could not live forever. Sooner or later the great game would resume. Arakasi tensed as the patches of sunlight on his knees fell into sudden shadow. Kevin's approach had gone unnoticed until he stood holding Ayaki on his shoulders, looming over the mat where Mara held her conference. My lady, the Midkemian said formally, the heir to your title is hungry. Gladdened by the distraction, Mara smiled. To Arakasi she said, Speak with Nakoya and Kyoki and make ready to leave tomorrow. You shall travel to Kentasani with the servants and slaves sent ahead to prepare our city house and our apartment in the Imperial Palace. Confirm all the resident staff's loyalty. We dare not assume all plotting will be directed at the warlord. Well satisfied with his assignment, Arakasi rose, made his bow and departed. When the lady still lingered in serious thought, Kevin broke her abstracted mood. Are we going somewhere? Mara met his blue eyes with a look too deep to interpret. The warlord has announced a major celebration to honour the emperor. We leave for the holy city next week. Her news was met with equanimity, even by the volatile Ayaki. In the month since her return from Dastari, life had settled back to routine. Mara had acceded to Kevin's wish to ease the Midkemian's lot 
and with better food and housing, new blankets, and a lighter work schedule, Patrick's impatience had subsided. But the schism remained between Kevin and his fellow countrymen. Pretending otherwise would not heal it. While escape was not mentioned, freedom was never far from the other captives' thoughts. They might not press, but they knew that Kevin visited only out of duty. He would never join them as long as he shared Mara's bed. Ayaki kicked at his mount. Jarred from uncomfortable reflection, Kevin gave a feigned cry of pain. Someone is hungry. I think I had best hurry the young lord to the kitchen so he may plunder the larder. Mara laughed and gave leave. Kevin reached up, grappled Ayaki by the wrists, and swung him down to his feet. Then swatted him on the backside. The future lord of the Akoma shouted another battle cry and charged toward the shade of the estate house. As Kevin raced after with no more sense of decorum, the lady of the Akoma shook her head. Nakaya hates it when those two eat in the kitchen, she said to no one. The birds in the treetops returned to their interrupted song. Mara let her mind wander. Weary of the pressures of leadership, she had lately given thought to reviving Hokanu's interest. The Shinzawai had shored up their weakened stock in the council by rejoining Almecho's alliance for war, making a Shinzawai Akoma union yet more desirable. The radicals in the Party for Progress made enough noise about social change in the council for the Blue Wheel Party's errant behaviour to pass without comment, but Mara sensed something larger was afoot. At the least, she could use the excuse to probe Hokanu for information. Bothered that her interest should shift so quickly from romance to politics, Mara sighed. My lady. Nakoya appeared in the doorway, regarding her mistress with concern. Is something amiss? Mara waved the old woman to the mat Arakasi had vacated. I grow tired, Nakoya. Slowly, painful with her years, Nakoya knelt. The rampages of Ayaki and Kevin were forgotten as she took Mara's fingers in her own. Grown daily more gnarled with infirmity, Dota, what weighs down your heart so? Mara pulled away from Nakoya's hold, as one of her ever-present servants arrived to remove Arakasi's refreshment tray. She took a dried bread crust and tossed it into the path. Two small birds swooped down to peck after the crumbs. Just this moment, I was considering paying court to the Lord of the Shinzawai for Hokanu, thinking a consort might ease my burdens. But then I found myself wanting to take the excuse to wrest information on the affairs of the Blue Wheel Party. This saddens me, Nakoya, because Hokanu is too fine a man to be used so. Acting more as nurse than as first adviser. Nakoya nodded her understanding. Your heart has no room for romance, daughter. For good or ill, Kevin holds all your affections. Mara bit her lip, while the birds stabbed and scrapped for the last bit of bread. For years, her household had kept silence before the obvious. That her love for the barbarian slave was more than a woman's need for a man's arms to comfort her against loneliness. Dutiful to a fault, Nakoya had not broached a subject the mistress had forbidden to her, no matter how often she might ignore Mara's wishes about trivial concerns. But since Mara had matured enough to question her own course, the elderly woman spoke plainly, "Dota." I warned you the first night the barbarian slave came to your bed. This is as it has been. Nothing can change what has occurred. Now, you must face your responsibility. Mara bridled, and the small bird spread nervous wings and flew. Do I not spend my life protecting what shall be Ayaki's some day? Her eyes on the abandoned bread crust, Nakoya said, 
Your father would glow with pride to know you have prevailed against his enemies. But your days are not your own. You are the life of House Akoma. No matter how great your desire, daughter, you must rule first and find your happiness second. Mara nodded, her face an emotionless mask. I have moments. Nikoya recaptured Mara's hand. Moments that none who loves you begrudges, daughter. But the time will come when you must seek a firm alliance. If not with Hokanu of the Shinzawai, then with another noble son. This new consort must father a child to seal the alliance between our house and his. As ruling lady, you may ask to your bed whoever pleases you, and none may say no but only after you bear a child to your husband. Before that, there must be no question who the father is. None. For that child must be as a bridge of stone across a deep chasm. I know, Mara sighed, but until that time, I shall pretend. She left the thought unfinished. When Nikoya made no move to leave, Mara forced aside her melancholy. You have news? The former nurse scowled to hide a smile of pride. The visiting emissary of Lord Kedar is at the end of his wits and patience. He will press for a settlement this afternoon. You will need to eat and see to your appearance for Jikan has used up excuses. The time has come for you to take charge of negotiations. Mara summoned up an impish grin. The desperate and vexing matter of grain warehouses. I had not forgotten. She rose, offered a hand to the elder woman to ease her back to her feet, then made her way to her quarters, where maids awaited with an exhaustive array of formal robes. Two hours later, with the hair at her temples pulled painfully taut by the weight of the pins that secured her headpiece, Mara entered the great hall of the Akoma. Awaiting her, looking hot, stood the dignitary who had spent most of two frustrating days in contention with her Hadonra. Equally bothered and near to bristling with nerves, Jikan arose to announce her. My lady of the Akoma, he called to the visitor, who swivelled around and regarded her down a beaked nose with the stuffiness of a clerk. Behind him, but less quick to stifle expressions of irritation, a rumpled-looking contingent of scribes and trade factors shoved to their feet and offered bows. Mara waited until their senior had performed the obeisance due her station before she advanced to her dais. All eyes marked her progress, and the tap of Kiyoke's crutch as he followed on her heels made a counterpoint to the creak of Lujan's armour. His sulkiness buried under silken tones, for his master's family was one of the great five and above Mara's in station, the tall emissary offered his respects. Are you well, Lady of the Akoma? Cautious of her elaborately piled hair, Mara tipped her head. I am well, First Advisor Hantigo. Is your master, Lord Kedar, well? The Kedar emissary responded stiffly to her courtesy. I can't say he was when last I saw him. Mara took care not to smile in the face of the man's veiled bitterness. Distantly related to the Shinzawai, his master was a powerful man, not only above her in family standing, but war chief of Clan Kanazawai. Lord Kedar's was not a house she cared to offend, though at her instruction Jikan had spent the last day and a half balking the man's first adviser. 
Settled on her cushions, her robes arranged in layers like flower petals, Mara gestured leave to her advisers and the Kedah's emissaries to be seated. She opened promptly, as if her Hadonra had not done his best to stall through the days of negotiation. Nakoya tells me we are close to an understanding. The Kedah first advisor maintained his impeccable manners, but his tone left no doubt as to his mood. With due respect to your most esteemed first adviser, Lady Mara, the matter is far from settled. Mara raised her eyebrows. Really? What more is there to discuss? The Kedda first adviser smoothed irritation with the skill of a seasoned politician. We require access to the docks in Silmani, Sulanku, and Jama, lady. Apparently, your factors have purchased so much of the available warehouse space that you hold, in effect, a monopoly. Soured by sarcasm, one of the lesser factors broke in. Given the lack of visible Akoma commerce in these areas, I would hesitate to suggest you had anticipated Kedah needs and sought to frustrate them. We remind that the season is short. Time compels us to arrange an accommodation to store our goods upon the river docks. The commerce of House Kedah must not suffer a detrimental interruption. Lest the angry clerk reveal too much, the Kedah first adviser took matters back in hand. My master has ordered me to make inquiry into your requirements and bargain for purchase of your contracts for warehouse leases in the three cities mentioned. After two days of talk, we are unclear exactly what price you demand. A movement in the shadows at the far corner of the hall drew Mara's eye. Unobtrusive, silent as always, Arakasi entered. He saw at once that his mistress had noticed him and gave her a clear signal to proceed with the matter at hand. Mara concealed her satisfaction over the spymaster's efficiency and looked pointedly at the Kedah first adviser. Hantigo. A coma plans for those facilities are a coma business. Suffice it to say that we will be relinquishing advantage in the fall markets next year if we do not retain our current contracts. My lady, if I may presume, the Kedda first adviser said with the faintest hint of acerbity, next fall's markets are of little concern to Kedda interests. It is this spring that our grain must be upon the river at flood. When our factor at Jamar was ignored by your own, we made efforts to negotiate rights to sublet the warehouses. He cleared his throat and forced himself not to sound patronising. This was not a capricious girl he confronted, but a proven player of the game. Because it is not common for a ruling lady to be concerned with minor matters of trade, we were slow to bring the matter to your attention, but, my lady, the days that remain now are crucial. For the Kedah, interjected Mara. Arakasi's intelligence had hinted that Kedah spring crops were sitting in granaries upon farms upriver, awaiting word that dockside storage was available. When the spring floods began, the grain needed to be close at hand for transport by boats and barges down river to the markets at the Holy City, Sulankur and Jamar. The dry winters of lowland Kelowan were the only season when travel on the Gagajin, the heartline of commerce in the empire, was restricted. While smaller craft could negotiate the shoals during winter, deep draft barges laden with cargo could not pass the shallows between Sulankur and Jamar. Only when the spring snow melt from the mountainous high wall swelled the waters could heavy cargo make passage. Mara had tried to tie up the dock space at Kentasani, the holy city, as well, but had failed owing to imperial edict. No one could commandeer the warehouses under long contracts against the possibility of imperial need. 
Yet even with this setback, Mara had established a barrier to an opponent's trade, but in such a way that no overt act or threat was ever made. That Lord Kedder sent his first adviser to another house as negotiator proved her impulsive plot had touched a weakness. The dilemma concerning the grain impasse was a matter of critical urgency. Mara feigned consternation. Well then, if my advisers have not been clear, let me set the terms. She paused as though counting on her fingers, then said, "We shall grant you full rights to our warehouses in Silmani without restriction from this day to the day after your crops leave for the south, and equal access to warehouses in all your southern market cities again without restriction until you have sold the last of this year's crops, but no longer than until the first day of summer." The first adviser of the Kedar sat motionless, no expression on his face, but his weary manner turned avid as he waited to hear the price. Almost, Mara regretted to disappoint him. In exchange, your lord must grant to me the promise of a vote in the council to be cast as I require without reservation or question. In violation of protocol, the Kedar first adviser blurted, "Impossible." Mara returned only silence. On cue, Nakoya said, "Past adviser, you forget yourself." Stung to shame, Hantigo flushed and fought to recover poise. "I beg the lady's forgiveness." Coldly, he narrowed his eyes. Nevertheless, I would be less than faithful to my lord. Should I answer this request in any way, save no. Aware that Lujan was smothering an ill-timed smile, and that Arakasi watched her in appreciation from his vantage at the rear of the hall, Mara managed her part to perfection. That is our prize. The clerks and factors looked miffed, and Hantigo's flush receded to a pallor that left him trembling. Lady. You ask too much. You could hire wagons and drive the grain to the southern markets," whispered a mortified factor. Hantigo glowered and answered through clenched teeth, "Had that been a feasible option, I should never have left the shade of my master's estates. The margin we had for alternatives has been wasted, and even should our wagons depart this hour, the grain would arrive too late to catch the market at peak. We would be forced to take whatever price the brokers offered. Hantigo faced Mara, his features a bland mask. Keda honor has no price. But Arakasi had disclosed that this year the Lord of the Keda was overextended. If pride was paramount to him, he could sell the grain at a loss and wait for another year to recoup. Yet Mara sensed that to force him to such a pass would be dangerous, perhaps even earn his enmity. She smiled, and warmth seemed to radiate from her. First, adviser Hantigo, you mistake me. I intend no disrespect towards Andero of the Kedar. Allow me to pledge before these witnesses that I shall ask your masters to support me only in a matter that holds significance to House Akoma. I will promise further that no vote shall be demanded that can adversely reflect upon the honor of House Keda. No demand of mine would call for military aid to the Akoma or attack upon a third party or any other act that would require Keda property or wealth to be placed at risk. I merely seek sureties to block any future attempts to disadvantage me in the High Council. Surely you recall the difficulty the Imperial call to muster on the border imposed upon my house. Hantigo rubbed dampness from his temples, reluctant to concede her point. Minoanabi's plotting had certainly inconvenienced Akoma fortunes for three years. The house's entry into the silk trade had been nearly ruined by that one action alone. But if the first adviser sympathised, 
he could not grant Mara's terms without leave from his master. The transfer of a vote in the High Council was not a concession to be granted by an emissary. Regretfully, Hantigo said, Even with such assurances, I doubt my master will accept your terms. That the man had ceased protesting impossibilities was significant. Confident of victory and knowing Andero of the Kedah for a man of steadfast integrity, Mara concluded the interview. Then you had best fly to your master and apprise him of my offer. We shall await his decision with interest. Tell him that we leave for the celebration at Kentosani within a week. Here or in the holy city, let him know I will be at his disposal. She gave a precise smile to hear his reply. The first adviser of the Kedah rose and bowed, his disappointment masterfully hidden. Attended by his troop of scribes and factors, he departed from the hall with dignity. Mara dispatched Jikan to attend the Kedah first adviser's departure. Then she waited a prudent interval and motioned Arakasi to her side. Shall we count upon a Kedah vote in the council? Her spy master turned a look as keen as a killwings through the doorway the emissary had just vacated. I suspect the Lord may relent, but you will have to provide him with sureties. Lord Kedar is firm in his role of clan war chief. He'll do nothing to compromise house or Kanazawa interests, and, most particularly, he would not become embroiled in any conflict with the Minwanabe. Lujan took a step away, toward the door, and his awaiting duties, but observed, Still, even if they're publicly in the Jedi party, the Kedah have many relatives involved with the Blue Whale party. If they're as deep into the game of the council as that suggests, perhaps giving Desio only one more reason to hate them won't matter very much. A faint smile was all that remark earned from Mara. Worn by the aftermath of a trying afternoon, she tugged out an itching hairpin. We have done all we can without risking insult. She turned the pin over in her hands, watching the light flash and sparkle in the small bead at the end. I don't enjoy twisting the tail of a clan war chief but I'll need all the support I can garner to thwart Minwanabi in the High Council. Our house cannot afford a repetition of our near disaster in Suba. Mara pulled out another hairpin, then motioned for a servant to remove her headpiece. Dark locks cascaded down her back, making her more comfortable but hotter. Where does that leave us now? Nikoya furrowed her brow, then snapped fingers for a maid to attend her mistress's loose hair. If every promise made to you is kept, you could sway close to one-third of the High Council. Weighing the odds as he had once done on the battlefield, Kyoke added, I will wager some will dishonour their vow, given adverse circumstances, my lady. But the game was never assured. Mara had learned the pitfalls of Tsurani politics at a very tender age. While the fingers of her servant worked her hair into a comfortable braid, she hugged her elbows against her chest and rested her chin on her fists. But if the clan war chief of the Kanazawa were to yield me his vote, others who might be inclined to waver would follow the stronger man's lead. Unspoken beneath her conjecture was the fear that she had gone too far and goaded House Kedah into enmity. If Lord Andero took offence, not even the fact that the Akoma and he both held to the Jedi party would prevent a move in retaliation. But uncertainties did not make for greatness. As the maid finished off her braid with a velvet tie, Mara asked for a lighter, plainer robe, then regarded her circle of advisers. We have much to do in preparation for the journey. A glance at the window showed several hours of daylight still remained. Lujan, please assemble an escort. Ayaki and the Natami must be secured against attack during our absence. 
and a shipment of our silk bales must be sent to those warehouses, so the Kedah have no cause to complain that we monopolize the space to disadvantage them. For that I must make arrangements with the Chojar Queen before nightfall. Like a patrol crossing an enemy border, the Akoma entered the holy city. From the lofty warehouses by the riverside to the grand avenues between courtyards, Kentasani was bedecked like a bride before her wedding. Freshly painted walls, garlands of flowers and coloured bunting made each street a joyous vista. Older than Sulanke and reflecting overlapping centuries of tastes and architecture, the city was the most impressive within the empire. Multi-tiered stone buildings crowded against carved and painted balconies. Lamp posts of cleverly fashioned wood and ceramic rose above boxes of flowers lining the avenues. Everywhere Kevin looked, he was stunned by beauty and stark ugliness in contrast. The scent of temple incense mingled with an underlying miasma of river sewage. Squalid beggars, licensed by the imperial government, sat in rows, open sores and missing limbs displayed to the passing throng. Not a few balanced upon crutches while resting naked backs against a mural painted by a master artist. Filthy bands of street urchins shouted and craned necks to catch sight of a great lady, while Mara's vigilant guard kept them back with shields and spear shafts. Town matrons, carrying baskets on yoke poles, jeered and pointed at the great barbarian slave who towered over the rest of her retinue and whose red-gold hair drew admiring eyes. The knots of merchants, avoided by running couriers, processions of priests in their cowled robes and beaded sashes hung with relics, darting house messengers and city guards in sparkling imperial white, lent an atmosphere of bustling prosperity. But Kevin was soldier enough to notice alert eyes peering from men hanging back in shadowed corners, whether they belonged to spies, informants or rumour mongers who sold news for shell coins, the Akoma guards took no chances. Alert scouts checked into every doorway and alley they passed, while Lujan kept his warriors poised to attack at the slightest hint of threat. Imperial peace was a promise of retribution against whoever broke it, not a guarantee for the unwary. Still, for all the underlying intrigue, the crossing of the trade quarter was spectacular. Only one member of the Akoma retinue was not occasionally drawn by the splendour. Forced to ride a litter like a courtier, Kiyoke sat impassive as a carved stone icon, no expression on his face. Mara's cortege passed into the Temple Plaza a giant square that served as focal point for twenty vast buildings, raised to praise Surani gods and house the priests of their separate orders. Archways inlaid with shell flashed in the sunlight, set off by lacquered tiles, precious marbles and pillars of malachite and onyx. At the centre of the plaza, a great bonfire burned, surrounded by incense pots and altars heaped high with bowls of offerings. Kevin walked with difficulty, torn between staring at the splendours of an ancient and alien culture and watching his feet for paving worn treacherously uneven. Mara's townhouse was situated off a quiet residential court, shadowed by the flowering trees that lined the avenue. The front stood enclosed by an opulently tiled wall, above which rose its many-tiered roof, adorned at each gable with carved chatra birds. The wide, semicircular wooden portals at the entry were shaded by an arbour of purple vines that grew on trellises cut from thousands of giant seashells. The effect was designed to impress. Like many older families of the Empire, the Akoma owned quarters convenient to the heart of Kentasani and the halls of the Imperial Seat. Years might pass between visits, but the stately, centuries-old houses were always maintained against the need to reside in the city for weeks at a time. Each family in the High Council was allotted a tiny apartment within the Imperial Palace, but for comfort 
and the advantages of private entertaining, most rulers preferred the freedom and spaciousness of their less formal accommodation outside the inner city. At the outer door to the Akoma townhouse, Jikan awaited, accompanied by a servant in house livery. As Mara's retinue halted before the dooryard, the Hadonra bowed. All is in readiness for your arrival, my lady. Then he gestured, and on cue the gate swung wide. Mara's bearers bore their mistress inside, and as Jikan and his attendant fell in behind, Kevin realised with surprise that the man in the servant's robe was Arakasi. Under cover of the arbour, shielded by the steps of marching soldiers as the honour guard squeezed through the entry, the spymaster leaned near to Mara's litter. Only Kevin walked near enough to note that words were exchanged between them. Then the retinue was fully into the courtyard within the walls and the gate swung closed and barred. Kevin offered Mara his hand and noticed as he helped her from her cushions that she was forcing herself not to frown. What's in play? he asked. Did Arakasi bring bad news? Mara flashed him a warning glance. Not here, she murmured pointedly, appearing to inspect the tiny garden that helped damp the street noise from the house. Everything appears in order, Jikan. Kevin remained puzzled by his mistress's reticence until Arakasi nodded slightly toward the overhanging galleries of the home across the way. Watchers might lurk in the shadows there, and, belatedly, the Midkemian recalled that spies in this world included particularly sharp-eyed individuals trained to read lips. Mollified, he kept the proper one step behind his mistress as she entered her townhouse. The inner hall smelled of waxed wood, spices and old hangings. Antique furnishings lay everywhere Kevin looked, lovingly polished by generations of servants. The residence in Kentasani was older than the estate home near Sulankur. Most of the screens on the street side were overhung with patterned silk, but the inward wall opened into a central courtyard, green-tinged by the shade of ancient trees. Cramped stairs with balustrades carved with mythical beasts, worn nearly smooth by hands resting upon them, ascended through lofty ceilings. As if the building had once been a walled compound, the ground-level walls were stone, with the upper three storeys of wooden frame and cloth walls. Kevin stared in amazement, for the building was like none he had seen on either side of the rift. While tiny compared to the Akoma estate house, Mara's townhouse was as large as a kingdom inn. Massive beams and stonework were cleverly constructed, forming a dwelling that fell open and airy. Balconies, crammed with potted flowers, overlooked the inner garden, with its fish pools and fountain. And one gnarled head gardener, who brandished his rake at two slaves who scrubbed moss from tiled pathways. To no one in particular, Kevin said, A man could get used to this. A jab from behind reminded him of his station. He looked around and down into the irascible countenance of Nakoya, who clutched her walking stick at an angle that still meant business. Your mistress calls for her bath, barbarian. Belatedly, Kevin noticed that the ground floor was suddenly emptier and servants were rushing up the stair. Arakasi did not seem to be among them. Poked again, and this time in a place that mattered sorely, Kevin said, All right, little grandmother, I'm going. With an insolent smile, he hurried along. Mara was already in her chambers, several strange maids busied with her undressing. Two other servants, neither one Arakasi, poured ceramic cauldrons of steaming water into a wooden tub. As Mara stood naked, her servant pinning her hair up, Kevin moved forward and tested the water temperature to ensure her comfort. At his nod, the servants departed. Mara dismissed the maids, then mounted a small riser and gracefully stepped into the bath. She settled into the soothing warmth, eyes closed as Kevin began applying scented soap to her cheeks. Softly, she said, That feels wonderful. 
but the bothered expression did not ease from her face. What did Arakasi say? Kevin asked as he massaged gently and removed the road dust from his beloved's face. He laid his hands upon her shoulders as she bent to rinse off suds, her tension still apparent. Mara sighed and blew droplets off her nose. A clan meeting has been called for this afternoon. Someone took care to see that the notice never quite reached me. Sometime tonight, an apologetic messenger will give us word upon his return from our estates, I am sure. Kevin retrieved the soap and resumed his washing. His fingers kneaded the nape of her neck, but she gave no sign of pleasure. Kevin guessed she thought upon that long-past visit from Jiro of the Anasati, when he had warned that factions within the Hadama clan were alarmed at the Akoma's sudden rise. The victory treaty with Tsubar could only have inflamed existing jealousies. And worse... Immediately before their departure for the Holy City, Arakasi's spies had sent news that young Jiro had paid a call upon Lord Desio. This missed message might be connected to both events. The politics of Kelowan were endless and deadly dangerous. Unwilling to dwell too long on Surani intrigue, Kevin pressed Mara forward and began sluicing her back. My lady... Mixed messages and clan rivalries will still be there after your bath, unless you want to confront your kinfolk covered in road dirt. He startled an outraged laugh from her. Beast! I'm certainly no dirtier than you, who walked the entire way in the open. Playfully, Kevin ran a finger over his face and held it out as if inspecting it. Hmm, yes, I do seem to be darker than when we began the journey. The soft cake of soap he held was unguarded, and Mara gouged out a dollop and seized the moment to deposit it on her lover's nose. Then you had best wash your own body as well. Kevin looked around in feigned regret. Ah, I don't see any servants at hand to scrub my back, my lady. Mara grabbed a sponge and drenched his face with water. Get in here, you foolish man. Grinning widely, Kevin dropped the soap stripped off his robes and climbed into the tub. He settled in behind Mara and cradled her close, his fingers roaming over her body. Her skin quivered under his attentions. She whispered, I thought you were going to wash off the road dirt. His hand slipped under the water, still touching. No one said the washing had to be unpleasant. She turned in the circle of his arms, then stretched up and kissed her barbarian slave. Soon the worries of clan rivalries were forgotten as she lost herself in the pleasures of his love. Robed in formal colours, Mara waved for her bearers to pause before the council hall entrance. Surrounded by her tightly clustered bodyguard and attended by a withered old serving maid, she endured several last-minute adjustments to her costume while Lujan and an honour company of five warriors waited to precede her into the chamber. Kevin stood behind her open litter. Unable to see past her towering jewelled headpiece to gain a view of the chamber, he settled with staring at the antechamber, its splendour unmatched by anything he had seen in his life. The building that housed the High Council was among the more imposing in Kentasani. The council occupied a complex larger than the entire Akoma estate house, with corridors lofty as caverns, each arch and doorway carved with fantastic creatures that earlier generations intended to repel evil influence. The gargoyles remained long after the names of the spirits had been forgotten, their fearsome countenances ignored by those who enjoyed their protection. The floors and ceilings were elaborately patterned, every inch of wall space painted with historical murals. Many of them showed warriors wearing Zacatecas and Minwanabi colours. Sometimes he recognised a contingent in a coma green. Newly appreciative of the Empire's grand traditions, Kevin felt a stranger to his own culture. This small city unto itself 
with its own entrances and conference chambers independent of the palace proper, was guarded by companies of soldiers levied from all of the houses of the council members. The corridors were lined with armoured warriors in a hundred different colour combinations. Each company was pledged to preserve the peace, taking no sides should disputes lead to violence. However, every lord ensured this vow was never put to the test, for Surani honour held house loyalty above any abstract concept of fair play. Kevin lost count of badges and colours long before reaching the anteroom. When he had faced Surani in the Rift War, the armies were homogenous, with perhaps two or three different houses marching under a combined command. But in this antechamber alone, at least a dozen armour patterns he did not recognise identified the houses that provided security for the meeting of Clan Hadama. A voice called out beyond the entry, The Lady of the Akoma! Then a huge pair of drums boomed. Lujan signalled his men to march in lockstep, and as Mara's bearers moved forward in procession, Kevin caught sight of the drummers. They stood to either side of the grand entry, clad in what looked like a costume of ancient pelts. The mallets in their hands were carved bone, and their instruments were of painted hide stretched over what close scrutiny revealed to be the inverted shells from gigantic turtles. Kevin made out the tripods underneath, fashioned from a lizard-like creature quilled with spines. Being a barbarian slave had advantages at times. No one showed surprise that he gawked. If the hallways and corridors had impressed Kevin earlier, the hall of the council itself was overwhelming. Constructed under a circular dome, the hall was surrounded by upper galleries with polished wooden benches, then descending levels of pillared galleries lined with chairs tantamount to thrones. Each gallery reminded Kevin of the Baron of Yarbon's private box on the festival grounds at the city's annual fairs, where the start and finish line for horse races was located. The meanest noble family in the Empire was entitled to a seat the equal of the Baron's in opulence. The most expansive galleries were on the lower levels, nearest the central dais, and many were set back under low canopies painted or embroidered with house symbols, ensuring that those behind and to the sides could not spy upon conferences. Aisles that were really promenades separated them one from the next, so that messengers and retainers might hurry effortlessly about their master's bidding. The vast size of the room was necessary. Kevin was astonished by the crowd. The lower levels were packed with lords in full Surani panoply. Colours and plumes and jewelled headdresses made a riotous feast for the eyes. Kevin closed his gaping mouth with an effort. This was only a clan meeting. Mara had attempted to explain clan relationships to him, and after a long and frustrating discourse, Kevin grasped only a fuzzy concept of how all these notables were affiliated. By his understanding, Somewhere back in the dim mists of history, these people had ancestors that were cousins. Bound to customs that seemed a knotwork of contradiction, they clung to what was, in mid logic, an outdated concept of relationship, one that might have held significance in an earlier age, but that now seemed mostly ceremonial. Yet, when Kevin had voiced this conclusion, Mara had insisted that clan loyalty was no phantom. Given the right motivation, these separate family factions would unite and die in bloody battle defending their elusive code of identity. It was the very urgency of such relationships that had created the great game. For once clan honour was invoked, no house could honourably ignore those ties of blood. Once past the entry platform and the drummers, Kevin could view the entire chamber. The sheer size made him feel dwarfed. On a dais slightly higher than the ring of seats on the central level of the hall, a man in flowing robes and a massive headdress of green and yellow plumes nodded to Mara's bearers to set down her litter. Her honour guard retired to take up position above and behind the concentric circle of seats cut into the lowest tier of galleries, 
and a snap of her fingers summoned Kevin to assist her to her feet. With the lady poised on his arm, the Midkemian guided where she pointed, down a shallow stair to a green-painted awning and a chair carved with Shatterbird symbols in a gallery large enough for all of Mara's advisers and officers to surround her should she need them close by. Followed by the ghostly echo of whispered conversation, Kevin kept his eyes down in proper Surani submission. He must observe the forms here, distasteful as they were to his beliefs. Fully five thousand people could fill the overhanging galleries, with room for ten thousand more at floor level if occasion warranted. As Kevin installed the Lady of the Acoma in her green lacquered chair, he marked that her place was relatively close to the dais. Aware that the time of entry as well as seating were cultural indicators of rank, Kevin had already marked the range of fashion and quality of clothing. The Lord farthest from the dais was a poor country relative by all appearance, for his finery was worn and faded with wear. But the man upon the dais was a peacock in full plumage. As Kevin performed a slave's bow beside his lady's chair, he risked a peek beneath his lashes. My Lord Chekawara, Mara greeted cordially. Are you well? The Lord, whose name Kevin recognised as belonging to the clan war chief, nodded back, though how he could do so and not topple under the weight of his jewels and plumes was mystifying. The man seemed something of a fop, yet his face was broad and masculine and almost as black-skinned as that of a native of Grand Kesh, the southern empire in mid -Kamea. Muttering as he rose from obeisance, Kevin commented, If you two are related, it's many generations back. Mara shot him a glance that was half irritated, half amused. From the dais, the lord of the Chekawara smiled, showing an array of ivory teeth. I am most well, Lady Mara. We welcome our most august ruling lady to our meeting, and presume that you are well also. Mara returned the ritual assurance, then coolly inclined her head to other surrounding lords. As he assumed a slave's place behind his lady's chair, Kevin searched faces for signs of displeasure. Yet, if any notable present was disappointed by Mara's timely arrival, nothing showed but Surani impassivity. Nearly seventy families had sent representatives to the gathering, and one or several could have been responsible for Mara's misdirected invitation. Stunned yet again by the scope of Suranuani, Kevin reminded himself that the Hadama were held to be a minor clan in the Empire, no matter how much honour the Akoma had gained. How many powerful houses must a great clan number? By Kevin's rough estimation, this tiny clan meeting, with advisers, servants and slaves, put the number of people in this building close to 500, with an equal number of soldiers waiting in outer halls. When the mighty of the Empire met in council, Kevin could only imagine the place filled to capacity. Clearly not intimidated, Mara said, I am most pleased to seek counsel with our cousins and attend this, the first clan meeting since I assumed the Akoma mantle. The Lord of the Chekawara's smile broadened. Much honour and prestige have you brought, House Akoma, since your father's untimely death. Lady Mara, you bring pride to our hearts. At this, many lords stamped upon the floor in a show of agreement like applause. Others offered congratulations, shouting, Yes, it is so! Much honour! And great success! Kevin leaned over to remove Mara's outer wrap, a light silk embroidered with her house symbol. This fellow's a snake oil salesman he whispered. Mara's brow furrowed under her formal makeup. She risked a hiss of disapproval. I don't know what snake oil is, but it has the ring of an insult. Now go and stand with Lujan's guard until I need you. Kevin folded the wrap over his arm and retreated up the stair. 
Once in place among the Akoma Honor Guard, he made a surreptitious study of the proceedings. The Lord of the Chekawara opened by announcing what seemed like social chat. A list of pending marriages, hand fastings and births, and a longer list of eulogies. Few of the deceased had died of age or infirmity. The phrase, fallen honourably in battle, occurred frequently. Kevin was astonished at the clarity of the acoustics in the hall. When the speakers chose not to mask their voices, they carried to the highest galleries. Kevin listened, mystified, as the Lord of the Chekawara's rich voice rose and fell as he mourned the passing of notables in the clan. To Lujan he murmured, That cully bird on the dais has all the sincerity of a relly. Silently at ease, the Akoma Force commander did not twitch a muscle, but deepening laugh lines around his eyes betrayed that he stifled a chuckle. Resigned that he would get nothing from an Akoma soldier on duty, Kevin moved among the litter bearers. Sirani slaves were not much of an improvement, but at least they noticed when he spoke, even if they only looked confused. Still, Kevin thought, any reaction was better than the stony manner of the warriors. Kevin idled away the passing minutes, observing the comings and goings of the many servants and retainers of the attending Hadama lords, when an odd behaviour caught his eye. Those who hurried through the vast hall seemed oblivious to the many paintings that adorned the walls, save one, a depiction of a fairly nondescript man. Like those around it, it was ancient, but this one had been recently repainted, and, for the obvious reason that any who passed by reached out and touched it, often without thought. Kevin nudged the slave next to him. Why do they do that? The slave looked discomforted. Do what? he whispered, as if speaking were sure to bring instant destruction. Touch that picture of a man, Kevin pointed. That's an ancient lord. He was servant of the empire. It's good luck to touch him. The slave withdrew into himself, as if that cryptic reference explained everything. Kevin was about to ask for explanation when a warning glance from Lujan silenced him and turned him back to watching the proceedings. No serious political discussion ever took place that he could see. Once the family announcements were finished, slaves thronged in with refreshments, and this lord or that would arise from his chair and speak with Chekawara or other clansmen. Many flocked around Mara's chair, and all of them seemed civil, if not friendly. Kevin waited for a second call to order or some sort of announcement of business, but no such thing ever happened. When the afternoon light faded above the domed chamber, Lord Chekawara lifted his staff of office and thumped a ringing blow on the dais. The meeting of Clan Hadama is concluded, he called out, and one by one, according to rank, the lesser lords bowed to him in parting. Seems like nothing but an absurd party to me, Kevin commented. A soldier in Mara's honour guard caught his eye then in urgent warning to keep silent. Kevin returned his usual insolent grin and then started. The warrior was Arakasi, clad in full armour and looking every inch the proper warrior. He had perfected military bearing so flawlessly that his presence was overlooked until now. More curious than ever to know why the spy master's attendance had been called for, Kevin shifted from foot to foot until Mara waved him over to replace her wrap. Kevin walked behind Mara's litter as her retinue re-entered the twilit streets. Lamplighters had just made their rounds and the imperial quarter of Kentasani glowed softly gold against the darkened sky. As the honour guard formed up to escort Mara to her townhouse, Arakasi fell in step beside Kevin. Wise enough not to call the spy master by name, the Midkemian simply said, Was anything of importance achieved in there? Arakasi marched with his hand on his sword, deadly and capable in appearance, though it was no secret he was not gifted with a blade. 
much. Exasperated by his brevity, Kevin probed, such as. The honor guard marched down a wide entrance ramp with torches blazing in bowls on either side. Below the rise, a larger contingent of warriors met them, affording their mistress the added security she would need in the darkening streets. Arakasi said nothing until they had rounded several corners and passed the gates from the imperial precinct. As they marched into the boulevard beyond, Arakasi murmured, Lady Mara's clansmen have made plain that she can expect a reasonable degree of support, assuming her alliances do not place other houses at risk. If she encounters trouble from her enemies, she'll need to invoke clan honour to gain assistance, and the outcome of such a call for aid could not in any way be assured. The Midkemian's puzzlement stayed obvious. Clan Honour, Arakasi repeated in his manner of piercing perception. You barbarians. The statement held no condemnation. The spymaster thoughtfully qualified, To draw her clansmen into war, Lady Mara must convince every lord from highest to least that an affront to her house was an insult not only to the Akoma, but to the Hadama clan as well. Kevin inhaled the incense-laden air they were passing the temple quarter and suffered a momentary interruption as their retinue was forced aside to allow a tribute caravan to pass. The huge, leather-strapped carry cases borne on heavy poles by slaves contained metals originally brought as plunder from the barbarian world and since dispensed by the Emperor's High Secretary, who portioned out allotments for the temples. Kevin waited until the guarding ranks of white-armoured imperial warriors passed on before he said, So? Arakasi tapped his sword. Calls to clan are difficult when the families who belong are as politically divided as ours are. For any attacking house is careful to make clear that it is moving against an enemy, not its clansmen. Gifts are often sent as reassurances. After a pause, Arakasi added, Lord Desio has been lavish. Kevin grinned in appreciation. What you're telling me is they're saying, Don't invite us unless you're going to win, because the Minwanabi might stop sending us bribes. But if you're sure you can destroy them, then we'll be happy to join in so we can take our share of the plunder. For the first time since Kevin could remember, the spymaster smiled outright. Then he loosed a chuckle that swelled into quiet laughter. I would never have thought to put it that way, Arakasi allowed. But that's precisely what they told her. Damn! Kevin shook his head in amazement, and I saw nothing going on except a gala. From the litter, Mara interjected, now you understand why I keep him around. His perspective is... fresh. Arakasi resumed his soldier's appearance, but a gleam lingered in his eyes. I agree, mistress. I don't know that I'll ever understand you people, Kevin said. He dodged to avoid a jigger bird that had escaped some scullion's cleaver. They had entered the residential quarter now, and the lamps were more widely spaced. I stood and watched that entire meeting, and the only discussion that got heated enough to seem important sounded like a debate on land reform. In council, Arakasi said patiently, what is not said is far more important. Who does not approach a lord's chair, and who hangs back, and who is seen with whom count for more than words? The fact that Lord Chekowara did not leave his dais to personally congratulate Mara on her border treaty was revealingly significant. The clan will not follow her lead, and all of that shuffling of bodies around Lord Mamogota's chair was proof that two factions within the clan support him against Our Lady. 
No one would seriously consider that nonsense about giving land to peasant farmers. The Party for Progress is without influence outside the Hunsan clan, and Lord Toklemekla of that clan is a close friend of Mamogota's. This was a dead issue before the meeting began. So, you presume that the intercepted message was arranged by Lord Mamo... whatever... Kevin surmised. We hope so, Arakasi answered. Mamagotas at least not affiliated with the Alliance War. He might take Desio's gifts, but he isn't a Minwanabi supporter. Kevin shook his head in amazement. You people have minds that twist like knitting. <sighs> Never mind. He interjected as Arakasi asked after the concept of knitting. Just take it that I'll be an old codger long before I understand this culture. The silence between slave and spy master lasted until the return to the townhouse. Kevin entered the lovely inner garden and helped his lady from her litter. He continued to doubt if he would ever truly know the people whose lives and fates he shared. As Mara retained his hand and smiled up at him, he looked into her dark eyes and found himself utterly lost. Sirani life might be a puzzle to him, but this woman was a mystery and a wonder. Chapter 15 Chaos The spectacle began. Banners flew from every tall building along the avenues leading to the arena. Citizens tossed flowers into the street to assure the gods they held no envy for those of loftier station. For reasons only the god of trickery might name, city dwellers invested favour in this house or that, cheering more or less vigorously depending upon who passed. Mara's litter and escort were greeted with loud applause. Again, dressed as a common servant and placed behind the litter alongside Kevin in the cortege, Arakasi commented, it seems the mob favours the Akoma this month, my lady. The victory in Suba has made you a heroine among the commoners. Noise defeated Mara's attempted reply. The long, stately boulevard that crossed the imperial precinct was thronged with folk from every walk of Surani life. Their clothing ranged from the costliest cloths and jewels worn by high-ranking nobles to the craftsman's unadorned broadcloth and the meanest beggar's rags. The games offered by the warlord in celebration of the light of heaven brought the finest ornaments out of jewel chests, the more daring of the wealthy merchants dressing their daughters for display in the hope of attracting a noble suitor. Surrounded by the flash of rare metal ornaments as well as lacquer combs, jades and gemstones, Mara's escort jostled and vied for road space along with dozens of other house guards and their litter-born lords and ladies. Some were carried in palanquins, painted in carnival colours or sequined with flecks of iridescent shell. Others held whole families, shouldered by as many as twenty slaves. For as far as the eye could see, the festival crowd made a vast, brilliant swirl of a thousand colours. Only the slaves stood out in commonplace robes of dull grey. Kevin stared like a blind man just given sight. Past a retinue of warriors in red and purple between the canopy poles of an uncountable crush of litters, he saw a wall hung with ribbons and banners that he took to be the end of the boulevard. But, as the Acoma party drew closer, his eyes widened in amazement. The barrier was no wall, but a segment of the Grand Imperial Stadium. The amphitheatre was vast, far larger than anything he might have imagined. The litters, soldiers and commoners on foot poured up a broad flight of steps, then across a concourse to a second flight. At the top lay yet another concourse, and beyond that the entrance to the stadium. As Mara's litter began the ascent, Kevin looked to either side and judged there must be at least another dozen entrances from the palace quarter alone. Even here, 
the guards had to shove and jostle to clear the way for their lady's passage. All of Sirani society had turned out to attend the games in the Emperor's honour, or to line up and gawk at the spectacle presented by their betters. Only great occasions such as this brought them so close to the might of the Empire, and country folk flocked in droves to the city to point, jabber and stare. Despite the festive atmosphere, the warriors maintained vigilance. Men of unclear rank and position moved through the crowd. Many wore guild badges. Others were messengers, vendors or rumour mongers. A few might be agents or spies or thieves. Assassins might wear any disguise. Any state festival that intermingled clans and political parties became an extension of the game of the council. Beyond the highest stair arose a stone arch 200 feet across. Kevin tried to calculate the size of the arena beyond and failed. The tiers of open seats must hold a 100,000 spectators and no amphitheatre in the kingdom could compare. At the first terrace, Lujan shouted, A coma! Individuals of lesser rank hurried clear of Mara's retinue. As the warriors ascended the second flight of steps, Kevin noticed bystanders exclaiming in surprise and pointing. When he realised the stairs were for him, his ears reddened. Commoners unaccustomed to his height and barbarian aspect made him an object of gossip and speculation. At the top of the second terrace, Lujan marched his guard through the crowd and cleared a space beside other noble retinues. The litter-bearers lowered their burden, and Kevin assisted Mara from the cushions. The force commander, a strike leader named Kenji, and three guards, and Arakasi, fell in at either side of the lady and her body-slave. The balance of the Akoma guard departed with the litter-bearers to wait upon them in the street at the bottom of the stairs. Lujan led the way into a corridor to the left of the archway. A hundred or more rows of seats rose above the level on which Mara's party moved, while another fifty rows descended toward the arena floor. To the left, two areas stood cordoned off, one of them dominated by a box adorned in lacquerwork gold and imperial white. The other section was bare of any decoration, but was immediately noticeable by contrast. The occupants all wore black robes. Arakasi noticed Kevin's interest. Great ones, he murmured in explanation. You mean the magicians? Kevin looked more carefully. But the men in their dark robes sat silently or were engaged in hushed conversations. A few watched the sandy expanse below, awaiting the first contest. They look entirely ordinary. Looks may deceive, Arakasi said. At Lujan's command, he helped the other warriors shoulder through a knot of bystanders. Why are all these people hanging about? Mara wondered. Usually there are no commoners on this level. Taking care not to be overheard, Arakasi answered. They hope to catch a glimpse of the barbarian Great One. The gossip mongers claim he will be in attendance. How can there be a barbarian Great One? Kevin interjected. Arakasi waved aside a matron with a flower basket who tried to sell Mara a bloom. Great Ones are outside the law. None may question them. Once a man is taken and trained to wear the black robe... He is of the assembly of magicians. What rank he held before is of no consequence. He is only a great one. Pledged to act in preservation of the empire, and his word becomes law. Kevin stilled further questions as Arakasi shot him a warning glance. They were too close to strangers for chance remarks or improper behaviour to be risked. The arena was not yet one-third full when Mara reached the box set aside for her. 
Like her seat in the council hall, the position indicated her relative rank in the hierarchy of the empire. By Kevin's estimation, some hundred families were closer to the imperial box, but thousands were farther removed. Mara sat with Lujan, the young strike leader, and the soldiers on either side. Kevin and Arakasi took up positions behind her chair, ready to answer her needs. Kevin studied the surrounding array of house colours and tried to puzzle out the pecking order of Surani politics. Past the magician's area and to the right of the warlord's dais lay a box dressed out in black and orange, the colours of House Minwanabi. On levels above sat other families of lesser importance, but all clan-related or in vassalage to Lord Desio. Adjacent came the yellow and purple colours of Zacatecas. The victory treaty with Subar had advanced Lord Chipino, and now he was second in power in the High Council. The Lord of the Chekawara took up his position in a box beneath Mara's, on the same level as the Warlords, but as removed from the white and gold as she was. A trumpet blast sounded from the arena floor. Wooden doors around the arena boomed open, and scores of young men in various colours of armour marched out in formation. As they moved, they sorted themselves out into pairs and saluted the empty imperial box. At a second signal from the game's director, who sat in a special niche by the gates, they drew swords and began to fight. Kevin quickly determined that the matches were to first blood only. The bested man would raise his helm as a sign of submission. The winner would then take on another victorious partner and initiate sparring again. Lujan answered Kevin's query. These are young officers of various houses. Most are cousins and younger sons of nobility, eager to show their prowess and gain a sliver of honour. He glanced around the stadium. This is of little consequence, save for those down there and their families. Still, a man may advance himself in the eyes of his master by winning a contest such as this. There were no colours on the floor from Minwanabi, Zacatecas or the other three great houses, nor from the Akoma, as houses recently covered in glory needed not bother with trivial displays. Kevin followed the combat with the trained eye of a soldier, but quickly lost interest. He had seen Sirani warriors much closer and with much more serious intentions than those boys who sparred upon the sand. Beyond the sunlit sands, lesser relations and servants were drifting into the boxes that would shortly hold the dominant lords of the empire. From the small size of their honour guards, none closer than a distant cousin had yet put in an appearance. The contest among the young nobles ended, and the last remaining pair departed, the loser with his sword lowered in defeat, and the winner nodding to the scattered cheers of those few interested spectators. The air off the sand was hot, and the amphitheatre's high walls cut off any breeze. Bored with the proceedings, and still finding the social reasons for Mara's attendance incomprehensible, Kevin bent to ask her if she wished for a cool drink. She had ignored him since they had entered public scrutiny for reasons of appearance, but... As she shook her head in curt refusal of his solicitude, Kevin noticed that his lover seemed uneasy. Protocol forbade him to make inquiry after her well-being. When Mara chose to assume Surani impassivity, a part of her became unreachable, though in most things he had come to know her moods as well as his own. As if his unspoken thoughts brought her worry to a head, the Lady of the Acoma beckoned to Arakasi. I would enjoy a chilled fruit drink. The spymaster bowed and departed. Kevin suppressed a reflexive flash of hurt and only belatedly realised that his mistress would hardly send Arakasi off just to fetch refreshments. On his way to seek a vendor, the spymaster would doubtless be contacting informants and gauging the activities of enemies. 
As Mara turned back to face the events below, she paused the briefest moment to catch Kevin's eye. That one glance let him know she was glad of his presence. Mara inclined her head casually to Lu Jan. Have you noticed? Most of the nobles are hanging back this afternoon. Caught off guard by this unexpected public conversation, the Akoma Force commander replied without banter. Yes, my lady. There seems an unusual quality to this festival. Kevin peered at their surroundings and determined there was something odd in the crowd rhythm. But he, with his alien viewpoint, had been slow to sense such strangeness. Distracting peals of laughter drifted up from lower courses of seats as other doors opened and short figures scurried out into the arena. Kevin's eyebrows arose in surprise as a cluster of diminutive insectoids raced back and forth across the sand, waving their forearms in agitation and clicking small mandibles this way and that. From the opposite end of the sand, a group of warriors hurried to meet them, dwarves by all appearances. Most wore mock body armour and makeup that ranged from the comic to the grotesque. They waved brightly painted wooden swords, formed up for a loose-ranked charge, and sounded war calls in surprisingly deep voices. The timbre of those cries was all too fresh in Kevin's memory. They're desert men. At Mara's permissive nod, Lujan said, Many were our captives, I expect. Wondering that such a fiercely proud race should submit to a demeaning act of comedy, Kevin marvelled further that Choja, who were allies, should be included in such honourless display. Not Choja, Lujan corrected. Those are Chuji La, from the forests north of Silmani. Smaller and without intelligence. They are essentially harmless. The dwarves and the insectoids met in a clash of shields and chitin. Kevin soon reassured himself that the combat was impotent, with blunt wooden swords unable to pass the armoured insectoids, while tiny mandibles and blunt forearms closed and tussled without any injury to the dwarves. This farcical spectacle drew laughter and jeers from the crowd, until a sudden electrical sense of presence turned all heads away from the field. Kevin's gaze followed everyone else's, like metal after a lodestone, to the entrance nearest the imperial box. There, a short man in a black robe made his way to the area set aside for great ones. Lujan said, Milamba. Kevin's eyes narrowed to bring his distant countryman into better focus. He's a kingdom man. Lujan shrugged. So the rumours say. He wears a slave's beard, which is enough to mark him as a barbarian. Short by kingdom standards and quietly unremarkable, the man took his place next to a very stout magician and another slender great one. Struck by a sense of déjà vu, Kevin said, There's something familiar about him. Ma returned. Was he a companion from your homeland? I would have to get closer to see, my lady. But Mara forbade him the liberty, since he would attract too much attention were he to venture off by himself. Like all in Mara's immediate service, strike leader Kenji knew of the relationship between the barbarian and his lady, but their unaccustomed familiarity left him feeling uncomfortable. My lady... Your slave should be reminded that, no matter where the Great One was before, he is now in service to the Empire. Kevin found his tone abrasive, just as Mara's had been, and though he knew her pose was necessary in public, it still rankled. Well, I wouldn't have much to say to a traitor to his own people anyway. A swift glance from Mara stilled his tongue before his brashness could demand the punishment that would become necessary should any passing stranger chance to overhear. Ghost quiet and suddenly there, 
Arakasi bowed and presented a large, cool drink to his mistress. Under his breath, he said, The Shinzawai are conspicuous by their absence. He glanced around. Satisfied to find the crowd still absorbed by the mysterious outworld Great One, the spy master added, There's something highly abnormal afoot, my lady. I urge vigilance. Outwardly calm and hiding the movement of her lips behind the rim of her cup, Mara whispered tensely, Minwanabi. Arakasi fractionally shook his head. I think not. Desyo is outside, still in his litter, and half drunk with sa wine. I would expect him to be sober if he had a plot under way. Looking uncharacteristically harried, the spy master made another reflexive check for listeners. The battle between dwarves and insectoids raged on to a crescendo of noise. Using the din as cover and hiding the nature of his talk behind gestures of submission, Arakasi went on. But something momentous is stirring. I suspect to do with the Blue Wheel's return to the Alliance for War. Too many things I hear ring false. Too many contradictions go unquestioned. And more members of the Assembly of Magicians are in attendance than a man will be likely to see in a lifetime. If someone seeks to undermine the warlord... Here, Mara sat up straight. Impossible! But the spy master confronted her scepticism. At the height of his triumph, he could be the most vulnerable. After a significant pause, he added, Nine times since birth, mistress, I have moved upon no more than a feeling and each time my life was saved. Be ready to depart at a moment's notice, I beg you. Many innocents could become entangled in a trap big enough to overwhelm Almecho. Others may die because enemies reacted swiftly to take advantage of the moment. I point out the Shinzawai are not the only ones absent. He need not name the empty chairs. Most of the Blue Wheel Party sent no representatives. Many in the Party for Peace had not brought wives or children, and most of the Kanazawai lords wore armour rather than robes. If such anomalies were taken as pieces of one related issue, a widespread threat might be real. Squads of white-armoured warriors were stationed at strategic points and entrances, many more than needed for crowd control, should an unfortunate event on the arena floor turn the mob's mood from celebration to riot. More boxes than the Imperial one were being watched. Mara touched Arakasi's wrist in agreement. She would take his caution to heart. The Minwanabi could easily have agents planted nearby, awaiting any excuse to strike. Lujan's eyes began to inventory the location and number of soldiers in the immediate area. Whether events occurred by design or accident made no difference to him. The intrigues of politics could surface just as well in chance opportunity. Should an enemy die of injuries in a brawl, who could cast blame? Such was fate. Such might be the thinking of many of the nobles within striking range should the opportunity only present itself in the heat of a riot. Arakasi's speculation was suspended as a rush of nobles into boxes signalled the imminent arrival of the Imperial Party. Nearest to the white-draped dais, a man in ceremonial robes of black and orange entered, a flock of warriors and servants clustered at his heels. His stout bearing carried a sureness of step that hinted at muscle beneath his fat. Minwanabi, Arakasi identified with a startling note of venom. Eager to put a form to the man who was the arch-fiend in the drama that involved his beloved Mara, Kevin saw only a stout young man flushed by the heat who looked rather petulant. Further study was cut short by trumpets and drums that signalled the approach of the Imperial Party. Conversation hushed throughout the stadium. 
handlers raced onto the arena sand and chased off the dwarves and insectoids. Across the cleared field, groundkeepers wearing loincloths hurried out with rakes and drags to smooth the ground in preparation for the coming games. Trumpets blasted again, much closer, and the first ranks of Imperial Guardsmen marched in. They wore armour of pure white and carried the instruments that sounded the fanfare. These were fashioned from the horns of some immense beast curling around their shoulders to end in bell-like flares above their heads. Drummers in the next rank came on beating a steady tattoo. The band assumed position in front of the Imperial box and the warlord's honour guard of two dozen entered after them. Each warrior's accoutrements and helm were lacquered in shiny white, marking them for an elite carder known as the Imperial Whites. Sunlight splintered in reflections off gold blazons and trim, which drew a murmur of amazement from the commoners seated highest in the amphitheatre. By Sirani standards, the metal worn by each warrior was costly enough to finance a coma expenses for an entire year. The guards took position and the crowd stilled. Into an avid silence, a senior herald shouted, in a voice that carried to the most distant tier of seats, Al Mecho! Warlord! The crowd surged to its feet, crying out welcome for the mightiest warrior in the Empire. Quiet in her place and sipping at her fruit drink, Mara watched but did not cheer as the warlord made his entry. Wide bands of gold adorned the neck and armholes of his breastplate. Additional gold work patterned his helm, which was surmounted by a crimson plume. Behind Almecho trailed two black-robed magicians, named the Warlord's Pets by the masses. Kevin had heard how, in the years before his capture, one of those distant great ones had cast the spell that proved Mara's claim of treachery by the Minwanabi, an action that compelled Desio's predecessor to ritual suicide to expiate the shame to his family. Then, unexpectedly, the Herald announced a second presence. Ichinda! Ninety-one times Emperor! The ovation became a deafening roar. The young light of heaven made his entrance. Even Lady Mara threw restraint to the winds. She cheered as loudly as any commoner, her face alight with admiration and awe. This was a man held in near religious devotion by his nation. The light of heaven made his unprecedented appearance in armour covered entirely in gold. He seemed no more than three years over twenty. His expression could not be interpreted over distance, but his bearing was erect and confident, and red-brown hair flowed from under his high gilt helm to lie in trimmed curls on his shoulders. Behind the emperor filed twenty priests from each of the twenty major temples. As the light of heaven made his way to stand beside the warlord, the crowd thundered. The cheering seemed inexhaustible. Through the unnerving din, Kevin shouted to Lujan, Why is everyone so carried away? Since decorum had been totally forsaken, Lujan freely called back, The light of heaven is our spiritual guardian who through prayer and exemplary living intercedes on our behalf to the gods. He is Swanwani. Never in living memory had an emperor blessed his nation by coming among the people. That Ichindar chose to do so now was inspirational, a cause for unrestrained joy. Yet, alone in a crowd of thousands, Arakasi was not cheering. He went through all the motions, but Kevin saw that he scanned the surrounding throng for any hint of danger to his mistress. With Surani impassivity abandoned to wild pandemonium, the moment offered the perfect opportunity for an enemy to slip close without notice. Kevin edged closer to Mara's back, prepared to leap to her defence if need be. The tumultuous ovation rolled on with no sign of warning. 
At length the emperor took his seat, and the warlord raised outstretched arms. His demand took several minutes to be noticed. When the crowd reluctantly quietened, Almecho shouted, The gods smile upon Suruani! I bring news of a great victory over the otherworld barbarians. We have crushed their greatest army, and our warriors celebrate. Soon all the lands called the kingdom will be laid at the light of heaven's feet. The warlord ended with a deferential bow to the light of heaven, and the masses roared out in approval. Kevin stood as if stunned. The pit of his stomach felt like ice. Then, aware through his shock and the howl of the crowd that Arakasi studied him intently, the Midkemian glared back. Your warlord means Brukel and Boric's forces were routed, the armies of the West. Desperate to bridle an anger that could only endanger his life, Kevin qualified... My own home lies in peril, for now the way lies open for Suranuani to march on Zun. Arakasi looked away first, and Kevin remembered. The spy master had lost a master and home to the Minwanabi before he swore service to the Akoma. Then Mara's fingers stole into Kevin's hand and returned a squeeze of understanding. The Midkemian battled a rush of emotion as his conflicts of loyalty, love and upbringing tore him a thousand different ways. Fate had taken him from his family and forced him away to a distant world. He had chosen life and love as a man may rather than miserable captivity. But the cost was only now becoming apparent. Who was he? Kevin of Zun or Kevin of the Acoma? Before the imperial box, the warlord held up his hands as the noise subsided. He shouted, To the glory of Suranuani, and as a sign of our devotion to the light of heaven, we dedicate these games to his honour. The cheering swelled afresh, grating on ears and nerves. Somehow Kevin endured it. Though Lujan and Arakasi might tolerate a breach of manners, any Surani warriors who guarded neighbouring boxes would cut him down and ask questions later, should they suspect him of impudence toward a lady of Mara's rank. Numbly, Kevin watched the doors open at the arena's far end. Roughly a hundred men shambled onto the sunlit sand. Naked but for loincloths, they were of all ages and states of health. Some stood with weapons and shields that were familiar to them, but they were few. Most seemed confused by their circumstances, their grip on their swords uncertain. These are not fighters, Kevin observed, a sting to his tone despite his best efforts. Arakasi quieted him with explanation. This is a clemency spectacle. All are condemned men. They will fight and the one who lives at the end will go free. Trumpet sounded, and the slaughter commenced. Before his capture, while soldiering for his father, he had seen many men killed. This was not warfare, nor even a savagely matched contest. What took place upon the sands of Kentasani's arena was butchery. The handful of trained men moved like cats through mice trapped in a granary, killing at will. Finally, fewer than a dozen men remained standing, and these more fairly matched. Kevin had lost his stomach for watching. He stared blankly at the spectators, but found no relief from his disgust. The Surani seemed to enjoy the blood, not the sport. They cheered each painful death and compared the agonies of one disemboweled man with those of another. Wages were made on how long the wretch who tried to stuff his spilled entrails back into his abdomen would last, and how many screams he would utter before he died. No one seemed interested in the skill of the handful of fighters still living. 
Kevin felt his gorge rise and swallowed hard. He controlled his loathing by force until the debacle ended, a man with a sword and knife taking the last of the condemned with a thrust under the shield. From the imperial box, the vaunted Sirani emperor observed the proceedings impassively, while the warlord at his side murmured to an adviser as if carnage were a daily event. Burning now, with a fury fuelled by outrage, Kevin looked to see how the Great One, who had once been a kingdom man, was handling this atrocity. Even at this distance, Milimber's countenance appeared stony. But to Kevin's dismay, the fat magician by his side had broken off his discussion and appeared to be studying the Acoma box. Kevin averted his gaze in sudden fear. Could a Great One hear thoughts? He bent without considering to ask Mara, but stopped, recalled to his place by the sight of her. The Lady of the Acoma endured the bloodletting with proper Surani restraint, her only sign of discomfort a slight stiffness in her shoulders. The former son of Zun felt his stomach burn. He knew Mara. Intimate with her throughout five years, he knew she could perceive the difference between the slaughter below and the battle campaign experienced in the desert. Yet she never so much as flinched when the victor swaggered among the fallen bodies, his gory weapon brandished aloft. Kevin checked surreptitiously to see whether the Great One was still watching. This time he could plainly see that the bearded one, Millember, bore an expression of distaste, even his eyes seemed ablaze. Kevin was not the only one to notice Millimber's disgust. Nobles in nearby boxes whispered and glanced toward the magician, and a few looked openly apprehensive. Arakasi saw the exchange. To Kevin he whispered, This doesn't bode well. Great ones may act on a whim, and not even the light of heaven dares gainsay their will. If this former countryman of yours shares your distaste for killing, there could be a scene. In sunlight, on hot sand, the victor finished his strutting. Slaves came and cleared away the corpses, while rakers smoothed over the rumpled, blood-soaked ground. Trumpet sounded the next round of the Imperial Games, while Kevin wished silently for a drink to wet his dry mouth. A band of men wearing loincloths entered the stadium, taller and fairer than most Sirani. Kevin instantly recognised countrymen from his homeworld. Their shoulders gleamed with oil, and they carried an assortment of ropes, hooks, weighted nets, spears and long knives. The festival atmosphere did not disorient them, nor did they give the crowds of showy nobles more than a desultory glance. Instead, they crouched in awareness that trouble approached from any of a dozen directions. Kevin had shared such uncertainty upon patrol and standing the night watch on the edge of the no-man's land where the enemy might strike at any moment. But these men had not long to wait for action. A pair of large doors rumbled open at the far end of the arena, and a creature out of a nightmare shambled out. All fangs and lethal claws, it stood the size of an elephant, but moved cat-fast on its six legs. At the sight of it, even Mara lost her composure and exclaimed, A Haroth! The Kelowanese predator blinked and snarled at the sudden blaze of sunlight. Scales armoured its hide, scattering chilly highlights across its neck as it quested to and fro, sniffing the air. The crowd sat charged with expectation. Then the beast spotted its foe. The tiny men who stood exposed on that cruel vista of sand. The Harold did not pour warning, as a bull or a nidra might, but lowered its head in belligerence and instantly sprang to the charge. It moved with terrible swiftness. The warriors scattered, not in panic, but in a desperate attempt to confuse. The beast made no sound, but its fury was apparent as it focused upon one unfortunate fellow and gave chase. The end came in a flash of claws and a spinning stop that ground the human underfoot. 
Unmindful of sand or weapons, the Harolth devoured the remains in two bites. Saddened, revolted and frozen in sympathy for his countrymen, Kevin could not look away. While the Harolth dispatched its meal, the survivors regrouped behind the animal and quickly deployed their nets. Faster than Kevin could possibly imagine, the creature spun and charged. The men stood their ground until the last instant, then threw the nets as they scattered. The hooks grappled and caught in thick hide and the creature was entangled. Kevin watched in admiration and fear as spearmen rushed in to strike. The weapons they had been issued were heavy, but the creature's scales were very tough. It took all of a man's strength just to penetrate, and the wounds were like stings to the monster. Its vitals stayed totally unharmed. The men saw the futility of further attack. Two of them conferred briefly, then ran to the rear, where the creature's huge tail thrashed and flailed up sand. Kevin's breath stopped as, against all rational thought, his countrymen leaped upon the Harolth and climbed in an attempt to drive their long knives into the monster's spine. The sheer bravery of the act brought tears to his Midkemian eyes. Even Lujan was impressed. These men show courage, Kevin answered in bitter pride. My countrymen know how to look death in the eye. The Harolth felt the prick at its back. It heaved and snapped, and nets unravelled, whirled away like torn string. The tail hammered down into sand, and the blow shook one man off. He sailed through the air and crashed, too stunned to run. The Harolth snapped him in half. The remaining man clung grimly. To jump down was to be trampled, to stay an act of sheer folly. The scales made treacherous handholds, and the Harold was maddened to fury. It spun and snapped and slashed, missing its mark by scant inches, for the man had resumed his climb. The crowds murmured their appreciation. Higher the man climbed, though tossed on his perch like a monkey on a storm-shaken branch. He reached the juncture above the stamping hind legs and drove his blade to the hilt into the creature's back. The hindmost pair of legs violently collapsed, all but throwing the man. He slipped, clawed a hold, and clung as the Harold shuddered and writhed in rage and pain. It whipped its neck, trying to bite at its tormentor, but its thick body lacked the suppleness to bend enough to snatch its tiny foe. The man flexed a blood-spattered wrist and jerked his blade. The weapon cleared bone and hide with difficulty, the Harolth bellowed and slashed, and the drag of useless limbs gouged up furrows in the sand. The man hung on, inching tortuously forward to the next joint of the spine. Again he drove his blade between the knobs of vertebrae and successfully severed the spine. The middle segment of legs went limp. Quickly the men on the ground raced in to blind and distract the paralysed monster until their companion could jump clear. Once he reached the sand safely, they all gave the stricken predator a wide berth until its struggles slowed and it perished. The crowd yelled their approval, and Lujan made free with admiration. As if he momentarily forgot that he addressed a slave, he said, No Harold has been felled by warriors without five times more losses. Your countrymen do themselves honour. Kevin wept unabashedly. Though all of these men were strangers to him, he felt he knew each one in his heart. He understood that they took no pleasure or pride from what they had achieved. What the Surani counted pride was to these men merely survival. Tears also streamed down the cheeks of Kevin's countrymen. Exhausted, alone, and aware they might never see their home again, the Midkemians left the arena while Nidra teams were rushed in to haul away the Harold's carcass, and rakers and slaves with drags scraped the marks of conflict from the sand. Abruptly aware that he had drawn Mara's scrutiny, Kevin made an effort to mend his glaring disregard for proper behaviour. Though she must show no flicker of sympathy in her pose as ruling lady, she handed her empty drink cup to Arakasi and exchanged a surreptitious whisper. Have we remained long enough to satisfy the needs of our status in the council. 
Arakasi glanced pointedly at Kevin, warning the barbarian not to show reaction to the possibility that the lady might not care for blood sports. I wish I could say yes, my lady, but if you were to leave now, before your enemies move to depart... Mara returned a slight nod and faced dutifully forward, and the fact that she must endure strictly for the sake of appearances sparked a wild anger in Kevin. Under his breath, in reckless reaction, he hissed, I will never understand your people and your game. The trumpets drowned out his protest. The ground's crew left the arena at a run as yet another door boomed open. A dozen fighting men in outlandish battle harnesses strutted onto the sand. Each wore leather wristbands set with studs and headdresses of vari-coloured plumes. They advanced in total disregard of the audience for whom they were imported to amuse and halted finally at the arena centre, their swords and shields held in relaxed confidence. Kevin had heard of the proud mountain men who inhabited the far eastern highlands. Alone among the people to defeat the Empire, they had forced a truce between nations some years before the Surani invasion of Midkemia. The trumpets blew again, and the herald cried an introduction. As these soldiers of the Thuril Confederation have violated the treaty between their own nations and the Empire by making war upon the soldiers of the Emperor... They have been cast out by their own people, who have named them outlaws and bound them over for punishment. They will fight the captives from the world of Midkemia. All will strive until one is left standing. Trumpets called for the event to begin. As the large doors at the end of the arena swung ponderously open, Lujan volunteered an observation. What is the games director thinking of? Thurl will not fight one another if they defeat the Midkemians. They'll die cursing the Emperor first. My lady, be ready to leave quickly. Arakasi broke in. If the fight is a disappointment, the mob will likely turn ugly. Since Surani customs seated commoners on the levels above the nobility, in the event of violence, the higher classes of the empire would need to fight their way up through a riot to reach the available exits. Kevin wondered at the much-vaunted Surani discipline, but, as if sensing his thought, Arakasi contradicted, These games sometimes awaken our bloodlust in the common folk. There have been riots before, and nobles have died in them. The seemingly endless contradictions of these people baffled Kevin only briefly. For that moment, a dozen Midkemians marched from the open archway opposite the warlord's dais. Their original metal armour was far too costly an extravagance to be used for arena entertainment. In place of good chainmail and armoured helms and shields, these captives wore garishly painted facsimiles fashioned of Surani materials. One shield bore the wolf's head of Lamut, and another, in two bright, splashy colours, the horse blazon of Zun. Kevin bit his lip to keep from voicing his anguish. He could not help his countrymen. He would only get himself uselessly killed and leave his beloved lady an inheritance of shame. But the outrage and the pain he felt would never answer to logic. Smouldering with pent-up emotions, Kevin closed his eyes and lowered his head. These imperial games were a barbarity, and he was unwilling to watch good men wasted for the perverse sake of a spectacle. But, instead of the clash of combat, a murmuring arose from the crowd. Kevin risked a look. The warriors of Thuril and Midkemia were not fighting, but speaking. Catcalls and whistles drifted down from the highest rim of the stadium as the two combatants faced one another with something less than a bellicose posture. Now one of the Thuril pointed at the crowd. While his words were too distant to hear, his expression reflected contempt. One of the Midkemians stepped forward and a Thuril came on guard, but a shout from his companion caused him to retreat a step. The Midkemian removed his leather helm and glared about the arena. Then, 
unthinkably insolent, he cast both armour and sword upon the sand. His shield followed, the thump of its impact clearly audible in the absolute silence. He spoke something to his companions and folded his arms. His example was shortly followed by the others in the arena. Swords, helms and shields tumbled from loosened fingers until, in a moment, both Midkemians and Thuril confronted one another, disarmed. More catcalls came from the commoners, but, as yet, the higher classes seemed more amused than offended by this odd behaviour. Danger did not seem imminent. Until Arakasi tapped Kevin lightly and quietly on the arm. Take this, he whispered. A knife haft slipped into the barbarian's palm. He all but flinched in astonishment before his fingers closed. For a slave to carry arms meant a death sentence, and honourless was the free man who dared to flaunt this law. That the spy master did so indicated a circumstance of deadly peril. To Mara, Arakasi murmured, Lady, I will fetch your guards and litter and have them brought as close to the arena entrance as the Imperial guards will permit. Then I will run back to your townhouse and muster your remaining soldiers. Come away and meet us in the streets as you can. I have that feeling I spoke of earlier. I fear the worst from this. Mara gave no visible sign that she had heard, but Lujan set his hand upon his sword hilt and Kenji and the other two warriors came alert. Arakasi slipped quietly away. Kevin held the blade against his forearm, eyes glued to the strange tableau, while his peripheral senses took stock of the advisers who conferred with masters and mistresses in the adjacent boxes. Within the imperial box, the warlord surged to his feet. The resounding catcalls and shouts redoubled. Mottled scarlet with rage, he shouted, Let the fighting begin! When the fighters on the sand defiantly held their ground, burly, leather-clad handlers rushed in to end their recalcitrance. They uncoiled Nidrahide whips and began lashing the warriors. The crowd began to shout their impatience. Whistles and obscenities blended into a note ominously rising, as even the well-born nobles objected to watching motionless men being whipped. Suddenly, one of the Thurl grabbed a handler, jerked the man off balance, and caught the trailing lash. He whipped the leather around his enemy's neck and began strangling the life from him. The other handlers turned upon the renegade and flailed at him viciously. Their blows drove him to his knees, but his determination did not relent. He twisted the leather tighter and tighter, while his victim puffed and turned purple and finally died. In the next stunned instant, before any could react, the Thuril soldiers recovered their dropped weapons and surged to the attack. The Midkemians joined them, and handlers died, their whips cut into pieces and spattered red with their blood. An ugly mutter raced through the upper concourses. Kevin glanced toward the magicians to see if they might intervene, but it seemed they had troubles of their own. The bearded one, called Milimba, was standing, and though the black robes on either side entreated him to return to his seat, the magician would hear no pleas. Rage burned in his eyes, hot enough to be felt across distance, and Kevin knew fear. He glanced back to Mara but a slight signal from Lujan indicated they must wait even yet to depart. Arakasi must have time to fetch the litter and guard and bring them to the outside stair. To be caught without an escort in the street was far too great a risk. Suddenly, a black robe at the warlord's side rose and swept his hand in an arc. A shudder ran down Kevin's spine and the hair prickled at his nape. Magic! And done with no more effort than a wave of one hand. Dumbstruck, the Midkemian saw the rebels on the sand buckle at the knees and fall limp. The warlord's shout echoed over their helpless prostrate forms. Now go bind them, build a platform and hang them for all to see. The crowd went still as a storm front. Lujan murmured, Be ready. 
Kenji and the warriors shifted forward in their seats. Kevin put a hand upon Mara's shoulder. Poised and apparently at ease throughout the entire exchange, the lady was hardly immune to the sense of danger. Through touch, the man who loved her could feel that she trembled. He ached to reassure her, but the tension in the arena continued threateningly to build. Young officers in the first rank of seats cried out in rage at the warlord's order. Vociferously they raised objection and demanded the prisoners below be permitted a warrior's death. Many had been patrol leaders in the forefront of the war against the Midkemians or the Thuril. Enemies or aliens, the captives on the sand had proven their mettle in battle. To hang them like soulless slaves would bring shame to all the Empire. Neither were the Great Ones remaining passive. Millenba exchanged what appeared to be heated words with another black robe who strove unsuccessfully to placate him. At length, Millenba shouldered past, still speaking. The stout one rose to hurry after too late. The Great One who had once been Midkemian was poised midway up the steps that separated the black robes from the Imperial box. On the sands of the arena... Chaos reigned. Carpenters rushed in, dragging tools and lengths of lumber, while warriors in Almecho's white armour escorted handlers to gather up and bind the stunned warriors. Warned by some nameless instinct, Kevin knew an instant of apprehension. The vast crowd in the amphitheatre seemed locked in the grip of the moment, mesmerised by fascination. Catcalls and shouts wavered off into silence, and all eyes watched the dark-robed figure next to the warlord's box. Millenba raised his arm. Blue flames slashed the air, scintillating even in full sunlight, and a bolt hurtled downward and exploded amid the warlord's guards. Living men were tossed in all directions, scattered like leaves before wind. Carpenters and craftsmen lost their footing, and the boards and tools brought for scaffolding were whirled away like straw. Nobles in the lower seats were hammered into their chairbacks by the fury of the detonation, and a gust clapped in backlash over the rising tiers of seats. Milumba's hand made a striking motion, and his voice cut through the stunned silence left in the aftermath of the explosion. No more! The fat magician abruptly gave up pursuit. As fast as stout legs could carry him, he rushed into the imperial box, his thin companion right behind him. The two great ones conferred briefly with the light of heaven, who arose from his chair. The next instant, with no warning, both great ones and emperor vanished. Too shaken to examine his amazement, Kevin caught Mara's arm. Right, that tears it. Unceremoniously, he raised her from her chair. If His Majesty sees fit to depart, we're leaving too. Lujan raised no objection, but drew his sword and leapt over the back of his bench. At his orders, strike leader Kenji and both other warriors formed a rear guard, while the Akoma force commander forged ahead to keep up with Kevin and Mara. Down the narrow aisle between boxes, the small party retreated in what approached unmannerly haste. Milumba's actions held most other spectators riveted, and those in the rows above Mara's line of flight called down irritable comments as the passage of the lady and her escort momentarily interrupted their view. Tension built to a fever pitch as the warlord's voice rang out in unmitigated fury. Who dares this? Milumba shouted answer. I dare this! This cannot be! Will not be! But the rest of his words went unheeded by Akoma warriors as running footsteps approached their party from behind. By now at the juncture of the aisle and the stair to the upper levels, Kevin spun round. He saw two strange soldiers in maroon armour racing to overtake the Akoma escort. Mara's rearguard warriors halted and immediately drew their swords. Left with only Kenji for protection, Kevin shouted warning. Lujan! The force commander looked back. He took in the threat and identified the armour at a glance. Sanjayo! They serve the Minwanabi! 
Still moving, he signalled to the two warriors who prepared to stand interference. Keep Stason at your lady's back! To Kevin he added, We could take them, but first we get Mara to safety! For the commotion in the arena showed no sign of abating. The warlord screamed at the magician, By what right do you do this thing? Millimber's reply seemed to scourge the very air with his fury. By my right to do as I see fit! Aware of little else beyond a sense of impending disaster, Kevin hurried Mara urgently forward. She tackled the stone stair gamely, despite the pegged soles of her sandals, which unreliably caught on the treads and threatened to trip her up. Through whitened lips she gasped, Oh, we know it's in shambles. Chaos is upon us. Other figures stirred in the cross aisles. The guards of the Sajau hesitated in their pursuit of the Akoma. They conferred, and one doubled back. The other diligently resumed chase. Now other retinues crowded the concourse stair, nobles and ladies and warriors withdrawing before the charged air of threat that lapped across the amphitheatre, like the swelling quiet before cataclysm. Lujan noted Kevin's shout that one Sajayo warrior had broken away, presumably with instructions to fetch reinforcements. The force commander never missed stride. Only a fool would start a fight now, or haven't you been listening? Shouts from the Imperial box ended with, My words are as law! Go! Mara started in fright and caught her soul on a cracked edge of paving. Kevin snatched her back from a fall, all but scooping her slight weight into his arms to keep her upright. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Milimba directing white-clad Imperial guards to free the prisoners who still lay in unconscious heaps on the sand. The warlord gave way to uncontained outrage. You break the law! No one may free a slave! Milimba's wrath towered and his voice sharpened to steel. I can. I am outside the law. Kevin felt a surge of wild hope as he crested the last rise to the concourse. The archway that led through to the street lay barely a dozen strides ahead. Is that true? he gasped to Mara. Can Milimba free a slave? Mara returned a stark look of fear. He can do anything. He is a great one. An overwhelming sense of imminent upheaval stirred the beginnings of panic. Spectators started erupting out of their seats and shoving onto the concourses. But their flight began too late. One of the warlord's great ones arose to challenge Milimba. Aware of mass fear and the crowd like a rising wave behind him, Kevin pushed Mara toward the exit. Lujan raised his sword to stem the rush, while his warriors shouted, Akoma! But not all in the mob fled the magic. Shouts sounded to the rear, and five warriors in maroon armour raced to engage Kenji and the two soldiers. The Akoma strike leader never hesitated. Rather than be attacked in full flight, he spun back with a cry of Akoma and charged the Sajayo attackers. The warriors rushed with him. Kevin and Mara raced ahead, with only their force commander left in reserve to defend them. Sajayo and Akoma met between stairs. The clash of their weapons passed unnoticed amid the vast upswelling of sound the cries of awed spectators and the calls of warriors and guards who sprang to their master's protection. Other folk cried out in amazement as the interplay between Milimba and the warlord's pets developed in the imperial box. Then, above such cries came screams of pain and terror. Poised on the brink of the stair, Kevin risked a glance back. From the area beside the magician's box, a sizzling discharge of energy cracked out. Milimba's presence disappeared in a searing dazzle, golden light entangled with blue in a fearful, blinding display. In the unearthly play of shadow and light, the faces of the crowd were etched sharply. Each expression held a reasonless need to flee. People pushed, shoved, jostled and stumbled in a frenzy to climb the stair. 
The combat initiated by the Sajayo soldiers was overwhelmed, swept away by the roiling thousands who fled the magician's wrath. Kevin gripped Mara tightly. Run! Barely ahead of the stampeding masses of spectators, he plunged with her down the stair. In the flickering, incandescent flash of sorcery, the plume on Lujan's helm shone an unearthly green. His repeated cry of a coma vanished into the angry shouts and terrified cries from behind. The stair plunged endlessly down. Mara ran and stumbled on her clumsy, pegged sandals. Scared beyond propriety by the danger, Kevin bent and caught her in his arms. Kick your shoes off! Mara said something. Words could not be distinguished over the noise. I don't care about the emeralds. Kick them off! Kevin commanded. Her weight made him awkward on the stair. Despite his best efforts to run, they were falling behind Lujan, and now Kevin felt himself battered by pushing hands and buffeted by fleeing bodies. Mara shed her sandals. In desperation, Kevin set her down, his hand like a vice on her arm. He towed her relentlessly against the jostle and pull of the mob. Someone fell to his left. In an instant, a thousand remorseless feet stamped over the hapless body. The victim never screamed. The crushing weight of the mob rolled over him, pressing air from his lungs and bruising him into a pulp. A frightened, witless commoner jammed hard against Kevin's linked arm, tearing at his hold upon Mara. By reflex, he drew Arakasi's knife. His lady's wrist slipped through his grasp. Now he held only her fingers. Over the shoulder of the man who still shoved, Kevin glimpsed her expression of sheer terror before he lost sight of her completely. His hand, joined to hers, all but loosened. He wept as he drove the knife through the back of the person who thrust into them. The weight fell away, and he jerked in merciless desperation upon the one bit of Mara he still held. She reeled free of a wedge of panicked craftsmen and tumbled into his arm. Akoma! The shout sounded near. Kevin stared out over the heads of the mob and blessed his Midkemian stature. At once he spotted a pair of soldiers in green armour hammering a path through the rush. Here! he screamed. Here! He waved his hand, forgetful that he held a bloodied blade. I have Mara! The warriors changed course toward him, their beacon his unmistakable red-gold head. Suddenly, Lujan was with him. Put that away! he screamed, pointing to the knife. He fell in before the barbarian and used his braces like clubs to fend off the worst of the crush. Kevin hid the knife. He pressed on, burdened with a trembling Mara who yet bravely struggled to stand. No! he shouted in her ear. You're too small and barefoot also. Let me carry you! The stairs fell away underfoot. Kevin tripped and recovered, held upright by the shove of the crowd. They'd reached the concourse between the outer levels. Vaguely, the Midkemian realised that Lujan directed their path with a purpose. By the stadium walls, surrounded by a wedge of beleaguered warriors, Mara's litter showed over running heads, a flutter of green pennons against chaos. A thunderclap pealed from the heavens. A gust struck down like a blow as the detonation knocked many of those fleeing to the ground. Kevin lurched forward, slammed into Lujan and felt the warrior brace to preserve balance. The effort failed. Both men crumpled to their knees. Ears ringing, Kevin shouldered Mara's weight. He shoved back to his feet, unmindful of scraped knees, and barged headlong toward the litter. The crowd soon recovered, closing in relentless panic until his elbow and side were jammed painfully into the ridges of Lujan's armour. Kevin held ground grimly and nearly tripped again as his feet entangled in an obstruction that felt like a rag. A warm rag. Another unfortunate who had been trampled. A victim who might yet be Mara if he were to lose her in the chaos. Fighting a sickness in his stomach, Kevin gripped her silk gown until the force left his knuckles bone white. That instant, 
a fountain of energies erupted from the arena and sprayed across sky and clouds. The crowd wailed in consternation. Heads turned heavenward to gawk. Driven by morbid fascination, some brash folk tried to stem the flow of mass flight for a better view of the display. Kevin and Lujan used the respite to reach the wall, where a barrier of warriors in green closed around them, an eddy of calm in the turbulence. As the Midkemian set down his shaking mistress, a voice pealed out over the chaos. That you have lived as you have lived for centuries is no license for this cruelty. All here are now judged and all are found wanting. The magician, Milimba. Kevin knew a savage surge of pride. "'that a man from the kingdom had dared to place righteous compassion before decadence. "'The tone of the mob changed subtly. "'Driven by curiosity and also by the beginnings of affront, "'a few people shouted in amazement. "'Movements swirled through the masses "'as more and more bystanders slowed their flight "'and shoved to re-enter the arena. "'They are fools that would linger here!' Lujan shouted. The mistress must be got safely home. Kevin reached out to steady Mara, saw blood on his hand, and belatedly remembered the knife. He made to surrender the weapon, but Lujan sharply shook his head. I didn't see you take that, and my eyes are blind if you use it in my lady's protection. Soldiers fell into a tight cordon, with Mara, Kevin and a half-dozen hapless bearers clustered in a knot at the centre. Out of habit, the slaves moved to their places by the litter poles. Then the voice of the magician echoed with unnatural force over the stadium. You who would take pleasure from the death and dishonour of others, see then how well you face destruction! Kevin shouted, To hell with the litter! Just run! Still greatly shaken by the commotion, Mara found her voice and shouted, Yes, we must run! At Lujan's order, the cumbersome litter was abandoned. The guards regrouped their formation on the fly and the dash for safety began afresh. A wind slapped outward from the arena, raising new screams and setting the plumes of the officers streaming. Kevin felt his skin rise up into goose flesh, and he marvelled at a sensation nearly forgotten since leaving home. Cold. On Kelowan, no natural gust could carry such a touch of ice. As if in response, Milimba's voice cried, Tremble and despair, for I am power! A keening wailed upon the air as the Acoma cordon began their rush down the lower stairway. The blustery gust increased as Milimba shouted, Wind! The gale swelled to a howl in response. A stink of death rode the gust and set Kevin and the staunchest warriors choking. They pressed on in their descent, forcing pained lungs to inhale. Mara's face drained of colour, but she kept pace with her retinue down the steep stairs. Their path was maddeningly crooked. Forced to skirt others who had doubled over with nausea from the foul odour, Lujan called to his soldiers to keep step. Some who succumbed to sickness became trampled, while others were jostled and kicked by the flood of retreating citizens. A low moan shivered the pavement. Created by nothing of this world, the sound tormented the ears with subsonics. The warriors increased pace, and Kevin caught Mara's wrist to aid her down the last of the stairs. Ominously, the shadows deepened, the atmosphere darkened, and the sun vanished from view. Clouds gathered above the stadium and swirled in a monstrous vortex. That Milimba stood at its centre, Kevin never doubted. He flung off fear with a laugh. He's going to make one hell of a show! Breathlessly jogging at his side, Mara shot him a confused look. Belatedly, Kevin realised he had slipped into the king's speech. He repeated his remark in Sirani. She forced a brave smile. 
They stumbled to the base of the stairs. Lujan halted as more guardsmen joined ranks, reinforcing the square of protection around their mistress. The outer ranks linked arms, and they resumed course down the avenue as the magician behind them cried, RAIN! The resonance of the voice had damped slightly. Kevin sucked air into burning lungs and hoped the change meant their progress had distanced them from the vortex of spells and trauma Millenba called in judgment upon the crowd. The heavens opened and icy drops slashed the air. The first fall sheeted into a downpour, soaking all in the street to the skin. The last light vanished. Eyes squinting against the storm of elements, Kevin ran. He kept hold of Mara's wrist, though her skin became slippery and her steps dragged against the cling of sodden formal robes. The rattle of rainfall against cobbles and armour blended with the slap of fleeing feet. The cries of the crowd seemed dimmer, whipped to misery and despair. Keep going! Kevin exhorted Mara. A few steps more and he sensed the rain lessening with each stride. The Akoma retinue reached the street that bordered the arena, and the distant voice of Milimba cried, Fire! A collective peal of terror arose from inside the stadium. Mara looked back in horror, afraid for the unfortunates who were still trapped. Kevin turned to hurry her on, and, through the patterning fall of thinning droplets, saw a thing of terrifying alien beauty. A display of flames played through clouds that even yet splashed icy wetness upon the earth. Jagged bolts of lightning rent the sky. A burning sting grazed Kevin's cheek as a rain of pure fire began to fall. Mara screamed. Flame blossomed in the silks that covered her head and the wet did not stop them igniting. Soldiers slapped at the flames with their gauntlets, and the odour of seared hide and lacquer grew choking on the smoke-filled air. They ran. Falling fires spattered sparks across the pavement, and in fear for their lives they ran harder. Lujan pointed. There! A hundred yards away, across a streaming expanse of puddles and flame, sunlight shone down untroubled. Kevin dragged Mara into a sprint, and still those last hundred yards stretched like miles. And then they were safe in the sunlight. The soldiers slowed to catch their breath at stern orders from Lujan. Winded men made poor fighters, and the streets were a seething mass of frightened people and soldiers battle ready to defend their lords. Kevin seized the respite to look back. The madness above the arena had not stopped. Fire splashed down in lurid streaks, and the cries of the dying and the injured mingled into one vast wail. The streets were packed with suffering, blazing scarecrows that danced and flapped in an agony of burning. Singed survivors raced into safety and collided with craftsmen and slaves who had paused about their business to gape. Many had fallen prostrate out of fear, while others made protective signs against the gods' displeasure. The most simple just stood in mute astonishment. A faint word carried over the confusion. Kevin couldn't make out the meaning, but at a wave from Lujan he gently urged Mara forward. Do your feet hurt? We better keep moving. I think we're still a little close to the action. Mara blinked, white-faced with exhaustion. Numbly she said, The matter of shoes must wait. To the townhouse! Lujan sent one soldier ahead to bring more warriors from the garrison to guard the lady in her walk across town. Skilful in his guidance, the force commander kept to quiet streets. He avoided the temple precinct where worshippers and priests seethed around offering tables, chanting and singing a rush of placating prayers. Runners hastened on unknown errands and beggars roved districts that were not in their usual province. Wary of attack, the soldiers kept together. Kevin kept a grip on Arakasi's knife. No ambush materialised, but an odd buzzing sensation rippled through the ground underfoot. The vibration swelled to a deep-throated rumbling, and Kevin knew a flash of fear. Earthquake! he shouted. Into that doorway! Now! Lujan and his warriors wheeled smartly. 
they forced aside a trio of commoners who sheltered under the arch of an alehouse door. Made of solid stone, the portal had once supported two wooden panels, torn down forgotten years before. The warriors passed Mara between them, sending her reeling into cover under the overhang. Kevin stumbled in behind her, and pressed on all sides by armoured men, he felt the earth fall out from beneath his feet. The warriors staggered and buckled to their knees, others fell prostrate, while the litter-bearers whimpered with their arms over their heads. The force of the quake sent people reeling and falling in the street, and screams arose from inside the alehouse as ceiling beams collapsed and plaster and debris rained down. Crockery mugs spilled and clattered. Buildings outside shed roof tiles and cornices and coping to crash and shatter on the pavement. Balconies collapsed and screens tore and people fell bleeding like tossed litter. A stone wall nearby collapsed in a grating puff of dust and the shaking increased. A bucking, surging motion rolled the length of the avenue and the air rang with the grinding crash of splintering timbers and masonry. Kevin fought the heave of the earth to reach Mara, but a pair of soldiers already lay atop her, shielding her with their bodies. On and on the madness raged, the very ground writhed like a thing in pain. From across the imperial precinct in the vicinity of the area, the noise of wrenched stones rumbled and roared like an avalanche. The sound raged tireless as the sea, cut by tens of thousands of voices shrieking in horror and pain. Then the earth stilled between one heartbeat and the next. Quiet fell, and sun shone down through a haze of raised dust. The street was left in wreckage, a battleground of rubble and moaning wounded. Mashed between stones, crushed under splintered falls of lumber, lay the silent, bloody dead. Kevin pulled himself to his feet. His cheek burned with blisters, and his eyes stung from grit. As the soldiers around him also recovered their footing, he helped Mara to rise. Looking at her soiled face with cobwebs of charred silk dangling from her tangled headdress and wet robes plastered to her body, Kevin repressed an urge to kiss her lingeringly on the lips. Instead, he dusted a fallen strand of hair from her earlobe and wakened the sparkle of an emerald ornament. He breathed a shaky sigh. We were lucky. Can you imagine what it must have been like within the arena? Mara's eyes were still wide with shock. She was past all attempt to hide her trembling, but her voice held a grim hint of iron as she said, We can only hope that our lord of the Minwanabi remained too long at the games. Then, as if the wrecked beauty that surrounded her suddenly wounded her, she gestured curtly to Lujan. Back to our townhouse at once. Lujan formed up the company and began the long trek back through the devastated avenues of Kentasani. Arakasi appeared later, his servant's garb dusty and singed. Far from the arena in the sight of Milimba's wrath, the Akoma house had taken only mild damage. But now a dozen warriors held the outer door and more stood guard in the courtyard. The spy master advanced with cat-footed caution. Not until he sighted Lujan in the hallway did he finally relax his stance. God preserve us! You made it! the force commander greeted in a hoarse-voiced rush of feeling. In an instant, Arakasi was directed upstairs, where he bowed before his mistress. Mara was seated on cushions, freshly bathed, but still pale from the day's excitement. A scraped knee showed beneath her lounging robe, and her eyes were shadowed by an anxiety that lifted at the sight of her spymaster. Arakasi, well met. What news do you bring? The spymaster arose from his bow. With my lady's forgiveness, he murmured, and he raised a stained cloth and dabbed at a bleeding cheek. Mara motioned to a maid, who hurried off for healer's salves and a basin. The spymaster tried to brush her solicitude away. The cut is of no consequence. A man sought to take advantage of the confusion and rob me. He is dead. Rob a servant? Mara questioned. 
The excuse was transparent. More likely, her spymaster had risked grave danger on her behalf, but she abided by his wishes and refrained from embarrassing him with questions. When Mara's party had arrived at the door to her townhouse, they had found the spymaster absent along with the bulk of her soldiers. Leaving a small garrison with Jikan, Arakasi had made his way back toward the arena, but the madness caused by Milimba had disrupted his passage through the streets. The two parties had passed and missed each other in the pandemonium. The maid arrived back with a basket of remedies. Mara nodded toward Arakasi, who looked irritated, but submitted to having his cheek doctored at his mistress's insistence. While the maid dabbed at the spymaster's wound, Mara asked, The rest of the soldiers? Back with me, Arakasi answered, unwarrantably peevish. He flicked a dark look at the maid, then finished his report. Though one warrior took a blow to his head from falling pottery, if you can believe, and is probably going to die. Mara watched the filth and old blood that came away on the cloth. That's more than a scratch. The bone shows. She added the question that burned to be asked. What of the city? Arakasi ducked the maid's hand. In a movement quick as a predator's, he caught up a clean rag and held it pressed to his injury. My lady should not bother herself with a servant's aches and pains. In the softening gloom of twilight, Mara's eyebrows rose. And servants should not bother to aid their mistresses by risking imperial charges for handing a blade to a slave, no? She raised her hand as Arakasi drew breath. Don't answer. Lujan swears he didn't see. There was a knife that turned up bloody in the pantry, but the cooks insist it was used to slaughter jigger-birds. Arakasi loosed a sharp chuckle. Jigger-birds. How apt. Very. Now answer my question, Mara demanded. Still delighted, Arakasi obeyed. All is in chaos. There are fires everywhere, and many wounded. Kentosani looks as if it has been overrun by an invading army in the quarters around the arena. The warlord has retired in shame, humiliated by the great one Milamber. The spectacle was too public, and caused too many innocent deaths. I wager Almecho will end his sorry life within the day. The Emperor? Through her excitement at this momentous news, Mara kept track of the prosaic. She dismissed the maid with orders to fetch a tray of supper. Arakasi said, The light of heaven is safe, but the imperial whites are withdrawn from all parts of the palace save the family suite, where they protect the emperor and his children. The council guards remain on duty, but with no orders from the warlord to direct them, they will not act. By nightfall, it should be presumed that house loyalty will prevail, and each company will return to its own master. What rules we know are temporarily suspended, with the council weakened and the warlord shamed. Arakasi shrugged. There is no law, except as strength demands. Mara felt chilled, in a room that seemed suddenly darker. She clapped for servants to light lamps, then said, Lujan should hear this. Do you think we could be attacked? Arakasi sighed. Who can know? All is madness out there. Yet if I were to hazard a guess, we are probably safe for the night. If the Lord of the Minwanabi survived the destruction of the games, then he is most likely hiding in his quarters as we are taking stock of personal losses and awaiting word that sanity has returned in the streets. The tray arrived, brought in by a servant with Lujan striding hard on his heels. Mara motioned for her force commander to be seated, then had a round of chocha poured. She sat back and sipped the hot, reassuring liquid while Lujan bullied Arakasi into treating his wound with salve. 
The warriors' graphic descriptions of separating sword cuts were enough to intimidate the bravest, and Arakasi's courage mostly stemmed from stubbornness. Roused to pity by her spymaster's harried frown, but not enough to let him escape being bandaged by the capable hands of her force commander, Mara judged her moment and intervened. If Almecho takes his own life, there will be a call to council. Eager for the diversion, Arakasi scooped up a cold meat pie. A new warlord. Lujan tossed the unused bandage back in the basket of remedies. Any who attend the election will be taking grave risks. There is no clear successor to the title. Yet that danger, while apparent enough, was not the worst imaginable. Mara raised steady eyes in the brightening light of the lamps. If ever the Akoma presence must be in force in the council, it's to elect Almecho's successor. Only five lords command enough following to strive for the title, and one of those is Desio of the Minwanabi. His claim must never be permitted to succeed. You have made bargains, Arakasi allowed compiled enough promised votes that you could carry an influence, but with all normal order overturned, do you dare rely on who will be present to be counted? Now Mara's fatigue showed plainly. No greater risk could exist than Desio wearing the white and gold. Lujan fingered his weapon hilt. Could that happen? In the normal course of events, no. Now, the spymaster shrugged. This morning, would any one of us have guessed the reign of Almecho could end in disgrace before sundown? The night beyond the window seemed suddenly more than dark. Menaced by gathering fears, Mara longed for the comfort of Kevin's arms— but he was outside with the warriors, helping to repair gaps the earthquake had opened in the wall. Millimber had broken more than stones and heads in his contest against the warlord. His deed had undermined all hierarchy within the Empire, and the dust would be long days settling. It would seem we must be ready for any eventuality, Mara announced with firmness. Arakasi, when you are able, you will be needed back in the city. Keep abreast of every rumour, for soon the powers of this empire will change their course, and if we do not lay our path carefully, we may be crushed in the by-play. There followed a tense, sleepless night, while Ujan's warriors rearranged furnishings and pulled old battle shutters out of storage. The ancient dwelling in Kentasani had not taken assault in many centuries, but the old walls were solid. The warriors fortified the gates and the doorways as best they could, their work lit by slaves bearing lanterns. Sounds of strife drifted in from the direction of the inner city, and running footsteps chased up and down the street. Whether these were men fleeing thieves or assassins sent out to knife enemies, no one within the safety of walls dared open their gates to know. Three hours after nightfall, Strike leader Kenji returned, a sword cut in his shoulder, and his armour chipped from hard fighting. He found Lady Mara in the kitchen, deep in consultation with Jikan concerning food stores. By the slate in her hand, and the inventory going on, she looked as if she prepared for a siege. Kenji bowed, and the movement caught Mara's eye. She called for a servant to bring Chocha, and settled her strike leader on a chopping table, while the battered basket of remedies was once again fetched from the stores. The shadow was swept away by the mob. Kenji fought back a grimace as he reached to unbuckle his armour. Don't, Mara said. Let me call a slave to help. But Kenji was too numbly focused on completing his duty to take heed. As the first fastening loosened, he started on another, and torturously resumed his report. The two men with me were lost. One died fighting, the other perished in the falling fire. The mob drove me far astray, though I fought to return to the townhouse. Thick crowds jammed the temple precinct, drawn there in fear of their lives. 
I tried to come by way of the waterfront, but the docks there collapsed in the earthquakes. A slave appeared at Mara's summons and stooped to help Kenji with his armour. His wound was sullenly bleeding, the silk padding underneath lacquer armour already ringed with stains. There were riots, lady. Kenji gasped as the breastplate was lifted from him. Sallow and sweating in his pain, he continued, his words laboured. The poor and the fisherfolk from the dockside started looting moored barges and nearby shops. Mara glanced anxiously at Jikan, who had earlier noticed the scarlet glow of fires and, rightly, predicted disastrous effects upon trade. Some of the warehouses were torn open and gutted. Other folk swarmed away to the Imperial Precinct to demand food and shelter from the warlord. Mara waved Kenji to silence. You have done well. Rest now and allow your hurts to be tended. But the battered strike leader insisted on rising to make his bow. As the slave brought warm water to soak the padding away from his half-formed scabs, he sank back and endured the discomfort in a wretched lethargy of exhaustion. Mara sat down and took the hand of her officer. She remained with him while his shoulder was tended and listened as sounds of distant strife mingled with the scratch of Jikan's chalk. Spread on benches and tables were supplies enough to last for several days. Thirty warriors might be enough to hold the gates against a mob bent on mayhem, but never a foray of armed force. In the end, toward dawn, when Kenji was bedded down and sleeping, Mara consulted with Lujan and an officer was chosen to summon reinforcements from the nearest Tacoma garrison. Thuds and screams drifted in through the screens, incongruous against the liquid play of fountains. The sky lay tinged by the glow of raging fires, and the streets were safe for no man. As Liu Jan let his messenger out the gate, he said in worried parting, Let us pray to the gods that our enemies are in as much disarray as we are. Indeed, Mara murmured. Let us pray. Chapter 16 Regrouping the trumpet sounded. After two days behind locked gates, with the coma soldiers camped in garden and courtyard, and even the downstairs hallway, the noise was a welcome intrusion. Mara pushed away a book scroll she had failed to read. Her nerves were like overwound strings, responsive to the slightest movement and sound. She was on her feet ahead of thought, even as the warriors on duty had blades half drawn from their scabbards. And then... Reason caught up with defensive instinct. An attack would not be heralded with a fanfare, nor take place in the light of midday. Trumpets could only signal a long overdue call to council or other imperial announcement. Grateful the waiting was ended, Mara arose to go downstairs. Arakasi had dispatched no reports in the interim. Mara had been reliant on hearsay, bought by tossing coins over the walls to rumour mongers. And what news she managed to glean was far too sparse for the enormity of the events that had transpired. Word had passed like wind through the streets the night before that Almecho had taken his life in shame. Odd talk also circulated that the Assembly had named Milimba outcast and stripped him of his rank. Less reliable sources said the barbarian magician had eliminated the assembly altogether. That version Mara doubted. When she tried to imagine power on a vast enough scale to subdue the tempest that had destroyed the arena, her mind balked at the concept. Unasked, Kevin had dryly observed that he would not wish to be the one sent to inform the barbarian magician of his change in status. Mara picked her way down the grand stair, which was stacked like shelves in an armoury with helms and braces laid aside by resting warriors. Swords lay piled in corners, and the curved scroll of the balustrade became a mustering place for spears. Since the arrival of the relief troops, her original thirty warriors had swelled to a garrison of one hundred, and the guest suites were all jammed with officers. 
The horn call had roused more sleepers, and the on-duty patrol of 75 was fully armoured. Prepared for immediate action, the men formed up at the appearance of their mistress and cleared a path between her and the door. Mara passed through and wondered that Kevin was not among the dicers in the corner. The dooryard outside was no less jammed with warriors. They formed ranks three deep in the narrow space as she signalled for Lujan to unbar the street gate. Four imperial whites waited on the other side, and a herald in a thigh-length robe of brilliant white. His badges of rank flashed in the sunlight, as did the golden ribbon around his head and his gilt-trimmed rod of office. Lady Mara of the Okoma, he intoned. Mara advanced a step ahead of Lujan and presented herself. The herald returned a shallow bow. I bring words from the light of heaven. Ichindar, ninety-one times emperor, bids you retire to your home at leisure. Go in peace, for his shadow is thrown across the breadth of the land, and his arms encircle you. Any who trouble your passage shall be enemies of the empire, so he has decreed. The warriors behind Mara maintained an expectant stillness. But, to the astonishment of all, the Emperor's Herald made no mention of a call to council. Without waiting for response and speaking no further word, he formed up his escort and marched down the lane to the next house. Surprised, Mara stood frowning in full sunlight while her officers closed and barred her gates. She had lost weight since the flight from the arena. Worry left her pale, with heavy shadows under her eyes, and now this latest development chilled her with bone-deep foreboding. If the warlord had died in disgrace, and the lords of the empire and their families were being sent home with no call to council, the implication could no longer be doubted. The emperor must have entered the great game. We need Arakasi. Mara said, coming back to herself with a start. She raised harried eyes to her force commander. If the Emperor's guard keeps the peace, surely we could send out a runner. Pretty lady, it will be done, said Lujan, in an almost forgotten tone of banter. Safe streets or not, every man or servant here would run barefoot through mayhem if you asked. I would not ask. In a mix of grave amusement, Mara looked down at her own feet, still wrapped in soft cloths from her shoeless flight through the streets. I've tried the experience. Jikan has already received orders. My slaves are all getting new sandals. Which, in its way, showed the influence of the Midkemian, though on that point Lujan withheld comment. The mistress was like no other ruler he had met, with her radical ideas, and her unflinching toughness, and her odd moments of compassion. If you think we could do with more floor space, he said, half the garrison could be sent to the public baths. Now Mara did smile. They don't like being stepped on in their sleep. We are a bit overcrowded, she allowed. In fact, the house smelled like an uncleaned, cheap public hostel. Do as you see fit. But I want an extra company kept close at hand within the city. As she turned to re-enter the townhouse to arrange her summons to Arakasi, she added a final thought. The last thing the Akoma are going to do is tuck up tail and run home. When Lujan bowed, he was grinning. The runner proved unnecessary. While Mara deliberated over how best to get covert word to one of the agreed-upon places for leaving messages, the spymaster himself showed up in the guise of a vegetable seller. The first Mara knew of the event was a commotion from the kitchens and an uncharacteristic bout of temper from Jikan. Gods, don't slice him with that meat cleaver, Kevin said in a merry baritone. His laughter echoed up the broad staircase, and aware that her irate Hedonra would retaliate by having her lover scrape latrines, Mara hurried down to intervene. 
she found her spy master leaning on the wheel of a handcart filled with a cargo of spoilt vegetables that some thrifty soul had saved to feed livestock. There aren't any fresh ones in the market, Arakasi was saying reasonably to Jikan. When that failed to placate the red-faced little man, he added on a note of hope, "In the poor quarter, these melons would fetch good prices." In danger of laughing outright after days of trauma and worry, Mara made her presence felt. Arakasi, I have need of you. Chikan, ask Lujan for an escort of soldiers and go and find some edible meat to butcher. If you find none, those melons won't smell so terrible. Arakasi pushed off from his perch, bowed, and left handcart and contents to the Hadonra. Happy hunting. He murmured as he passed, and earned an intent look from Mara. You seem in a fine mood this morning, she commented. That's because nobody else is. Kevin interrupted. He does it just to be perverse. The barbarian fell into step with Mistress and Spymaster as she retraced her way through the scullery, then settled for conference on the stone benches laid out in a circle within the courtyard. Mara liked the place, with its flowering trees and its soft-voiced trio of fountains, but her manner was far from languid as she opened. Is it certain Almecho is dead? Arakasi shed a smock that smelled ripely of fruit mould. The warlord performed the rite of expiation before all his retainers and friends, including two great ones. His body lies in state in the imperial palace. You heard there is no call to counsel, Mara questioned, and now her concern showed through. Arakasi's lapse into levity ended. I had heard. Some lords are already grumbling, and Desio's voice is the loudest. Mara closed her eyes and breathed in the sweet scent of flowers. So fast, events were moving all too swiftly. For the sake of her house, she must act. But how? All the known laws had been broken. Who will rule? The emperor. All eyes turned to Kevin. Mara sighed in a burst of impatience. You do not understand. The emperor rules as a spiritual leader. While the daily business of the Suranuani is conducted by the imperial staff, the High Council governs the nation. All policy begins there, with the warlord foremost among the great lords of the land. Kevin hiked a thumb over his shoulder in the general direction of the palace. I seem to remember someone saying the light of heaven never went out in public either. There he was, big as life, sitting at the games. This emperor has already changed the way of his fathers. As I see things, Ichindar may be more intent on governing than you think. Arakasi stroked his chin. If not he, then the great ones could be at play here. There was an inordinate number of them present the other day. Everyone has guesses, Mara interjected. What we need are facts. Who survived the debacle at the games, and were there any suspicious accidents in the aftermath? Far more injuries than fatalities, Arakasi said. I will write you a list before I leave. If a momentous precedent is being set at the palace, there are agents I can approach with questions. For now, I advise caution, despite the emperor's peace. Many streets are still blocked with debris. The priests of the twenty orders have opened their temples to house the homeless, but with trade disrupted at the docks, food is scarce. There are hungry, desperate people at large who are every bit as dangerous as assassins. Repair work began at the waterfront this morning, but until the markets reopen, the streets will be perilous to walk. Mara made a rueful gesture at the wrappings on her feet. I shouldn't be going out until my litter is replaced in any event. Arakasi rose, stretched, and flexed his hands until his knuckles cracked. Mara regarded him narrowly. 
The cut on his cheek was healing, but the surrounding flesh looked more drawn than she recalled. How long has it been since you slept? I haven't, said the spymaster. There has been too much to do. With the faintest distaste, he picked up the discarded farm smock. With your leave, my lady, I will borrow back the handcart and seek your guards and Hadonra. The markets may be closed, but I do have ideas where Jikan might buy vegetables. His head vanished briefly behind crumpled, filthy cloth as he tugged the garment over his house robe. Tousled, squint eyed, and looking every inch the weathered field hand when he emerged, he added, The price will be very dear. Then Jikan will owe you no favours. Go carefully. Mara bade him. Arakasi bowed and stepped under the arch that led into the house, where he instantly became all but invisible. His voice issued softly out of the shadow. You'll be staying. Then, after barely a pause, I thought so. And suddenly he was gone. Kevin regarded his lady in the greenish light falling through the trees. You won't be persuaded to go home to Ayaki. He asked also for himself, at the back of his mind a need to speak to Patrick and share with his countrymen the news that waited on his heart since the games. Boric and Brukel routed, and the kingdom open to invasion. For an instant, Mara looked anguished. I cannot go home, not with this much change underway. I must be close to the seat of power. No matter in whose charge things fall, I will not have House Akoma crushed as a consequence of other men's decisions. If we are in peril, I will cherish my son beyond the last breath in my body. But I will act. Her hands rested tense on the stonework. Gently, Kevin captured them in his own warm palms. You are frightened, he observed. She nodded, which for her was a momentous admission. Because I can act against a plot by the Minwanabi or any other enemy lord, but there are two forces in the Empire I must bow before without question, and one or both are at play here. Kevin needed no prompt to guess she referred to the Emperor and the magicians. As her gaze darkened and turned inward, the Midkemian knew she worried also for her son. Three more days passed, filled with the sounds of marching soldiers in the streets and the grind of carts bearing away wreckage, rubble and bodies. Mara waited and took reports from Arakasi, delivered in strange forms and at odd hours of the night. Kevin laconically remarked that the spymaster had a knack for spoiling their love-making but the truth was that boredom left the couple more time for indulgence. His prediction that the Emperor would undertake the rule of the Empire proved partially correct, but more than one game within politics was underway, and Arakasi diverted all his resources into uncovering whose hand pulled the strings. As time passed and the council members scrambled to assemble a profile of the emerging power structure, it became plain that Ichindar's intervention was not a whim. He had planned carefully and kept men ready to step in and conduct the business usually left to the factors and agents of the council lords. The puzzle became clearer as Arakasi began to unwind which factions provided Ichindar with support. Members of the Blue Wheel Party, nearly all of them absentees from the chaos at the Imperial Games, were at the heart of the plot. Even the old Imperial Party families who could claim ties of blood were outsiders in this new order. Since the declaration of Imperial Peace, the city began recovery from its wounds. Repairs of the destruction wreaked by the barbarian magician began with the laborious clearing of broken stones and timbers. For days a spire of smoke rose over the vicinity of the arena as the dead were brought there and burned. Stories of imperial whites hanging looters or black marketeers who were hoarding put an end to both practices. 
Moorings were set in the river and small craft used to ferry goods ashore while new docks were built on old pilings. The shops began slowly to restock. Servants with shoulder yokes and handcarts picked their way around fallen stones to do business. Ten days after the disaster at the games, Mara received reports from Sulanku. There had been a small influx of refugees there and some fighting over salvage on the riverbanks, but Akoma interests had not suffered. Nakoya reported that, except for Ayaki's tantrums, all was quiet at the Akoma estate. The worst the first adviser had contended with was Kiyoki, who had to be dissuaded from sending half the standing garrison to Kentasani to extricate his mistress. They had learned she was safe, Nakoya wrote, through Arakasi's agents. Mara set down the inscribed parchment. Tears blurred her eyes as she thought upon the devotion of those who loved her. She missed her son unbearably and vowed to spend more time with him at the earliest opportunity. Fast footsteps sounded in the hallway. Mara heard her guards snap to attention and then Arakasi appeared, looking hollow-eyed and grim. In a total breach of protocol, he burst into her private quarters and threw himself face down on the carpet in absolute obeisance. Mistress, I beg forgiveness for my rush. Caught in a moment of weakness, Mara dabbed at her eyes. She knew she ought to feel frightened, but events were changing so quickly she felt as if they were happening to somebody else. Be seated, Mara said. What is the news? Arakasi rose and his eyes roved the chamber, seeking. Where is Kevin? He should hear this, as you will certainly want his opinion. Mara flicked her hand, and her runner departed for the kitchen, where the Midkemian had gone for hot chocha. Already returning up the stairs, the barbarian slave entered almost immediately. What's the excitement? he asked, as he set down a tray laden with a pot and assorted cups. A bit of spiced chocha hardly seems caused with getting nearly knocked flat by your runner. Kevin's back was turned to Mara as he bent to pour the first cup, and he had not noticed Arakasi, who habitually sought the least conspicuous corner. First, the barbarians. The spy master began. Startled into rattling the china, Kevin spun. You! He covered his overreaction with a sour smile. What about the barbarians? Arakasi cleared his throat. The Outworlders have launched a completely unexpected and massive counter-offensive. Our armies on Midkemia have been overwhelmed and routed back to the valley where we control the rift. We have just suffered the worst defeat of the war. Tactful for once, Kevin reined back a laugh of joy, but he could not resist a smug look at Arakasi as he handed his lady her spiced chocha. What else? Mara asked, sure there must be more because of her spy master's precipitous entrance. Second, Arakasi ticked off, the emperor has agreed to meet with the barbarian king to discuss peace. Mara dropped her cup. What? Her exclamation cut across the smash of china and steaming chocha splashed in a flood across the floor. Kevin stood rooted. Mara ignored the drenched tiles and the fine spray of stains that spread slowly through the hem of her robe. Peace! Arakasi continued, speaking quickly. My agent in the palace sent word this morning. Before the warlord's last major offensive, two agents of the Blue Wheel Party slipped through the rift with the outbound troops. They were Kasumi of the Shinsawai and a barbarian slave, and they left the encampment and carried words of peace to the barbarian king. That's why your Shinsawai friend wasn't at the games, Kevin said. He didn't know if he was going to be a hero or an outlaw. Mara pulled wet cloth from her knees, but called no maids to assist. Kasumi, that's Hokanu's brother. Her eyes narrowed. But... The Blue Wheel Party would never do something this bold without... Without the Emperor's approval, Arakasi interjected. That's the gist. 
Ichinda had to be willing to discuss peace prior to dispatching any envoy. Mara turned pale as she considered. So this is why the light of heaven was prepared to step in and rule? Slowly, she added to Kevin, Your appraisal of our emperor may be more accurate than we gave you credit for, my love. Ichinda meddled in the great game and none knew. She shook her head in disbelief. This goes counter to all tradition. Kevin pulled a napkin from the tray and knelt to dam the flow of chocha. You're one to talk. I seem to recall you've bent one or two traditions to the point of twisting them beyond recognition. Mara protested. But the Emperor... Her awe made it clear she considered the light of heaven to be just short of a god. He's a man, said Kevin. The hand with the dripping rag rested on his bent knee. And he's young. Young men often do unexpected and radical things, but this one's lived a pampered life for all his boldness. He's surely naive if he thinks he can skip in and order your power-hungry Sirani lords to pack up and go home and grow radishes. Arakasi said, Mistress, whatever radishes might be, I fear Kevin is right. There's another hand in this, Mara insisted, unsatisfied. She glared at her sodden overrobe, then threw it impatiently off. Fine cloth finished where Kevin's ministrations had left off, but if a few silk cushions had been saved, Mara never noticed. Had the magician Millenburn not caused our Metro's disgrace, how would things have proceeded? If the question was rhetorical, the progression was not hard to trace. Even Kevin could follow that the Blue Wheel Party would have once more reversed policy and withdrawn from the Alliance for War. This would have left Almecho with only Minwanabi as a major supporter. With the Akoma and the Zacatecas busy worrying the Minwanabi flank, Desio could not afford to increase support. Almecho and his party would have been deadlocked after 13 years of near-absolute rule. Kevin wrung his rag savagely over the chocha tray and voiced the only viable conclusion. So, your emperor would have barged into the High Council to announce a peace proposal, and your warlord would have lacked enough support to confront him. Very neatly done. Kevin finished with a whistle of admiration. Your Ichindar is a very smart boy. Arakasi appeared inwardly calculating. Even had things gone as Kevin surmises, I don't think our emperor would have risked an open confrontation with the warlord, not unless he had some special avenue of appeal. Kevin's eyes widened. The magicians! Mara nodded. Almecho has his pets, so Ichinda would need allies to counter them. To Arakasi she said, Go and speak with your agents. Discover, if you can, who among the Great Ones is a likely candidate to have been involved in this game. See if one has a special relationship to any within the Blue Wheel, especially the Shinzawai. They seem to be at the heart of things. As her spymaster bowed and departed, Mara's gaze sharpened as if she viewed some private vista from a place of dizzying height. Great changes are coming. I feel this like the breeze that brings the Bhutana, she said in reference to the bitter dry wind that in the old stories raised the spirits of demons and set them free to roam the land. Then, as if thoughts of mythological evils and present-day strife gave her shivers, she ruefully acknowledged her clumsiness. But one can hardly seize the initiative while swimming in puddles of chocha. That depends on what sort of initiative, Kevin countered, and he rescued her from the disaster by sweeping her into his arms. The upheaval precipitated by Millimber brought in a few small concessions. As trade resumed and shortfalls opened opportunities, Mara received word from Lord Kedder 
that her terms for the warehouse space had been accepted. The destruction along the dock front in Kentosani had made her offer the only option, and a premium would reward the first grain shipments to reach the market on the flood. Lord Andero conceded her the Kedda vote with a minimum of sureties. With no High Council called to session, such a promise held questionable value. Yet Mara dispatched a messenger with word of her acceptance anyway. Any promise was worth more than no promise at all, and, from the information brought by her spymaster, the ruling lords who were not busy exploiting trade advantages were displeased with the Emperor's machinations. Peace, they said, was a coward's act, and the gods did not favour weak nations. The news came thick and fast after that. Mara spent yet another morning in conference with Arakasi while Kevin dozed in the shade of a tree in the courtyard. He did not hear until later when official word came that the light of heaven had departed for the city of the plains. His intent to cross the rift to Midkemia and negotiate for peace with Liam, King of the Isles. Kevin shot bolt upright at the mention of the Midkemian name. Liam! King Liam, Mara repeated. She tapped the parchment delivered to her townhouse by Imperial Messenger. So it is written here, by the Emperor's own scribe. But... Liam is Lord Boric's son. Kevin remembered, a dazed look on his face. If he's king, that can only mean King Roderick, Prince Erland of Crondor, and Boric himself are all dead. What do you know of King Liam? Mara asked, choosing a seat by his side. I don't know him well, Kevin admitted. We played together as children one time. I just remember him as a big, blonde boy who laughed a lot. I met Lord Boric once at a commander's meeting. He fell silent, wrapped in thoughts of his own land, until curiosity caused him to ask to read the parchment. The Emperor of Suranuani did not believe in travelling without half the nobles in his empire, it appeared. Kevin's mouth quirked wryly. By imperial command, the Light of Heaven's honour guard consisted of the war chiefs of the five great clans and the eldest sons of half the other lords in Suranuani. Hostages, the Mikemian said outright. The lords will hardly defy edict and make bloody trouble with their heirs in the Emperor's field army. The arena of politics suddenly paled. Kevin shut his eyes and tried to imagine the brown-haired youth in gilt armour seated across a table with Boric's son, Liam, who was also young. And it came home to Kevin, like a slam to the heart, that time had passed. The war had gone on and people had died in his absence. He did not even know if his father and elder brothers were alive. The thought stung that for years he had forgotten to care. Seated in a beautiful courtyard, surrounded by alien flowers and a woman from a culture that often seemed incomprehensibly cruel, Kevin, third son of the Baron of Zun, took a deep breath and tried to take stock of who he was. But why should Ichinda go there? Mara mused, unmindful of his turmoil. Such a risk to our light of heaven. Her thoroughly Surani viewpoint sparked shock, and Kevin bridled. Do you think our king would come here? After your warriors have been ravaging his lands for nine years? Forget we've burned your villages, Your Majesty. Just step through this gate into our world. <laughs> Not bloody likely. Remember, this king has been a field commander with his father's army almost since the start. He knows whom he faces. Trust will be a very thin commodity in the Kingdom of the Isles until your people prove otherwise. Mara conceded that Kevin was right on all points. I would guess, from your perspective, we would be worthy of distrust. Her equanimity struck a nerve, mostly because he expected a fight. Kevin laughed, 
a cold and bitter sound. I love you as the breath of my life, Mara of the Acoma. But there is just one of me. Thousands of my countrymen know the Surani only upon the battlefield. What they see are men who have invaded their homeland for bloody conquest. There will be no easy peace in all this. Framed by an arching trellis of Akasi vines, Mara frowned. Do you infer that Ichinda will be asked to surrender the lands the warlord has gained? Kevin laughed again. <laughs> you, Surani, you believe that everyone thinks as you do. Of course the king will demand that you depart. You're invaders. You're alien. You don't belong on the Midkemian side of the rift. Caught by an upwelling tide of irony, Kevin looked into Mara's face. She looked worried, even hurt, but uppermost was her concern for him. That wrenched. She did not share his concept of cruelty, could never grasp what it cost him to beg for the concessions that had given Patrick and his fellow slaves the most basic sustenance. Torn by his improbable love and his inborn sense of justice, Kevin rose precipitately and left. The trouble with the Kentasani townhouse was that it had no vast yards to get lost in. Mara found Kevin within a few minutes crouched on their bed mat, casting small pebbles into the fish pool that separated the outer screen from the wall shared with the building next door. She knelt and circled his waist with an embrace from behind. With her cheek against his back, she said, What do you see in the fish pool, beloved? Kevin's reply held flinty honesty. As a years of pretense. I let myself become lost within your love, and for that I am grateful. But upon hearing of this coming peace... You remember the war? She prompted, hoping he would talk. Mara sensed bitterness behind the fine tremors of rage that coursed through him as he said, Yes, I remember. I remember my countrymen, my friends, dying, trying to defend their homes from armies we knew nothing of, warriors who came for reasons we could not understand, men who asked for no parley, but who just came and butchered our farmers, took our villages and occupied our towns. I remember fighting your people, Mara. I didn't think of them as honourable foes. I thought of them as murdering scum. I hated them with every fibre of my being. She felt him sweat with the memories, but when she did not withdraw, he made an effort to calm himself. In all this... I have come to know you, your people. I can't say I find some of your ways pleasant, but at least I understand something of the Sirani. You have honour, though it's a different thing from our own sense of justice. We have our honour too, but I don't think you understand that fully. And we have things in common, as all people do. I love Ayaki as if he were my own. But we're people who have both suffered. You at the hands of my countrymen, me at the hands of yours. Mara soothed him with her touch. Yet I would change nothing. Kevin turned within the circle of her arms and looked down at a face shining with tears that were considered an unconditional weakness in her culture. Immediately he felt shamed. You'd not save your brother and father if you could? Mara shook her head. Now I would not. Most bitter of all is that knowledge, my beloved. For to alter my past griefs, I would never have had Ayaki or the love I share with you. Behind her eyes were other, darker realizations. She would never have ruled, and so would never have known the intoxicating fascination she found in the power of the great game. Stunned by her soul-bearing honesty, 
Kevin felt his throat constrict. He held Mara close, letting her tears wet his shoulder through his shirt. Half choked by emotion, he said, But, as much as I love you, Mara of the Acoma. She let him push her away. Her eyes held his as she searched his face and discovered the harsh truth he could no longer evade. Fear twisted her spirit, and a sorrow not felt since the day fate had forced her to assume the mantle of the Acoma. Tell me, she snapped, tell me all now. Kevin looked tortured. Ah, lady, I love you beyond doubt. I will until death. But I will never embrace this slavery, not even for you. Mara could not bear to look at him. In this moment, for the first time, she at last knew the depth of his pain. Gripping him desperately, she said, If the gods willed it, would you leave me? Kevin's arms tightened around her shoulders. As if she were his only antidote against pain, he held her. Yet he said what could no longer be denied. If I could be a free man, then I would stay with you forever. But, as a slave, I would take any expedient I could to return home. Mara lost the heart to control her sobbing. But you can never be free here. I know. I know. He brushed damp hair from her cheek and lost his own poise with the touch. His tears fell as freely as hers. The depths had been shared at last and acknowledged. While they loved each other desperately, there would always be this open wound as vast as an ocean and as deep as a chasm and as wide as the rift between worlds. Events in the Holy City revolved around the coming peace conference. With only days left before the Emperor's departure, the ruling lords of the Empire exchanged heated speculation over what terms had been agreed to in advance. Yet even Arakasi's network could glean only sparse information on that subject. Mara spent long hours closeted with her scribes, sending messages to allies and tentatively confirming ties. Occasionally... She entertained other lords whose townhouses were located nearer to the inner city and whose households had been inconvenienced by damage. Small frustrations and concessions balanced larger ones. The craftsmen were slow in replacing her lost litter, with every carpenter in Kentasani busy fixing broken roof trees, lintels and door frames, not even an apprentice could be borrowed from the work. Jikan bargained to no avail. Imperial decree held a freeze on all private contracts until the dockside warehouses were rebuilt. Mara resigned herself to playing host to those she wished to see, until Lord Chipino of the Zacatecas heard of her straits and sent a replacement litter as a gift. It was Zacatecas purple and yellow and well chipped, since a succession of Isashani's daughters had used it for shopping excursions. Jikan remedied the matter by delving into the cellars after paint, but there were still no craftsmen to be hired. The task, in the end, fell to Tamu, a runner slave who had outgrown his post and graduated to formal messenger. But for three days after, young Tamu sat idle because his hands and arms were stained green to the elbow but at least the litter looked passable. Mara made social calls and compared her findings with Arakasi. Overtly, the ruling lords of Suanuani were supportive of the emperor's intervention. They sent their eldest sons to serve the imperial delegation and they did not break peace. But beneath compliant manners, each lord jockeyed for position and counted enemies and made compacts. Frustrated in their desire to convene the council, the rulers of all the great houses made covert alternative plans. Mara paid particular attention to the movements of the Minwanabi. Tasayo remained in exile in the remote western islands, but Desio had insinuated another cousin, 
Jeshurado into the former warlord's army as sub-commander, which gave Minwanabi an ally in the emperor's camp. Desio was one of the five war chiefs who would be in attendance at the conference on Midkemia, along with Andero of the Kedda, the Lord of the Zacatecas, and the Lord of the Tonmargu. But Clan Oaxatucan named no Amechan war chief, owing to bitter infighting over who should succeed the seat left vacant by Almecho. His eldest nephew, De Canto, was the obvious choice, but another nephew, Aksan Tukar had shown unexpectedly strong backing from other members of the clan. Since the most vigorous factions were deadlocked and many held back from supporting either man, De Canto and Aksan Tukar were forced to cede the privilege to a third cousin, Pimarka, to act as a Mechan war chief for the Imperial Honor Guard. Mara's inquiry into the role taken by the Great Ones had drawn no clear answers. But Arakasi did find a relationship between the Assembly of Magicians and the Blue Wheel Party. As Mara watched the water fall in silver streams from the fountains in her courtyard garden, the spymaster addressed that point. It turns out that the Great One Fumita was once the younger brother to Lord Kamatsu of the Shinzawai and is Hokanu's true father. Mara showed astonishment, for whenever and wherever arcane talent was discovered, the assembly took that man for training and broke all ties to family. Children were raised by relatives as if they were their own, their ties to their natural parents forgotten. So, Hokanu is Kamatsu's adopted son, and actually a nephew by blood. Since his mother had sworn service to the Temple of Indiri after her husband's departure, Kamatsu and Kasumi were the only family Hakanu had known since the age of ten. Do you know if Fumita ever visits his son? she asked of her spymaster. Arakasi shrugged. Kamatsu's house is well guarded. Who can know? Recognising that the continuance of her house would be better served by cultivating Hokanu's interest, Mara was equally curious to ply him for information on the chance that Fumita's commitment to the assembly might have a weak point, that he might not have entirely put aside family concerns and had been influential in bringing the Shinzawai and the Kanazawai clan aid from the magicians. But any thought of Hakanu led endlessly back to the thorny hedge of pain concerning Kevin. Mara sighed. In a rare moment of abstraction, she watched the water drops fall and fall, then firmly forced herself to concentrate on more immediate concerns. If she indulged herself in preoccupation with personal troubles, the Akoma would be overwhelmed at the next move of the great game. The light of heaven would depart downriver in four days. If he succeeded in his peace with the Kingdom of the Isles, all houses would be equally disadvantaged. But if the Emperor failed, there must be a call for a new warlord. Otherwise, Ichindar, ninety-one times Emperor of Suranuani, would face open revolt in the Council. It had been centuries, but regicide had occurred before in the Empire. A short while later, Mara clapped her hands for her runner. Tell Jikan we shall move our quarters to the apartment in the Imperial Palace this afternoon. Your will, lady. The slave boy bowed and raced off to complete the errand, as if happy for the chance to run. Jikan received the order like an antidote to frustration after days of simply assessing damage. Kevin was set to work lifting carry boxes outside to the waiting Nidra carts. On the stairs and landing, crates of jigger birds rubbed edges with parchment satchels and the ladies' coffers of shell centies and centuries. At least the number of warriors had thinned down. One half of the company had relocated to a public barracks in the city. Of the others, fifty would serve as escort to see their mistress across town of which twenty would return to guard the townhouse grounds. Removed from the bustle, Mara sat in the courtyard with pen in hand, scribbling notes to Kiyoki and Nokoya. 
To ensure other houses could not pry into her affairs, the lady entrusted Lujan to carry her missive to the fastest bonded guild messenger. Add this verbal message to my report, she instructed. I want the bulk of our army ready to march at a moment's notice, and as near to Kentasani as Kiyoke thinks prudent. We must stand prepared for any turn of events. Dressed in the plain armour he preferred for the field, Lujan accepted the sealed parchments. We prepare for war, my lady, Mara said. Always. Lujan bowed and left without banter. Mara set down her pen and rubbed cramped fingers. She took a deep breath and held it a moment, then let it out slowly, as she had been taught at the temple. Kevin had forced her to see the ways of her people with new eyes. She understood that greed and ambition were masked by tradition, and honour became the justification for endless hatred and blood. The young emperor might strive to change his people, but the great game would not be abolished at a stroke by imperial edict. No matter what she felt, no matter how tired she became, no matter what regret came her way, Mara knew there would always be the struggle. To be Tsurani was to struggle. Kevin had thought the Great Hall was impressive, but the Imperial Palace complex beyond the High Council's meeting place was even more grandiose. Mara's retinue entered portals wide enough to admit three wagons drawn abreast. Behind, doors whose weight required a dozen slaves to shift boomed closed. Sunlight vanished, leaving a dry, wax-scented dimness lit purple-blue by chojar globes suspended on ropes from a ceiling over two storeys high. The corridor was immense, with worn flagstone floors and two levels of galleries rising up on either side. Off these were doorways painted in riotous colours. Each led to an apartment assigned to a council member's family, with those closest to the outer walls belonging to the lowest in rank. Forward! commanded strike leader Kenji to the honour guard, his voice a flurry of echoes off a ceiling dim under layers of varnish and dust. Kevin marched at mid-column, beside his lady's litter. Except for the Akoma retinue, the hallway was largely empty. Servants in imperial livery moved briskly from this task to that, but otherwise the enormous complex appeared deserted. Which is the Akoma apartment? Kevin inquired of the nearest bearer slave. The Sirani returned a look of disgust at Kevin's irrepressible tongue, but out of pride he could not resist giving answer. We are not on the first hall, but the seventh. A moment later, Kevin understood the odd reply. When the honour guard turned a corner and he saw a vast intersection ahead where several other corridors joined in a concourse, Gods, this place is huge! Then he looked up and saw that this section had four tiers of galleries accessed by wide stone staircases that zigzagged between landings. Yet, for all the grandeur, the building seemed empty. Then he realised that, unlike the area that housed the council hall, these passages had no mixed companies of guards on duty. It's so quiet. Mara peeked out of her litter curtains. Everyone is at the docks, bidding the Emperor and his honour company farewell. This is why we hurried here. Better chance to enter unobserved. I did not want to risk meeting Imperial guards right now. They ascended no stairs. The Akoma apartment complex was situated at ground level near a slight bend and identified by a lacquered green door with a shatterbird seal. The corridor stretched away from the crook for a hundred yards in each direction, with gigantic portals and more intersecting halls at either end. By now, Kevin had deduced that the apartments were arrayed in semicircles around the central dome that housed the High Council Hall. Set out in blocks, another three hundred or so small complexes turned this section of the palace into a warren of halls and passages. 
Two massive apartment complexes stood adjacent to Mara's, and opposite lay the residence of House Washota, its green and blue doors securely closed. Past the bend, the doorways had yet more majestic decorations, from vaulting arches obscured by sixty-foot-high silken hangings to carpeted stairs and urns overflowing with flowers. These were the apartments of the five great families, with the smaller gallery complexes above reserved for guests and vassals. The allotment of space was by rank, but barracks room did not vary. Every lord in the empire could dwell within the imperial palace with a maximum retinue of twelve. Yet Mara had brought fully thirty Akoma warriors into the palace precinct. Though technically she flouted a rule to do so, there were no patrols mustered in the corridors. In unstable times, she knew full well that other lords would do likewise or bring still more warriors if they could manage it. At Kenji's discreet tap, the green door opened. Inside, two guards bowed to their mistress and made way for her retinue to enter. Chikan bowed also as her litter was set down in the small anteroom. Nyeria is safe, lady," said the Hadonra, and at his shoulder, Lujan gave Mara a slight nod. Then the rest of the warriors crowded through the outer door, leaving Kevin barely enough space to raise his lady from her litter. Judged by the standards of the townhouse, the apartment seemed spartan. The wooden floors held little beyond old woven carpets and cushions, and an occasional ceramic oil lamp. And then Kevin realized, the heavier furniture had been moved to block all the windows and doors. The apartment was three rooms deep, and the inner chambers opened into a small terrace courtyard. But today, the Sirani passion for breezeways and open doors was sacrificed for safety. Several screens had been nailed shut and backed with heavy wooden barricades. Expecting an attack? Kevin asked no one in particular. Always, Mara answered. She looked sad as she reviewed the steps her warriors had taken to secure her family quarters. We may not be the only house to realize that now is the perfect time to enter without attracting notice. Imperial whites will always be on duty in the imperial family's complex, but without council-sanctioned guards, this area is now a no man's land. We travel these halls and concourses at our own peril. While the bearers began the task of piling Mara's carry boxes against an outside screen, Arakasi arrived. His face drenched in perspiration. He wore the loincloth and sandals of a messenger, and his hair was tied back with a ribbon too dirty for anyone to reliably determine its colour. Mara threw off her travelling robe, a look of inquiry on her face. "You look like a merchant's runner." Arakasi replied, eyes alight with sly humour. "Runners wearing house colours are being waylaid by everybody." This drew a slight laugh from Mara, who softened at Kevin's blank look and explained, "Merchants' runners often don house colours because that discourages street urchins from throwing stones at them. But now, a messenger in house colours is apt to be seized for information. Since stone bruises are less to be feared than torture, roles have been reversed." She asked Arakasi, "What news?" Strange bands of men move through the shadows. They hide their armor under cloaks and carry no badge of house service. Imperial servants give them a wide berth. Assassins, Mara asked, and her eyes held her spy masters without shifting as a servant retrieved the robe that trailed from her fingers. Arakasi shrugged. They could be that. Or some lord's army being smuggled into the city, they might also be agents of the emperor sent under cover to see who seeks to break the peace. Someone highly placed let slip some information that has caused a stir of talk. Mara sank down onto a nearby cushion and motioned permission for the others to retire, but Arakasi declined. I won't be staying. 
except to add that it appears that some of the demands made by the king upon the emperor are very odd. This piqued Kevin's interest. How do you mean? Reparations. In spare tones, the spymaster qualified. Liam demands something on the order of a hundred million centis to compensate his nation for damages. Mara shot straight on her cushions. Impossible! Kevin calculated and realised that the Midkemian sovereignty was being generous. In kingdom terms, Liam was asking for something close to 300,000 golden sovereigns, which would barely replace the cost of keeping the armies of the West in the field for nine years. That's half of what he should ask for. The amount is not the issue, but the concept of paying damages, Mara said in acute frustration. Ichindar cannot do so and keep his honour. It would shame Suranuani before the gods. Which is why the light of heaven refused, Arakasi cut in. Instead, he takes a gift of rare gems to the young king, the value of which should approximate a hundred million centis. Appreciative of the emperor's ingenuity, Mara smiled. Not even the High Council can deny his right to give another monarch a gift. There's this other thing. Arakasi's dark eyes flicked meaningfully to Kevin. Liam wishes a prisoner exchange. This drew a strange, emotionally weighted look between the barbarian slave and his mistress. With a strange reluctance to her tone, Mara turned back to Arakasi. I understand what he asks for, but will Ichinda? Arakasi returned the open-handed shrug of the Surani. Who can say? Giving slaves to the king of the Isles is not an issue. Liam could do as he pleased with them. More to the point, what would the emperor do with our returning war captives? A silence developed for it was true that in Saranuani the honour and freedom of such men could never be restored. Suddenly tired, Mara studied her feet. The bruises left since her flight from the arena had nearly faded, but emotional wounds between Kevin and herself over issues of slavery and freedom ached still. You have word on the Minwanabi? As if he had prompted the change of subject, Arakasi's mouth thinned. They ready more than three thousand soldiers for war. Alarmed, Mara looked up. They are coming to the Holy City? No. But the spy master had only thin reassurance to offer. They merely ready themselves upon the Minwanabi estates. Mara's eyes narrowed. Why? But it was Lujan who answered, and bitterly, from the doorway, where he paused after appointing his warriors to guard posts by every window and door. Thus he fears the imperial peace with reason, my lady. If you abandon conflict with the Minwanabi, you renounce only a commitment to blood feud. Some might judge a coma honor compromised, but who would fault you for obeying the light of heaven? But... If the Emperor forces peace among warring houses, Desio forfeits his blood oath to Turakamo. He must destroy us before the Emperor's power becomes too strong to challenge or offend the Death God. Kevin took the liberty of asking a servant to bring his lady a cool drink. He could sense her effort at self-control as she asked, Would Desio risk attacking the Emperor? Arakasi shook his head. Not openly, but should the High Council find cause to unite against Ichindar's will, Desio would have the largest army within striking distance of the Holy City. That offers a dangerous combination. Mara chewed her lip. With the Ometchen clan divided between Decanto and Aksantuka, the danger was apparent. Desio could become the new warlord if a large enough faction of the High Council decided to use force to defy Imperial Edict. 
Kevin added an unwelcome observation to this reflection. Three thousand Minwanabi swords outside the council hall could make a persuasive argument, even if Desio doesn't have a clear majority. Wrung by more than fatigue, Mara regarded the drink brought in by the servant as if it contained deadly poison. Then she put off dark thoughts. The truce meeting beyond the rift won't happen for another three days. Until Ichinda and Liam fail in negotiations, all is speculation. Now that we are safely within the palace, let us enjoy this quiet time. Arakasi bowed more deeply than usual and, like a wraith, departed. Mara watched the doorway for long minutes after he left and returned to life only when Kevin settled beside her and gathered her into his arms. Trembling, Afraid to voice the uneasiness she felt inside, Mara finished her thought. I fear much is carried upon the shoulders of a very young man, and while the gods may favour our light of heaven, they also may turn away from him. Kevin pressed a kiss onto the crown of her head. He held no illusions. Like her, he understood that the best they could hope for was that Arakasi could garner a last-minute warning in the hour before an enemy attack. For three days, the Empire seemed to hold its breath. Outside the palace, the Holy City struggled back to normality as workers finished repairs to the last damaged dock and masons borrowed fallen stonework from the arena to fix the gateways to the Imperial Palace. Fishermen left before dawn to draw their nets through the currents of the River Gagajin, and farmers drove the late season's crops in on heavily burdened wagons or floated them in on barges. Temple incense and flowers prevailed over the smell of the cremated dead, and vendors set up open-air stalls within the roofless walls of their shops. Once more their sing-song voices called their wares to the attention of passers-by. And yet all these sounds and signs of industry held dreamlike transients, even for the poor and the beggars who stood furthest from the centre of power. Rumours respected no class boundaries, and, like the wrecked timbers still heaped like bones between the fabric of makeshift walls, disquieting undercurrents dogged the city's normality. Surinuani's emperor was upon another world, and Iskisu, the god of trickery and chance held the balance, not only the peace of two peoples, but the stability of an ancient nation, all hinged upon the meeting of minds between two young rulers from vastly different cultures. Deprived of the solace of her courtyard and fountains, Mara spent her hours within the small room in the centre of the apartment. With soldiers camped in the chambers on either side and guards at each door and window, she studied notes and messages and maintained cautious contact with other lords. Arakasi showed up almost hourly in the guises of bird seller, messenger and even mendicant priest. He had not slept but laboured tirelessly between brief naps, employing every tool at his disposal to discover even the faintest shred of information that might be of use. In an adjoining room, Lujan held sword drill with his soldiers one man at a time. The waiting frayed everyone's nerves, the warriors most of all, since they could do nothing but stand through endless idle hours on watch. Several more Akoma companies had slipped into the city, and, by dint of clever planning and the use of a carpet dealer's cart, more warriors had been smuggled into the Imperial precinct. Mara's apartment garrison now numbered fifty-two, and Jikan complained. His scullions could not scrub pots without banging into scabbards, and Lujan would have warriors sleeping four deep on the carpets if he continued to muster more troops. But the numbers of warriors were unlikely to swell beyond the current count, for the Akoma as well as other houses, Imperial guards had noticed the influx of soldiers into the palace and were now inspecting all inbound wagons and servants to limit potential combatants. Racing footsteps echoed through the outer corridor, 
The tap of the runner's sandals passed through the walls, a ghostly whispered counterpoint to the clack and snap of swordplay between Lujan's sparring warriors. Mara heard from her desk in the middle of the chamber. She stiffened and looked wildly at Kevin. Something has happened. The Midchemium did not ask how she knew, or why this set of hurried steps should be different from those of any of the dozen or so runners that had passed by the apartment within the hour. Bored with being cooped up and with the endless dragging hours that passed between Arakasi's reports, Kevin bowed to the warrior he had challenged at dice and crossed the chamber to sit with his lady. What's to do? he murmured. Mara regarded the inkwell and parchment on her lap desk. The pen in her hands was dry and the letter unmarked except for the name of Hokanu of the Shinzawai in careful characters at the top. Nothing she replied. There is nothing to do except wait. She set down her quill and, to keep her hands busy, picked up the Akoma chop. She did not say, and Kevin did not remind her, that Arakasi was late. He had promised to stop by in the morning, and by the white slash of sunlight that glared through the barricaded screens, noon had come and gone. Long minutes passed, filled by the patter of more runners and the muffled, excited tones of someone speaking urgently from an apartment several doors down. The thin plaster and lathe partitions between domiciles were not impervious to sound. While Mara made a pretense of trying to concentrate on the wording of her message, Kevin touched her shoulder, then slipped away into the kitchen to make hot chocha. When he returned, the lady had done little but dip her quill. The ink had set in the nib. Arakasi had not returned. When Kevin set the tray on top of the parchment, Mara did not protest. She accepted the filled cup he handed her, but the drink cooled untasted. By then, her nerves were showing, and she started up at the slightest sound. More steps passed by, all running. You don't suppose somebody's holding foot races and making odds to pass the time? Kevin suggested in an attempt at humour. Lujan appeared in the doorway, soaked with sweat from his exercises and still gripping his unsheathed sword. Foot racers don't wear battle sandals with studs, he commented dryly. Then he looked at Mara, who sat as still as a figure in a china shop with too little colour in her face. My lady, at your word... I could go out and find a rumour monger. Mara turned paler. No, she said sharply. You are too valuable to risk. Then she frowned, as she weighed whether she should deplete her garrison by two and send a pair of warriors on the errand instead. Arakasi was three hours late, and to hold uselessly to false hope was to invite yet greater risk. A scratch came at the outer screen. Lujan spun, his sword pointed at the barricade, and every other Akoma guard in the room whipped around ready for attack. But the scrape was followed by a whisper that caused Mara to cry, Thank the gods! Quickly, cautiously, the warriors let down the wooden tabletop wedged up by three heavy coffers and cracked the screen. Arakasi entered, a black silhouette against daylight. For an instant, fresh air filled with the sweet scent of flowers swirled through the close apartment. Then Kenji fastened the screen and slotted the wooden pegs that secured it, and coffers and tabletop were replaced with swift dispatch. In the falling gloom, Arakasi found his way to Mara's cushions in five unerring strides. He threw himself prostrate before her. Mistress, forgive my delay. At his tone, a mixture of disbelief and masked anger, Mara's brief joy at his return vanished. What's amiss? All, said the spymaster without preamble. Wild rumours sweep the Paris. There has been trouble upon the barbarian world. Mara relinquished her quill pen before tension caused her to snap it. Somehow her voice remained firm. The Emperor? He is safe. But little more is known. 
Arakasi's voice became gritty with rage. The barbarians acted with dishonor. They sang a song of peace while they plotted murder. At the conference, despite their bond of truth, they attacked suddenly and almost killed the emperor. Mara sat speechless in shock, and Kevin cursed in astonishment. What? Arakasi sat back on his heels, his manner bleak. At the conference, a large company of those you call dwarves and elves massed nearby, and when the light of heaven was most vulnerable, they attacked. Kevin shook his head in denial. I, I can't believe this. Arakasi's eyes narrowed. It is true. Only through the bravery of his officers and the war chiefs of the five families did the light of heaven survive this treachery on your world. Two soldiers carried him back through the rift unconscious, and there followed a terrible thing. The rift closed and could not be reopened, trapping four thousand Surani soldiers upon the Midkemian world. Mara's confusion sharpened into rapt attention. She drew a quick breath. Mimunabi? Dead, snapped Arakasi. He was among the very first to fall. His cousin Jeshurado died at his side. The other war chiefs? Gone. Dead or not, none can say. But the rift exists no more. All of the warlord's honor guard remain trapped upon the barbarian world. Mara couldn't comprehend the enormity of this. Zacatecas? The list continued inexorably. Gone. Lord Chipino was last seen fighting kingdom horsemen. All of them, Mara whispered. Scarcely a handful return, Arakasi said, anguished. The two soldiers who carried the light of heaven and a half-dozen who served to marshal soldiers waiting on our side of the rift. The imperial force commander was killed. Lord Kedda lay bleeding upon the ground. Lord Tonmagu was nowhere to be seen. Pimaka of the Oaxatukan also was unaccounted for. Kasumi of the Shinazawai was the one who forced the emperor to leave, but he did not himself pass the rift. Arakasi forced himself to take a breath. The runner who arrived in the city knew nothing more than this, my lady. I doubt at this time that even those involved could hazard much beyond guesses as to who is gone. The losses are too widespread, and the shock of the event far too sudden. After the Emperor assumes command, we may have a clearer idea of what occurred. Silent a long minute, Mara leapt to her feet. Arakasi, you must go out and ascertain an accurate list of losses and survivors, quickly. Her urgency must not be denied. At a stroke, the Empire had lost its most powerful older lords and the heirs to many important houses. The effects would be too widespread to anticipate. Houses in mourning, troops lost, and young, untried second sons and daughters thrown headlong into rulership. The after-effects of such turmoil left only stunned shock. But Mara knew that the ambitious would very quickly transform turmoil to a devastating bloody grab for power. She understood what it was to have authority and responsibility newly thrust upon one unprepared for them. Knowing who was in that frightening predicament and who was still alive to rule with experience could prove a significant advantage in days to come. As Arakasi bowed and hurried out, Mara stripped off her lounging robe and called for her maid to bring formal garments. Kevin hurried to help her undress while she delivered rapid instructions. Lujan, ready and honor guard. We leave for the council hall at once. Caught with both hands full of pins as the maid began arranging Mara's hair, Kevin said, Shall I go with you? Mara shook her head, then spoiled the maid's efforts by leaning forward and giving him a fast kiss. There will be no welcome for one of your nation in this council today, Kevin. For your safety, please stay out of sight. Shamed by his countryman's broken faith, Kevin did not argue. 
But a short time later, when thirty Acoma guards marched in lockstep and vanished beyond the far concourse, he wondered how he was going to survive the wait. For the Lady of the Acoma did not go to a council, but to frightening, unmitigated chaos in which the strongest would move fastest to seize power. Desio dead did not leave one enemy less on her heels, but rather elevated a more competent foe to primacy. Tasayo now ruled the Minwanabi. Chapter 17 Grey Council The hall filled. Although there had been no sanctioned call to council, when Mara and her warriors arrived at the great chamber, many lords were there ahead of her. Perhaps a quarter of the seats were occupied, with more arrivals by the minute. The lack of council guards kept no ruler away. Each lord had from a dozen to fifty armed men close at hand. No imperial herald announced Mara's name as she entered the wide portals and descended the stair. This unofficial gathering had no pomp or ceremony. House rulers entered in the order that they came, all concerns of rank set aside. Neither did any particular house act as spokesman. Several lords conferred near the platform dais that customarily seated the warlord or, in his absence, an appointed first speaker of the council. With Almecho dead and all of the clan war chiefs either killed or lost, no single house held clear-cut supremacy. But sooner or later, some lord might try to seize power or at least intervene to hinder the advancement of a rival. Those lords already present stood in tight-knit whispering groups, divided roughly by faction. They eyed all newcomers with suspicion and kept their warriors close at hand. No one wished to be the first to draw sword in the council, but everyone was more than prepared to be the second. Mara swiftly scanned the gathering for familiar or friendly house colours. The red and yellow of the Anasati stood out boldly amid a cluster of older nobles who conferred in the aisle between the lower-level seats and the dais. Mara recognised her former father-in-law. She hastened down to meet him, taking Lujan and two warriors for protection. Seeing Mara approach, Takuma of the Anasati turned and bowed slightly. He wore armour, but the hair that showed beneath his helm was now more white than iron grey. His face, always thin, now seemed drawn taut to the bone, and his eyes darkly shadowed. In acknowledgement of a superior power, Mara returned his bow and said, Are you well, grandfather of my son? Takuma seemed almost to look through her. He said, I am well, mother of my grandson. His lips thinned as he cast a glance around the disordered band of speakers in the hall. Would that the Empire were as fit. The Emperor? Mara said, hungry for information. The light of heaven, from all reports, lies at rest in his command tent upon the plain near the rift gate. Takuma's tone stayed hard. When Ichinda recovered from his incapacitation, he made known to his officers that he seeks a return to the Kingdom of the Isles to launch another invasion. Yet our desire to punish these barbarians for their treachery may be frustrated. The Great Ones may manipulate a rift but they do not control all its aspects. Whether this one to mid Kemia can be re-established is doubtful. Again, the Lord of the Anasati regarded the house rulers who gathered in the great hall in defiance of the Emperor's orders. He softened not at all as he concluded, Meanwhile, the business of the game continues. Taking swift stock of other elders present, Mara said, Who shall speak for the Ioannani? Secure in his power, and holding a name amongst the oldest in the empire, Takuma said, Until clan Ioannani retires to elect a new war chief, I shall be its spokesman. Abruptly, he pointed across the room. There gathers clan Hadama, my lady. I suggest you hurry there 
and make your presence known. Lord Takuma, the old man interrupted with his hand, Mara, I am a grieving man, so forgive my bluntness. His manner grew piercingly forced. Halesco was one of those trapped upon the alien world, and by all reports he lay dying upon a lance. I have lost a second son this day. I have no time for the woman who took away my first. Mara felt her throat tighten. She bowed lower in sympathy. My apologies, Takuma. I was tactless not to realise. The Lord of the Anasati shook his head slightly in what might have been a gesture of suppressed disbelief or pain. Many of us mourn, Mara. Many brothers, sons and fathers were trapped upon the alien world. The loss is a blow to our honour and to our hearts. Now, if you would excuse me. Without waiting for a reply, he turned his back on his former daughter-in-law and resumed the discussion she had interrupted. Left outside his circle and given a hostile look from the Yellow Flower Party member cut off when she addressed Takuma, Mara moved on around the dais to the first set of stairs, where the Hadama clan chief stood in caucus. Several bowed with respect as Mara approached, while others gave her a perfunctory nod. One or two, along with a palsied elder seated in a litter chair, offered the Akoma ruler no sign of greeting at all. Mara took stock and said, How many losses have we suffered? The Lord of the Satanta, a tall man in dark blue robe with pale blue trim, gave her a perfunctory bow. Lord Chakawara and his forty warriors are on their way from the city of the plains. The Lord of Kozinchach and two vassals remain with the Emperor. Hadama's losses were slight, since smaller clans were not placed in the forefront of the lines at the betrayal. Most of our rulers will be returning to Kentosani within the week. Who called this council? asked Mara. Lord Satanta's leathery features stayed carefully blank. Who called you here? Equally noncommittal, Mara said, I just came. With a wave of his hand, Lord Satanta indicated the filling chamber. No one here would speak against the will of the light of heaven. He fixed bird-bright eyes upon Mara. Also, no one here would see their first-born son dead of treachery and sit idly at home. Mara nodded, and inwardly concluded the things that remained unsaid. The defiance of Ichindar's play for power was being politely acknowledged, but in the great game courtesy often masked murder. The High Council of Suranuani intended to make itself heard. There would be no formal meeting this day. Too many lords were absent. No lord would make a move until it was known which enemies and which allies remained alive to be reckoned with. Today was for taking stock, and tomorrow was for playing, seizing advantage over rivals for the openings that chance had offered. And, while this council was unauthorised, this meeting was no less a round of the great game, for, while a grey warrior could kill as easy as one sworn to house colours, so was this grey council just as deadly as one with imperial sanction. Mara stole a quiet moment for review. Akoma prospects were not reassuring. The Minwanabi had lost a few opponents and gained a new lord who could use all their resources, especially military might, to full potential. The odds did not favour Lord Zacatecas. As war chief of Clan Zakala, Lord Chipino would have stood in the Emperor's front rank. His eldest son, Dezilo, would have represented Zacatecas as third of the five great families. Both were lost which left Lady Isashani and a brood of offspring, the oldest of which were young and untrade for the Lord's mantle. Mara's strongest ally was now dangerously weakened. All too reliant upon Ayaki's tenuous blood tie with the Anasati for some protection, Mara felt as though a cold breeze blew against her naked back. Around her, like jagoonas sniffing over corpses before deciding which choice bits to fight over, 
The ruling lords of Suranuani gathered with members of their clans, then splintered off to speak with allies and factions, usually along party lines. The Akoma were technically members of a minor political party, the Jade Eye, but the connection had lapsed since Lord Sezu's rule. Mara had little to do with party politics, being far too consumed by the need to preserve her house from obliteration. But with all the empire now cast into upheaval, no tie was too tenuous to ignore. Mara threaded her way past Lord in Radaka and the Lord of the Akamchi's fat second son, and a cousin of the Lord of the Kehotara, who conferred together in whispers and cast her cold glances. Finding two other members of the Jedi party beyond them, Mara approached and began a conversation that devolved from lists of sad condolences. The dead and those abandoned beyond the rift seemed to haunt by their absence. Yet life in Saranuani did not retreat from losses. Around the hall, members of the High Council explored by-plays behind facades of polite conversation, and all the while they played, once more, the great game. Lightning rent the sky, flashing silver-white on the great house of the Minwanabi. Seated at his lap desk, pen in hand, with fresh ink by his elbow, Incomo reviewed the documents arrayed before him, ignoring the sound of driving rain from outside. He was never a fast thinker, and now his shock and disbelief would not leave him. The events surrounding the Emperor's betrayal still seemed the uneasy aftermath of a nightmare. That Decio was dead was undoubted. Three witnesses reported seeing him go down with arrows in his throat and chest. His cousin, Jeshurado, already dead at his feet. No friend or retainer had been near enough to rescue the Lord's body from the chaos before the magical rift closed, forever sealing Kelowan from Midkemia. Incomo pressed dry palms to his temples and inhaled a breath of damp air. Decio of the Minwanabi rested with his ancestors, if indeed a man's spirit could cross the unknowable gulf between worlds. The rites had been said in the Minwanabi sacred glade by a hastily summoned priest, and runners departed with the news. All that remained to be done was await the new lord's return from the outpost in the Western Isles. At that moment, the screen at the first advisor's back slipped open. Warm, damp air swept through the room, ruffling the parchment and spattering a fall of wind-borne drops across the floor. I left orders not to be disturbed, Incomo snapped. A dry, incisive voice said, Then pardon the interruption, first advisor. But time passes, and there is much to be done. Incomo started and spun around. He saw a warrior, backlit by a white flash of lightning, step through the doorway. Water streamed off his battle armour and slicked his officer's plume into spikes. Light-footed, lithe and almost without sound, the man reached the circle of radiance cast by the room's single lamp. He swept off his helm, shadows circled his honey-coloured eyes and wet hair clung to his neck. Incomo dropped his quill and bowed from the waist in obeisance. Tasayo! Tasayo looked Incomo in the eyes for a silent moment and then said slowly, I'll forgive the familiarity this time, first advisor. Never again. Incomo shoved his lap desk aside, spilling quill and parchment and nearly upsetting the inkwell. He unfolded gaunt legs and stiffly touched his forehead to the floor. My lord! The boom of the storm filled silence while Tassio looked keenly around the room. He did not grant Incomo permission to rise, but studied the painted images of birds, the worn sleeping mat, and lastly, most leisurely of all, the prostrate elder on the carpet. Yes. Tassio. Lord of the Minwanabi. At last, given leave to sit upright, Incomo said, 
How did you... The new master interrupted in a tone that was faintly derisive. Encomo. Did you think yourself the only one with agents in this house? My cousin commanded my loyalty, but never my respect. Never would I dishonour the Minwanabi name, but in my position only a fool would have left cousin Desio unobserved. Tassio smoothed back drenched bangs, then adjusted the set of his sword belt. Since the moment I set foot on that cursed island, I kept one boat in readiness, manned and provisioned to leave. Day or night, if the call came, the lines need only be cast off. On the instant of my cousin's death, those loyal to me sent word to the outpost isles. Tassio shrugged, scattering droplets in the lamplight. I took a boat to Na and commandeered the first ship. When is the High Council to elect a new warlord? Eyes fixed on the runnels of rainwater that threatened his sleeping mat, Incomo recorded his thoughts. Word came only this morning. The light of heaven has called the High Council into session to meet three days from now. In almost silken calm, Tassio said, You would have let me miss that meeting, Incomo. Wet pillows quite abruptly ceased to matter. My lord! Again, Incomo pressed his forehead to the floor. Desio's end was most sudden. Our swiftest messenger departed within the hour, with orders to choose the fastest boat. I humbly submit that I did my best. Do not falter servants' limits when my lord has been clever beyond the expected call of duty. Tassio laughed without humour. I dislike pointless flattery, first adviser, as well as unconvincing humility. Rise and remember that. A loud peal of thunder rattled the house and echoes boomed across the night-dark lake. With a field commander's ability to adjust his voice to noise, Tassio said, Here are your orders, first adviser. Dismiss Desio's body, servants and concubines. I have staff of my own and they will attend me as I don my robes of mourning. I shall sleep this night in the officers' barracks. Tell my Hadonra to clear everything that belonged to Desio from the Lord's quarters. I want the chambers stripped. My carry boxes and personal items will be fully installed by dawn and the old lord's robes, bedding, and other personal items will be burned. Tassio's eyes narrowed. Tell the kennel master to cut the throats of the man-killer hounds. They will answer to no other master. After first light, assemble every member of this household on the drill field. A new lord of the Minwanabi rules, and all must understand that inefficiency will not be tolerated. As my lord wishes... Incoma prepared for a sleepless night. He unfolded sore knees and made ready to stand, but his master had not finished. The lord of the Minwanabi regarded his first adviser with flat, unwavering eyes. You do not need to indulge me as you did my cousin. I will hear your thoughts on all matters, even if my opinion lies contrary. You may suggest as you see fit until the moment I give orders. Then you will silently obey. Tomorrow we shall review the accounts and call together an honour guard. By midday I wish to be in my barge of state on my way down river to Kentasani. See that every detail is in order for my journey. For when I reach the holy city, I intend to present my case. What case, my lord? Incomo inquired in tacit respect. At last Tassio smiled, a sword-sharp brightness to his expression. Why? To assume the seat of warlord, obviously. Who has a better claim than I? Incomo felt the hair stir at his neck. At last, after years of wishful learning, he would serve a lord who was clever, competent and ambitious. Thunder shook the floor again, and rain slashed against the screens. Straight in the wavering flare of lamplight, Tassio finished his thought. 
once I wear the white and gold, we shall obliterate the Akoma. Incomo bowed again. When he rose, the room was empty, a draught through the darkened doorway, the only trace of his master's visit. Silently, the first adviser considered the desire he had never dared utter, but that fate and the gods had freely granted. Tasayo now wore the Minwanabi mantle. Touched by a mood of dry irony, Incomo wondered why the gift left him feeling worn and old. The storm left runoff that trickled in streams around the luck symbols anchored to the roof peaks of the Imperial Palace, and downspouts dripped into puddles in the courtyards. Inside the building, the sound of falling water became muffled. Drafts played like sighs up and down the cavernous corridors, setting streaming the flames of those lamps that servants had bothered to light. Lujan and five armoured warriors marched briskly through concourses gloomy with shadows to report back to the Akoma apartment. Mara met her force commander in the middle room, where she conferred with Arakasi. Kevin stood by the wall at her shoulder, his mood of biting sarcasm brought on by inactivity. He had a headache. His teeth were on edge from listening to warriors sharpen weapons, and the reek of the lacquer used to preserve laminated hide armour made his stomach queasy. Before the ladies' cushions, Lujan arose from his bow. Mistress, he said briskly, we bring word of new movement by Sajayo, Tondora and Gineza soldiers into apartments previously unoccupied. Mara frowned. Minwanabi dogs. Any word of the kennel master himself? No, not yet. Lujan unstrapped his helm and scuffed his fingers through damp hair. Arakasi looked up from the untidy pile of notes passed on to him that morning by his contacts throughout the palace. He regarded the Akoma force commander with hooded eyes. In three more days, the emperor will return to the palace. Propped by one shoulder against the wall, his arms folded across his chest, Kevin said, Taking his own sweet time about it, isn't he? There are a great number of rituals and ceremonies along the way, Mara broke in, her irritation barely masked. One does not travel with twenty priests, a thousand bodyguards and five thousand soldiers and make speed. Kevin shrugged. Confinement and stress affected them all. For two days, the business in council had been building momentum. Mara spent up to fifteen hours at a stretch closeted in the great hall. At night, she returned so exhausted that she barely had inclination to eat. She looked peaked and thin, and despite lavish solicitude from her lover, what little sleep she garnered was troubled. If the nights were unsatisfactory, the days were worse. Inactivity of any sort burned Kevin's nerves, but even boredom had limits. Duty in the scullery drove him to vocal rebellion, and though seldom given to self-indulgence, he lacked the fatalism that enabled the Sirani warriors to endure in seemingly endless patience. Mara sighed and took stock of her gains. So far I have held counsel with seventeen lords and have bound only four to agreements. She shook her head. A poor record. No one wishes to commit, though many pretend to be willing. Too many factions contend for the warlord's seat, and to support one candidate openly brings the enmity of all of his rivals. Arakasi uncrumpled a note that carried a pungent smell of fish. My agent at the dockside reports the arrival of Dajalo of the Keda. Mara perked up at this. Is he in residence at his townhouse or the Imperial Palace? Patience, lady. Arakasi shuffled through his notes, discarded three, then scanned the coded script of another that smelled intriguingly of perfume. Townhouse, the spymaster concluded. At least for tonight. Mara clapped her hands for the scribe brought in to help with correspondence. Address this to Lord Dajalo of the Kedah. First, offer our condolences for the death of his father, along with our certainty that his end was both brave and honourable. 
Then let Dajalo understand that the Akoma hold a document over Lord Andero's personal chop that binds House Kedder to one vote of our choosing. Dajalo, as new ruling lord, is bound to honour this. Mistress, Arakasi broke in. Isn't this a little... Uh, abrupt? Mara ran her fingers through the masses of her hair, the ends of which were still crimped into curls from being pinned. Perhaps I have acquired habits from this barbarian I keep around. She paused as thunder rolled in the distance. Have no doubt. Tasayo of the Minwanabi will be among us quite soon, and then I may need this vote instantly. A tap at the entry interrupted. A guard appeared in the doorway and bowed. Mistress, our scouts report armed men moving through the outer hallways of the palace. Mara glanced at Lujan, who jammed his helm over tangled hair and left still fastening the strap. Lightning flickered silver beyond the outer screens, reduced to slits between barricades now reinforced with raw boards. Kevin resisted a caged animal's need to pace, while Mara and Arakasi made a pretense of reading reports. The scratch of the scribe's quill filled the interval until the force commander returned. His bow was almost cursory as he said, Our lookouts have spied two bands of soldiers numbering twenty to thirty each. They pass in the shadows and would seem to be moving toward another section of the palace. What house? Mara asked, half fearful to hear the reply. None, pretty lady. Lujan's reassurance was dubious. These wear black armour, without markings or badge. Mara raised eyes gone wide in the lamplight. Then it is beginning. Lujan passed quiet orders to the warriors in the front chamber. The last screen cracked to let in air, was drawn shut and wedged in its frame with wooden pegs. A table was turned on end and levered against the outer door, then braced in place with a massive bar. Now the humidity brought in by the storm became like a stifling blanket. Arakasi seemed unaffected, where he sat in poised stillness, poring over his notes. But Kevin sweated and chafed, his empty hands itching for a blade. The hours wore on toward midnight. Sounds came muffled through the walls. Footfalls splashed through puddles or pounded down hallways and stairs, sometimes broken by a shout. The rain ceased and insects in Mara's garden rasped their nightly song. Since nobody seemed inclined to attend to the commonplace necessities, Kevin finally knelt at Mara's shoulder and pulled away the parchment she had held without reading for an hour. You must be hungry, he coaxed. Mara leaned her head against him. Not really, but I should eat something if I am to be alert in council tomorrow. Kevin arose, prepared for the inevitable battle of wills that transpired when he invaded the kitchen. Jikan considered any slave caught empty-handed to be fair game. Tonight he seemed primed for fight, since a squad of busy scullions was already scouring kettles and plates. As if the din of crockery were a charm to ward away the distant sounds of conflict, every ladle or cup or soup bowl was getting sanded down and polished. Jikan spotted Kevin in the doorway, and his worried face brightened. The mistress wishes to eat? Kevin nodded, and found himself the startled recipient of a tray of warm bread, cheeses and fruit. Disappointed by his easy victory, he swallowed a carefully prepared retort and returned to his lady. He set down the supper and sat with her, while she made a concerted effort to take sustenance. In the end, Arakasi finished the food. Kevin urged Mara to bed, while at every window and door the warriors waited like statues, prepared for an attack that never came. Morning dawned. Mara arose from her cushions and called for her bath and her maids. Makeup erased the shadows of worry from her face, and three layers of formal robes disguised her thinness. At the last minute, just as she was poised to leave, she turned and looked hard at Kevin. Nettled by the prospect of another tedious day, he regarded her with reproachful blue eyes. 
mostly because she feared an attack on her apartment in her absence, Mara gave in to impulse and relented. Come with me. Remain close and stay silent unless I tell you otherwise. Kevin fairly leaped to join her retinue. Lujan called her honour guard to form ranks, and minutes later the Akoma contingent made their entrance into the council hall. Sunlight angled across the dome overhead, spotlighting the yellow murals above the galleries. The upper seats were already filled with those lowest still empty. The chaos had subsided enough for the Surani nobles to be once more attentive to rank, Kevin observed. He followed Mara down the steps, while Lujan took station with two other warriors behind her. The rest of her honour guard remained on the concourse by the door, as if this council were no different from any other. But as she passed an empty chair on the way to her appointed place, Mara pressed her fingers to her mouth to stifle a cry of shock. Trouble? Kevin murmured, his promise of silence forgotten. Mara returned a barely perceptible nod. Clearly unhappy, she whispered, The Lord Pataki of the Siddha is dead. Kevin said, Who? A man who was kind to me once, in defiance of public sentiment. He was also a potential ally. Yesterday he was here, but this morning his seat is vacant. How do you know he isn't just lingering over his breakfast? Kevin murmured. Mara settled into her chair and nodded for her slave to stand behind and to her right. Only an assassin could have kept Pataki from this chamber. She made an inventory of the nearby galleries. Three other lords are also absent from the look of things. Friends of yours? Kevin did his best to keep his voice down. No. Enemies of the Minwanabi, answered Mara. She snapped her small ornamental fan open and murmured something to Lujan, who arranged his warriors around her seat, then assumed the place nearest the aisle where his sword would be first in her defence. The lowest gallery was now beginning to fill. Kevin looked around at the great lords of the Empire dressed up like peacocks in full plumage. Some sat like royalty in their places, speaking to those who came to petition for favours or alliances. Others stood in clumps, changing position or exchanging confidences like butterflies congregating around flowers. The game of the council was less an overt battle for hierarchy than a subtle, endless sequence of encounter, rebuff and social machination. I don't understand, Kevin said after long minutes of study. No one seems to act as if four of their fellow councillors were murdered. Death is part of the game, Mara answered. And as the morning wore on, Kevin came finally to understand. To show undue notice of another's defeat was to imply dishonour, since murder in and of itself meant that someone was responsible. In the absence of proof, the Sirani perceived only accidents. A lord might kill with impunity, and even win the admiration of his rivals for doing so, as long as the forms were observed. A middle-aged lord sauntered up to Mara, who rose in greeting and bowed. Social conversation was exchanged with a word or two concerning trade issues. Kevin was left to his own thoughts. This calm conducting of business during the day, while assassins had roamed the palace the night before, frightened him beyond anything he had known since he was captured. A rustle of voices swept through the room as a young man strode into the lower gallery. Flanked by six guards in scarlet and grey armour, he assumed one of the more imposing chairs opposite the central dais. Heads turned to watch as he motioned an adviser to his side. After a word in conference, the minister bowed and immediately hurried up the steps to where Mara and the other noble spoke. Aware by a low stir of whispering that something significant had occurred, Kevin watched the exchange. The adviser made Mara a bow. My lady of the comma. My lord wishes you to know that the Keras stand ready to honour any debt incurred in their name. Mara inclined her head slightly, and the minister departed. 
This message had a profound effect upon the man whose conversation was interrupted. His entire manner changed from dominance to sincere subservience, and suddenly several other lesser nobles were making their way down from the galleries, seeking word with the Lady of the Acoma. Kevin watched in wonder as the subtle currents of Surani politics shifted, with Mara becoming more and more a central object of attention. With the leaders of the five great houses lost on the alien world, the more powerful clans were caught up in their own internecine struggle. This left openings for the lesser families within those clans and for the smaller clans within the council to negotiate, make promises and seek out potential support. If the armies of the mighty were to march upon one another in rivalry, the weaker houses needed to stand together or else insinuate themselves beneath the mantle of more powerful protectors. Treaties and standoffs were arranged, concessions were made freely and under duress, and trade properties changed owners as sureties and gifts. As the day wore on toward noon, Kevin realised that Mara had not yet needed to leave her chair. Interested parties came to her, which did not escape the notice of other factions. In Rodaka and Ikamchi glanced often toward the vacant seat of the Lord of the Minwanabi, while members of the Ianani clan made smiling remarks to a stiff-faced Takuma of the Anasati. Just before midday, a company of soldiers in purple and yellow entered and accompanied by a slender young man of dark good looks to the chair of the Zacatecas. The heir to Chipino's mantle took his place within the council with all of his father's cool poise. Mara, watching, flipped out her fan and held it pressed for a moment against her forehead. Kevin sensed her distress. He could offer no word of sympathy, but only stand rigid as he, too, noticed with a wrench how much the Zacatecas boy resembled his departed father. Three lords waited politely for Mara's attention. She recovered her poise and entertained them with anecdotes until most of the lords of Clan Zakala had had time to present themselves to the heir of their former war chief. A lull came at last. Mara beckoned to Lujan and descended the shallow stair until she stood before the lord of the Zacatecas. Up close, Hopara looked every inch the young raptor, though his hair and eyes were a warmer brown and his slenderness was his mother Isashani's. But he had Chipino's bearing and presence, even in untried youth. He rose, formally bowed, and said, Are you well, Mara of the Okoma? Mara felt her colour rise. By inquiring after her health before she could speak, Hopara had acknowledged before all present that Mara was his social superior. Since his blood was of the five great families, this gesture was little more than a courtesy, but in some meaningful, if subtle way, the concession held stunning consequence. Even as Mara drew breath to frame her reply, she could sense the stir in the galleries. Nobles near Lord Zacatecas regarded her with astonished awe, while others looked sourly on from their seats across the dais. Her answer held true warmth, I am well, my lord of the Zacatecas. Your grief is the grief of House Akoma. Your father was a credit to his family and clan and more. He defended the empire's borders with courage and honoured the Akoma by permitting us to count him an ally. I would consider it a signal privilege if you would number my house among the friends of the Zacatecas. Hopara managed a creditable smile, though the effort did not entirely mask his grief. My lady, I would count it an honour if you would consent to dine with me this afternoon. Mara bowed formally, indicating she was at his disposal. The way back to her own chair was suddenly impeded by a wave of flatterers, and until the Zacatecas' first adviser came calling to fetch her to lunch, she had no moment to herself. The Zacatecas' apartments in the Imperial Palace were twice the size of Mara's. The carpets and antiques were sumptuous, 
black lacquered furnishings in tasteful contrast to shades of lavender, royal purple and cream. Lee birds in hanging wicker cages filled the room with song and the flutter of brightly coloured wings. Mara recognised Isashani's love of comfort and grace and she settled in relief upon soft, thick cushions. The servants had been trained by Lord Cipino and one of them had served on the desert campaign. Already familiar with her habits, he held a bowl of water scented with the perfume she preferred. As Mara washed, she thought sadly of the old master, while Kevin found his place on the floor behind her shoulder. Hopara shed his heavy outer robe, pushed a hand through tightly curled hair, then seated himself opposite a low table laden with a sumptuous lunch. He sighed, tugged his sleeves back to free, strong, sun-tanned wrists, then offered his hands to be washed by the body slave who waited at his elbow. When the slave had finished the ablutions, the young lord turned frank eyes to study the bearded barbarian who stuck to Mara like a shadow. Kevin stared levelly back until Hapara raised an eyebrow. This is your barbarian lover? The curiosity did not offend. Hapara had his father's bluntness and his mother's shrewd judgment of people. He was simply being direct, not mocking her personal choices. Mara returned a slight nod, and Hapara gave back Isishani's disarming smile. My father mentioned this man to me, if it is the same one. This is Kevin, Mara said guardedly. Hopara nodded in satisfaction. Yes, the slave who owns a full set of armour in Akoma colours. He sighed, his sorrow barely concealed. My father told us how this Kevin was more than merely useful in the battle he fought in the desert. Mara smiled slightly, indicating the point was not lost. He had one or two suggestions. Liebird sang sweetly through an interval of reflection. Father was not often free with compliments, Hopara admitted. He stared at the cutlery, as if he saw memories instead of food on the plates. He credited much of what he saw in the field to brilliantly original ideas. He said no Sirani would have thought to order his soldiers onto the backs of Choja warriors. The tactic impressed him greatly. The young lord gave his guest another engaging smile, as he was also impressed by you, my lady. Kevin suddenly felt a stir of jealousy as Mara blushed at the compliment. I thank you, my lord. Is it hot? Hopara said suddenly, as if the colour on the lady's face had other cause than his attention. He waved for a servant to open the screen, and sunlight and air spilled into the room. The garden beyond was planted in violet flowers and canopied over with fruit trees. Then, as if Lujan's slight stiffness revealed that a guest might be concerned for her safety in the Zacatecas' home, the Lord offered swift reassurance. This apartment backs up to a barracks that houses the Emperor's honour guard. Eighty Imperial Whites are in residence at all times. When Lujan stayed unbendingly alert, Hapara's tone turned genial. Mother never liked that much. She said she could never wear lounging robes or bathe in her garden without putting the Imperial family at risk. Assassins could be murdering them all, she insisted and there the Imperial Guards would be, peeking over the walls with the wrong spears raised and not an eye among them on defence. Mara smiled. Lady Isashani's beauty was legendary. Repeated motherhood over the years had done little more than add a mature lushness to her figure, and her forthright spicy tongue was the outrageous delight of polite Sirani society. How is your mother? Mara inquired. Hopara sighed. Well enough. My father's and older brother's deaths were a blow to her, of course. Did you know, he added, unwilling to lose the thread of his original subject, 
that my sire suggested you might marry one of his younger sons one day should you escape from Decio's attempts to obliterate you. Mara's eyes opened wide at that, for gossip said Isashani unequivocally favoured Hokanu for her match. I'm flattered. You're not eating, Hopara observed. He lifted his knife and stabbed a morsel of wine-soaked meat. Please refresh yourself. My sister's lapdogs are all overweight. If the scullions give them more scraps, the poor beasts will end up being mistaken for pillows. Papara chewed thoughtfully. He appeared to weigh Mara's expression. Then he arrived at some inward decision, and his manner changed from charming to serious. My father believed you will become one of the most dangerous women in the history of the Empire. As a man who chose his enemies with great care, he clearly wished to have you as a friend. Mara could only bow low at the compliment. She sipped at her fruit drink and waited while the lee birds chirped dulcet melodies. Now convinced beyond doubt that she would not soften to praise, Hopara tore an end off a loaf of bread. He soaked the crust in a sauce and remarked, You realise, of course, that many of us are going to die before the new warlord is invested. Mara made a spare gesture of assent. The white and gold had too many contenders, and alliances were too much in flux. Even a fool could perceive that rivalries would become bloody. I have been ordered to seek you out, and will bluntly make my point. Hapara motioned to a servant who bowed and unobtrusively began to remove the bird cages. Into an air of growing silence, the young lord said, The Zacatecas wish to survive this ordeal without surrendering too much of the prestige my father gained in life. To this end, we look for the situation of greatest advantage. My first adviser instructed me to offer you informal alliance and to promise whatever aid the Zacatecas can provide, as long as... Mara stopped him with a raised finger. A moment, my lord. Ordered. Instructed. Who directed you? The young man's manner turned rueful. She said you'd ask. My mother, of course. Kevin laughed, and Mara said, Your mother? Unabashed, Hopara admitted, I will not reach my twenty-fifth birthday for three more years, Lady Mara. I am Lord of the Zacatecas, but not, not yet, ruling Lord, she finished. Hapara sighed. Not yet. Mother is ruling Lady until then, if I can manage to stay alive. Then why isn't Lady Isashani here? Kevin asked. Hopara glanced at Mara, who said, He often forgets his place. And he never met Mother, obviously. The young lord shook off discomfort. Isashani might seem like a leebird, but she's as tough as any soldier and weighs her options like a silk merchant. She has six sons left and four daughters. If she lost me... She would mourn, no doubt, but Chaduni would take my place, and after him Mizu, then Elamku, and so on down the line. After us there are the get of my father's concubines, some eighteen sons, not counting those still in milk teeth, and another batch yet to hit the cradle. Now the boy coloured as he thought of the storms that had rocked the house when Lord Chipino had arrived home from the desert with six new concubines, every one of them pregnant. The Zacatecas would be a difficult line to eradicate, Kevin summed up. Hopara sighed in appreciation. Too many babies and cousins with hundreds of offshoots, and every one but a moment away from being recognised as heir to mother's office, if need be. My mother stays safely upon our estates, deputising me to come here and conduct the business of the council. He gestured in the direction of the great hall. Most of our rivals don't realise I am not ruling lord yet. 
and they won't be given cause to pose the question, since I have full authority from my mother to negotiate on behalf of House Zacatecas, within limits. Mara's mind raced along as she examined the implications. Then we know for a fact what few will guess. You did not come to council to claim the office of warlord. Even had father lived, he would be no higher than third among those who claim the white and gold, Hopara said. Who stands higher? Now, at long last, Mara found her appetite. Hopara shrugged. I can only repeat my mother's view. Minwanabi has the most power, but the vote won't give him a clear majority. Should the Oaxatucan cease their internal bickering, an Omechan could succeed their former war chief. They still wield impressive influence. The Kanazawai are in disgrace because of the failed peace plans, so even the Tomagu rank higher than the Kedah. He shrugged again, then concluded, Minwanabi is the logical choice. Tasayo is a more than able general. Many will back him who wouldn't have supported Desio. The meats suddenly lost their savour. Mara abandoned her plate. We come to the crux of the matter. What are you proposing beyond alliance? Hopara also put down his eating knife. For all our vaunted power, the Zacatecas are presently disadvantaged. We lost two advisers in the company with my father, and we are short on reliable guidance. I have been instructed to follow your lead unless your wits should fail you. Otherwise, I am to throw our support to Tasayo. Kevin said, You'd support that murderer after his treasonous manipulations in Subar? Mara put up a hand, silencing him. That is logical. Once Minwanabi wore the white and gold, the Zacatecas would be free from the immediate worry of attack from the other four great families. We would have time to muster our defences while Tasayo was occupied destroying the Akoma. Hapara's tone was matter of fact. However, he hastened to add, it is only a choice of last resort. While safest for the Zacatecas in the short run, an empire under the dictates of a Minwanabi warlord. His voice trailed off in distaste. Kevin voiced his puzzlement. Damned if I understand that logic. Hopara's eyebrows rose. I would have thought... To Mara he said, Have you not explained? As if the sunlight through the screen had suddenly lost its warmth, Mara sighed. Only the roots of our current strife, the death of my father and brother. A lee bird chirped, muffled from the adjoining chamber. Please cover the cages, Hopara instructed a servant. He looked at his guest. If I may... At Mara's nod, he turned, troubled, to Kevin. The Minwanabi are... strange. Inappropriate, though it may be, to pass judgment upon another noble family whose behaviour remains honourable in public, there is something in the Minwanabi nature that makes them... more than merely dangerous. Kevin returned a look of flat confusion. Any mighty house is dangerous, and to my view the game of the council is just treachery with protocols. If Hopara was shocked by the slave's outspokenness, he masked it well. Patiently he sought to elaborate. You are here more because of Lady Mara's potential to be a threat than her not inconsequential charm. He bowed slightly as he said this. But the Minwanabi are more than dangerous. They are... Mara interrupted. They are insane. Hopara held up his hand. That is harsh. <sighs> Understandable in your case, but still harsh. To Kevin he added, Let us say, they have tastes that are considered unwholesome by many. 
Kevin grinned, his eyes very innocent and blue. You mean they're bent? Hapara said, Bent? Then he laughed. I like that. Yes, they are bent. The Minwanabi enjoy pain. Mara's gaze fixed on some inward image less pleasant than Isashani's lavender sitting room. Sometimes their own, always others. They kill for pleasure slowly. Past Minwanabi lords are known to have hunted captives like wild animals. They have tortured prisoners and hired poets to compose verse in praise of their victims' agonies. Some have a sickness in them becoming aroused at the sight and smell of blood. Hapara waved for servants to remove the dishes and bring wine. Some Minwanabi hide it better than others, but they all have this bent appetite for suffering. Sooner or later it emerges. Jingu was obvious in his vices. Several of his concubines were murdered in his bed, and his first wife was strangled while he took her, rumour claims. Desio was held to be less violent, but even the street beggars know he beat his slave girls. Did you never wonder, with all the Minwanabi wealth and power, why noble lords were not anxious to petition a marriage for their daughters? He let the question go unanswered. Tasayo is more guarded. I have served with him in the field and seen him raping captive women like a common soldier. He also makes rounds through the healer's tents, lingering there not to bring comfort to his wounded soldiers, but to savour their pain. His attention returning to the crystal as his servant poured the wine, Hapara repressed a grimace. Tasayo is not a man I would wish to see upon the warlord's throne. He is very bent, observed Kevin. And very dangerous, Hapara summed up. He lifted his wine, waited for Mara to taste her own, then drained his goblet freely. This is why I must either covertly block Tasayo's bid for the white and gold, or openly support him, gaining his favour. Mara set down her glass, her eyes veiled by lowered lashes as she weighed available options. So you ask that I contrive a way for you to support someone else, a candidate who would not stand at odds with your covert alliance with the Akoma, lest the wrath of the Minwanabi be brought down upon House Zacatecas. Hapara nodded in obvious relief. That would be the preferable choice. Mara rose and waved the young man back as he moved to get to his feet. Your father was never formal with me in private, and I prefer to keep the custom. As Lujan assembled her honour guard by the outer doorway, she guardedly said, I will consult with my advisers and keep you apprised, Lord Hopara. But understand that should I be able to save you and protect your house, you will be required to support me in another matter. The boy nodded, silent, and motioned his hovering servants not to pour more wine. Mara bowed slightly and departed toward the door. Kevin lingered behind, his eyes on the pretty garden courtyard. The wall and the Emperor's barracks were set back a good fifty yards from the screen. Mara's force commander had not relaxed one instant throughout the hour's discussion. One piece of free advice, Kevin said to the Lord of the Zacatecas. Double your guards and start turning this apartment into a fortress. Three or four lords have been murdered in their beds already, and unless Imperial Whites have wings, they won't get over that back wall in any kind of time to help you. As Kevin hurried to overtake Mara and her warriors at the doorway, the young Lord of the Zacatecas called his force commander to attend him. The Akoma party left the apartment while Hapara's voice rose in steel-voiced command that could have been an echo of Chipino's. I don't care if there's nothing to use but purple pillows and bird cages. Just seal these godforsaken windows and barricade every screen. That barbarian's ideas saved my father's life once in Subar, and I have a mind to heed his warning. 
A servant, embarrassed by this outburst, hurried the outer door closed, and Mara smiled at her Midkemian slave. Opara is a very likable young man. I hope he survives to assume his family mantle. I hope we all survive, Kevin said sourly, as a companionable shove from Nujan jostled him into place. This jockeying to choose a new warlord definitely gives me a stomachache. Chapter 18 Bloody Swords The council ended. Long shadows streaked the courtyard between concourses as Mara and her retinue chose an alternative route back to her apartment. Though the meeting itself had gone quietly, the charged air of tension left even the strongest lords cautious. Takuma of the Anasati had not objected to Mara's suggestion that they join their honour guards together for their return to their quarters. With Clan Ionani vaulted into unanticipated prominence, whether he wished it or not, the young lord of the Tonmagu was seen as being in contention for the white and gold, and Takuma was vital for any support the Ionani wished to give their favourite son. And who wished to throw the Ionani into disarray could not find a quicker means than killing Takuma of the Anasati. Times were uncertain for all. Takuma gave no nod of farewell as he and his warriors branched off to his red-painted entry. He gave no sign that Mara had been with him at all, lest the wrong I see and presume a warmer relationship between his house and the Akoma. Bone-tired, Mara marched on to her apartment. After Zacatecas's airy sitting-room and the enormous vaulted council hall, the inside of her own quarters seemed stuffy and cramped. Mara settled wearily in the central chamber and was immediately approached by Jikan, who offered a note left by Arakasi. Mara broke the seal and read. An immediate frown creased her face. "'Tell Lujan to keep his armour on,' she called, then sent a servant for her pens and writing desk. Kevin settled resignedly into his accustomed corner. He watched his mistress write two hasty messages. She handed them to her force commander for delivery with quick last-minute instructions. Tell the lords in question that we have no further details. If they feel unable to protect themselves, have them join us straight away. What was that? Kevin asked over the rattle of men donning armour as Lujan selected an escort from the ranks of off-duty warriors. Mara passed her soiled nib to a servant and sighed. One of Arakasi's agents overheard a band of men who were hiding in the Imperial Gardens. One of them carelessly mentioned names and revealed that they were sent to attack the suites of two lords who happened to be in Radaka's enemies. Since any who hinder that faction are potential allies to our cause, I deemed it wise to send warning. She tapped her chin with the note. I suspect this means that Inradaka and his gang will support Tasayo. The single maid in residence entered. At a nod from her mistress, she began to unpin Mara's elaborately high-piled hair and remove her necklaces of carved jade and amber. The lady endured with closed eyes. I just wish we had some clear indication of our own danger. Kevin loosened his Surani-style slave robe and, from a pocket that by rights should not have been there, removed what looked like a meat knife. He turned the blade toward the lamp, inspecting the edge for flaws, saying, We're ready. Should it matter when they come? Mara opened her eyes. Did you steal that from the pantry? It is death for you to have a weapon. It is death for a slave to have opinions, and you haven't hanged me yet. Kevin looked at her. If we're attacked tonight, I'm not going to stand by and watch you killed because you think meek behaviour is going to gain me a better station in my next life. I'm going to slice some throats. He said the last without humour. Mara felt too spent to argue. Jikan would know the knife was missing. If her Hadonra had not seen fit to report the theft, inquiry would be met with shrugs and blank looks unless she were to pose a direct question. 
The Hadonra and her Midkemian slave had evolved a complex relationship over the years. Between them, most issues were cause for unending bickering, but in the select few areas they agreed upon, it was as if a blood oath held them together. Near midnight, a knock sounded on the outer door of the Acoma apartment. Who passes? called the guard on duty. Zonwai! Roused from a half doze where she lay in Kevin's arms, Mara ordered urgently, Open the door! She clapped for her maid to bring an overrobe, then motioned for Kevin to assume a position of more propriety, while her warriors lifted down the heavy bar and slid back the tabletop pressed into service as siege shutter. The portal opened into a dark, lampless corridor and admitted an old man bleeding from a blow to the head. He was supported by an equally wounded guard, who looked over his shoulder as if expecting pursuit. Lujan hurried the pair into the apartment, then spun to help the guards bolt and bar the door behind them. Mara had a sleeping mat pulled out of the room that served as an officer's barracks. Her own servants relieved the injured warrior of his master's weight and made the old lord comfortable with pillows. Strike leader Kenji arrived with a satchel of remedies, and it was he who washed and dressed the old man's head wound, while another of Mara's warriors helped the soldier out of his armour. His cuts also were tended, the deepest ones spread with salve and tightly bound. None were life-threatening. Mara sent her servant to bring wine, then inquired what had befallen. Still pale from shock and pain, the old man fixed eyes of startling blue upon his hostess. An inopportune fate, my lady. I dined late this night with my cousin, the Cantor of the Omechen, in celebration of my support for his claim to the white and gold. As I was making ready to depart, his apartment was overwhelmed by soldiers wearing unmarked black armour. Lord de Canto was the target of their attack. I just happened to be in the way. De Canto was still fighting when we escaped. The servant arrived with a tray of filled goblets. Mara waited until her guests had been served the warrior accepting his drink with his one unbandaged hand. Delicately, she asked, Who sent such soldiers? The old man tasted his wine, half smiled his appreciation of the vintage, then grimaced as the expression pulled at his cuts. Any one of six other cousins, I fear. The Omechen are a large clan, and Aumecho appointed no clear heir from his Oaxatucan nephews. De Canto was the obvious successor. But someone else disagrees, Mara prompted. Lord Zanwai pressed the cloth against his scalp and scraped back a damp strand of hair. De Canto is the first son of Aumecho's eldest sister. Aksantuka is the older because he was born first, but his mother was a younger sister, so that leaves a mess. Almecho, curse his black soul, thought he was immortal. A wife and six concubines, and not one son or daughter. Mara considered, sipped her own wine, then said, you are welcome to stay, my lord, or if you prefer your own quarters, I'll offer a guard of my warriors to escort you back. The old man inclined his head. My lady, I am in your debt. If I may, I will stay. It is a killing ground out there. I had an honour guard of five. We eluded no less than six companies of men. I fear four of my warriors lie dead or dying. There were other armoured bands afoot, but the gods be thanked they ignored my last man and me. Quietly, Lujan doubled the guards at the door. Then he leaned on the lintel between the chambers and, out of habit, squinted along the edge of his blade. Did all wear black armour like the ones who attacked you? 
I did not see, the old man said. The wounded warrior did better. Revived a bit by the wine, he grated, No, some were like that. Others wore Minwanabi orange and black. Lord Tasayo must have arrived in Kedosane tonight, and still others were tongue. Mara almost spat. Assassins! Here in the Imperial Palace! Over the shiningly perfect edge of Lujan's weapon, the eyes of Lady and Force Commander met. The one recalled, and the other knew that Mara had once almost died at the hands of a hired Tong killer, dispatched to her home by Jingu of the Minwanabi. The warrior continued bleakly with his tale. There were Tong, my lady. Black robes and headcloths, hands dyed in colours, swords across their backs. They swept through on silent feet, glanced at our colours to determine our family, then passed on. We were not their chosen prey this night. Kevin arose and joined Lu Jan by the screen track between the rooms. Softly he asked, What are tongs? Lu Jan ran his thumb over his blade. No unseen flaws met his touch, but a frown marred his complacency nonetheless. Tongs he said in a dead, flat tone. Our brotherhoods, families without clan or honour. Each tongue holds allegiance to no one and nothing save their Obajan, the Grand Master, and their outlaw code of blood. Politely put, they are criminals who have no respect for tradition. The sword flashed in the lamplight as the force commander turned it. Some of them, like the Hamoi, make of their unclean craft a renegade religion. They believe the souls of their victims are true prayers in praise of Turakamu. To them, murder is holy. Lujan sheathed his sword, and his tone assumed a grudging admiration. They make terrible enemies. Many of them train from childhood, and they kill most efficiently. I know who wants me dead, Mara said, the wine glass forgotten in her hand. Tasayo has enough strength to threaten me directly. So then, who dares hire tongs into the palace? Lord Zanwai tiredly shrugged his shoulders. These are reckless times. Rivalries run hot enough that a slain man could have had his death bought by any of a dozen factions, and the work of a tongue is not traceable. Brother could kill brother and never be accused of disloyalty. Mara set down her goblet and clenched her hands to still their shaking. Almost, I wish this matter could be settled in open war. The killing at least might be cleaner. A bitter laugh met her words. Dead is dead, said Lord Zanwai, and any contest on the battlefield would see Minwanabi take the prize. He put down his wine glass. I judge the tongue more likely in Tasayo's employ simply because overt display of Minwanabi arms might frighten potential allies into supporting another claimant to the white and gold. And it is rumoured the Minwanabi have had dealings with the Tongs in the past. Mara chose not to mention that she had certain knowledge this was correct. The real question is who sends soldiers without house colours through the palace? Sadly silent, Mara conceded the truth. One could only guess. Certain knowledge might never be hers. She called for servants to clear one of the guest rooms of warriors for Lord Zanwai's use. Rest well, he said, as one of her men helped him stiffly to his feet. May all here live to see the morning. Throughout the night, 
The palace echoed with shouts, running feet, and sometimes the crack of swords in distant combat. No one slept except in snatches. Mara lay long hours in Kevin's arms, but the best she managed was a fitful doze that led to bloody nightmares. A coma soldiers stood watch in shifts, ready for any attack upon their ladies' quarters. An hour before sunrise, a bump outside the apartment door caused the warriors on guard to draw weapons. Who passes? called Lujan. The low voice that answered was Arakasi's. Mara had given up trying to sleep. She waved away the maid who arrived to help her dress, while the door was unbarred and opened and the spymaster let inside. His hair was matted with dried blood, and he cradled one forearm in the crook of his elbow. The flesh above the wrist bore an ugly lump and a purple mass of swelling. One look, and Lujan said tersely, "'We're going to need a bone-setter.' He caught the spymaster strongly beneath the shoulder on his uninjured side and helped his unsteady feet across the floor and onto the sleeping mat that had served Lord Zanwai the night before. No, bone said that. Arakasi grunted as his knees folded and he settled back on the cushions. It's chaos out there. Unless you sent half a company, a messenger would have a knife in him before he crossed the first concourse. The spymaster looked meaningfully at Lujan. Your field medicine will do well enough. Find Jikan, Mara snapped to her maid. Tell him to bring spirits. But Arakasi held up his sound hand, forestalling her. No, spirits, I have much to tell, and a bang on the head has me dizzy enough without making my wits stupid with drink. Mara said, What has happened? A battle between unknown warriors in black armour and a dozen assassins of the Hamoi Pong. Arakasi fell silent as Lujan examined the cut in his scalp, then unstrapped his braces and set to cleaning away scabbed blood with rags and water brought in a basin by the maid. As the injury was bared to light, the force commander said softly, Fetch the lamp. The maid did so, and Mara waited through a worried interval while Lujan held the flame before Arakasi's eyes and watched for response from the pupils. You'll do, he said presently, but the scar might grow back in white hair. That brought a curse from the spymaster. The last thing a man in his profession might desire was a distinguishing feature to mark him. Lujan turned next to the arm. My lady, he said gently, you might do better in the next room, but leave me Kevin and one of the warriors who wins at arm wrestling. Arakasi murmured a protest, then said clearly, Just Kevin. The spy master looked paler when Mara was allowed to return. Beneath clipped hair and a fresh dressing, his face was running sweat. Yet he had made no outcry when Lujan had set his arm. Kevin's comment as he returned to his accustomed corner was, Your spy master's tough as old sandal leather. Mara waited patiently while her force commander finished with splint and bandages. Once Arakasi was arranged with his arm settled on pillows, she sent a servant to bring wine. Don't speak until you are ready. Arakasi looked back in impatience. I'm ready not to be fussed over. He nodded his thanks as Lujan stood to depart, then turned dark eyes to his lady, all business. At least three more lords were murdered or injured. Several others withdrew from the palace and fled to their townhouses or back to their estates. I have a list. He shifted awkwardly and produced a paper from his robe. The servant arrived with the wine. Despite his insistence on abstinence, Arakasi accepted a glass. He drank while his mistress scanned his hasty notes, and a little colour returned to his face. The dead are all supporters of Tasayo and Lord Kedda, Mara summed up. You think the killers are being underwritten by either the Ionani or the Omechan faction? 
Arakasi sighed deeply and set down his glass. Perhaps not. Aksantuka of the Oaxatukan also suffered an attack. Mara heard this without surprise, for he had strong rivals within his own faction. How did he fare? Well enough. Eyes closed, the spymaster forced himself to relax. With his head tipped back against the wall, he added, All the attackers died, which is surprising. They were Tong. But Aksantukar was always a competent fighter. He too had managed armies on the barbarian world. Mara observed her spymaster and noted that tension had not quite left him. You know more. I wish that I did not, mistress. Arakasi opened eyes that shone too bleak. A delegation of lords went to the imperial barracks and presented the commander of the emperor's garrison with a demand. They wished three companies of imperial whites to guard the council hall. The commander refused. Since the light of heaven has called no official council, the halls are not his responsibility. The duty appointed him was to protect the imperial family, and he would send no soldiers away from their post unless his emperor saw fit to give orders. Mara tapped her wine glass in a fever of suppressed irritation. When will the emperor return? Noon tomorrow, by all reports. Mara sighed. Then we have no choice but to endure. Order will be restored when the Emperor steps into the palace. Kevin raised his eyebrows. His presence alone will do that? Dryly, Arakasi corrected. The five thousand soldiers he brings with him will do that. He went on to add, The great lords have made their case adamantly. Also, the chief priests of the Twenty Orders adjourned late last night and proclaimed that the betrayal on Midkemia was evidence of divine anger. Tsirani tradition has been broken, they say, and the light of heaven strayed from spiritual to mundane concerns. If Ichindar had the support of the temples, he might command still, but at this point he must relent and allow the council to name a new warlord. Then the matter must be settled by noon, observed Mara. The reasons were all too clear. Enough misfortune had occurred since the emperor set his hand in the game. The high council lords had shown they would not be displaced. A new warlord would greet Ichindar upon his return to the palace. Tonight, said Arakasi quietly, this building will become a battlefield. Kevin yawned. Will we get any sleep before then? This morning only, Mara allowed. We must be at council this afternoon. Today's meetings will largely decide who lives through tonight, and tomorrow whoever survives will appoint the new warlord of Suranuani. As Arakasi gathered himself to rise from his pillows, Mara waved him back. No, she said firmly. You will stay and rest for the day. The spymaster did little but look at her, yet Mara spoke as if he questioned her aloud. No, she repeated. This is a command. Only a fool would assume that the Minwanabi will not make an appearance. You have done enough and more, and Kevin spoke rightly last night. Whether or not there is a threat against the Akoma, I will not leave this council. We are already as prepared as we can be for an attack. If our efforts are not enough, then Ayaki is protected at home. Arakasi inclined his white-wrapped head. His fatigue must have been great, for the next time Kevin looked, the nervous intelligence of the man had stilled. Mara's spymaster lay in a loose-limbed sprawl, soundly and finally asleep. Disquiet pervaded the great council hall. Mara was not the only ruling noble to enter with more than the traditionally permitted honour guard. 
The aisles between seats and concourses were packed with armoured warriors, and the hall looked more like a marshalling yard than a chamber for deliberation. Each lord kept his soldiers at hand, sitting on the floor at his feet or lined up along the railings between stairways. Any who needed to travel from place to place were forced to take tortuous routes, often stepping over warriors who could only bow their heads and mutter apologies for the inconvenience. As Mara picked her way between the retinues of two rival factions, Kevin muttered, If one idiot drew a sword in here, hundreds would die before anyone had a chance to ask why. Mara nodded. She said softly, Look there. In the lowest gallery, the seat opposite the warlord's dais at last stood occupied. Warriors in orange and black filled the floor in a wedge formation, and in their midst, clad in battle gear barely more ornamented than an officer's, sat Tasayo of the Minwanabi. If Kevin had been disappointed by the late Lord Desio's innocuous appearance, the same could not be said of his cousins. Tasayo sat his chair with a relaxed and waiting stillness that even from a distance revealed presence. Kevin was reminded of nothing so much as a tiger. Briefly, Tasayo glanced across the chamber. His eyes locked with Kevin's for an instant, yet recognition occurred. The face beneath the fluted rim of the helm stayed impassive, but there was no mistaking the shock of awareness that passed between the two men. Kevin stared a moment longer, then bent his head toward his lady. The tiger knows we're outside his lair. Mara arrived at her chair and sat, and by all appearance seemed occupied with arranging her formal overrobe. Tiger? Like one of your sarcats, only four-legged, twice as big and a lot more dangerous. Kevin assumed his position behind her chair, crowded into the narrow space by the press of extra warriors who normally would have waited on the upper concourse. Mara took stock of the hall, which seemed more gloomy and, oddly, more resonant to sound. There were empty chairs with the gloss of armour and sword scabbards more plentiful than fine silks and jewels among the lords present. As intrigues became more tangled, the talk turned convoluted. Words gained layers of meaning, and looks between lords were all weighted. Each empty place meant a council member dead or intimidated into withdrawal. The factions that remained were resolute, and some caucuses fairly bristled with unspoken aggression. A council runner brought Mara a note. She slit the seal, glanced at the two chops stamped inside, then motioned for the boy to wait while she read. Lord Zanwai entered, along with a dozen warriors. He appeared recovered from his ordeal the night before, and, as a blocked aisle forced him to improvise a route, he chose one that brought him close to Mara. He gifted the Acoma lady with a smile and slight nod as he passed. She returned his tacit greeting, then penned a response to the note just received, and dispatched the runner to another gallery. To Lujan she said, We have gained two more votes in thanks for Arakasi's information. The morning's business wore on. Mara exchanged talk with a dozen lords on seemingly harmless subjects, Although Kevin tried to follow the byplay, he could not discern if the exchanges masked threats or offers of alliance. More and more he found his eyes drawn to the lower gallery, where lord after lord paid court to Tasayo of the Minwanabi. Kevin could not help but notice that the visitors spoke most, while Tasayo largely remained silent. When he did reply, his words were sparse and crisp, as evidenced by the flash of white teeth. The warriors at his sandaled feet moved no muscle all the while, but sat with the inhuman poise of statues. His followers fear him, Kevin whispered to Lujan in a stolen moment of confidence. The Akoma force commander returned a barely perceptible nod. With good reason, he murmured back. Tasayo is a superb killer, and he keeps his skills sharp by using them. His gaze on the figure in the orange and black chair, Kevin felt a chill skim his flesh. If the game of the council was ruthless, there sat the most merciless player of them all. 
Mara returned to her quarters for lunch and a consultation with her advisers. Arakasi had tied his arm in a sling and commandeered her writing desk. By the clutter of notes and quills, he had been busy and remained so as Mara asked her servants to bring up trays of light food. Kevin watched the spymaster pen three more missives in the interim. The parchments held braced under his splinted forearm while he wrote in level, left-handed script. "'You're right-handed,' the Midkemian accused. He had a swordsman's eye, and noting which hand a man used was part of an ingrained reflex. I would have sworn it. Arakasi did not look up. "'Today I cannot be,' he said with spare irony. When Kevin looked to see if the penmanship suffered, he was further awed to find that the handwriting varied like artistry. One of the notes looked as though it had been scribed by a strong male hand, another seemed feminine and delicate, and yet another, as if the author could neither read nor spell with skill, but struggled by with scanty education. "'Do you ever get confused about who you are today?' Kevin asked, for he had yet to find an impersonation that the spy master would not try. Arakasi deemed the question beneath notice, and went on with enviable dexterity to fold and seal his letters one-handed. By now, Mara had slipped out of her overrobe. She did not ask Arakasi to move, but sat instead on the sleeping mat he had vacated. "'Who is going to deliver those?' she asked tartly. The spymaster acknowledged her annoyance by offering a bow made graceless by the encumbrance of the sling. "'Kenji volunteered once already,' he said gently. "'These are the replies to a good morning's work.' As Mara's look warmed toward outrage, Arakasi raised his brows in reproof. You forbade me to go out, and I have not done so. So I see, Mara said. I should have assumed you could feign sleep as well as you shape your disguises. The effects of the wine were quite genuine, Arakasi objected, faintly hurt. He looked at the papers scattered around his knee. You do wish to know what I've learned. Taseo, Mara cut in. He's here. More than that. Arakasi's air of lightness disappeared. Most of the struggles so far have been tactical sparring. Tonight that will change. Entire sections of the palace are being set up as staging areas for large numbers of warriors and assassins. Some prior battles were fought simply to gain quarters from which to launch assaults. Mara looked silently to Lujan, who said, Mistress, our soldiers are still two days away by forced march. We must rely upon the forces we have here to defend you. These words left a difficult silence, through which the arrival of the servant with the lunch tray seemed a clattering alien intrusion. Mara sighed. Harakasi? The spymaster grasped her meaning by instinct. Intelligence will not be necessary. Tasayo is preoccupied with gaining support for his own claim to the warlord's throne. He expects you will throw a coma support to whichever of his opponents is strongest— even if he overestimates your courage and you try to bury your enmity under a show of neutrality, he will still move to obliterate you. Your death would satisfy his family's blood vow to the Red God and additionally throw your allies into disarray. Your popularity is on the rise. To cut you down would bring notice. Perhaps give the Minwanabi enough edge to claim the white and gold over whoever emerges intact from the infighting of the Omechan clan. By now, Mara had recovered her wits. I have a plan. Who else is likely to be attacked tonight? Arakasi did not need to consult any notes. Opara of the Zacatecas and Iliando of the Bonchura seem high on the list. Iliando of the Bonchura? But he's one of Lord Takuma's best friends and an Ionani stalwart. Mara noticed the servant hanging uncertainly by the food trays. 
she motioned for the man to resume his duties. Why would an Ionani lord be singled out as a target? As a warning to the Tonmagu and other Ionani clan lords not to oppose Tasayo or the Omechans, Arakasi supplied. Kevin said, A polite note would be sufficient, I should think. Lujan broke in with dry humour. Killing Lord Iliando is a Sirani polite note. Mara gave the interruption short shrift. She asked Arakasi, Could your contacts get word to the lords you judge to be highest on the Minwanabi's list? I need to ask them for time in council this afternoon. Arakasi reached for his pen. He dipped the nib, slipped a sheet of fresh parchment under his splint and said, You will loan me Kenji and two warriors for the task. Without looking up between lines, he added, They need only go to the city and leave the notes with a certain sandal maker in the river stalls. From there, the deliveries will be accomplished by other hands. Mara closed her eyes as though she suffered from a headache. You can have the use of half my company if you need them. To Kevin, she added, See what Jikan has ready for us to eat. We must be back in council shortly. While the Midkemian moved off to investigate the trays, Lujan left to review the state of his garrison. Have the men rest, he instructed his patrol leaders. Tonight we shall fight. When Kevin returned with a plate and juice, he found Mara still motionless on the mat. Her brows were gathered into a frown, her gaze distantly intense. Are you all right? Mara focused on him as he laid the meal by her knees. I'm just tired. She looked at the food without interest. And worried. Kevin heaved an exaggerated sigh. God, I'm glad to hear you say that. Mara smiled at his japery. Why? Because I'm scared senseless. Kevin stuck a two-tined Sirani fork through a slab of cold jigabird as if he skewered an enemy. It's good to know you're human under all that hard-boiled Sirani stoicism. When I set out to do something foolhardy, the last thing I feel is complacent. From the next room came the rasp of warriors sharpening laminated hide swords. That sound makes me want to commit suicide, Kevin added. He looked at Arakasi, who worked over his notes with economical lack of nerves. Don't you ever want to throw something? The spymaster looked up utterly bland. A knife, he said, with ice-cold lack of inflection. Through Tasayo of the Minwanabi's black heart. He was unarmed, bandaged, a man in tired clothes writing letters in a crowded apartment. But at that moment, through chills, Kevin could not have said which was the more dangerous, Tasayo of the Minwanabi or the man who served Mara as spymaster. Warriors stood at the ready. The rooms of the Akoma apartment had become an armed camp, with fourteen additional soldiers in the purple and yellow of the Zacatecas joined to the ranks. Lord Hopara had seen sense almost immediately when Mara approached him in council. Having too few warriors to fortify his larger quarters, and with Minwanabi already set against him, he saw no point in standing behind an appearance of neutrality that by morning might see him coldly dead. Some of the Zacatecas garrison had fought in Dastari, and Force Commander Lujan was known to them. Warriors sought old companions or made new as they waited through the first hours of evening. Behind furniture barricades in the central room of the apartment, amid a ring of warriors and the last few cushions and sleeping mats, Mara fretted. They should have been back by now. Hopara swirled a finger in his wine glass to stir up the spices and fruit that had been added in accordance with his taste. Lord Iliando has always been a man to look upon logic with suspicion. Mara resisted an urge to seek Kevin's comfort as the gloom of twilight deepened and the first thuds and cries of distant combat echoed through the corridors outside. 
Against her better wishes, she had granted Arakasi's request to take Kenji and a patrol of five in a final attempt to convince Iliando of the Bontura to see reason. As the muffled clatter of swordplay resounded through the palace, Mara worried that her men had delayed their return until too late. Then came the signal she longed for, a coded knock at the door. Lujan's men swiftly slid barriers aside and lowered the heavy bar. The portal opened, and Kenji hurried in, a force commander in violet and white plumes at his shoulder. "'Thank the gods!' Mara murmured, as more warriors entered, the heavy-set Lord Iliando of the Bonchura in their midst. Last came warriors in a coma green, and after them, at a flat run, Arakasi. He slipped in just as the door was closing, his helm with its patrol leader's badge shadowing a face pale as parchment. Mara left the inner circle of protection to meet him. "'You should not have been running!' She accused her spymaster, aware that his poor colour was solely due to pain. Arakasi bowed. Mistress, it was necessity. The splinted arm under his officer's cloak was flawlessly hidden. No one would think that the warrior before her was not fully able to defend himself. As Mara began to voice recriminations, the spymaster quickly cut in. Lord Iliando was obdurate until at the last we gave him a detailed picture of his own forces, their deployment, and four ways he was vulnerable to attack. He dropped his voice to a whisper. It was his own weakness that convinced him, not our belief that he is the obvious object lesson for Clan Ionani and Lord Tonmargu. Arakasi glanced to the doorway, where warriors replaced the bar and barricades, and the Lord of the Bronchura and his force commander stood in conference with Lujan and Hopara to formulate a combined defence. We were none too soon, the spymaster allowed. His gaze flicked back to Mara. Lord Bontura's apartment was already under assault when I left, and the chests I shoved under the door will not detain his attackers very long. When they find the rooms empty... They will be coming here. At Mara's slight frown, he added, I escaped out the back, through the gardens. She dared not ask how he had climbed walls in his condition. Only his breathlessness told how hard he had run to overtake Lord Iliando's escort. Now, firmly the ruling lady, Mara addressed her spymaster. Get out of that armour! she commanded. Find a servant's robe and hide in the cupboards with the scullions. That's an order, she snapped out as Arakasi drew breath in protest. When this is over, if I am alive, I will have need of your services more than ever. The spymaster bowed. But before he disappeared in the direction of the kitchen, he used his patrol leader's badge to collar a pair of warriors in Bonchura and Acoma colours. Get your master and mistress back into the fortified room and convince them to stay there. Attack will be upon us any moment. Minutes later, the solid ring of axes bit into the outer window frames. Warriors in the rooms on the garden side sprang to the ready, while in the room that faced the corridors, a thundering crash hammered at the barricaded front portal. Lujan shouted, A battering ram! A coma soldiers leaped and threw their weight against the furniture used as shoring, but their efforts availed nothing. The second blow struck. Wood exploded into splinters as furnishings and bar and doors gave way, and the ram burst into the room. The invaders who manned its weight fell forward to allow ranks of swordsmen behind to spring over their backs. The attackers who poured through the breach door wore black. Dark cloth also veiled their faces. As the leader waved his killers onward, Lujan glimpsed the dyed palm that identified a hired assassin of the Hamoi Tong. Then battle closed between his own combined troops and the enemy. Sword met sword with an unnatural belling clang. As Mara's force commander parried and thrust to defend, he realised some of these Tong carried metal swords, a rarity in the Empire. 
Valued beyond measure, such weapons were never risked in combat, despite their deadly ability to cut through laminated Surani armour. A Bonchura warrior went down, pierced through his breastplate. Lujan switched tactics, using his bracer to deflect the stabbing sword point. He called out a warning to his warriors, and two assassins fell before they were six feet into the room. Ordinary blades could not withstand repeated impacts. Metal carved chips from the edges and shattered good resin with cracks. Six Akoma guards went down, and Lujan's men fell back in a race to stop the enemy from gaining the door that connected the outer room to the inner complex. The battle became a two-sided struggle between the doorposts as the remaining Akoma guards, with Bonchura and Zacatecas allies, jammed together to defend the rulers who huddled behind a wall of jumbled furniture. At his lady's side stood Kevin, his eyes on the outside windows in the farthest innermost chamber. The frames bounced and shivered, and plaster cracked from the sills as the axe blows continued from outside. Warriors hammered reinforcements into place, planks ripped at need from screen tracks, shelving and carry boxes. The shoring would delay the invasion only by minutes, and the frontal attackers were gaining. Within minutes of the first assault, the Tong members were joined by an influx of black armoured warriors who carried no house badge or colours. Kevin weighed the odds and decided the barricade of furnishings would not withstand assault from three sides. Tamara, he said, Lady, quickly, move over into that corner. The Lord of the Bonchura watched wide-eyed as she arose and changed her position. You would listen to a barbarian slave. Hapara had better grace. The man speaks sense, Lord Iliando. If we stay, we'll soon be surrounded. The Lord of the Zacatecas moved to join Mara, then glared long and levelly at Iliando, until the fighting edge nearer and the first of the windows gave way. In the instant before more assailants flooded the rear room, the stout older ruler relented. The two lords drew blades and positioned themselves before Mara. Kevin stayed close, but a clear step ahead, enough to move should the need arise. The battle in the outer room intensified. There was no way to guess how many attackers entered through the breached front door. The clack and uncanny clang of metal sword meeting laminate came fast and furious, mingled with horrible cries. Defenders from the inner room rushed in two directions, some to stay the frontal assault and others to stave off the influx of assailants who shoved to gain access through the torn window, while at the second window the axe blows suddenly ceased. Kevin cocked his head. Through the bang and crash of the melee, he heard a faint scrape through the wall at his back. Guards! Someone's found a way into the sleeping chamber! He hesitated then rushed to the screen that gave access to the hall. One lamp burned, washing the corridor in a wavering interplay of shadow and light. Kevin advanced, his bare feet sensed vibrations through the wooden floor. Warriors falling, and the blows of another axe. He hugged the wall by the bedchamber door, waiting, his hand on the meat knife concealed inside his robe. A man in black armour charged through. Kevin swung around. He drove a knee into the man's groin, then stabbed the meat knife through the hollow of the neck beneath the chin strap. Blood ran hot over his hands as he thrust the shuddering, dying body backwards into another man who followed. Both warriors fell with a crash. There were more coming in a wave. Kevin cried, Lujan! Back here! Aware that help might never come, the Midkemian crouched, dagger raised, to meet the black-armoured man who jumped over the fallen pair. Lamplight flickered over a levelled sword too long for a short blade to thrust past, and thrusting too hard to parry. Kevin backstepped into the room. The black warrior lunged. Kevin jumped and all but tumbled over backwards. The sword grazed the cloth over his stomach. Off balance, sure the next strike would kill him, the Midkemian flailed to stab the wrist above the man's sword guard. But the knife grazed flesh and bounced off the enemy's bracer. Kevin gasped a curse, tensing to take the killing blow. Then the Lord of the Zacatecas shoved out of the corner and drove his sword into the man's back. 
The black warrior stiffened. His locked legs skidded across the floorboards, and his eyes rolled back as he collapsed. Another black-clothed assassin charged from the depths of the hall. "'My lord, look out!' Kevin cried. Hopara spun, his guard up, barely in time. The enemy blade did not spit him, but grated edge to edge in a grinding contest of strength. Metal carved the rim of the young lord's chest armour, gouging a groove in the plate. Hopara grimaced in pain. He turned his wrist in a disengage, twisted, and returned a ringing blow to the side of his assailant's head. The unarmoured Tong assassin staggered dizzily back. From the opened hallway dashed more dark-clad enemies. The Lord of the Bonchura threw his stout weight into the fray, and Mara was alone, exposed in the corner. Kevin ducked the swing of swords and crashed into a black-armoured elbow. His hand on the meat knife was slick with blood. His grip slipped as he stabbed. The enemy fell writhing between him and his lady. Then a pair of axes bit through wooden bracing and the shutters behind Kevin burst inward. Plaster puffed from the wall as the heavy panels struck and rebounded to be bashed back again by dyed fists. More Tong assassins in black clothing swarmed through. Unencumbered by armour, they leaped to the sill, swords drawn from scabbards in one fluid motion. Kevin grasped the lead man's wrist. The sword descended. He ducked sideways and jerked mightily. The assassin catapulted through the window. Both men overbalanced. In the rolling tumble as they struck the floor, Kevin's short knife held the advantage. He stabbed before the enemy could turn his longer weapon. Dead man and slave hammered hard into the barrier of furniture. Impact jammed the meat knife into the corpse's sternum. Kevin yanked with futile result, then abandoned the blade and snatched the sword from dying fingers. Spinning on his feet cat fast, Kevin brought up the sword. Blade struck blade, deflecting a cut coming fast at his neck. A ringing clang met the impact, not the dull thud he expected. Kevin laughed aloud. He held a metal blade. The gods knew how, on this world that had no oars, but this was a weapon he knew. Kevin lashed out with the strange sword and quickly found its balance. Long as a broadsword but finely made, the blade handled with murderous ease despite the slightly curved edge. The first man Kevin engaged stumbled back in confusion before this alien slave who knew his way with the sword. Then the eyes behind the black mask narrowed. The assassin recovered poise and fought back. Slammed by a fast reach and practised parries, Kevin realised he faced an equal weapon and an opponent of greater skill. Then a green-clad warrior was at his side, and another sword was harrying the assassin's flank. Shoulder to shoulder, slave and a coma soldier beat the tongue back toward the hall. The man had a sword arm like lightning. Parry after parry, he deflected the strokes that sought his life. The Akoma warrior missed his footing and staggered a half-step sideways. A weighted cord snapped through the splintered window and circled his unarmoured throat. He dropped his sword, fingers clawing at his neck as he strangled. As he buckled and crashed to his knees, the Tong assassin, who had wielded the throwing garrote, leaped through. A second Akoma warrior and another in Bonchura colours charged to take him. Alone and beaten backwards by his original foe, Kevin skidded helplessly to the side. Luck favoured him. The assassin mired a heel in a cushion flung from somewhere. He slipped and Kevin took him in a thrust under the armpit. The Midkemian yanked his blade clear. He cast about and saw the Lord of the Bonchura backed against the wall by a black warrior. The stout man somehow warded off a stroke that should have killed him, as the next one surely would. Not so fast as the assassin, the lord was still deadly quick. Kevin rushed the black-armoured warrior and struck him full from behind. Metal slid through laminated armour with a slap like a melon being punctured. The enemy died choking on blood. Kevin leaped clear and came to stand before Mara, sword at the ready. Hopara had stationed himself by the window. A wad of blood-sodden black lay jammed across the sill, the most recent assassin who tried to enter. 
Breathing hard and running with sweat, Kevin took stock. An insane three-way battle raged in the tiny apartment. Knots of black warriors and robed Hamoy Tong thrashed and strained and wrestled to tear down beleaguered defenders. A Tong assassin broke free of the fray, spied Mara and snapped a hand to his belt sash. A knife was going to follow, Kevin knew with a rise of the hair at his nape. Even as the assassin moved to throw, the Midkemian had a handful of Mara's robe. He let himself collapse and his weight dragged her down, just as the assassin let fly. The knife thudded into the wall, kicking up grains of burst plaster. Kevin felt a yank at his shirt. He saw the pinned fold of his robe, then felt his left arm slung up at an awkward angle. Mara lay beneath him, gasping for breath against the press of his weight. The assassin saw his opening. He leaped in, and his raised sword flicked shadow across both victims' faces. Kevin twisted, cloth tore with a scream as he threw his sword point-first at the assassin. The blade caught the man in the stomach. He doubled, slammed to his knees, and pitched forward. The sword flew from his hand and skidded to stab into the skirting board. Kevin freed the last shred of his robe, then jerked the still quivering blade from the wood. He reached his feet just as another assassin shouldered through the window and bounded into the room. Kevin's stroke decapitated him in mid-air. The corpse slammed down, spraying blood, while the head bounced with a sick, wet thump across the floor. The head rolled on and slapped into a black-armoured warrior who charged through the rear doorway. Kevin spun to meet him. The warrior hesitated only an instant, then levelled his weapon at Kevin. The mid braced for the sword blow, but belatedly realised the man would not cross blades with the slave. In bull-mad Surani outrage, he chose to use his armoured bulk to smash an upstart barbarian to a pulp. Too late, Kevin tried to sidestep. The enemy rammed him, knocking breath from his lungs and driving him backwards into the gloom of the hall. His back met heaving bodies. A vicious struggle raged between an invading mass of Tong and Lujan's most disciplined defenders. Kevin rolled left as the heavily armoured warrior crashed atop him. Half crushed by his opponent's sword arm and aware by a repeated jerk beneath his flank that he had managed to fall on the flat of his enemy's blade, Kevin struggled. He could not win free and his own sword and hand were pinned against the wall. But... Neither could the other man succeed in grappling his weapon back. The warrior had no choice but to let go of the hilt and slam ineffectively at the slave's exposed face. Kevin tried to chop at the man's neck, but his efforts won him only a skinned elbow. Then Kevin saw his opening. He threw his weight into his assailant and rolled him onto his back. Pulling upward, Kevin dragged his arm across the man's throat. The sword followed, slicing deep. Throat strap, gristle and cartilage parted. The warrior thrashed and died. Buffeted by other fighters, Kevin extricated himself from the corpse. He ducked an assassin, raced back into the main room and tried to locate Mara. Hopara battled an armoured man by the furniture barricade. A Hamoy assassin was besting the fatigued Lord of the Bonchura. Kevin slashed the man's black-clothed flank and stepped past. Mara was nowhere to be seen. Leaving Lord Iliando to dispatch the wounded assassin, Kevin raced into the hallway that connected the suite to the garden. Two rooms proved empty. A corpse twitched in the third. Another black-armoured soldier stared with blank eyes from the bed. Kevin all but hurled himself through the screen into the last room. There, he found Mara backed against a wall holding a dagger, her robes spattered with fresh blood. His panic found no time for outcry. Two men in black armour were closing in, leaving her no gap to flee. One man showed a nasty cut on his sword arm. Already Mara had taught them to treat her with respect. An animal cry of outrage erupted from Kevin as he surged into the room. The first warrior died before he had time to turn. The second back to half-step, then stiffened as Mara drove her dagger into the gap between neck and helm. Kevin spun left, then right, seeking the presence of more opponents. A warm weight crashed into his chest. Mara. 
She did not weep, but simply clung inside the circle of his arm, trembling with fear and exhaustion. He held her tightly, his sword still angled to fight. But from the hallway the sounds of struggle had lessened. The crack and clang of sword strokes ended in a scraping thump, and silence descended, ringingly strange after the din of chaos and death. Kevin let out a pent-up breath. He lowered his dripping blade, stroked Mara's hair with fingers that were hardly less sticky, and noticed the sting of cuts and grazes that had passed unnoticed in the action. After a moment, a call came from the outer rooms. Mistress! Mara licked dry lips, swallowed, and forced herself to speak. Here, Lujan. The Akoma force commander burst into the chamber, snapped to a stop and said, Mistress. His relief was a tangible wave. Are you injured? Belatedly, Mara regarded her smeared and spattered clothing. Her hands, even her cheeks, were covered with blood. She still held the knife in slippery fingers. She dropped it in distaste and absently dragged her knuckles on her soiled robe. I am all right. Someone fell on me. This is a dead man's blood. As if aware that she still clung like a child to her slave, she released her hold and straightened. I'm all right. Sickened by the thick stink of death, Kevin stepped to the window. The frame was a savaged mass of splinters, and across the garden he could see a gaping hole in the brick wall. They came from the next door apartment, he said dully. That's why there were so many pouring in from the rear. Lujan held a sword out for Mara's inspection. Some of the assassins carried steel. Gods! exclaimed Mara. That is the blade of a dynasty! She examined the weapon more carefully and frowned. But it bears a plain hilt. No clan or house markings. She gestured briskly toward the passage. Have your men inspect the dead. See if any more such blades are found. What's the significance? Kevin pushed away from the ruined sill and lent his arm to Mara, who still seemed to be shaking. He steered her gently around the fallen and into the corridor beyond. A step ahead, Lujan answered, Few true steel swords exist in the Empire. Each house that traces lineage back to the dawn of our history owns one, or is rumoured to. Only the master of the house, the ruling lord, has access to such a blade. They are priceless, second only to the Natami in importance to a house's honour. Mara agreed. There is an Akoma family sword that was my father's before me, and that I hold in trust for Ayaki. It is a rare weapon of steel. They reached the juncture of the corridor and the blood-soaked central room. Already Akoma warriors worked to clear the floor of the dead. Five more steel swords lay lined up against one wall, with Kevin's bringing the number to six. These were found among the dead assassins, Force Commander. Lujan looked upon the blades in awe. Where can they have come from? Minwanabi? asked Kevin. The lords of the Zacatecas and the Bonchura entered from the front chamber, both as blood-streaked as Mara, but little the worse for wear. Drawn by the glint of steel in the flickering lamplight, they also examined the weapons. Kevin drew his blade clean between a fold of his slave robe. This is new he said quietly. It still bears faint marks from the grinder's wheel and the stamp of the armourer's mallet. He inspected it closely one last time and added, It bears no maker's mark. All eyes turned to the slave. Iliando inflated his chest in the beginnings of offence, but Hopara's curiosity forestalled his response. Who has the skill to make ancient weapons? Kevin shrugged. Among my people, the art is commonplace. Any one of a dozen good smiths would be able to duplicate this, I think. Unwilling to be shown up as graceless by a younger lord, Iliando lifted a blade and stiffly offered comment. It's sharp, 
but I think not so finely fashioned as the ones made by our ancestors. These could be copies made with inferior metals. But where would a man get such wealth? asked Hopara. My world? suggested Kevin. The lords exchanged glances. The stouter one taken aback by the slave's forthright manner. Yet no one interrupted as Kevin said, After a battle, your warriors pick up swords and armour as spoils. Someone gets his hands on enough iron and a good smith then shows them one of your ancestral blades. He made a pass with the weapon. Say he duplicates it. This blade is not so unlike those used by the Hadati mountain people in my homeland. A smith from Yarbon could forge its like, and there could easily be such a captive working for one of your lords. Minwanabi, said Mara, her voice almost splitting over the name. All metals taken across the rift as spoils are property of the Empire. Some sent as tribute to the temples, some to the Imperial Treasury, and the rest to pay the upkeep of the army upon Midkemia. But the collection is overseen by the warlord, and in his absence, his sub-commander. Tasayo served in that post for five years. That's ample time for a man without scruples to divert contraband resources back to his cousin's estates. Mara's tone grew reflective. Or to his own estate, for his private use. Iliando's heavy features showed distaste. If every assassin carried one, the price of this one attack is incredible. For a raid in the Imperial Palace? Hopara interjected. I would wager five times this many swords would be needed. He regarded the red-stained floorboards. No guarantee of success, and every man expected to die. No, Tasayo is the logical one to have hired the tongue. Then, said Kevin, kicking the helm of a fallen black warrior with his toe, who sent this lot? Hopara sank tiredly down on an unstained corner of a bed mat. He regarded his sword, the edge of which was chewed with chips and the tip long since delaminated. Whoever it was, their day's work was a blessing. The assassins and these warriors caused each other great confusion. I don't know if we could have withstood the Hamoi Tong alone. Mara crossed the floor and sat next to the young man. Exhaustion made her sigh. Good men won the day for us, my lord. You have done your house proud. Lord Iliando glanced significantly at Kevin, who yet held one of the metal blades. The gods will find ill in this. A slave! But Lujan cracked out an interruption. I saw nothing. The heavyset lord turned toward Mara, incensed at her force commander's rudeness. She gave him back his stare with bland eyes. I saw nothing untoward, my lord of the Bonchura. Iliando heaved in a great breath, but it was Hopara who stepped in with diplomacy. You speak, I believe, of a blade that saved your life. The lord of the Bonchura reddened. He cleared his throat, stabbed a glance at Kevin, then shrugged stiffly. I saw nothing, he allowed grudgingly. For here, in the Akoma apartments, when Akoma guards had died to spare him, to contradict the word of a lady and her guest was to insult Mara's honour. Kevin grinned. He held out his bloodied blade to Lujan, who accepted the offering with a flatly impassive face. Quick to ease the tension, Mara said, My lords, it would be appropriate if you each took two of the swords as spoils of war. I plan on awarding worthy soldiers with the others as a token of esteemed service. The lords bowed their heads, for her gift was a magnanimous gesture. Opara smiled. Your generosity is without precedent, Lady Mara. The lord of the Bonchura nodded, and by the flash of his eyes, as he considered the enormous gain in wealth, 
Mara knew greed had won him. Kevin's transgression would be overlooked. Let us clear these floors of honourless garbage, Mara added to Lujan. The surviving warriors went to work. Scabbards were gathered up and swords sheathed as the dead were examined for any clue that might prove who had ordered the assaults. None was found. Tongs earned their pay through anonymity. The black-clothed assassins bore only the blue flower tattoo of the Hamoy Tong and the traditionally red-stained hands. The black-armoured soldiers were devoid of any common marking at all. When Lujan was satisfied nothing incriminating would be found, he had men dump the bodies out the back screen into the garden. Then he set squads of warriors to re-barricade the windows and doors with whatever materials were available, and to see to the care of his wounded. A soldier brought Lady Mara a bowl of scented water and a cloth. My lady! Mara dabbed at her face and hands, dismayed by the mess that soon discoloured the basin. In the morning, I must have the services of my maid. She looked up at the soldier. You do well enough, gently, but tomorrow I will need more than the mercies of good warriors to make myself presentable for counsel. Lord Hapara laughed at the remark, surprised that a woman of such dainty stature should have the fibre to look beyond the harrowing horror of the past hour. I begin to see what my father admired in you, he started and paused as a strange crawling sensation visited everyone in the room. Kevin whipped round, empty hands groping for the sword he no longer held. A glance at Lujan showed the force commander also peering into shadows, seeking the source of this unnameable dread. Then came a faint hissing sound, like the release of steam from a cookpot. All in the room found their eyes drawn to the floor, where a moat of green light burned into existence. The staunchest of warriors instinctively cringed back, and those who wore weapons reached for swords. The glow intensified until it outshone the single lamp. Eyes burned and teared at the brilliance, and a fey energy raised the hair on everyone's arms. Magic! hissed Lord Bonchura, the widened whites of his eyes stained sickly green by the dazzle. The speck brightened and swelled, then smeared to a sinuous form that twisted and undulated in the air. No one was able to move, for the effect of the light was hypnotic. The phenomenon coalesced into a horrible glowing apparition. Scintillating eyes appeared, and a wedge-shaped head and a deadly tapered tail writhed against the floor. Under his breath, Hopara said, Arelli. Kevin knew the poisonous snake of Kelowan, but this surpassed the biggest river viper he had ever seen. Fully two feet in length, the serpent shimmered with a green incandescence that cast an evil glow over every object in the room. The creature slithered forward a few inches, its head slightly raised, and its forked tongue flickering from armoured jaws to taste the air. Kevin glanced at Lujan, who gripped his sheathed weapon in taut fingers. Yet even a gifted swordsman could not draw from the scabbard and expect to strike before the serpent. Still on the mat, barely breathing, Mara whispered, Don't move anyone. As if the sound of her voice keyed response, a low buzz shook the air. The serpent's head snapped toward the Lady of the Acoma. Its eyes brightened and seemed eerily to shine through the body of the soldier who knelt between the basin by his knees and one hand raised to bathe his mistress's face. The magical apparition writhed to one side. The slanted head twisted toward Mara and its tail whipped suddenly into a coil. The head rose and arched back. Lujan nodded to Kevin, who took a slow, soundless step back. Permitted room to swing, the force commander snapped his wrist. His blade sang free of its scabbard and descended edge on toward the creature's neck. Yet, against an arcane summoning, no man could move undetected. The snake-like creature arose until it towered to full height. Then it struck, blindingly fast. Lujan's sword sliced air, and Mara cried out in shock. 
The warrior by her side flung his body across hers, and the basin flooded water across the floor. The glowing apparition missed its mark. Fangs like arrows pierced through hide armour with no more resistance than cloth. The wedge-shaped head followed, vanishing into the warrior's body like liquid sucked through a hole, and the sickly illumination poured after. For an instant, the room crawled with shadow. Then the warrior screamed. His hands worked and clenched in agony, and his eyes began to glow greenly. The illumination brightened, spilling across his skin in a flood that burned, then blazed, then dazzled. The room held nothing of darkness. Then flesh itself began to pucker and crumple. The whites of the man's eyes swelled and collapsed, and his teeth glittered emerald in gums that smouldered and turned black. Hopara and Iliando shrank away in voiceless terror. Mara sat frozen, as if the spell held her rooted. Only Kevin, driven by love, found the will to react. He stepped aside, reached past the shining flesh that now thrashed in mindless torment, and caught Mara's upper arm. With a tortured cry of effort, he half-lifted, half-dragged her beyond reach of the shrieking warrior. Then he flung his own body before hers. Lujan found his reflexes. His sword spun down in an expert stroke and silenced the harrowing screams. Smoke puffed from the corpse and the green glow flickered and vanished. Ordinary gloom flooded back, full darkness held off by the flame of one guttering lamp. Openly shaking, the Lord of the Bonchura made a sign against evil. A magician wishes your death, Lady Mara. That thing sought you out by the sound of your voice. Kevin wiped sweating hands on his robe, forgetful that the cloth was already sodden. He shook his head. I think not. Lord Bonchura looked irritated at the contradiction, but Mara raised herself from the floorboards without offence. Why? The Midkemian looked back at her, his blue eyes level. If a black robe wanted you dead, you would be, and no effort of ours could have spared you. Just one of those lightning globes we saw at the games tossed in here would make an end of things. But if someone wanted to scare the hell out of you as a warning, a slow snake would turn the trick nicely. Snake? said Mara. Then comprehension dawned as she pulled her arms around her knees in a huddle. You mean the Relly? Yes, perhaps you are correct. There is another possibility. Hopara offered, blotting sweat from his brow with the back of one wrist. Lesser magicians and priests can work magic, and, unlike any member of the assembly, they might be susceptible to bribes. Who? Kevin fought to keep the shiver of reaction from his voice. Who would have the means? Hopara regarded the corpse left dead by the spell, its lips pulled back in a haunting rictus of pain. If a man could consign a nation's wealth to the Hamoi Tong to buy assassins, might he not also stoop to paying off the priests of a powerful temple or hire the services of a renegade lesser magician? Do you accuse Minwanabe? said Iliando, his ham hands still clenched in his sleeves. Perhaps. Or else the party who sent us the soldiers in black... Papara surged to his feet, as if further stillness might burn him. Armoured, blood-streaked, and left haggard by stress, he looked the image of Chipino. We may know tomorrow, if we survive to return to council. No one spoke. Chapter 19 Warlord Four more attacks came. Throughout the night, the Akoma soldiers and their allies endured assaults by dark warriors without house badges. The Hamoi tongue troubled them no more, but the armoured soldiers came in waves. On the last influx, the defenders were forced to retreat into the small back bedroom that had no outside door. Jammed in the narrow area, they beat back enemies who sallied from the hall and others who pressed for entry through the shattered window. 
Kevin stationed himself before Mara at all times and fought like a man possessed. By the third attack, almost no one remained without injuries. The most tradition-bound Sirani was too tired to look twice at the red-headed, loud-mouthed barbarian as he rested with sword and shield in hand after the latest struggle. His blade had stood ground with the best warriors and let the gods determine the fate of a slave who refused to know his place. While the night wore on and men died, no hand that could still grip a weapon could be spared. After the fourth attack, Kevin could barely move. His arms ached with fatigue and his knees shook uncontrollably. When the last black warrior fell under his sword, his legs folded and he hunkered on the floor, while the nervous energy that had sustained him drained away. Mara brought him a cup of water, and he laughed at the reversal of roles. He drank deeply as she moved on to tend to the others able to drink. Kevin surveyed the carnage. The floor, the cushions, the walls, every cranny of the chamber glistened red, and hacked bodies lay sprawled in grotesque positions. The once pleasant room now looked like some nightmare charnel house. Of the thirty Akoma soldiers and two dozen Zacatecas and Bonchura who had joined the ranks the night before, only ten Akoma, five Zacatecas and three Bonchura warriors stood. The rest lay slain or wounded between heaps of black-clad corpses that no one had energy left to clear. Dully, Kevin said, We must have killed a hundred of them. Perhaps more! Called from the pantry cupboard by necessity, Arakasi knelt beside the slave. The sling that supported his arm was splashed red, and the dagger in his left hand seemed glued to his fingers with gore. Kevin inclined his head. Doesn't that hurt? Arakasi glanced at the splinted arm and nodded. Of course it hurts. He looked out the door. Morning is almost here. If they are to come one last time, it will be soon. Kevin heaved himself to his feet. He would have dropped his sword, could he have done so without cutting his ankles. Bone-tired and shivering from stress, he crossed unsteadily to where Mara knelt, comforting Hopara's wounded force commander. She looked up at Kevin's approach. She looked painfully thin by the light of the one lamp left burning, her eyes too large in her pale face, and one of her hands was scraped raw across the knuckles. Are you all right? Kevin asked. She nodded absently as she struggled against weariness to rise. So much... waste, she said at last. Somehow Kevin mustered the will to hold out a hand and pull her to her feet. Don't let the others hear you, my love. They'll drum you out of the council for unsurani attitudes. Mara was too beaten to manage even the ghost of a smile. You're not safe in here, he added. We'll get one of the servants to bring Hopara's officer along. Mara shook her head. Too late. She buried her face in the sweaty hollow of her lover's neck. Kevin looked down and saw that the Zacatecas force commander had ceased to breathe. The quiet strength and leadership that had kept men on the march through the burning sands of Tsubar were only a memory now. God, he was a grand soldier. Kevin guided his lady back to the small room that had proven the most defensible. There, Lujan, two warriors, and Mara's remaining house staff were trying to clear away bodies. Those loyal soldiers who had fallen were carried to another bedroom, waiting a time for honourable cremation, while the black armoured corpses were kicked or rolled through the outer screen into a heap in the garden. Mara leaned into Kevin. I don't think I shall ever get the stink of this room out of my nose. Clumsy with weariness, Kevin stroked her hair. The reek of a battlefield is not easily forgotten. A crash from the outer doorway echoed through the apartment. Lashima! They won't stop! 
cried Hapara in a note of desperation. Lord Iliando stood hunched over his sword, wheezing painfully, while Lujan signalled two soldiers to take position close to their lady. Then the Akoma force commander shouldered into the corridor, Kevin hard on his heels. There were no longer enough able-bodied defenders for him to hang back beside Mara. As he stepped into the gloom of the hallway, a voice soft as velvet touched his ears. Don't worry for her. Just fight as you can, Kevin of Zun. The barbarian managed to nod over his shoulder at the still presence of Arakasi. Then a pair of black soldiers were bursting through the makeshift barricade Zacatecas' men had raised in the hall. Kevin charged, while to one side more enemies shoved at the debris that blocked an adjoining doorway. A man could not think, but only react by reflex. Kevin lashed out, feeling the jar as his metal blade sliced into the arm of an enemy. Another foe took his place. The pressure of attack did not ease. Slash, backstep, slash again. Kevin moved by ingrained instinct. He was aware of Lujan at his side, and somebody else shouting curses in monotone. Then the warriors at the side door smashed through the rubble, and defenders started dying. Somebody went down under Kevin's feet, and he stumbled, caught from a tumble by the blood-slippery hands of a Bonchura warrior. He could only nod swift thanks, for another assailant was upon him. Crazily, he wondered where in the Empire anyone had found so many sets of black armour. Or had somebody just lacquered over house colours to loose such an army against them? The attackers stormed into the first chamber as the defenders flagged. Numbers prevailed. Lujan and his last survivors were driven back and back, and yet they were not beaten. The Surani possessed mulish courage, and they gave no ground freely in retreat. Kevin felled a black warrior. Behind, an exhausted lord of the Zacatecas helped the lord of the Bonchura into the second chamber. The heavier man was battling for air, and one leg appeared to be dragging. Kevin felt desperation close around his chest. But the ugly, fearful vision of Mara with a sword through her heart hardened his resolve to keep going. He spun, raised his sword, and attacked with reborn fury. The interval gained the two lords enough time to make their escape. Another pair of live bodies between Mara and death, thought Kevin with callous practicality. He almost laughed as he recalled Arakasi's words of encouragement. His sword rose and fell, parried and thrust. The fury was gone now, only the pain of exhaustion remained. Then his shoulder slammed against a door jam and his clumsy misjudgment cost. An enemy sword scored his ribs. He hacked it away, metal hammering, brittle laminate. The black warrior's sword shattered at the grip. Kevin shoved steel into the man's stark, surprised face, then stumbled over a body and landed on one knee inside the door. Too slowly, Kevin recovered. A black soldier leaped behind him, turning a backhanded blow upon the barbarian's unarmoured back. Pain burned his skin, but a fast parry from Lujan cracked the sword away. Kevin whirled and delivered a heavy-handed thrust to the stomach. The enemy folded. Beyond stood Arakasi, a sword clutched in his left hand as a boy might threaten with a club. I you all right? Kevin gasped. Hurts like hell, but I'll live. Against a pearl-grey light that filtered through gaping screens, he saw black warriors massed for a charge down the corridor. He bit back another crazy laugh. Did I say live? Behind grunts of effort from Lujan and the bang and hammer of swords sounded warning. Once again, foes had breached the wall between Mara's quarters and the next-door apartment. Kevin muttered, guard this door, and raced to reach Mara's location. There, two Akoma soldiers stood at bay, their mistress behind them, while a half-dozen dark warriors pressed to overwhelm them. Hoarsely, Kevin shouted, you bastards! He threw himself against the rearmost. The men he struck carried forward into those ahead. Legs tangled and sword arms flailed, and the whole mass tumbled to the floor. Kevin slid and rolled on the slick floor, forcing fatigued muscles to respond one more time and one more time again. 
he came up sword foremost and staggered a step. Three foes yet survived the sally. Kevin hamstrung the nearest, another he hacked across the back of the neck, and the blow carried barely enough force to wound. As the Tuacoma soldiers rallied to kill the last attackers, Mara cried out, Kevin, behind you! Kevin spun, peripherally aware that the hamstrung man had a knife. That one he had to leave to fate, because a sword sang down at his head. He jerked right, caught a foot upon the outflung leg of a dead man, and crashed hard into the corpse. The attacker's sword carved a glancing line along his upper left arm. Howling with anger at the pain, Kevin twisted. His blade caught the dark warrior just above the groin. He shook blood out of his eyes. One of the Akoma soldiers jumped to his side, a foot raised in a thrust against the dying man's shield. The enemy crashed back, thrashing into the narrow hallway, hampering another dark warrior behind him. Kevin gasped a searing breath. Gods, there's more of them! He struggled to stand against a terrible ringing noise. Trumpets, he realised dully. His back was aflame and his left arm dangled. Wetness dripped off his fingers. Still he staggered upright and dragged after the first Tacoma soldier toward the outer door. At his back, one last man waited, sword poised in protection before Mara. Kevin managed a lopsided smile of farewell before he stumbled into the hall. The end was upon them. Lujan, Arakasi, Hopara, Bontura, all were nowhere to be found, though sounds of struggle issued from the second bedchamber. Without outside help, their numbers were too depleted for them to survive. As he reached the last doorway, Kevin sighted two soldiers in black armour fleeing out of the hole in the wall toward the garden. Their rush struck him as funny, but tears came instead of laughter. Again a trumpet sounded, louder. Then the apartment was silent, save for the groan of a wounded warrior and, from somewhere, the laboured wheeze of the Lord of the Bonchura. Lujan stumbled out of a doorway, his helm gone and blood streaming down his face from a scalp wound. He gave a silly grin at Kevin and rocked to an exhausted halt. The Emperor is here. Those trumpets are the garrison of the palace. The Imperial Whites have returned. Kevin collapsed where he stood, and only the wall that banged his shoulder prevented him from hitting the floor. Lujan sank down beside him. A nasty cut on his temple bled freely, and his armour was hacked to scraps. Kevin uncramped his fingers from his sword, groped after a shredded cushion, and used that to staunch the flow of blood. Hopara stumbled out of the bedchamber door, Lord Iliando leaning on his arm. But Kevin had eyes only for Mara. As weary as the rest, she came to kneel by his side and said, The Emperor. Before Lujan found his voice, a pair of white-clad warriors marched smartly through the door. One of them demanded loudly, Who claims this place? Mara drew herself erect, her hair in tangles and her robe smudged scarlet. She recovered a lady's haughty poise. I, Mara of the Akoma, this is my apartment. The lords of the Zacatecas and Bonchura are my guests. If the imperial warrior found anything incongruous in her choice of terms, he made no comment. Lady... He addressed her in formal tones, his brows raised as he glanced around at the carnage. My lords, the light of heaven commands all house rulers to attend the high council at noon. I shall attend, Mara replied. Without another word, the imperial whites reeled around and departed. Kevin thumped his head back against the wall. Tears of exhaustion ran down his face. Oh, I could sleep for months. Mara touched his face almost sorrowfully. There is no time. To Lujan she said, Find where Jikan is hiding and send him to our townhouse for clean clothing. 
He must also bring back maids and servants. This place must be cleansed, and I must be ready in full formal attire by noon. Kevin closed his eyes, savouring one blessed moment of peace. No matter how tired he was, a long, trying day lay before Mara. Where she went, he was bound by his love to go with her. Pulling himself to his feet, he opened his eyes and motioned to an equally exhausted Akoma warrior. Come on, let's start fertilising the garden. The pillow cloth pressed to his head, Lujan motioned for the soldier to comply. Kevin had but a step to go to find the first corpse, which he gripped under the arms. As the warrior hefted the feet and the pair of them stumbled awkwardly to the screen with their burden, Kevin observed... Too bad it wasn't more of those Hamoy assassins. At least then we wouldn't have to lug armour. Lujan shook his head slightly, but a faint smile showed his appreciation of Kevin's strange view of life. After hours of bustling preparations, Mara emerged from an apartment cleared of dead and debris. Her hair was washed and bound back under a jewelled headdress, and formal robes brought from her townhouse flowed down to slippers unspattered with blood. Her honour guard wore trappings borrowed at need from the house garrison, and Lujan's officer's plumes nodded proudly from his helm, still damp, but at least rinsed clean since the battle. If braces and flowing cloaks hid scabs and bandages, and if the walk of the warriors was on the stiff side of correct, Mara judged the honour of the Akoma remained unblemished by their appearance as she approached the entrance to the High Council chambers. Imperial White stood guard in the hallways, and a troop of ten was stationed before the portal. There, Mara's party was signalled to halt. Ready! one of the soldiers commanded, with scant sign of deference. The light of heaven permits you to enter with but one soldier, lest more bloodshed defile his palace. Mara could only bow before an imperial edict. After an instant of swift thought, she inclined her head to Lujan. Return to our quarters and await my summons. Then, from the ranks of her guard, she signalled to Arakasi to stand forth. The splint beneath his right bracer might decrease his advantage as a fighter, but she did not wish to be without his counsel. And, after the past night, even if a lord was rash enough to try violence in the presence of the Emperor's guard, Kevin had proved he could handle the sword in Arakasi's scabbard. Yet, as Mara also waved her body slave from her retinue, the guard put up a restraining hand. One soldier only, my lady. Mara returned a disdainful look. Do slave robes look like armour today? Her eyes narrowed, and with all the arrogance she could muster, she added, I will not subject an honourably wounded warrior to the duties of a common runner. When I need to send for my escort, the slave will be needed to carry my orders. The guard hesitated, and Mara swept past before he could rally and offer argument. Kevin forced himself to follow without a glance back, lest unsubservient behaviour precipitate a quick change of mind about his worthiness to be admitted. The hall seemed sparsely populated after the previous day, and those lords present were considerably more subdued. Mara acknowledged a few greetings as she moved to her seat, her eyes busy between times taking stock of empty places. To Arakasi she murmured, At least five Omechan lords are absent. The instant she settled in her chair, a flurry of activity commenced. A dozen notes were placed before her by soldiers who simply bowed and left without waiting for reply. Mara scanned each quickly, then handed the papers to Arakasi, who put them in his tunic without a glance. We have gained, she said in amazement. She pointed to an area that had stayed empty throughout the previous week. Now, elaborately robed nobles were arriving to take their seats with warriors that looked untouched by combat. The Blue Wheel Party is among us. 
Arakasi nodded. Lord Kamatsu of the Shinzawai comes to bargain with others, gaining whatever advantage Lord Keda can command. He and Lord Zanwai will do little more than keep their party from deserting wholesale in the first ten minutes. Mara glanced at the company, seeking the familiar face of Hokanu. Only one soldier wore Shinzawai blue, and he was a stranger, wearing the high plume of a force commander. Obviously, the heir to the Shinzawai estate was no longer permitted to come where he would be at risk. Mara felt disappointed. A hush fell over the room as the two highest-ranking lords entered last. Aksantuka, now lord of the Waxatukan, stepped down to his chair roughly the same moment as Tasayo. Both walked with haughty bearing, as if they were the only men of consequence in the room. Neither one so much as glanced in the direction of his major opponent. As soon as each candidate was seated, a number of lords stood up and moved as if to confer with either Tasayo or Aksantuka. Each would halt a moment, as if exchanging a quick greeting, then return to his chair. Kevin asked, What are they doing? Voting upon the office of warlord, answered Arakasi. By this act, each lord confirms his allegiance to the claimant he prefers to wear the white and gold. Those who are undecided, his hand swept the room, watch and choose. Kevin looked down and observed that Mara closely measured the play of the great game. When do you go to Aksatukan? Not yet. Mara's brow furrowed as she studied the order of nobles who moved across the floor to either the Lord of the Waxatukan or the Lord of the Minwanabi. Then, for no reason that was apparent to foreign eyes, Mara abruptly rose and descended the stairs. She crossed the lower floor as if heading toward Tasayo. A hush fell over the room. All eyes watched the slender woman as she mounted the stairs toward the Minwanabi chair. Then she turned, and in three short strides came alongside the seat of Hopara of the Zacatecas. She spoke briefly to him and returned to her place. Kevin whispered, What was that? Could the boy take the office? Arakasi said, It's a ploy. Several other lords moved to speak to Hopara, and soon it was clear that no other claimant would declare himself. Kevin quickly calculated in his head and said, It's roughly equal. A quarter for Minwanabi, a quarter for Waxatukan, a quarter for Zacatecas, and a quarter yet undecided. For a long, quiet moment no one moved. Lords sat in their finery and looked about, or spoke to advisers or servants. Then another lord here or there would rise and move to one of the three claimants. After a few moments, another pair would rise and make their preference known. Then Kevin said, Wait! That lord in the feathered headdress spoke to Minwanabi before. Now he's speaking to Aksatukan. Mara nodded. The balance shifts back and forth. The afternoon wore slowly on. As bars of sunlight moved across the high expanse of the dome, the High Council continued the strange custom that determined primacy among ruling lords of the Empire. Twice Mara rose to speak with Lord Zacatecas, showing that her support for the young man was unshaken. Then, as evening approached, Mara nodded at some unseen signal. The next moment, both she and Lord Hopara rose. As one, they moved from their different vantage points and arrived before the chair of Aksantuka. A rustle swept the chamber. Suddenly, another score of nobles left their places and advanced to stand before the Amechan lord. Then Mara returned to her seat and said, Now. Kevin saw her eyes move to where Tasayo sat. The lord of the Minwanabi returned a look of such pure malevolence that Kevin felt chills touch his skin. By now his wounds ached, and his robes itched, and every bruise acquired the night before made standing a trial of endurance. 
As Kevin wondered how much longer the council could drag on without resolution, the climate in the hall changed suddenly from waiting stillness to charged expectancy. Tassayo rose. The great chamber became silent, every lord motionless in his chair. In a voice that rang loudly in the quiet, the lord of the Minwanabi said, It is fitting. A message be sent to the light of heaven that one among us is willing to wear the white and gold, that he will stand first among us to guarantee continuance of the empire. Let it be known. His name is Aksan Tuka of the Waxatukan. A cheer arose from the council gathering, a vast echo of sound that filled the chamber to the highest arch in the ceiling. Though Kevin noticed more than half of the lords responded with little enthusiasm. He asked Arakasi, Why did Minwanabi give up? Mara herself returned answer. He was defeated. It is tradition for the lord who is closest to the victor to proclaim to the emperor. Kevin smiled. That's a bitter draught. The lady of the Akoma nodded slowly. Bitter indeed. As if she noticed the discomfort that wore away at her love's reserves, she added, Patience. By tradition, we must wait until the light of heaven sends his acknowledgement of the appointment. Kevin bore up as best he could. Despite today's call to council and the selection of a new warlord, the barbarian remained unconvinced that Ichindar was as much a slave to tradition as his lady thought. Yet he chose to say nothing. Within a half hour, a messenger in white and gold livery entered with a company of the Imperial Whites. They carried a mantle of snowy feathers, the edges trimmed in shining gold. They bowed before the chair of a mechen and presented the cloak to Aksantuka. Kevin studied the new warlord as the mantle was laid upon his shoulders. While the uncle, Almecho, had been a barrel-chested, bull-necked man... This nephew looked like a slender poet or teacher. His frame was thin to extreme and his face ascetic, almost delicate. But the triumph in his eyes revealed as rapacious a soul as Tassayo's. He seems pleased, said Kevin under his breath. Arakasi spoke quietly. He should be. He must have spent a large portion of his inheritance to have a half-dozen lords murdered. You think the black-clad warriors were his? Almost without doubt. Mara said, Why would he send soldiers against us? We would support any rival of Tassayo. To prevent unpredictable alliances and to ensure blame for the general slaughter was placed at Minwanabi's door. Arakasi's mood turned expansive, perhaps from satisfaction over an enemy's defeat. He is the victor. Minwanabi isn't. The Tong almost certainly worked for Tasayo. Logically, the other soldiers were Omechen. Order returned to the council, and after an uneventful interval of speech-making, Mara gave Kevin the order to fetch Lujan and her warriors. We return to our townhouse tonight. The Midkemian bowed to her, as a proper slave might, and walked slowly from the huge hall with its bejeweled, enigmatic ruling lords. Again, he concluded that the Sirani were the strangest race, with the most convoluted customs a man might ever encounter. Calm returned to Kentasani. For an interval, Mara and her household rested, healing wounds and assimilating the changes effected in politics since Wax and Tukar's assumption of the warlordship. Evenings were festive in the townhouse as the Lady of the Akoma entertained several influential lords whose interest now favoured her house. Kevin seemed more disgruntled than usual, but between exhaustion and her social obligations, Mara had little opportunity to deal with his dark mood. Arakasi sought out his mistress on the third morning as she reviewed communications from several lords still within the city. Clad in a clean servant's robe and content for the moment to let his splinted arm rest openly in a sling, 
he still gave her the deep bow her rank entitled. Mistress, the Minwenabi retinue has boarded barges upon the river. Tasayo is returning to his estates. Mara stood, her pens and papers and messages forgotten in the joy of the moment. Then we may safely return home. Again Arakasi bowed, this time lower than before. Mistress, I wish to beg your forgiveness. In all that occurred, I was not prepared for the lord of the Waxatukan to rise so quickly to replace his uncle. You take yourself too harshly to task, Arakasi. A shadow crossed Mara's face, and she moved restlessly to the window. Outside, the trees were shedding blossoms over the streets. Servants still pushed vegetable carts, and messengers still ran on swift feet. The day seemed bright and ordinary, like waking after nightmare. Who among us could have anticipated the murder that was done that night? Mara added, Your work spared five lords, myself among them. I would venture no single person did more, and the result gained the Akoma great prestige. Arakasi bowed his head. My mistress is gracious. I am grateful, Mara amended. Come, let us go home. Later that afternoon, the Akoma garrison marched smartly from the townhouse. Mara's litter and carry boxes and a wagon bearing the wounded securely in their midst. At the docks, boats waited to take the mistress and her retinue down river. Settled upon cushions beneath a canopy with Kevin at her side, Mara regarded the everyday bustle of trade along the waterfront. It is so tranquil. You would think nothing untoward had occurred in the last few weeks. Kevin also watched the dock workers, fishermen and labourers, the occasional beggar and street child, interrupting the organised flow of commerce. The common folk are never caught up in the affairs of the powerful, unless they have the misfortune to find themselves in the way. Then they die. Otherwise their lives go on, each day of work like the next. Troubled by an undercurrent of bitterness in his tone, Mara studied the man she had come to love. The breeze ruffled his red hair and the beard she could never quite become accustomed to. He leaned intently against the rail, the set of his shoulders stiff, the result of the scabs left by battle. The wrist beneath her hands was still bandaged and the look in his eyes held a bleakness as if he saw sorrow in the sunlight. She wanted to ask him his thoughts, but a shout from the shore distracted her. The boatmen cast off lines, pole men began their chant, and the craft slipped away from Kentasani and turned down river on the seaward pull of the Gagajin. Afternoon breezes snapped the pennons above the canopy, and Mara felt her heart lift. Tasayo had been defeated, and she was returning safely home. Here, she said to Kevin. Let us sit with a cool drink. The boats passed beyond the lower boundary of the holy city, and the banks showed the green of land under cultivation. The smell of river reeds mixed with the rich aroma of spring soil and the pungency of ngagi trees. The towers of the temples receded, and Mara drowsed contentedly, her head against Kevin's thigh. A cry from the shore aroused her, Akoma! Her force commander hailed back from the prow of the first boat, and presently the servants were all pointing to a cluster of tents at the river's edge. A war camp of impressive size spread over the meadow, and from the highest pole a green banner with a Chatrabird emblem blew in the wind. At Mara's signal, the steersman changed course for the bank and by the time the boat reached the shallows, a thousand Akoma soldiers waited to greet their mistress. Mara marvelled at their number, and her throat tightened with emotion. Scarcely ten years before, when she had assumed the mantle of ruling lady, there had been but thirty-seven left to wear the Akoma green. 
Three strike leaders greeted her litter and bowed as Kevin assisted her out onto firm soil. Welcome, Lady Mara! The warriors cheered as one to see their mistress again. The three officers formed ranks and escorted her through the troops to the shady awning of the command tent. There, Kiyoke waited, standing tall upon his crutch. He managed a formal bow and said, Mistress, our hearts are joyous at the sight of you. Fighting a sudden rush of tears, Mara answered, And my heart sings for the sight of you, dear companion. Kiyoke bowed at the kindness and moved aside so she might enter and settle in comfort on the pillows piled upon the thick carpets. Kevin sank to his knees beside her. He kneaded her back with the hand that had sustained no injury, and, under his touch, he felt her tension dissolve into quiet contentment. Still at his post by the entrance, Kiyoki saw the calm that settled over his mistress's face. As he had in the past for Lord Sezu, he faced the outer world where Lujan approached with Arakasi, strike leader Kenji, and the few hale survivors from the Night of the Bloody Swords. A secret smile twitched the old retainer's lips as he held up a hand in restraint. Force Commander, said the former holder of that office, if I may presume, there are times when it is best to let matters wait. Return to your mistress in the morning. Lujan bowed to Keoki's experience and called to the others to share a round of Huat beer. Inside the cool tent, Kevin glanced questioningly at the old man, who nodded his head in approval, then slipped the ties on the door curtains and let them slap gently closed. Outside the door now, Kiyoke faced the sunlight. His craggy features remained impassive, but his eyes held a clear light of pride for the lover of the woman he counted the daughter of his heart. Arakasi's messenger had made very plain what the Akoma owed to Kevin's courage with a sword. Kiyoke's grim face softened a fraction as he considered the stump that had been his right leg. Gods, but he was getting soft in his dotage. Never had he thought to see the day when he would be grateful for the impertinence of that red-headed barbarian slave. Evening shadows dimmed the great hall of the Minwanabi in the hour Lord Tassayo returned. Still clad in the armour he had worn on his trip upriver, his only concession to formality, the silk officer's cloak he had tossed over his shoulders, he strode through the wide main doorway. The chamber was filled. Every member of the household stood arrayed to meet him, and behind them every second cousin and vassal that had serviced the years of warfare and conflict. Thasayo strode between their still ranks as though he were totally alone. Only when he reached the dais did he stop, turn, and acknowledge the presence of others. Inkomo stepped forward to greet him. The hearts of the Minwanabi are filled at our Lord's return. Tasayo returned a curt nod. He handed his battle helm to a servant who bowed and retreated hastily. Never a man to waste words on banalities, the Lord of the Minwanabi turned a flat gaze upon his adviser. Are the priests ready? Enkomo bowed. As you requested, my Lord. New black and orange cushions adorned the high dais, along with a rug sewn of sarcat pelts and a table fashioned of intricately etched harolf bones. Tassayo gave the change in furnishings what seemed a passing glance, yet no detail escaped him. Satisfied that nothing left over from Desio's rule remained, he sat and gave no other sign before laying the bared steel blade of the Minwanabi ancestral sword across his knees. There followed a pause, in which Inkomo belatedly realised that he was expected to act without further sign from the master. Where Desio had insisted on control over even the tiniest action, Tasayo expected to be served. The Minwanabi first adviser waved for the ceremony to commence. 
A pair of priests approach the dais, one wearing the red paint and death mask of Turakamu and the other clad in the full-sleeved white robe of Juran the Just. Each intoned a blessing from the god they served. There followed no offerings and no grand ceremony in the manner that Desio had orchestrated. The priest of Duran lit a candle for constancy and left it burning in a stand woven of the reeds that symbolised the frailties of mortal man before his god. The priest of the death god did not dance or blow whistles. Neither did he ask his deity to show favour. Instead, he trod up the stairs of the dais and reminded in cold words that a promise of sacrifice remained unfulfilled. A vow sworn upon the blood of House Minwanabi, the priest reminded. The family of the Akoma must die in the name of Turakamu with Minwanabi lives as surety. Who would accept the Lord's mantle must also complete this charge. Tasayo said thinly, I acknowledge our debt to the Red God. My hand on this sword confirms it. The Red Priest traced a sigil in the air. Turkamu, smile upon your endeavour, or seal your death and that of your heirs should you fail. Bones clacked and rattled as the priest spun around and left the dais, while the draught of his passage guttered the candle of the just god. The new lord of the Minwanabi sat silently without expression, as first one and then another family member or retainer came forward to bow and pledge loyalty. When the last vassal had affirmed fealty, he arose and called to the strike leader posted by the side door. Send in my concubines. Two young women entered, both wearing rich clothes. One was tall, slender and fair-haired, her wide-set eyes jade green and delicately enhanced with paint. The other, robed in gauze lace dyed scarlet, had a dark complexion and a rounded figure. Of different types, both women owned a beauty that stopped men's eyes, and they advanced in tiny steps in the fashion of those trained since childhood to give pleasure. Both bowed gracefully before the dais, slender legs shown to advantage by short robes and loose-wrapped gowns revealing an ample glimpse of breast. Although such women were chosen from among the loveliest in the empire, neither held status above the meanest servant. All who were gathered in the hall stilled in curiosity to see what their lord wished with his courtesans. Before Tasayo's dais, both women fell to their knees, touching foreheads to the floor. Look at me, commanded Tasayo. Frightened, but in all things obedient, the two young women did as instructed. Your will, my lord, they intoned in voices of practised softness. The new lord of the Minwanabi regarded them with dispassionate eyes. Inkana, he addressed the dark one. Are your children close? Inkana nodded, dread draining the colour from her cheeks. She had borne her lord two illegitimate children, but their father's rise in status might not be to their benefit. It was not uncommon for a man come to the mantle of ruling lord to kill such offspring, preventing any claim upon the family. Bring them, Tasayo commanded. A shimmer that might have been tears brightened in Kana's almond eyes. Yet she jumped to her feet and hurried out of the Minwanabi Great Hall. Tasayo's regard shifted to the fair woman who remained on her knees before the dais. Sanjana, you have told my first adviser you are with child. Sanjana held her hands clasped, but the beadwork on her robe shimmered in the light as she trembled. Yes, Lord, she replied, the huskiness in her voice no ploy to seem seductive. Tasayo said nothing. His face and manner did not change even when Inkana reappeared, half dragging a small boy behind her. He had Tasayo's auburn hair and his mother's rosy complexion, and though he did not cry, his mother's nervousness frightened him. 
Carried in the concubine's arms was a second child, a girl not yet old enough to walk such a distance on her own. Too young to understand, she rode with her fingers in her mouth, her pale amber eyes on the gathering of people in the hall. From his place on the dais, Tassayo looked the children over as a man might inspect merchandise for floors. Then, almost absently, he motioned to the force commander Irilandi. Pointing at Sanjana, he said, Take this woman outside. I will see her die. Sanjana's fist came to her mouth. Her magnificent jade-coloured eyes filled with tears of terror, and her poise failed her. Unable to rise, she remained trembling on her knees until two warriors stepped in and gripped her by the arms. Her efforts to choke back painful sobs echoed over the stillness of the gathering as the men half-led, half-carried her from the hall. Alone before the dais, Inkana stood shivering, her hands clenched to her children and her face sweating with fear. Tassayo regarded her without pity or tenderness and said, I take this woman for my wife and name these children. What are their names? Inkana blinked, then hastily managed to whisper, Dasari and Ilani, my lord. Dasari is my heir. Tassayo's voice rang out over the gathering and echoed off the vaulted ceiling. Ilani is my first daughter. Then the stillness broke before a rustle of movement as all in the room bowed to the new lady of the Minwanabi. Tasayo instructed in Como, Have servants prepare suitable quarters for the lady of the Minwanabi and her children. To Inkana he said, Wife, retire to your quarters and await my call. Teachers will be sent for the children tomorrow. I would have them begin instruction in their duties to their family. The Sari will someday rule this house. The former concubine bowed, her movements still tense with terror. She took no joy from her sudden rise in station, but hurried her son and carried her daughter from the dais past hundreds of staring strangers. To his guests, relations and vassals, Tasayo said, We shall have the wedding ceremony tomorrow. You are all welcome to share the feast. At this, Incomo's long face froze against showing alarm. A wedding required careful planning to ensure the most favourable auspices. The timing, the food, the ritual marriage hut, all required the blessings of priests and meticulous attention to tradition. Unions of great lords were seldom undertaken at short notice, lest details be overlooked and ill luck visit the new couple and carry through the next generation. Yet Tassayo gave the matter short shrift. With the silvery steel of his ancestral sword set at rest on his shoulder, he said, See to the arrangements, first adviser. Then, the bared blade flashing under the skylight as he turned, he motioned for Incomo to follow and strode from the hall without further speech. Tassayo moved toward the outer door, certain that the two soldiers who were stationed on either side would have it open in time for him to pass through. As their lord emerged from the house and stepped into the courtyard, two warriors snapped to attention, the terrified Sanjana between them. She had shaken her hair from its pins, and the length of it fell in waves down her back, rare gold enhanced by the sun. She held her eyes downcast, but at Tassayo's appearance she looked up entreatingly. The soft white skin over her breasts showed her quick breathing, but her courtesan's skills did not fail her. Even frightened, even driven by desperation, she still managed to husband the only advantage she possessed. Sanjana parted red lips and arranged her slim body so that no man who beheld her could mistake her for what she was, a magnificent ornament whose sole purpose was pleasure. The effect was not lost upon Tassayo. His eyes brightened as he followed all of her curves and hollows and drank in the promise of lust that her provocative pose implied. He licked his lips bent down and kissed her fully and long. With one hand he caressed her breasts. Then he stepped back and said, I have found you a satisfactory bedmate. 
as hope filled her magnificent eyes, he smiled at her. He savoured the moment and the sparkle of relief in her expression as he added, Kill her now. Her face blanched in stark terror, but she had no chance to cry out. One warrior caught both of her wrists and yanked them high, forcing her to look at Tassayo, while the other, stiff-faced, pulled out his sword and drove the blade home in her stomach. She jerked and gave one thin, high scream of abject agony. Then blood fountained from her mouth, pattering in drops on the courtyard path. Her legs crumpled. Held pinioned by the warrior's grip, she hung through the throes of her dying. Bright blood darkened brighter hair. Then her muscles sagged and her head rolled forward and the lovely long white thighs went limp. Take her away, Tasayo said on a wild, ragged breath. His eyes were round and his colour high. Then he inhaled deeply as if to calm himself and said to Incomo, I shall bathe. Send two slave girls to attend me, and see that they are young and beautiful, preferably untouched. Faintly sick and distressed that it might show, Incomo bowed. As my lord wishes. He began to leave. I am not done with my instructions, Tasayo chided. He walked on down the garden path, his mouth curled at the corners in the faintest beginning of a smile as he signalled in Como to follow. I have given some thought to the matter of the Acoma spies. The time has come to turn our knowledge into advantage. Come, I will instruct you before I retire. Incomo forced his mind away from the memory of the dying courtesan. He must pay attention. Tasayo was not a man who took kindly to incompetence. He would give orders once and expect them to be followed to the letter. Yet the avid gleam in the master's eye left the first adviser deeply discomforted. He held up a hand that shook despite his best efforts. Perhaps, he suggested tactfully, my lord would prefer to discuss such matters of business after the comforts of his bath. Tasayo stopped. He turned amber eyes to his first adviser and studied the older man intently. His smile deepened. You have served my family well, he said finally, his tone like unmarked velvet. I will humour you. Then he continued down the path, saying, Consider yourself dismissed until I call. The old adviser remained, his heart pounding as if he had finished a hard run. His knees shook. He sensed with uncanny certainty that the master had perceived his weakness, then let the matter pass, as if he knew the first adviser's imagination would torment him with abuses far worse than the sport Tasayo planned in his bath with his slave girls. Too shaken yet to feel sadness, Incomo faced facts. Against his deepest hopes, Lord Tassayo had inherited the family predilection for viciousness and appetite for pain. The Lord of the Minwanabi rested in his bathing tub while a servant poured hot water over his shoulders. He watched his first adviser bow through hazy, half-closed eyes, but Incomo did not deceive himself. Languid though Tasayo might seem, the hands left poised on the rim of the tub were neither slack nor relaxed. I came as my lord required. Incomo straightened, his nostrils flaring as he caught a pungent, sweet odour on the air, explained a moment later as Tasayo reached over and lifted a long pipe of tatisha from a side table. He set the stem between his lips and sucked deeply. The first adviser of the Minwanabi buried his surprise. The sap of the tatin bush contained a substance that induced euphoria. The nuts were often chewed by slaves in the field to lessen the drudgery of their lives. But the silks at bloom contained a powerful narcotic. 
The smoke brought first an enhancement and then a distortion of perception. Prolonged use brought the mind to a trance-like stupor. The first adviser considered the lure of such a drug to a man who enjoyed inflicting pain on others, then thought better of such musing. It was not his place to question the practices of his master. In Como, said Tassayo with sharp and incisive clarity, I have decided that we must move forward with our plan to destroy the Acoma. As my lord commands, Incomo said. Tasayo's fingers tapped arrhythmically on the tub rim as if he ticked off points. Once that is accomplished, I shall then destroy that preening collie bird Aksantuka. His eyes abruptly flicked open. He gazed at the first adviser, every fibre of him angry. If that buffoon of a cousin of mine had done his duty and destroyed Mara, I would wear the white and gold today. Incomo thought it politic not to remind his lord that it had been Tassayo who had devised the plan to destroy Mara, not Desio. He returned a stiff nod. Tassayo waved away the bath servant. Leave us. Alone with his adviser, and wrapped in rising curls of steam, he drew again on his pipe. Physically, he seemed to relax, and his eyes grew drowsy once more. I want one of those two Acoma spies promoted. My lord? Tassayo leaned over the edge of the tub and rested his chin upon it. Need I repeat myself? No, my lord, Incomo murmured quickly, warned by the spark of fire under the master's lashes. I am just not sure what you mean. I wish to have one of the Acoma spies close at hand. Tasayo considered a rising ribbon of smoke as if it told him secrets. He went on. I would observe this servant. Let him believe that he can eavesdrop upon critical conversations. You and I shall be certain that nothing he overhears is inherently false. No, never false, but... We'll also remember anything we say will also be heard by Mara. The deep plans we keep to ourselves discussed only when we are alone. The little things we say before the spy will be offered as a gambit. I want this servant observed and followed until this network of Acoma spies is infiltrated. Incomo bowed. Anything else, my lord? Tasayo set the pipe to his lips and drew another lungful of the intoxicating smoke. No, I am tired. I will sleep. Tomorrow at dawn I will hunt. Then I will dine with you and the other advisers. At midday I will marry, and throughout the afternoon we shall celebrate the wedding festival. Send to the nearby villages for entertainers. Nothing if not concise, Tasayo summed up. Now leave. The Minwanabi first adviser retired from his master's presence. Upon return to his quarters, he determined the time was appropriate to begin composition of his death prayer. A careful man addressed this task when he got on in years, that his final appeal to the gods be read by someone who survived him. To name the Lady of the Acoma for destruction seemed a perilous enough course but to mark the new warlord who had just come to power over the bodies of five other claimants as a target was suicide. As he shed his formal robe of office, Incomo wasted no time wondering whether Tasayo's planning was a dream that would disperse with the Tatisha smoke. The eyes beneath their heavy lids had been all too dangerously aware. Sighing at the discomfort of stiff knees, Incomo knelt before his writing table. Three Minwanabi lords before Tasayo he had called master, and while they were not men he admired, they were lords he was pledged to serve with his mind and will and, if need be, his life. Taking a deep breath, he took up his pen and began to write. The festivities were modest, but those in attendance seemed to enjoy themselves. 
The food was ample, the wine abundant, and the lord of the Minwanabi sat atop his dais in the great hall of his ancestors, looking every inch the quintessential Sirani warrior. If he was not overly solicitous to his wife, he was polite and observed all the forms. In Karna's skimpy courtesan's garb had been replaced by a robe of stunning richness. Black silk embroidered with orange threads at sleeves, neck and hem, and studded down the front with matching pearls of incalculable worth. The two children sat quietly at their father's feet, the boy slightly higher and closer than the girl. Occasionally, Tassayo would speak to Dasari, instructing him in some point of trivia or another. From the moment he named his son legitimate, Tassayo was determined to groom him for rulership. The boy's robe was a clear imitation of his father's, down to the embroidery upon the sleeve, the outline of a snarling sarcat. The little girl, Ilani, was content to sit below her father's feet, chewing upon a sweet fruit, while a juggler entertained. Behind the Lord of the Minwanabi stood a servant, one recently promoted to the personal service of the master of the estate. While only the least of four men assigned responsibility for attending to their lord's needs, this one listened with a little more attention to the nuances of conversation. Throughout the evening, the festivities continued until Tassayo rose and bid his guests good evening. Motioning for Incomo to accompany him, the Lord of the Minwanabi moved toward his private quarters. Incomo quietly requested the servant to follow and station himself at the door to the master's chamber, against Tassayo's needs. The servant did as he was bid, with a patience that concealed the fact that he avidly consigned to memory every word that passed between the Lord and his first adviser. An ancient ulo tree clutched the soil with gnarled roots and its branches threw the sight of the Akomanatami into deep, cool shade. Mara bowed before the stone that was sacred to her ancestors and the embodiment of Akoma honour. She spoke a few ritual phrases and placed a tied cluster of flowers before the monument, blossoms in seven colours that represented each of the good gods. On this, the first day of summer, she gave thanks for the well-being of all under her protection. For a moment, after the brief ceremony, she lingered. The sacred contemplation glade held unique peace, for here none but the head gardener, an invited priest, or those born of a coma blood might tread. Here she could truly be alone with her thoughts and emotions. Mara regarded the beautiful reflecting pool, the small stream, and the graceful shapes of the shrubs. A sudden disquiet came over her. At times she recalled too clearly the assassin who had once nearly brought her death on the soil before her own Natami. The memory often visited her unawares, like a chill on a hot day. Restless now, and anxious to leave the confinement of the garden's high containment hedge, Mara arose. She left the lovely garden and stepped under the arched outer gate and, as always, found a servant waiting. He bowed the instant she made her appearance. Mysteries, said a voice she immediately recognised. Your spymaster has returned with news. Four weeks had passed since Mara's return from the council that elected the new warlord. The spymaster had been absent gathering information for most of that time, and her delight at discovering him back was most welcome to him. Rise up, Arakasi, Mara said. I will hear your report in my study. Inside, settled on cushions with the customary light meal on a tray by his elbow, Arakasi sat quietly, his arm resting in a sling of elaborately knotted string of a fashion tied by sail hands. You have been on a boat, Mara observed, or else in the company of sailors. Neither, Arakasi said in his distinctively modulated voice, but that was the impression I wished to lend the last person I paid for information. Sailors' gossip is seldom reliable, he added conclusively. Curious who such a person might have been, Mara knew better than to inquire. 
She had no idea how Arakasi's network operated, nor who his agents were. That was part of her original agreement when the spy master swore service to her house. Mara always saw that Arakasi received whatever he needed to maintain his agents, but she was oath-bound not to ask for names. A spy in house service risked slaves' death by hanging were he to be discovered, betrayed or sold out. Should Mara's house fall to an enemy, neither she nor any retainer could break trust. The network would survive to serve Ayaki, or, in worst case, were the Akomanatami to be buried upside down, forever denied the sunlight, loyal subjects who served as spies could die on the blade without shame in the eyes of the gods. Arakasi said, Something fortunate has occurred, perhaps. One of our agents in the Minuanabi house has been promoted to the personal service of Tasayo. Mara's eyes widened with pleasure. That is wonderful news! Yet, as Arakasi's face betrayed his lack of agreement, she said, You are suspicious? This is too timely. Blandest when he was troubled, Arakasi qualified, We know one agent was discovered and escaped only by means that border upon miraculous. The other two have been left untroubled, and their intelligence has been accurate for the most part. But something in this rings false. Mara considered for a moment, then suggested, Begin to insinuate another agent into the Minuanabi house. Arakasi worried at a loose end of string and watched one of the knots come unravelled. Lady... It is too soon after the discovery of our agent, and too near the accession of a new lord. The Minwanabi will closely examine new candidates for service in any capacity, particularly since Aksantukas rise to power. At this time, it is too risky to send a stranger into the Minwanabi estate. Only a fool would not bow to the spy master's judgment. Mara made a tight gesture of frustration that she had no clear line of intelligence into the one house she feared above all others. Tasayo was too dangerous to remain unwatched. Let me think on this, she said to her spy master. Arakasi bowed his head. Your will, my lady. His next item of news was still less welcome. Takuma of the Anasati is ill. Gravely? Mara sat straight in concern. Despite an antagonism begun in her father's time and continued through her late husband's death, she respected the old lord, and Ayaki's safety depended heavily upon the unofficial alliance between the Akoma and Anasati. With a pang of self-recrimination, Mara saw that she had tempted trouble by not taking a suitable husband. One heir was too slender a thread on which to hang a coma continuance. Arakasi's voice snapped her out of reflection. To all appearance, Takuma is in no danger, but the illness lingers and he is an old man. Much of his former vigour was lost with the death of his eldest son, Halesco, during the betrayal upon Midkemia. With Jiro now heir, I think the Lord of Anasati grows tired of the game of the council, and perhaps of life. Mara sighed, feeling oppression in the deepening shadows. The rest of Arakasi's information consisted of intriguing minor details, a few of which were going to interest Jikan. But worry undermined the interplay of wits she usually enjoyed with her spymaster, and she excused him without speculation at the conclusion of his report. Alone in her study, she called for her writing desk and penned a note to wish Takuma a swift recovery. She picked up her chop, inked it, and pressed it into the parchment then had her runner summon a messenger to deliver the note to the Anasati. 
By now, the sun hung low over the meadows. The heat had lessened, and Mara walked alone in her garden a while, listening to the play of water over the rocks and the rustle of birds in the trees. The round of the game that had brought the new warlord to power had been extremely bitter and bloody. New strategies would have to be evolved and new plans made, for, while winners and losers alike were retiring to their estates to reassess, the plotting would go on unabated. Tassio was far more dangerous than Decio, but fate had given him a more perilous situation than his predecessor. His defeat in Suba had left his resources lessened, and he had gained an unpredictable and potentially lethal rival in the new warlord. Tassio would be forced to move cautiously for the time being, lest he overextend himself and find enemies exploiting his vulnerabilities. Many of the old guard had died, and new forces were emerging. Despite its questionable role in the debacle at the peace treaty with the Midkemian king, the Blue Wheel Party, especially the Kanzawai clan members, and most especially the Shinzawai, had emerged surprisingly unscathed. They still held the regard of the emperor and were actually gaining influence. Mara weighed possibilities in her mind as to the next likely turn of politics. A squeal of laughter and a shout from inside the house told her that Kevin and Ayaki had come back from their outing. Game birds had returned to the northern lakes for the hot season and Kevin had agreed to take the boy hunting to try his growing skills with the bow. Mara had faint hopes for any success, given the boy's youth. But, against her best expectations, her son and his companion burst into the garden bearing a fine brace of waterfowl. Ayaki cried out, Mother, see, I shot them! Kevin grinned down upon the small hunter, and Mara felt a surge of love and pride. Her barbarian had not recovered entirely from the black moods that had begun with the news of the aborted peace treaty. Despite his silence on the subject, Mara knew that Kevin's slavery rankled with him, no matter how deep his regard for herself and Ayaki. But worries could not intrude to ruin the excitement of her son's first manly accomplishment. Mara made a display of being impressed. You shot them? Kevin smiled. Indeed he did. The boy's a natural bowman. He killed both of these, whatever you call these blue geese. Ayaki wrinkled his nose. Not geese. That's a dumb word. I told you, they are Jojana. He laughed, for this naming of things had become an ongoing joke between them. Abruptly, Mara was chilled by a shadow from the past. Ayaki's father had been a demon with a bow. A hint of bitterness tinged her words as she said, Ayaki comes to this gift honestly. Kevin's expression clouded over, for Mara rarely spoke of Buntakapi, the Anasati son she had married as a move in the great game. The Midkemian sought at once to distract her. Have we time for a walk near the meadow? The calves are now old enough to play, and Ayaki and I made a bet that he can't outrun them. Mara considered only a moment. There is nothing I would wish for more, to spend some time with you both watching the calves play. Ayaki held his bow overhead and shouted enthusiastic approval as Mara clapped for a maid to bring her walking slippers. Off you go, she said to her ecstatically happy son. Take your Jojana to the cook and we shall see if two legs are faster than six. As the boy pounded off down the path, the brace of birds flapping awkwardly around his knees, Kevin gathered Mara close and kissed her. You look distracted. Irked that he should find her so transparent, Mara said, Ayaki's grandfather is ill. I'm worried. Kevin stroked back a stray lock of hair. Is it serious? It doesn't seem to be. Yet Mara's frown lingered. Kevin felt an inward pang for concern for her son's safety overlaid a quagmire of issues they would rather leave unbroached. One day he knew she must marry, but that time was not now. 
put worry aside for today. He said gently, You deserve a few hours for yourself, and your boy won't stay carefree much longer if his mother can't spare him time to play. Mara returned a wry smile. I'd better work up an appetite, she confessed. Else a good deal of hard-won jajana meat will wind up feeding jigger birds as scraps.'